Section zero zero of To the Last Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. To the Last Man by Zane Gray. Forward. It was inevitable that in my efforts to write romantic history of the Great West, I should at length come to the story of a feud. For long I have steered clear of this rock, but at last I have reached it and must go over it, driven by my desire to chronicle the stirring events of pioneer days. Even today it is not possible to travel into the remote corners of the West without seeing the lives of people still affected by a fighting past. How can the truth be told about the pioneering of the West if the struggles the fight, the blood, be left out. It cannot be done. How can a novel be stirring and thrilling, as were those times, unless it be full of sensation? My long labors have been devoted to making stories resemble the times they depict. I have loved the West for its vastness, its contrast, its beauty and color, and life for its wildness and violence, and for the fact that that I have seen how it developed great men and women who died unknown and unsung. In this materialistic age, this hard, practical, swift, greedy age of realism, it seems there is no place for writers of romance, no place for romance itself. For many years all the events leading up to the Great War were realistic, and the war itself was horribly realistic, and the aftermath is likewise. Romance is only another name for idealism, and I contend that life without ideals is not worth living. Never in the history of the world were our ideals needed so terribly as now. Walter Scott wrote romance, so did Victor Hugo, and likewise Kipling, Hawthorne, Stevenson. It was Stevenson, particularly, who wheeled a bludgeon against the realists. People live for the dream in their hearts, and I have yet to know anyone who is not some secret dream, some hope, however dim, some storied wall to look at in the dusk, some painted window leading to the soul. How strange indeed to find that the realists have ideals and dreams. To read them, one would think their lives held nothing significant. But they love, they hope, they dream, they sacrifice, they struggle on with that dream in their hearts just the same as others. We are all dreamers, if not in the heavy-lidded wasting of time, then in the meaning of life that makes us work on. It was Wordsworth who wrote, The world is too much with us, and if I could give the secret of my ambition as a novelist in a few words, it would be contained in that quotation. My inspiration to write has always come from nature character and action, a subordinated to setting. In all that I have done, I have tried to make people see how the world is too much with them. Getting and spending, they lay waste their powers, with never a breath of the free and wonderful life of the open. So I come back to the main point of this forward, in which I am trying to tell why and how I came to write the story of a feud notorious in Arizona as the Pleasant Valley War. Some years ago, Mr. Henry Adams, a cattleman of Vermajo Park, New Mexico, told me that he had been in the Tonto Basin of Arizona and thought I might find interesting material there concerning this Pleasant Valley War. His version of the war between cattlemen and sheepmen certainly determined me to look over the ground. My old guide, Al Doyle of Flagstaff, had led me over half of Arizona but never down into that wonderful wild and rugged basin between the Mogollon Mesa and the Mazatels Mountains. Doyle had long lived on the frontier, and his version of the Pleasant Valley War differed markedly from that of Mr. Adams. I asked other old-timers about it, and their remarks further excited my curiosity. Once down there, Doyle and I found the wildest, most rugged, roughest, and most remarkable country either of us had visited, and the few inhabitants were like the country. I went in ostensibly 
to hunt bear and lion and turkey. But what I was really hunting for was the story of that Pleasant Valley War. I engaged the services of a bear hunter who had three strapping sons, as reserved and strange and aloof as he was. No wheel tracks of any kind had ever come within miles of their cabin. I spent two wonderful months hunting game and reveling in the beauty and grandeur of the Rimrock country. But I came out knowing no more about the Pleasant Valley War. These Texans and their few neighbors, likewise from Texas, did not talk, but all I saw and felt only inspired me the more. This trip was in the fall of 1918. The next year I went again with the best horses, outfit, and men the Doyles could provide. At this time, I did not ask any questions. But I rode horses, some of them too wild for me, and packed a rifle many a hundred miles, riding sometimes thirty and forty miles a day. And I climbed in and out of the deep canyons, desperately staying at the heels of one of those long-legged Texans. I learned the life of those backwoodsmen, but I did not get the story of the Pleasant Valley War. I had, however, won the friendship of that hardy people. In 1920, I went back with a still larger outfit, equipped to stay as long as I liked, and this time, without my asking it, different natives of the Tonto came to tell me about the Pleasant Valley War. No two of them agreed on anything concerning it, except that only one of the active participants survived the fighting. Whence comes my title, To the Last Man. Thus I was swamped in a mass of material out of which I could only flounder to my own conclusion. Some of the stories told me are singularly tempting to a novelist, but though I believe them myself, I cannot risk their improbability to those who have no idea of the wildness of wild men at a wild time. There really was a terrible and bloody feud, perhaps the most deadly and least known in all the annals of the West. I saw the ground, the cabins, the graves, all so darkly suggestive of what must have happened. I never learned the truth of the causes of the Pleasant Valley War, or if I did hear it, I had no means of recognizing it. All the given causes were plausible and convincing. Strange to state, there is still secrecy and recitance all over the Tonto Basin as to the facts of this feud. Many descendants of those killed are living there now, but no one likes to talk about it. Assuredly, many of the incidents told me really occurred, as, for example, the terrible one of the two women, in the face of relentless enemies, saving the bodies of their dead husbands from being devoured by wild hogs. Suffice it to say that this romance is true to my conception of the war, and I base it upon the setting I learned to know and love so well upon the strange passions of primitive people, and upon my instinctive reaction to the facts and rumors that I gathered. Zane Gray, Avalon, California, April 1921 End of Forward Section 1 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1, Part 1 At the end of a dry uphill ride over barren country, Jean Isbel unpacked to camp at the edge of the cedars where a little rocky canyon green with willow and cottonwood promised water and grass. His animals were tired, especially the pack mule that had carried a heavy load and with slow heave of relief, they knelt and rolled in the dust. Jean experienced something of relief himself as he threw off his chaps. He had not been used to hot, dusty, glaring days on the barren lands. Stretching his long length beside a tiny rill of clear water that tinkled over the red stones, he drank thirstily. The water was cool, but it had an acrid taste an alkali bite that he did not like. Not since he had left Oregon had he tasted clear, sweet, cold water, and he missed it just as he longed 
for the stately shady forests he had loved. This wild, endless Arizona land bade fair to earn his hatred. By the time he had leisurely completed his tasks, twilight had fallen, and coyotes had begun their barking. Jean listened to the yelps and to the moan of the cool wind in the cedars with a sense of satisfaction that these lonely sounds were familiar. The cedar wood burned into a pretty fire, and the smell of its smoke was newly pleasant. "'Reckon maybe I'll learn to like Arizona,' he mused half aloud. "'But I've a hankering for waterfalls and dark green forests. Must be the Indian in me. Anyway, Dad needs me bad, and I reckon I'm here for keeps.' Jean threw some cedar branches on the fire, in the light of which he opened his father's letter hoping by repeated readings to grasp more of its strange portent. It had been two months in reaching him, coming by traveler, by stage and train, and then by boat, and finally by stage again. Written in lead pencil, on a leaf torn from an old ledger, it would have been hard to read even if the writing had been more legible. Dad's writing was always bad, but I never saw it so shaky, said Jean, thinking aloud. Grass Valley, Arizona. Son, Jean, come home. Here is your home, and here you are needed. When we left Oregon, we all reckoned you would not be long behind. But it's years now, and I'm growing old, son, and you was always my steadiest boy. Not that you ever was so damn steady. Only your wildness seemed more for the woods. You take after mother, and your brothers, Bill and Guy, take after me. That is the red and white of it. You're part Indian, Jean, and that Indian I reckon I'm going to need bad. I'm rich in cattle and horses, and my range here is the best I ever seen. Lately we have been losing stock, but that is not all, nor so bad. Sheepmen had moved into the Tonto and are grazing down on Grass Valley. Cattlemen and sheepmen can never bide in this country. We have bad times ahead. Reckon I'll have more reason to worry and need you, but you must wait to hear that by word of mouth. Whatever you're doing, chuck it, and rustle for Grass Valley, so to make here by spring. I am asking you to take pains to pack in some guns and a lot of shells, and hide them in your outfit. If you meet anyone when you are coming down into the Tonto, listen more than you talk. And last, son, don't let anything keep you in Oregon." Reckon you have a sweetheart, and if so, fetch her along. With love, from your dad. Gaston Isbel Jean pondered over this letter. Judged by memory of his father, who had always been self-sufficient, it had been a surprise and somewhat of a shock. Weeks of travel and reflection had not helped him to grasp the meaning between the lines. Yes, dad's growing old, mused Jean feeling a warmth and a sadness stir in him. He must be way over sixty, but he never looked old, so he's rich now and losing stock and going to be sheeped off his range. Dad could stand a lot of rustling, but not much from sheepmen. The softness that stirred in Jean merged into a cold, thoughtful earnestness, which had followed every perusal of his father's letter. A dark, full current seemed flowing in his veins, and at times he felt it swell and heat. It troubled him, making him conscious of a deeper, stronger self opposed to his careless, free, and dreamy nature. No ties had bound him in Oregon except love for the great still forests and the thundering rivers, and this love came from his softer side. It had cost him a wrench to leave and all the way by ship and down the coast to San Diego and across the Sierra Madres by stage, and so on to this last overland travel by horseback, he had felt a retreating of the self that was tranquil and happy, and a dominating of this unknown somber self, with its menacing possibilities. Yet despite a nameless regret and a loyalty to Oregon, when he lay in his blankets he had to confess a keen interest in his adventurous future, a keen enjoyment 
of this stark, wild Arizona. It appeared to be a different sky stretching in dark, star-spangled dome over him. Closer, vaster, bluer. The strong fragrance of sage and cedar floated over him with the campfire smoke and all seemed drowsily to subdue his thoughts. At dawn he rolled out of his blankets, and pulling on his boots, began the day with a zest for the work that must bring closer his calling future. White crackling frost and cold, nipping air were the same keen spurs to action that he had known in the uplands of Oregon, yet they were not wholly the same. He sensed an exhilaration similar to the effect of a strong, sweet wine. His horse and mule had fared well during the night, having been much refreshed by the grass and water of the little canyon. Jean mounted and rode into the cedars with gladness that at last he had put the endless leagues of barren land behind him. The trail he followed appeared to be seldom traveled. It led accordingly to the meager information obtainable at the last settlement, directly to what was called the Rim, and from there Grass Valley could be seen down in the basin. The ascent of the ground was so gradual that only in long open stretches could it be seen. But the nature of the vegetation showed Joan how he was climbing. Scant, low, scraggly cedars gave place to more numerous, darker, greener, bushier ones and these two high, full-foiled, green-buried trees. Sage and grass in the open flats grew more luxuriously. Then came the pinions, and presently, among them, the checkered-barked junipers. Jean hailed the first pine tree with a hearty slap on the brown, rugged bark. It was a small dwarf pine, struggling to live. The next one was larger, and after that came several, and beyond them, pines stood up everywhere above the lower trees. Odor of pine needles mingled with the other dry smells that made the wind pleasant to Jean. In an hour from the first line of pines, he had ridden beyond the cedars and pinions into a slowly thickening and deepening forest. Underbrush appeared scarce, except in ravines, and the ground in open patches held a bleached grass. Jean's eyes roved for sight of squirrels, birds, deer, or any moving creature. It appeared to be a dry, uninhabited forest. About midday, Jean halted at a pond of surface water, evidently melted snow, and gave his animals a drink. He saw a few old deer tracks in the mud, and several huge bird tracks new to him, which he concluded must have been made by wild turkeys. The trail divided at this pond. Jean had no idea which branch he ought to take. Reckon it doesn't matter, he muttered, as he was about to remount. His horse was standing with ears up, looking back along the trail. Then Jean heard a clip-clop of trotting hoofs, and presently espied a horseman. Jean made a pretense of tightening his saddle girths while he peered over his horse at the approaching rider. All men in this country were going to be of exceeding interest to Jean Isbel. This man at a distance rode and looked like all Arizonians Jean had seen. He had a superb seat in the saddle, and he was long and lean. He wore a huge black sombrero and a soiled red scarf. His vest was open, and he was without a coat. The rider came trotting up and halted several paces from Jean. "'Hello, stranger,' he said gruffly. "'Howdy yourself,' replied Jean. He felt an instinctive importance in the meeting with the man. Never had sharper eyes flashed over Jean and his outfit. He had a dust-colored, sunburned face, long, lean, and hard, a huge, sandy mustache that hid his mouth, and eyes of piercing light intensity. Not very much hard Western experience had passed by this man. Yet he was not old, measured by years. When he dismounted, Jean saw he was tall, even for an Arizonian. "'Seen your tracks back a ways,' he said, as he slipped the bit to let his horse drink. "'Where bound?' 
Reckon I'm lost, all right, replies Jean. New country for me. Sure. I seen that from your tracks and your last camp. Well, where was you headed before you got lost? The query was deliberately cool with a dry, crisp ring. Jean felt the lack of friendliness or kindness in it. Grass Valley. My name's Isbel, he replied shortly. The rider attended to his drinking horse and presently rebridled him. Then, with long swing of leg, he appeared to step into the saddle. "'Sure I knowed you was Jean Isbel,' he said. "'Everybody in the Tonto has heard old Gas Isbel sent for his boy.' "'Well, then why did you ask?' inquired Jean, bluntly. "'Reckon I wanted to see what you'd say.' "'So? All right.' but I'm not caring very much for what you say. Their glances locked steadily, then, and each measured the other by the intangible conflict of spirit. Sure, that's natural, replied the rider. His speech was slow, and the motions of his long brown hands, as he took a cigarette from his vest, kept time with his words. But seeing you're one of the Isbels, I'll have my say whether you want it or not. My name's Coulter, and I'm one of the sheepmen Gas Isbel's riled with. Coulter, glad to meet you, replied Jean, and I reckon who riled my father is going to rile me. Sure, if that wasn't so, you'd not be an Isbel, returned Coulter with a grim little laugh. It's easy to see you ain't running into any Tonto Basin fellows yet. Well, I'm going to tell you that your old man gabbed like a woman down at Greaves' store, bragged about you and how you could fight and how you could shoot and how you could track a horse or a man, bragged how you'd chase every sheep herder back up on the rim. I'm telling you because we want you to get our stand straight. We're going to run sheep down in Grass Valley. Uh-huh. Well, who's we? queried Jean curtly. We at? We, I mean, the sheepmen ranging this rim from Black Butte to the Apache country. Coulter, I'm a stranger in Arizona, said Jean slowly. I know little about ranchers or sheepmen. It's true my father sent for me. It's true, I dare say, that he bragged, for he was given to bluster and blow, and he's old now. I can't help it if he bragged about me. But if he has, and if he's justified in his stand against you sheepmen, I'm going to do my best to live up to his brag. I get your hunch. Sure we understand each other, and that's a powerful help. You take my hunch to your old man, replied Coulter, as he turned his horse away toward the left. That trail leading south is yours. When you come to the rim, you'll see a bare spot down in the basin. That'll be Grass Valley. He rode away, out of sight, into the woods. Jean leaned against his horse and pondered. It seemed difficult to be just to this Coulter, not because of his claims, but because of a subtle hostility that emanated from him. Coulter had the hard face, the mask intent, the turn of speech that Jean had come to associate with dishonest men. Even if Jean had not been prejudiced, if he had known nothing of his father's troubles with these sheepmen, and if Coulter had met him only to exchange glances and greetings, still Jean would never have had a favorable impression. Coulter, grated upon him, roused an antagonism seldom felt. "'Hi ho,' sighed the young man. "'Good-bye to hunting and fishing. Dad's given me a man's job.' With that he mounted his horse and started the pack mule in the right-hand trail. Walking and trotting, he traveled all afternoon, toward sunset, getting into heavy forest of pine. More than one snowbank showed white through the green, sheltered on the north slopes of shady ravines, and it was upon entering this zone of richer, deeper forest land that Jean sloughed off his gloomy forebodings. These stately pines were not the giant firs of Oregon, but any lover of the woods could be happy under them. Higher still he climbed, until the forest spread before and around him like a level park, 
with thicketed ravines here and there on each side, and presently that deceitful level led to a higher bench upon which the pines towered and were matched by beautiful trees he took for spruce. Heavily barked, with regular spreading branches, these conifers rose in symmetrical shape to spear the sky with silver plumes. A graceful gray-green moss waved like veils from the branches. The air was not so dry, and it was cooler, with a scent and touch of snow. Jean made his camp at the first likely sight, taking the precaution to unroll his bed some little distance from his fire. Under the softly moaning pines he felt comfortable, having lost the sense of an immeasurable open space falling away from all around him. The gobbling of wild turkeys awakened Jean. Chug-a-lug, 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 chug. There was not a great difference between the gobble of a wild turkey and that of a tame one. Jean got up, and taking his rifle, went out into the gray obscurity of dawn to try to locate the turkeys. But it was too dark, and finally when daylight came, they appeared to be gone. The mule had strayed, and, what with finding it and cooking breakfast and packing, Jean did not make a very early start. On this last lap of his journey he had slowed down. He was weary of hurrying. The change from weeks in the glaring sun and dust-laden wind to this sweet, cool, darkly green and brown forest was very welcome. He wanted to linger along the shaded trail. This day, he made sure, would see him reach the rim. By and by, he lost the trail. It had just worn out from lack of use. Every now and then, Jean would cross an old trail, and as he penetrated deeper into the forest, every damp or dusky spot showed tracks of turkey, deer, and bear. The amount of bear sign surprised him. Presently his keen nostrils were assailed by the smell of sheep, and soon he rode into a broad sheep trail. From the tracks, Jean calculated that the sheep had passed there the day before. An unreasonable antipathy seemed born in him. To be sure, he had been prepared to dislike sheep, and that was why he was unreasonable. But on the other hand, this band of sheep had left a broad, bare swath, weedless, grassless, flowerless, in their wake. Where sheep grazed, they destroyed. That was what Jean had against them. An hour later he rode to the crest of a long park-like slope, where new green grass was sprouting and flowers peeped everywhere. The pines appeared far apart, gnarled oak trees, showed rugged and gray against the green wall of woods. A white strip of snow gleamed like a moving stream away down in the woods. Jean heard the musical tinkle of bells and the baa, baa of sheep and the faint, sweet bleating of lambs. As he rode toward these sounds, a dog ran out from an oak thicket and barked at him. Next Jean smelled a campfire, and soon he caught sight of a curling blue column of smoke, and then a small peaked tent. Beyond the clump of oaks, Jean encountered a Mexican lad carrying a carbine. The boy had a swarthy, pleasant face, and to Jean's greeting he replied, Buenos dias. Jean understood little Spanish, and about all he gathered by his simple queries was that the lad was not alone, and that it was lambing time. This latter circumstance grew noisily manifest. The forest seemed shrilly full of incessant baas and plaintive bleats. All about the camp, on the slope, in the glades, and everywhere were sheep. A few were grazing. Many were lying down. Most of them were ewes, suckling white fleecy little lambs that staggered on their feet. Everywhere Jean saw tiny lambs, just born. Their pinpointed bleats pierced the heavier baa of their mothers. End of Chapter 1 Part 1
To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One, Part Two. Jean dismounted and led his horse down toward the camp, where he rather expected to see another and older Mexican, from whom he might get information. The lad walked with him. Down this way the plaintive uproar made by the sheep was not so loud. "'Hello there,' called Jean cheerfully as he approached the tent. No answer was forthcoming. Dropping his bridle, he went on, rather slowly, looking for someone to appear. Then a voice from one side startled him. "'Mornin', stranger.' A girl stepped out from beside a pine. She carried a rifle. Her face flashed richly brown, but she was not Mexican. This fact, and the sudden conviction that she had been watching him, somewhat disconcerted Jean. "'Beg pardon, miss,' he floundered. "'Didn't expect to see a girl. I'm sort of lost, looking for the rim, and thought I'd find a sheep herder who'd show me. I can't savvy this boy's lingo.' While he spoke, it seemed to him an intenseness of expression, a strain, relaxed from her face. A faint suggestion of hostility likewise disappeared. Jean was not sure that he had caught it, but there had been something that now was gone. "'Sure I'd be glad to show you,' she said. "'Thanks, miss. Reckon I can breathe easy now,' he replied. "'It's a long ride from San Diego, hot and dusty. I'm pretty tired, and maybe this woods isn't good medicine to my aching eyes.' "'San Diego? You from the coast?' "'Yes.' Jean had doffed his sombrero at the sight of her, and he still held it, rather deferentially, perhaps. It seemed to attract her attention. "'Put on your hat, stranger. Sure I can't recollect when any man bared his head to me.' She uttered a little laugh, in which surprise and frankness mingled with a tint of bitterness. Jean sat down with his back to a pine, and, laying the sombrero by his side, he looked full at her, conscious of a singular eagerness, as if he wanted to verify by close scrutiny a first hasty impression. If there had been an instinct in his meeting with Coulter, there was more in this. The girl half sat, half leaned against a log, with a shiny little carbine across her knees. She had a level, curious gaze upon him, and Jean had never met one just like it. Her eyes were rather wide, oval in shape, clear and steady, with shadows of thought in their amber-brown depths. They seemed to look through Jean, and his gaze dropped first. Then it was he saw her ragged homespun skirt and a few inches of brown bare ankles, strong and round, and crude worn-out moccasins that failed to hide the shapeliness of her feet. Suddenly she drew back her stockingless ankles and ill-shod little feet. When Jean lifted his gaze again, he found her face half averted and a stain of red in the golden tan of her cheek. That touch of embarrassment somehow removed her from this strong, raw, wild woodland setting. It changed her poise. It detracted from the curious, unabashed, almost bold look that he had encountered in her eyes. "'Reckon you're from Texas,' said Jean presently. "'Sure am,' she drawled. She had a lazy southern voice, pleasant to hear. "'How'd y'all guess that?' "'Anybody can tell a Texan. "'Where I came from, there were a good many pioneers and ranchers from the old Lone Star State. I've worked for several. And, come to think of it, I'd rather hear a Texas girl talk than anybody.' "'Do you know many Texas girls?' she inquired, turning again to face him. "'Reckon I did. Quite a good many. Did you go with them?' "'Go with them? Reckon you mean keep company?' "'Why, yes, I guess I did a little,' laughed Jean. "'Sometimes on a Sunday or a dance once in the blue moon. An occasional ride.' "'Sure that accounts,' said the girl wistfully. "'For what?' asked Jean. You being a gentleman, she replied with force. Oh, I've not forgotten. I had friends when we lived in Texas three years ago, 
Sure it seems longer. Three miserable years in this damned country. Then she bit her lip, evidently to keep back further unwitting utterance to a total stranger. And it was that biting of her lip that drew Jean's attention to her mouth. It held beauty of curve and fullness and color that could not hide a certain sadness and bitterness. Then the whole flashing brown face changed for Jean. He saw that it was young, full of passion and restraint, possessing a power which grew on him. This, with her shame and pathos, and the fact that she craved respect, gave a leap to Jean's interest. "'Well, I reckon you flatter me,' he said, hoping to put her at ease again. "'I'm only a rough hunter and fisherman, woodchopper, and horse-tracker. Never had all the school I needed, nor near enough company of nice girls like you.' "'Am I nice?' she asked quickly. "'You sure are,' he replied, smiling. "'In these rags?' she demanded, with a sudden flash of passion that thrilled him. "'Look at the holes.' She showed rips in worn-out places in the sleeves of her buckskin blouse, through which gleamed a round, brown arm. I sew when I have anything to sew with. Look at my skirt, a dirty rag, and I have only one other to my name. Look. Again a color tinged her cheeks, most becoming, and giving the lie to her action. But shame could not check her violence now. A damned-up resentment seemed to have broken out in flood. She lifted the ragged skirt almost to her knees. No stockings, no shoes. How can a girl be nice when she has no clean, decent women's clothes to wear? How? How can a girl? began Jean. See here, miss, I'm begging your pardon for, sort of stirring you to forget yourself a little. Reckon I understand. You don't meet many strangers, and I sort of hit you wrong, making you feel too much and talk too much. Who and what you are is none of my business, but we met, and I reckon something has happened, perhaps more to me than to you. Now let me put you straight about clothes and women. Reckon I know most women love nice things to wear, and think because clothes make them look pretty that they're nicer or better, but they're wrong, you're wrong. Maybe it'd be too much for a girl like you to be happy without clothes, but you can be. You act just as nice and, and fine, and, for all you know, a good deal more appealing to some men. Stranger, you sure must excuse my temper and the show I made of myself, replied the girl with composure. That, to say the least, was not nice, and I don't want anyone thinking better of me than I deserve. My mother died in Texas and I've lived out here in this wild country, a girl alone among rough men. Meeting you today makes me see what a hard lot they are and what it's done to me. Jean smothered his curiosity and tried to put out of his mind a growing sense that he pitied her, liked her. Are you a sheep herder? he asked. Sure I am now and then. My father lives back here in a canyon. He's a sheepman. Lately, there's been herders shot at. Just now, we're short, and I have to fill in. But I like sheep herding, and I love the woods and the rim rock, and all the Tonto. If they were all, I'd sure be happy. Herders shot at, exclaimed Jean thoughtfully. By whom? And what for? Trouble brewing between the cattlemen down in the basin and the sheepmen up on the rim. Dad says, there'll sure be hell to pay. I tell him I hope the cattlemen chase him back to Texas. Then, are you on the rancher's side? queried Jean, trying to pretend casual interest. No, I'll always be on my father's side, she replied with spirit, but I'm bound to admit I think the cattlemen have the fair side of the argument. How so? Because there's grass everywhere. I see no sense in a sheepman going out of his way to surround a cattleman and sheep off his range. That started the row. Lord knows how it'll end. For most all of them here are from Texas. So I was told, replied Jean, and I heard most of all these Texans got run out of Texas. Any truth in that? Sure, I reckon there is, she replied seriously. But, stranger, it might not be healthy for you to say that anywhere. 
My dad, for one, was not run out of Texas. Sure, I never can see why he came here. He's accumulated stock, but he's not so rich nor so well off as he was back home. Are you going to stay here always? queried Jean suddenly. If I do, so it'll be my grave, she answered darkly. But what's the use of thinking? People stay places until they drift away. You can never tell. Well, stranger, this talk is keeping you. She seemed moody now, and a note of detachment crept into her voice. Jean rose at once and went for his horse. If this girl did not desire to talk further, he certainly had no wish to annoy her. His mule had strayed off among the bleeding sheep. Jean drove it back and then led his horse up to where the girl stood. She appeared taller and, though not of robust build, she was vigorous and lithe with something about her that fitted the place. Jean was loath to bid her good-bye. "'Which way is the rim?' he asked, turning to his saddle girths. "'South,' she replied, pointing. "'It's only a mile or so. I'll walk down with you. Suppose you're on your way to Grass Valley?' "'Yes, I've relatives there,' he returned. He dreaded her next question, which he suspected would concern his name, but she did not ask. Taking up her rifle, she turned away. Jean strode ahead to her side. Reckon if you walk, I won't ride. So he found himself beside a girl with the free step of a mountaineer. Her bare brown head came up nearly to his shoulder. It was a small, pretty head, graceful, well held, and the thick hair on it was shiny, soft brown. She wore it in a braid, rather untidily and tangled, he thought and it was tied with a string of buckskin. Altogether her apparel proclaimed poverty. Jean let the conversation languish for a little. He wanted to think what to say presently, and then he felt a rather vague pleasure in stalking beside her. Her profile was straight-cut and exquisite in line. From this side view, the soft curve of her lips could not be seen. She made several attempts to start conversation, all of which Jean ignored, manifestly to her growing constraint. Presently, Jean, having decided what he wanted to say, suddenly began, I like this adventure. Do you? Adventure? Meeting me in the woods? And she laughed the laugh of youth. Sure you must be hard up for adventure, stranger. Do you like it? he persisted and his eyes searched the half-averted face. "'I might like it,' she answered frankly, "'if if my temper had not made a fool of me. I never meet anyone I care to talk to. Why should it not be pleasant to run across someone new, someone strange in this here wild country?' "'We are as we are,' said John simply. "'I didn't think you made a fool of yourself. If I thought so, would I want to see you again?' Do you? The brown face flashed on him with surprise, with the light he took for gladness. And because he wanted to appear calm and friendly, not too eager, he had to deny himself the thrill of meeting those changing eyes. Sure I do. Reckon I'm overbold on such short acquaintance, but I might not have another chance to tell you. So please don't hold it against me. This declaration over, Jean felt relief and something of exaltation. He had been afraid he might not have the courage to make it. She walked on as before, only with her head bowed a little and her eyes downcast. No color but the gold-brown tan and the blue tracery of veins showed in her cheeks. He noticed then a slight swelling quiver of her throat, and he became alive to its graceful contour and to how full and pulsating it was, how nobly it set into the curve of her shoulder. Here, in her quivering throat, was the weakness of her, the evidence of her sex, the womanliness that belied the mountaineer's stride and the strong grasp of brown hands on a rifle. It had an effect on Jean totally inexplicable to him, both in the strange warmth that stole over him and in the utterance he could not hold back. Girl, we're strangers. But what of that? 
We've met, and I tell you it means something to me. I've known girls for months and never felt this way. I don't know who you are. I don't care. You betrayed a good deal to me. You're not happy. You're lonely. And if I didn't want to see you again for my own sake, I would for yours. Some things you said I'll not forget soon. I've got a sister, and I know you have no brother, and I reckon. At this juncture, Jean, in his earnestness, and quite without thought, grasped her hand. The contact checked the flow of his speech and suddenly made him aghast at his temerity. But the girl did not make any effort to withdraw it. So Jean, inhaling a deep breath and trying to see through his bewilderment, held on bravely. He imagined he felt a faint warm, returning pressure. She was young, she was friendless, she was human. By this hand in his, Jean felt more than ever the loneliness of her. Then, just as he was about to speak again, she pulled her hand free. Here's the rim, she said, in her quaint southern draw, and there's your Tonto Basin. Jean had been intent only upon the girl. He had kept step beside her without taking note of what was ahead of him. At her words, he looked up expectantly to be struck mute. He felt a sheer force, a downward drawing of an immense abyss beneath him. As he looked afar, he saw a black basin of timbered country, the darkest and wildest he had ever gazed upon, a hundred miles of blue distance across to an unflung mountain range, hazy purple against the sky. It seemed to be a stupendous gulf, surrounded on three sides by bold, undulating lines of peaks, and on his side by a wall so high that he felt lifted aloft on the run of the sky. "'Southeast you see the Sierra Anchas,' said the girl, pointing. "'That notch in the range is the pass where sheep are driven to Phoenix and Maricopa. Those big rough mountains to the south are the Mazatals. Round to the west is the Four Peaks Range, and you're standing on the rim.' Jean could not see at first just what the rim was, but by shifting his gaze westward he grasped this remarkable phenomenon of nature. For leagues and leagues a colossal red and yellow wall, a rampart, a mountain-faced cliff, seemed to zigzag westward. Grand and bold were the promontories reaching out over the void. They ran toward the westering sun. Sweeping and impressive were the long lines slanting away from them, sloping darkly, spotted down, to merge into the black timber. Jean had never seen such a wild and rugged manifestation of nature's depths and upheavals. He was held mute. "'Stranger, look down,' said the girl. Jean's sight was educated to judge heights and depths and distances. This wall upon which he stood shared precipitously down, so far that it made him dizzy to look. And then the craggy, broken cliffs merged into red-sided, cedar-greened slopes, running down and down, in the gorges choked with forests, and from which soared up a roar of rushing waters. Slope after slope, ridge beyond ridge, canyon, merging into canyon. So the tremendous bowl sunk away to its black, deceiving depths, a wilderness across which travel seemed impossible. Wonderful, exclaimed Jean. Indeed it is, murmured the girl. Sure that is Arizona. I reckon I love this, the heights and depths, the awfulness of its wilderness. And you want to leave it? Yes and no. I don't deny the peace that comes to me here, but not often do I see the basin, and for that matter, one doesn't live on grand scenery. Child, even once in a while, the sight would cure any misery if you only see. I'm glad I came. I'm glad you showed it to me first. She, too, seemed under the spell of a vastness and loneliness and beauty and grandeur that could not but strike the heart. Jean took her hand again. Girl, say you will meet me here, he said, his voice ringing deep in his ears. 
Sure I will, she replied softly and turned to him. It seemed then that Jean saw her face for the first time. She was beautiful as he had never known beauty. Limbed against that scene, she gave it life, wild, sweet, young life, the poignant meaning of which haunted yet eluded him. But she belonged there. Her eyes were again searching his, as if for some lost part of herself, unrealized, never known before, wondering, wistful, hopeful, glad they were eyes that seemed surprised to reveal part of her soul. Then her red lips parted. Their tremulous movement was a magnet to Jean. An invisible and mighty force pulled him down to kiss them. Whatever the spell had been, that rude, unconscious action broke it. He jerked away, as if he expected to be struck. Girl, I, I, he gasped in amazed and sudden dawning contrition. I kissed you, but I swear it wasn't intentional. I never thought. The anger that Jean anticipated failed to materialize. He stood breathing hard, with a hand held out in unconscious appeal. By the same magic, perhaps, that had transfigured her a moment past, she was now invested again by the older character. Sure, I reckon my calling you a gentleman was a little previous, she said, with a rather dry bitterness. But, stranger, you're sudden. You're not insulted? asked Jean hurriedly. Oh, I've been kissed before. Sure, men are all alike. They're not, he replied hotly with a sudden rush of disillusion, a dulling of enchantment. Don't you class me with other men who've kissed you? I wasn't myself when I did it, and I'd have gone on my knees to ask your forgiveness. But now I wouldn't. And I wouldn't kiss you again either, even if you, you wanted it. Jean read in her strange gaze what seemed to him a vague doubt, as if she was questioning him. Miss, I take that back, added Jean shortly. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. It was a mean trick for me to kiss you, a girl alone in the woods who's gone out of her way to be kind to me. I don't know why I forgot my manners, and I ask your pardon. She looked away then, and presently pointed far out and down into the basin. There's Grass Valley, that long gray spot in the black. It's about fifteen miles. Right along the rim that way, you cross the trail. Sure, you can't miss it. Then go down. I'm much obliged to you, replied Jean, reluctantly accepting what he regarded as his dismissal. Turning his horse, he put his foot in the stirrup, then, hesitating, looked across the saddle at the girl. Her abstraction, as she gazed away over the purple depths, suggested loneliness and wistfulness. She was not thinking of that scene spread so wondrously before her. It struck Jean that she might be pondering a subtle change in his feeling and attitude, something he was conscious of, yet could not define. "'Reckon this is good-bye,' he said, with hesitation. "'Adios, senor,' she replied, facing him again. She lifted the little carbine to the hollow of her elbow, and, half-turning, appeared ready to depart. Adios means goodbye, he queried. Yes, goodbye till tomorrow, or goodbye forever. Take it as you like. Then you'll meet me here day after tomorrow. How eagerly he spoke on impulse, without consideration of the intangible thing that had changed him. Did I say I wouldn't? No, but I reckoned you'd not care to after, he replied breaking off in some confusion. Sure, I'll be glad to meet you day after tomorrow about mid-afternoon, right here. Fetch all the news from Grass Valley. All right, thanks, that'll be fine, replies Jean. And as he spoke, he experienced a buoyant thrill, a pleasant lightness of enthusiasm, such as always stirred boyishly in him at a prospect of adventure. Before it passed, he wondered at it, and felt unsure of himself. He needed to think. Stranger, sure I'm not recollectin' that you've told me who you are, she said. No, I reckon I didn't tell you, he returned. What difference does that make? I said, 
I didn't care who or what you are. Can't you feel the same about me? Sure, I felt that way, she replied, somewhat nonplussed, with the level brown gaze steadily on his face. But now you make me think. Let's meet without knowing any more about each other than we do now. Sure, I'd like that. In this big, wild Arizona, a girl, and I reckon a man, feels so insignificant. What's a name, anyhow? Still, people and things have to be distinguished. I'll call you a stranger and be satisfied, if you say it's fair for you, not to tell me who you are. Fair? No, it's not, declared Jean, forced to confession. My name is Jean, Jean Isbel. Isbel, she exclaimed with a violent start. Sure you can't be the son of old gas Isbel. I've seen both his sons. He has three, replied Jean with relief. Now the secret was out. I'm the youngest. I'm twenty-four. Never been out of Oregon till now. On my way. The brown color slowly faded out of her face, leaving her quite pale, with eyes that began to blaze. The suppleness of her seemed to stiffen. "'My name's Ellen Jorth,' she burst out passionately. "'Does it mean anything to you?' "'Never heard it in my life,' protested Jean. "'Sure I reckon you belong to the sheep raisers who are on the outs with my father. That's why I had to tell you that I'm Jean Isbel. Ellen Jorth, it's strange and pretty. Reckon I can be just as good a friend to you.' "'No, Isbel, can ever be a friend to me,' she said, with bitter coldness. Stripped of her ease and her soft wistfulness, she stood before him one instant, entirely another girl, a hostile enemy. Then she wheeled and strolled off into the woods. Jean, in amaze, in consternation, watched her swiftly draw away with her lithe, free step, wanting to follow her, wanting to call her. But the resentment roused by her suddenly avowed hostility held him mute in his tracks. He watched her disappear, and when the brown and green wall of forest swallowed the slender gray form, he fought against the insistent desire to follow her and fought in vain. End of chapter one, part two. Section three of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two, part one. But Ellen Jorth's moccasined feet did not leave a distinguishable trail on the springing pine needles covering the ground, and Jean could not find any trace of her. A little futile searching to and fro cooled his impulse and called pride to his rescue. Returning to his horse, he mounted, rode out behind the pack mule to start it along, and soon felt the relief of decision and action. Clumps of small pines grew thickly in spots on the rim, making it necessary for him to skirt them, at which times he lost sight of the purple basin. Every time he came back to an opening through which he could see the wild ruggedness and colors and distances his appreciation of their nature grew on him. Arizona, from Yuma to the little Colorado, had been to him an endless waste of wind-scoured, sun-blasted barrenness. This black-forested, rock-rimmed land of untrodden ways was a world that in itself would satisfy him. Some instinct in Jean called for a lonely, wild land into the fastness of which he could roam at will, and be the other's strange self that he had always yearned to be, but had never been. Every few moments there intruded into his flowing consciousness the flashing face of Ellen Jorth, the way she had looked at him, the things she had said. Reckon I was a fool, he soliloquized, with an acute sense of humiliation. She never saw how much in earnest I was, and Jean began to remember the circumstances with a vividness that disturbed and perplexed him. The accident of running across such a girl in that lonely place might be out of the ordinary, but it had happened. Surprise had made him dull. The charm of her appearance 
the appeal of her manner, must have drawn him at the very first, but he had not recognized that, only at her words. Oh, I've been kissed before, had his feelings been checked in their heedless progress. And the utterance of them had made a difference he now sought to analyze. Some personality in him, some voice, some idea, had begun to defend her, even before he was conscious that he had arraigned her before the bar of his judgment. Such defense seemed clamoring in him now, and he forced himself to listen. He wanted, in his hurt pride, to justify his amazing surrender to a sweet and sentimental impulse. He realized now at first glance that he should have recognized in her look, her poise, her voice, the quality he called thoroughbred. Ragged and stained apparel did not prove her of a common sort. Jean had known a number of fine and wholesome girls of good family, and he remembered his sister. This Ellen Jorth was that kind of girl irrespective of her present environment. Jean championed her loyally, even after he had gratified his selfish pride. It was then, contending with an intangible and stealing glamour, unreal and fanciful, like the dream of a forbidden enchantment, that Jean arrived at the part in the little woodland drama where he had kissed Ellen Jorth and had been unrebuked. Why had she not resented his action? Dispelled was the illusion he had been dreamily and nobly constructing. Oh, I've been kissed before. The shock to him now exceeded his first dismay. Half bitterly she had spoken, and wholly scornful of herself, or of him, or of all men. For she had said all men were alike. Jean chafed under the smart that, a taunt every decent man hated. Naturally, every happy and healthy young man would want to kiss such red, sweet lips. But if those lips had been for others, never for him. Jean reflected that not since childish games had he kissed a girl, until this brown-faced Ellen Jorth came his way. He wondered at it. Moreover, he wondered at the significance he placed upon it. After all, was it not merely an accident? Why should he remember? Why should he ponder? What was the faint, deep, growing thrill that accompanied some of his thoughts? Riding along with a busy mind, John almost crossed a well-beaten trail, leading through a pine thicket and down over the rim. Jean's pack mule led the way without being driven, and when Jean reached the edge of the bluff, one look down was enough to fetch him off his horse. That trail was steep, narrow, clogged with stones, and as full of sharp corners as a cross-cut saw. Once on the descent, with a packed mule and a spirited horse, Jean had no time for mine wanderings and very little for occasional glimpses out over the cedar tops to the vast blue hollow asleep under a westering sun. The stones rattled, the dust rose, the cedar twigs snapped, the little avalanches of red earth slid down, iron-shod hoofs rang on the rocks. The slope had been narrow at the apex in the rim, where the trail led down a crack, and it widened in fan shape as Jean descended. He zigzagged down a thousand feet before the slope benched into dividing ridges. Here the cedars and junipers failed, and pines once more hid the sun. Deep ravines were black with brush. From somewhere rose a roar of running water, most pleasant to Jean's ears. Fresh deer and bear tracks covered old ones made in the trail. Those timbered ridges were but billows of that tremendous slope that now sheared above Jean, ending in a magnificent yellow wall of rock, greened in niches, stained by weather rust, carved and cracked and caverned. As Jean descended further, the hum of bees made melody. The roar of rapid water and the murmur of rising breeze filled him with the content of the wild. Sheepmen like Coulter and wild girls like Ellen Jorth and all that seemed promising or menacing in his father's letter could never change the Indian in Jean. So he thought. 
Hard upon that conclusion rushed another, one which troubled with its stinging revelation. Surely these influences he had defied were just the ones to bring out in him the Indian he had sensed but had never known. The eventful day had brought new and bitter food for Jean to reflect upon. The trail landed him in a boulder-strewn bed of a wide canyon, where the huge trees stretched a canopy of foliage which denied the sunlight, and where a beautiful brook rushed and foamed. Here at last Jean tasted water that rivaled his Oregon Springs. Ah, he cried, that sure is good. Dark and shaded and ferny and mossy was the streamway, and everywhere were tracks of game, from the giant spread of a grizzly bear to the tiny bird-like imprints of a squirrel. Jean heard familiar sounds of deer crackling the dead twigs, and the chatter of squirrels was incessant. This fragrant, cool retreat under the rim brought back to him the dim recesses of Oregon forests. After all, Jean felt that he would not miss anything that he had loved in the Cascades. But what was the vague sense of all not being well with him? The essence of faint regret, the insistence of a hovering shadow, and then flashed again, etched more vividly by the reputation and memory, a picture of eyes, of lips, of something he had to forget. Wild and broken, as his rolling basin floor had appeared to him from the rim, the reality of traveling over it made that first impression a deceit of distance. Down here, all was on a big, rough, broken scale. Jean did not find even a few rods of level ground. Boulders as huge as houses obstructed the stream bed. Spruce trees eight feet thick tried to lord it over the brawny pines. The ravine was a veritable canyon, from which occasional glimpses through the foliage showed the rim as a lofty, red-tipped mountain peak. Jean's pack mule became frightened at the scent of a bear or a lion and ran off down the rough trail, imperiling Jean's outfit. It was not an easy task to head him off, nor, when that was accomplished, to keep him to a trot. But his fright and succeeding skittishness at least made for fast traveling. Jean calculated that he covered ten miles under the rim before the character of ground and forest began to change. The trail had turned southeast. Instead of gorge after gorge, red-walled and choked with forest, there began to be rolling ridges. Some high, others were knolls, and a thick cedar growth made up for the falling off of pine. The spruce had long disappeared. Juniper thickets gave way more and more to the beautiful manzanita, and soon on the south slopes appeared cactus and a scrubby live oak. But for the well-broken trail, Jean would have fared ill through this tough brush. Jean espied several deer, and again a coyote, and what he took to be a small herd of wild horses. No more turkey tracks showed in the dusty patches. He crossed a number of tiny brooklets, and at length came to a place where the trail ended or merged in a rough road that showed evidence of considerable travel. Horses and sheep and cattle had passed along there that day. The road turned southward, and Jean began to have pleasurable expectations. The road, like the trail, led down grade, but no longer at such steep angles, and was bordered by cedar and pinyon, jack pine and juniper, mescal and manzanita. Quite sharply, going round a ridge, the road led Jean's eye down to a small open flat of marshy, or at least grassy, ground. The green oasis in the wilderness of red and timbered ridges marked another change in the character of the basin. Beyond that country began to spread out and roll gracefully its dark green forest interspersed with grassy parks, until Jean headed into a long, wide, gray-green valley surrounded by black-fringed hills. His pulse quickened here. He saw cattle dotting the expanse, and hearing there along the edge log cabins and corrals. 
As a village, Grass Valley could not boast of much, apparently, in the way of population. Cabins and houses were widely scattered, as if the inhabitants did not care to encroach upon one another. But the one store, built of stone, and stamped also with the characteristic isolation, seemed to John to be a rather remarkable edifice. Not exactly like a fort did it strike him, but if it had not been designed for defense, it certainly gave that impression, especially from the long, low side, with its dark, eye-like windows about the height of a man's shoulder. Some rather fine horses were tied to a hitching rail. Otherwise, dust and dirt and age and long use stamped this Grass Valley store and its immediate environment. Jean threw his bridle, and getting down, mounted the low porch and stepped into the wide, open door. A face, gray against the background of gloom inside, passed out of sight just as John entered. He knew he had been seen. In front of the long, rather low-ceilinged store were four men, all absorbed, apparently, in a game of checkers. Two were playing, and two were looking on. One of these, a gaunt-faced man past middle age, casually looked up as Jean entered. But the moment of that casual glance afforded Jean time enough to meet eyes he instinctively distrusted. They masked their penetration. They seemed neither curious nor friendly. They saw him as if he had been merely thin air. "'Good evening,' says Jean. After what appeared to Jean a lapse of time, sufficient to impress him with a possible deafness of these men, the gaunt-faced one said, "'Howdy, Isbel.' The tone was impersonal, dry, easy, cool, laconic, and yet it could not have been more pregnant with meaning. Jean's sharp sensibilities absorbed much. None of the slouched, sombreroed, long-mustached Texans, for so Jean at once classed them, had ever seen Jean, but they knew him, and knew that he was expected in Grass Valley. All but the one who had spoken happened to have their faces in shadow under the wide-brimmed black hats. Motley garbed, gun-belted, dusty-booted, they gave Jean the same impression of latent force that he had encountered in Coulter. "'Will somebody please tell me where to find my father, Gaston Isbel?' inquired Jean, with as civil a tongue as he could command. Nobody paid the slightest attention. It was the same as if John had not spoken. Waiting, half amused, half irritated, Jean shot a rapid glance around the store. The place had felt bare, and Jean, peering back through the gloomy space, saw that it did not contain much. Dry goods and sacks littered a long, rude counter. Long, rough shelves divided their length into stacks of canned foods and empty sections. A low shelf back of the counter held a generous burden of cartridge boxes, and next to it stood a rack of rifles. On the counter lay open cases of plugged tobacco, the odor of which was second in strength only to that of rum. Jean's swift roving eye reverted to the men, three of whom were absorbed in the greasy checkerboard. The fourth man was the one who had spoken, and he now deigned to look at Jean. Not much flesh was there stretched over his bony, powerful physiognomy. He stroked the lean chin with a big, mobile hand that suggested more of bridle-holding than familiarity with buck-saw and plow-handle. It was a lazy hand. The man looked lazy. If he spoke at all, it would be with lazy speech, yet Jean had not encountered many men to whom he would have accorded more potency to stir in him the instinct of self-preservation. Sure, draw this gaunt-faced Texan. Old Gas lives about a mile down here. With a slow sweep of the big hand, he indicated a general direction to the south. Then, appearing to forget his questioner, he turned his attention to the game. Jean muttered his thanks, and striding out, he mounted again and drove the pack mule down the road. "'Reckon I've run into the wrong folds today,' he said. 
If I remember Dad right, he was a man to make and keep friends. Somehow, I'll bet, there's going to be hell. Beyond the store were some rather pretty and comfortable homes, little ranch houses back in the coves of the hills. The road turned west and John saw his first sunset in the Tonto Basin. It was a pageant of purple clouds with silver edges and background of deep, rich gold. Presently, Jean met a lad driving a cow. "'Hello, Johnny,' he said genially, and with a double purpose. "'My name's John Isabel. By golly, I'm lost in Grass Valley. Will you tell me where my dad lives?' "'Yep. Keep right on. You can't miss him,' replied the lad, with a bright smile. He's looking for you. How do you know, boy? queried Jean, warmed by that smile. Oh, I know. It's all over the valley that you'd ride in today. Sure I was the one that told your dad, and he give me a dollar. Was he glad to hear it? asked Jean, with a queer sensation in his throat. Well, he plumb was. And who told you that I was going to ride in today? I heard it at the store, replied the lad, with an air of confidence. Some sheepmen were talking to Greaves. He's the storekeeper. I was sitting outside, but I heard. A Mexican came down off the rim today and fetched the news. Here the lad looked furtively around, then whispered. And that greaser was sent by somebody. I never heard no more, but them sheepmen looked pretty plum sour. And one of them, coming out, Give me a kick, darn him. It sure is the luckiest day for us cowmen. How's that, Johnny? Well, that's sure a big fight come in the Grass Valley. My dad says so, and he rides for your dad. And if it comes, now you'll be here. Ah, uh, laughed Jean. And what then, boy? The lad turned bright eyes upward. Aw, oh, now, you can't come that on me. Ain't you an Injun, Jean Isabel? Ain't you a horse tracker that rustlers can't fool? Ain't you a plumb dead shot? Ain't you wrestled a grizzly bear in a rough and tumble? Now ain't you, sure? Jean bade the flattering lad a rather somber good day and rode on his way. Manifestly a reputation somewhat difficult to live up to had preceded his entry into Grass Valley. End of chapter 2, part 1
I sure am glad to see you, said his father, and wrung his hand. Well, well, the size of you. Sure you've grown, and how you favor your mother. Jean felt in the iron clasp of hand, in the uplifting of the handsome head, in the strong, fine light of piercing eyes, that there was no difference in the spirit of his father. But the old smile could not hide lines and shades strange to Jean. Dad, I'm as glad as you, replied Jean heartily. It seems long we've been parted. Now I see you. Are you well, Dad, and all right? No complaining, son. I can ride all day, same as ever, he said. Come, never mind your horses. They'll be looked after. Come meet the folks. Well, well, you got here at last. On the porch of the house a group awaited Jean's coming. Rather silently, he thought. Wide-eyed children were there, very shy and watchful. The dark face of his sister corresponded with the image of her in his memory. She appeared taller, more womanly, as she embraced him. "'Oh, Jean, Jean, I'm glad you've come,' she cried, and pressed him close. Jean felt in her womanly anxiety for the present as well as affection for the past. He remembered his Aunt Mary, though he had not seen her for years. His half-brothers, Bill and Guy, had changed little except perhaps to grow lean and rangy. Bill resembled his father, though his aspect was jocular rather than serious. Guy was smaller, wiry, and hard as rock, with snapping eyes and a brown, still face, and he had the bow legs of a cattleman. Both had married in Arizona. Bill's wife, Kate, was a stout, comely little woman, mother of three children. The other wife was young, a strapping girl, red-headed and freckled, with wonderful lines of pain and strength in her face. Jean remembered, as he looked at her, that someone had written him about the tragedy in her life. When she was only a child, the Apaches had murdered all her family. The next to greet Jean were the little children, all shy, yet all manifestly impressed by the occasion. A warmth and intimacy of forgotten home emotions flooded over Jean. Sweet it was to get home to these relatives who loved him and welcomed him with quiet gladness. But there seemed more. Jean was quick to see the shadow in the eyes of the women in that household and to sense a strange reliance which his presence brought. "'Son, this here, Tonto, is a land of milk and honey,' said his father, as Jean gazed spellbound at the bounteous supper. Jean certainly performed gastronomic feats on this occasion, to the delight of Aunt Mary and the wonder of the children. "'Oh, he's starved to death,' whispered one of the little boys to his sister. They had begun to warm to this stranger uncle. Jean had no chance to talk, even if he had been able to, for the mealtime showed a relaxation of restraint, and they all tried to tell him things at once. In the bright lamplight, his father looked easier and happier as he beamed upon Jean. After supper, the men went into an adjoining room that appeared most comfortable and attractive. It was long, and the width of the house, with a huge stone fireplace, low ceiling of hewn timbers, and walls of the same. Small windows, with inside shutters of wood, and homemade table, and chairs, and rugs. "'Well, Jean, do you recollect those shooting irons?' inquired the rancher, pointing above the fireplace. Two guns hung on the spreading deer antlers there. One was a musket, Jean's father had used in the War of the Rebellion and the other was a long, heavy, muzzle-loading flintlock Kentucky rifle, with which Jean had learned to shoot. "'Reckon I do, Dad,' replied Jean, and with reverent hands and a rush of memory, he took the old gun down. "'Jean, you sure handle that old arm some clumsy,' said Guy Isbel dryly, and Bill added a remark to the effect that perhaps Jean had been leading a luxurious and tame life back there in Oregon and then added, but I reckon he's packing that six-shooter like a Texan. Say, I fetched a gun or two along with me, replied Jean jocularly. 
Reckon I near broke my poor mule's back with the load of shells and guns. Dad, what was the idea of asking me to pack out an arsenal? Son, sure all shooting arms and such are at a premium in the Tonto, replied his father, and I was giving you a hunch to come loaded. His cool, drawing voice seemed to put a damper upon the pleasantries. Right there Jean sensed the charged atmosphere. His brothers were bursting with utterance about to break forth, and his father suddenly wore a look that recalled the Jean critical times of days long past. But the entrance of the children and the women folk put an end to confidences. Evidently the youngsters were laboring under subdued excitement. They preceded their mother, the smallest boy in the lead. For him, this must have been both a dreadful and wonderful experience, for he seemed to be pushed forward by his sister and brother and mother, and driven by yearnings of his own. There now, Lee. Say, Uncle Jean, what did you fetch us? The lad hesitated for a shy, frightened look at Jean, and then, gaining something from his scrutiny of his uncle, he toddled forward and bravely delivered the question of tremendous importance. "'What did I fetch you, hey?' cried Jean in delight as he took the lad upon his knee. "'Wouldn't you like to know?' "'I didn't forget, Lee. I remembered you all. Oh, the job I had packing your bundle of presents. Now, Lee, make a guess.' "'I guess you fetched a dun,' replied Lee. "'A dun?' "'I'll bet you mean a gun,' laughed Jean. "'Well, you four-year-old Texas gunman, make another guess.' That appeared too momentous and entrancing for the other two youngsters, and adding their shrill and joyous voices to Lee's, they besieged John. "'Dad, where's my pack?' cried John. "'These young Apaches are after my scalp.' "'Reckon the boys fetched it onto the porch,' replied the rancher. Guy Isbel opened the door and went out. "'By golly, here's three packs,' he called. "'Which one do you want, John?' It's a long, heavy bundle, all tied up, replied Jean. Guy came staggering in under a burden that brought a whoop from the youngsters and bright gleams to the eyes of the women. Jean lost nothing of this. How glad he was that he had tarried in San Francisco because of a mental picture of this very reception in far-off, wild Arizona. When Guy deposited the bundle on the floor, it jarred the room. It gave forth metallic and rattling and crackling sounds. "'Everybody stand back and give me elbow room,' ordered John majestically. "'My good folks, I want you all to know that this is something that doesn't happen often. The bundle you see here weighed about a hundred pounds when I packed it on my shoulder down Market Street in Frisco. It was stolen from me on shipboard. I got it back in San Diego and licked the thief. It rode on a burrow from San Diego to Yuma, and once I thought the burrow was lost for keeps. It came up the Colorado River from Yuma to Ehrenberg, and there went on top of a stage. We got chased by bandits, and once, when the horses were galloping hard, it near rolled off. Then it went on the back of a pack horse and helped wear him out. And I reckon it would be somewhere else now if I hadn't fallen in with a freighter going north from Phoenix to the Santa Fe Trail. The last lap, when it sagged the back of a mule, was the riskiest and full of the narrowest escapes. Twice my mule bucked off his pack and left my outfit scattered. Worst of all, my precious bundle made the mule top-heavy coming down the place back here where the trail seems to drop off the earth. Then I was hard put to keep sight of my pack. Sometimes it was on top, and other times the mule. But it got here at last, and now I'll open it. After this long and impressive harangue, which at least augmented the suspense of the women and worked the children into a frenzy, Jean leisurely untied the many knots round the bundle and unrolled it. He had packed that bundle for just such travel as it had sustained. Three cloth-bound rifles he laid aside, with them a long, very heavy package tied between two thin, wide boards. 
From this came the metallic clink. Oh, I know what them is, cried Lee, breaking the silence of suspense. Then Jean, tearing open a long flat parcel, spread out before the mute, rapt-eyed youngsters such magnificent things as they had never dreamed of. Picture books, mouth harps, dolls, a toy gun and a toy pistol, a wonderful whistle and a fox horn, and last of all, a box of candy. Before these treasures on the floor, too magical to be touched at first, the two little boys and their sister simply knelt. That was a sweet full moment for Jean, yet even that was clouded by the something which shadowed these innocent children, fatefully born in a wild place at a wild time. Next Jean gave to his sister the present he had brought her, beautiful cloth for a dress, ribbons and a bit of lace, handkerchiefs and buttons, and yards of linen, a sewing case and a whole box of spools of thread, a comb and brush and a mirror, and lastly, a Spanish brooch inlaid with garnets. There, Anne, said Jean, I confess I asked a girlfriend in Oregon to tell me some things my sister might like. Manifestly, there was not much difference in girls. Anne seemed stunned by this munificence, and then awakening, she hugged John in a way that took his breath. She was not a child any more, that was certain. Aunt Mary turned, knowing eyes upon John. Reckon you couldn't have pleased Anne more. She's engaged, John, and where girls are in that state, these things mean a heap. Anne, you'll be married in that. She pointed to the beautiful folds of material that Anne had spread out. What's this? demanded Jean. His sister's blushes were enough to convict her, and they were mightily becoming, too. Here, Aunt Mary, went on Jean, here's yours, and here's something for each of my new sisters. This distribution left the women as happy and occupied, almost as the children. It left also another package, the last one in the bundle. Jean laid hold of it, and lifting it, he was about to speak when he sustained a little shock of memory. Quite distinctly he saw two little feet, with bare toes peeping out of worn-out moccasins, and then round, bare symmetrical ankles that had been scratched by brush. Next he saw Ellen Jorth's passionate face as she looked when she had made the violent action so disconcerting to him. In this happy moment, the memory seemed farther off than a few hours. It had crystallized. It annoyed while it drew him. As a result, he slowly laid this package aside and did not speak as he had intended to. Dad, I reckon I didn't fetch a lot for you and the boys, continued John. Some knives, some pipes and tobacco, and sure the guns. Sure, you're a regular Santa Claus, John, replied his father. Well, well, look at the kids, and look at Mary, and for the land's sakes, look at Anne. Wow, well, I'm getting old. I'd forgotten the pretty stuff and gym cracks that mean so much to women. We're out of the world here. It's just as well you've lived apart from us, John, for coming back this way with all that stuff does us a lot of good. I can't say, son how obliged I am. My mind has been set on the hard side of life, and it's sure good to forget to see the smiles of the women and the joy of the kids. At this juncture a tall young man entered the open door. He looked a rider. All about him, even his face, except his eyes, seemed old, but his eyes were young, fine, soft, and dark. How do y'all, he said evenly. Anne rose from her knees. Then Jean did not need to be told who this newcomer was. Jean, this is my friend, Andrew Colmer. Jean knew, when he met Colmer's grip, and the keen flash of his eyes, that he was glad Anne had set her heart upon one of their kind. And his second impression was something akin to the one given him in the road by the admiring lad. Colmer's estimate of him must have been a monument built of Anne's eulogies. Jean's heart suffered misgivings. Could he live up to the character that somehow had forestalled his advent in Grass Valley? 
Surely life was measured differently here in the Tonto Basin. The children, bundling their treasures to their bosoms, were dragged off the bed in some remote part of the house, from which their laughter and voices came back with happy significance. Jean forthwith had an interested audience. How eagerly these lonely pioneer people listened to news of the outside world. Jean talked until he was hoarse. In their turn, his hearers told him much that had never found place in the few and short letters he had received since he had been left in Oregon. Not a word about sheepmen or any hint of rustlers. Jean marked the omission and thought all the more seriously of probabilities because nothing was said. Altogether, the evening was a happy reunion of a family of which all living members were there present. Jean grasped that this fact was one of significant satisfaction to his father. Sure, we're all going to live together here, he declared. I started this range. I call most of this valley mine. We'll run up a cabin for Anne, soon as she says the word. And you, Jean, where's your girl? I sure told you to fetch her. Dad, I didn't have one, replied Jean. Well, I wish you had, returned the rancher. You'll go courtin' one of these Tonto hussies that I might object to. Why, father, there's not a girl in the valley Jean would look at twice, interposed Aunt Isbel, with spirit. Jean laughed the matter aside, but he had an uneasy memory. Aunt Mary averred, after the manner of relatives, that Jean would play havoc among the women of the settlement, and Jean retorted that at least one member of the Isbels should hold out against folly and fight and love and marriage. The agents which had reduced the family to these few present. I'll be the last Isabel to go under, he concluded. Son, you're talking wisdom, said his father. And sure that reminds me of the uncle you're named after, Jean Isbel. Well, he was my youngest brother, and sure a fire eater. Our mother was a French Creole from Louisiana, and Jean must have inherited some of his fighting nature from her. When the War of the Rebellion started, Jean and I enlisted. I was crippled before we even got to the front. But Jean went through three years before he was killed. His company had orders to fight to the last man. And Jean fought and lived long enough just to be that last man. At length Jean was left alone with his father. "'Reckon you're used to bunking outdoors,' queried the rancher, rather abruptly. Most of the time, replied Jean. Well, there's room in the house, but I want you to sleep out. Come, get your bedding and gun. I'll show you. They went outside on the porch, where Jean shouldered his roll of tarpaulin and blankets. His rifle, in its saddle sheath, leaned against the door. His father took it up, and half pulling it out, looked at it by the starlight. Forty-four, huh? Well, well, they're sure no better. If a man can hold straight. At the moment a big gray dog trotted up to sniff at Jean. And here's your bunkmate, Shep. He's part loafer, Jean. His mother was a favorite shepherd dog of mine. His father was a big timber wolf that took us two years to kill. Some bad wolf packs running in this basin. The night was cold and still, darkly bright, under moon and stars. The smell of hay seemed to mingle with that of cedar. Jean followed his father round the house and up a gentle slope of grass to the edge of the cedar line. Here several trees with low, sweeping, thick branches formed a dense, impenetrable shade. Son, your Uncle Jean scouted for Liggett, one of the greatest rebels the South had, said the rancher, and you're going to be scout for the Isbels of Tonto. Reckon you'll find it most as hot as your uncle did. Spread your bed inside. You can see out, but no one can see you. Reckon there's been some queer happenings round here lately. If Shep could talk, he'd sure have a lot to tell us. Bill and Guy have been sleeping out, trailing strange horse tracks and all that. But sure who's ever been prowling around here was too sharp for them. Some bad, crafty, light-stepping woodsmen around here, Jean. 
Three mornings ago, just after daylight, I stepped out the back door, and some one of these sneaks I'm talking about took a shot at me. Missed my head a quarter of an inch. Tomorrow, I'll show you the bullet hole in the doorpost and some of my gray hairs that are sticking in it. Dad, ejaculated Jean with an outstretched hand. That's awful. You frighten me. No time to be scared, replied his father calmly. They sure is going to kill me. That's why I wanted you home. In there with you, now. Go to sleep. You sure can trust Shep to wake you if he gets scent or sound. And good night, my son. I'm saying that I'll rest easy tonight. Jean mumbled a good night and stood watching his father's shining white head move away under the starlight. Then the tall dark form vanished. A door closed and all was still. The dog Shep licked Jean's hand. Jean felt grateful for that warm touch. For a moment, he sat on his roll of bedding, his thought still locked on the shuddering revelation of his father's words. They're sure going to kill me. The shock of inaction passed. Jean pushed his pack in the dark opening, and crawling inside, he unrolled it and made his bed. When at length he was comfortably settled for the night, he breathed a long sigh of relief. What bliss to relax! A throbbing and burning of his muscles seemed to begin with his rest. The cool starlight night, the smell of cedar, the moan of wind, the silence, and were real to his senses. After long weeks of long, arduous travel, he was home. The warmth of the welcome still lingered but it seemed to have been pierced by an icy thrust. What lay before him? The shadow in the eyes of his aunt, in the younger, fresher eyes of his sister. Jean connected that with the meaning of his father's tragic words. Far past was the morning that had been so keen, the breaking of camp in the sunlit forest, the riding down the brown aisles under the pines, the music of bleeding lambs, that had called him not to pass by. Thought of Ellen Jorth recurred. He had met her only that morning. She was up in the forest asleep under the starlit pines. Who was she? What was her story? That savage fling of her skirt, her bitter speech and passionate flaming face, they haunted Jean. They were crystallizing into simpler memories, growing away from his bewilderment and therefore at once sweeter and more doubtful. Maybe she meant differently from what I thought, Jean soliloquized. Anyway, she was honest. Both shame and thrill possessed him at the recall of an insidious idea. Dare he go back and find her, and give her the last package of gifts he had brought from the city? What might they mean to poor, ragged, untidy, beautiful Ellen Jorth? The idea grew on Jean. It could not be dispelled. He resisted stubbornly. It was bound to go to its fruition. Deep into his mind had sunk an impression of her need, a material need that brought spirit and pride to abasement. From one picture to another, his memory wandered. From one speech and act of hers to another, choosing, selecting, casting aside, until clear and sharp as the stars shone, the words, oh, I've been kissed before, that stung him now. By whom? Not by one man, but by several, by many, she had meant. Shaw, he had only been sympathetic and drawn by a strange girl in the woods. Tomorrow he would forget. Work there was for him in Grass Valley. And he reverted uneasily to the remarks of his father until at last sleep claimed him. A cold nose against his cheek, a low whine, awakened Jean. The big dog Shep was beside him, keen, wary, intense. The night appeared far advanced toward dawn. Far away a cock crowed. The near-at-hand one answered in clarion voice. "'What is it, Shep?' whispered Jean. And he sat up. The dog smelled or heard something suspicious to his nature. But whether man or animal... Jean could not tell. End of chapter 2, part 1
Part Two. Section Five of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Part One. The morning star, large, intensely blue-white, magnificent in its dominance of the clear night sky, hung over the dim, dark valley ramparts. The moon had gone down, and all the other stars were wan, pale ghosts. Presently the strained vacuum of John's ears vibrated to a low roar of many hoofs. It came from the open valley along the slope to the south. Shep acted as if he wanted the word to run. Jean laid a hand on the dog. Hold on, Shep, he whispered. Then hauling on his boots and slipping into his coat, Jean took his rifle and stole out into the open. Shep appeared to be well trained, for it was evident that he had a strong natural tendency to run off and hunt whatever had roused him. Jean thought it more likely that the dog scented an animal of some kind. If men were prowling around the ranch, Shep might have just been as vigilant, but it seemed to Jean that the dog would have shown less eagerness to leave him, or none at all. In the stillness of the morning it took Jean a moment to locate the direction of the wind, which was very light and coming from the south. In fact, that little breeze had borne the low roar of trampling hoofs. Jean circled the ranch house to the right and kept along the slope at the edge of the cedars. It struck him suddenly how well fitted he was for work of this sort. All the work he had ever done, except for his few years in school, had been in the open. All the leisure he had ever been able to obtain had been given to his ruling passion for hunting and fishing. Love of the wild had been born in Jean. At this moment he experienced a grim assurance of what his instinct and his training might accomplish if directed to a stern and daring end. Perhaps his father understood this. Perhaps the old Texan had some little reason for his confidence. Every few paces Jean halted to listen. All objects, of course, were indistinguishable in the dark gray obscurity, except when he came close upon them. Shep showed an increasing eagerness to bolt out into the void. When Jean had traveled half a mile from the house, he heard a scattered trampling of cattle on the run, and farther out a low strangled bawl of a calf. Uh-huh, muttered Jean. Cougar or some varmint pulled down that calf. Then he discharged his rifle in the air and yelled with all his might. It was necessary then to yell again to hold Shep back. Thereupon Jean set forth down the valley, and tramped out and across and around, as much to scare away whatever had been after the stock as to look for the wounded calf. More than once he heard cattle moving away ahead of him, but he could not see them. Jean let Shep go, hoping the dog would strike a trail. But Shep gave neither tongue nor came back. Dawn began to break, and in the growing light Jean searched around until at last he stumbled over a dead calf, lying in a little bare wash where water ran in wet seasons. Big wolf tracks showed in the soft earth. Loafer, said Jean, as he knelt and just covered one track with his spreading hand. We had wolves in Oregon, but not as big as these. Wonder where that half-wolf dog Shep went. Wonder if he can be trusted where wolves are concerned. I'll bet not, if there's a she-wolf running around. Jean found tracks of two wolves, and he trailed them out of the wash, then lost them in the grass. But guided by their direction, he went on and climbed the slope to the cedar line, where in the dusty patches he found the tracks again. Not scared much, he muttered, as he noted the slow, trotting tracks. Well, you old gray loafers, we're going to clash. Jean knew from many futile hunts that wolves were the wariest and most intelligent of wild animals in the quest. From the top of a low foothill he watched the sun rise, and then no longer wondered why his father waxed eloquent over the beauty and location 
and luxuriance of this grassy valley. But it was large enough to make rich a good many ranchers. Jean tried to restrain any curiosity as to his father's dealings in Grass Valley until the situation had been made clear. Moreover, John wanted to love this wonderful country. He wanted to be free to ride and hunt and roam to his heart's content, and therefore he dreaded hearing his father's claims. But Jean threw off forebodings. Nothing ever turned out so badly as it presaged. He would think the best until certain of the worst. The morning was gloriously bright, and already the frost was glistening wet on the stones. Grass Valley shone like burnished silver, dotted with innumerable black spots. Burrows were braying their discordant message to one another. The colts were romping in the fields. Stallions were whistling. Cows were bawling. A cloud of blue smoke hung low over the ranch house, slowly wafting away on the wind. Far out in the valley, a dark group of horsemen were riding toward the village. Jean glanced thoughtfully at them and reflected that he seemed destined to harbor suspicion of all men, new and strange to him. Above the distant village stood the darkly green foothills leading up to the craggy slopes, and these ending in the rim, a red, black-fringed mountain front, beautiful in the morning sunlight, lonely, serene, and mysterious against the level skyline. Mountains, ranges, distance unknown to Jean, always called to him to come to seek, to explore, to find, but no wild horizon ever before beckoned to him as this one. And the subtle vague emotion that had gone to sleep with him last night awoke now hauntingly. It took effort to dispel the desire to think, to wonder. Upon his return to the house, he went around on the valley side, so as to see the place by daylight. His father had built for permanence, and evidently there had been three constructive periods in the history of that long, substantial, picturesque log house. But few nails and little sawed lumber, and no glass had been used. Strong and skillful hands, axes, and a cross-cut saw had been the prime factors in erecting this habitation of the Isbels. "'Good morning, son,' called a cheery voice from the porch. "'Sure we all heard your shoot, and the crack of that forty-four was as welcome as May flowers.' Bill Isbel looked up from a task over a saddle girth and inquired pleasantly if Jean ever slept of nights. Guy Isbel laughed, and there was warm regard in the gaze he bent on Jean. The old Indian, he drawled slowly. Did you get a bead on anything? No, I shot to scare away what I found to be some of your loafers, replied Jean. I heard them pulling down a calf, and I found tracks of two whoppin' big wolves. I found the dead calf, too. Reckon the meat can be saved. Dad, you must lose a lot of stock here. Well, son, you sure hit the nail on the head, replied the rancher. What with lions and bears and loafers, and two-footed loafers of another breed, I've lost five thousand dollars in stock this last year. Dad, you don't mean it, exclaimed Jean in astonishment. To him that sum represented a small fortune. I sure do, answered his father. Jean shook his head as if he could not understand such an enormous loss where there were keen, able-bodied men about. But that's awful, Dad. How could it happen? Where were your herders and cowboys, and Bill and Guy? Bill Isbel shook a vehement fist at Jean and retorted in earnest, having manifestly been hit in a sore spot. Where was me and Guy, huh? Well, my Oregon brother, we was here all year sleeping, more or less, about three hours out of every twenty-four, riding our boots off, and we couldn't keep down that loss. Jean... "'You'll have a mighty tumble coming to you out here,' said Guy, complacently. "'Listen, son,' spoke up the rancher. "'You want to have some hunches before you figure on our troubles. "'There's two or three packs of loafers, and in the winter time, "'they are hell to deal with. "'Lions thick as bees, and sure bad when the snow's on. "'Bears will kill a cow now and then, "'and whenever an old silver tip comes moseying across the Mazatels, 
He kills stock. I'm in with a half a dozen cattlemen. We all work together, and the whole outfit can't keep these varmints down. Two years ago, the Hash Knife Gang come into the Tonto. Hash Knife Gang? What a pretty name, replied John. Who are they? Rustler's son, and sure the real old Texas brand. The old Lone Star State got too hot for them and they followed the trail of a lot of other Texans who needed a healthier climate. Some two hundred Texans around here, Jean, and maybe a matter of three hundred inhabitants in the Tonto, all told, good and bad. Reckon it's about half and half. A cheery call from the kitchen interrupted the conversation of the men. You come to breakfast. During the meal, the old rancher talked to Bill and Guy about the day's order of work and from this jean gathered an idea of what a big cattle business his father conducted after breakfast jean's brothers manifested keen interest in the new rifles these were unwrapped and cleaned and taken out for testing the three rifles were forty four caliber winchesters the kind of gun jean had found most effective he tried them out first and the shots he made were satisfactory to him and amazing to the others. Bill had used an old Henry rifle. Guy did not favor any particular rifle. The rancher pinned his faith to the famous old single-shot buffalo gun, mostly called needle gun. Well, reckon I'd better stick to mine. Sure you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But you boys may do well with the forty-fours. Pack them on your saddles and practice when you see a coyote. Jean found it difficult to convince himself that this interest in guns and marksmanship had any sinister propulsion back of it. His father and brothers had always been this way. Rifles were as important to pioneers as plows, and their skillful use was an achievement every frontiersman tried to attain. Friendly rivalry had always existed among the members of the Isbel family. Even Aunt Isabel was a good shot. But such proficiency in the use of firearms and life in the open that was co-relative with it had not dominated them as it had John. Bill and Guy Isabel were born cattlemen, chips off the old block. John began to hope that his father's letter was an exaggeration, and particularly that the fatalistic speech of last night, they're going to kill me, was just a moody inclination to see the worst side. Still, even as John tried to persuade himself of this more hopeful view, he recalled many references to the peculiar reputation of Texans for gun-throwing, for feuds, for never-ending hatreds. In Oregon, the Isabels had lived among industrious and peaceful pioneers from all over the states, to be sure. The life had been rough and primitive, and there had been fights on occasions though no Isbel had ever killed a man. But now they had become fixed in a wider and sparsely settled country among men of their own breed. Jean was afraid his hopes had only sentiment to foster them. Nevertheless, he forced back a strange, brooding mental state and resolutely held up the brighter side. Whatever the evil conditions existing in Grass Valley, they could be met with intelligence and courage, and with an absolute certainty that it was inevitable they must pass away. Jean refused to consider the old fatal law that at certain wild times and wild places in the West certain men had to pass away to change evil conditions. "'Well, Jean, ride around the range with the boys,' said the rancher. "'Meet some of my neighbors, Jim Blaisdell in particular. Take a look at the cattle.' and pick out some horses for yourself. I've seen one already, declared Jean quickly. A black with white face. I'll take him. Sure you know a horse. To my eye, he's my pick. But the boys don't agree. Bill especially has degenerated into a fancier of pitching horses. Anne can ride that black. You try him this morning, and son, enjoy yourself. True to his first impression, John named the black horse Whiteface and fell in love with him 
before he ever swung a leg over him. Whiteface appeared spirited, yet gentle. He had been trained instead of being broken. Of hard hits and quirks and spurs, he had no experience. He liked to do what his rider wanted him to do. A hundred or more horses grazed in the grassy meadow, and as John rode on among them, it was a pleasure to see stallions throw heads and ears up and whistle or snort. Whole troops of colts and two-year-olds raced with flying tails and manes. Beyond these pastures stretched the range, and Jean saw the gray-green expanse speckled by thousands of cattle. The scene was inspiring. Jean's brothers led him all around, meeting some of the herders and riders employed on the ranch, one of whom was a burly, grizzled man with eyes reddened and narrowed by much riding in wind and sun and dust. His name was Everts, and he was the father of the lad who Jean had met near the village. Everts was busy skinning the calf that had been killed by the wolves. "'See here, you Jean Isabel,' said Everts. "'It sure was about time you come home. "'We all hears you have an eyes for tracks. "'Maybe you can kill old Gray, the loafer that did this job. "'He's pulled down nine calves as yearlings this last two months that I know of, "'and we've not held the spring roundup. Grass Valley widened to the southeast. Jean would have been backward about estimating the square miles in it. Yet it was not vast acreage so much as rich pasture that made it such a wonderful range. Several ranches lay along the western slope of this section. Jean was informed that open parks and swales and little valleys nestling among the foothills, wherever there was water and grass, had been settled by ranchers. Every summer, a few new families ventured in. Blaisdell struck Jean as being a lion-like type of Texan. Both in his broad, bold face, his huge head with its upstanding tawny hair like a mane, and in the speech and force that betokened the nature of his heart. He was not as old as Jean's father. He had a rolling voice with the same drawling intonation characteristic of all Texans and blue eyes that still held the fire of youth. Quite a marked contrast he presented to the lean, rangy, hard-jawed, intent-eyed men Jean had become to accept as Texans. Blaisdell took time for a curious scrutiny and study of Jean. That, frank and kindly as it was, was evidently the adjustment of impressions gotten from hearsay, yet bespoke, the attention of one used to judging men for himself, and in this particular case, having reasons of his own for so doing. "'Well, you're like your sister Anne,' said Blaisdell, "'which you may take as a compliment, young man. Both of you favor your mother. But you're an Isbel. Back in Texas, there are men who never wear a glove on their right hands, and sure I reckon if one of them met up with you sudden, he'd think some graves had opened.' and he'd go for his gun. Blaisdell's laugh pealed out with deep, pleasant roll. Thus he planted in Jean's sensitive mind a significant, thought-provoking idea about the past and gone Isabel's. His further remarks, likewise, were exceedingly interesting to Jean. The settling of the Tonto Basin by Texans was a subject often dispute. His own father had been in the first party of adventurous pioneers who had traveled up from the south to cross over the Reno Pass of the Mazatals into the basin. Newcomers from the outside get the impression of the Tonto according to the first settlers they meet, declared Baysdell. And sure it's my belief these first impressions never change. Just so strong they are. Well, I've heard my father say there were men in his wagon train that got run out of Texas, but he swore he wasn't one of them. So I reckon that sort of talk held good for twenty years, and for all the Texans who emigrated, except, of course, such notorious rustlers as Dags and men of his ilk. Sure, we got some bad men here. There's no law. Possession used to mean more than it does now. 
Daggs and his hash knife gang have begun to hold forth with a high hand. No small rancher can keep enough stock to pay for his labor. At the time of which Blaisdell spoke, there were not many sheepmen and cattlemen in the Tonto, considering its vast area. But these, on account of the extreme wildness of the broken country, were limited to the comparatively open Grass Valley and its adjacent environs. Naturally, as the inhabitants increased and stock raising grew in proportion, the grazing and water rights became a matter of extreme importance. Sheepmen ran their flocks up on the rim in the summertime and down in the basin in wintertime. A sheepman could throw a few thousand sheep round a cattleman's ranch and ruin him. The range was free. It was as fair for sheepmen to graze their herds anywhere as it was for cattlemen. This, of course, did not apply to the few acres of cultivated ground that a rancher could call his own. But very few cattle could have been raised on such limited area. Blaisdell said that the sheepmen were unfair because they could have done just as well, though perhaps at more labor, by keeping to the ridges and leaving the open valley and little flats to the ranchers. Formerly, there had been room enough for all. Now the grazing ranges were being encroached upon by sheepmen newly come to the Tonto. To Blaisdell's way of thinking, the rustler menace was more serious than the sheeping off of the range, for the simple reason that no cattleman knew exactly who the rustlers were, and for the more complex and significant reason that the rustlers did not steal sheep. Texas was overstocked, with bad men and fine steers, concluded Blaisdell. Most of the first and some of the last have struck the Tonto. The sheepmen have now got distributing points for wool and sheep at Maricopa and Phoenix. They're sure waxing strong and bold. Uh-huh. And what's likely to come of this mess, queried John? Ask your dad, replied Blaisdell. I will but I reckon I'd be obliged for your opinion. Well, the short and sweet is this. Texas cattlemen will never allow the range they stocked to be overrun by sheepmen. Who's this man Greaves, went on Jean. Never run into anyone like him. Greaves is hard to figure. He's a snaky customer in deals, but he seems to be good to the poor around here. Says he's from Missouri. Ha, <laughs> ha. He's as much a Texan as I am. But he rode into Tonto without even a pack to his name. And presently he builds his stone house and freights supplies in from Phoenix. Appears to buy and sell a good deal of stock. For a while it looked like he was steering a middle course between cattlemen and sheepmen. Both sides made a rendezvous of his store where he heard the grievances of each. Lately... He's been leaning to the sheepmen. Nobody has accused him of that yet, but it's time some cattleman called his bluff. Of course there are honest and square sheepmen in the basin, queried John. Yes, and some of them are not unreasonable. But the new fellows that dropped in on us the last few years, they're the ones we're going to clash with. This sheepman Jorth went on John in slow hesitation, as if compelled to ask, what he would rather not learn. Jorth must be the leader of the sheep faction that's harrying us ranchers. He doesn't make threats or roar around like some of them, but he goes on raising and buying more and more sheep. And his herders have been grazing down all around us this winter. Jorth's got to be reckoned with. Who is he? Well, I don't know enough to talk about. Your dad never said so. But I think he and Jorth knew each other in Texas years ago. I never saw Jorth but once. That was in Greaves' bar room. Your dad and Jorth met that day for the first time in this country. Well, I've not known men for nothing. They just stood stiff and looked at each other. Your dad was about to draw. But Jorth made no sign to throw a gun. Jean saw the growing and weaving and thickening of threads of a tangle that had already involved him. And the sudden pang of regret he sustained 
was not wholly because of sympathies with his own people. The other day up in the woods on the rim, I ran into a sheepman who said his name was Coulter. Who is he? Coulter? Sure he's a new one. What he'd look like? Jean described Coulter with a readiness that spoke volumes for the vividness of his impressions. I don't know him, replied Blaisdell, but that only goes to prove my contention. Any fellow running wild in the woods can say he's a sheepman. Coulter surprised me by calling me by my name, continued John. Our little talk wasn't exactly friendly. He said a lot about me being sent for to run sheep herders out of the country. Sure, that's all over, replied Blaisdell seriously. You're a marked man already. What started such a rumor? Sure you can't prove it by me, but it's not taken as rumor. It's got the sheepmen as hard as bullets. Aha. Uh -huh. That accounts for Coulter seeming a little sore under the collar. Well, he said, they were going to run sheep over Grass Valley, and for me to take that hunch to my dad. Blaisdell had his chair tilted back and his heavy boots against the post of the porch. Down he thumped. His neck corded with a sudden rush of blood, and his eyes changed to blue fire. The hell he did, he ejaculated, in furious amaze. Jean gauged the brooding, rankling hurt of this old cattleman by his sudden break from the cool, easy Texan manner. Blaisdell cursed under his breath, swung his arms violently, as if to throw a last doubt or hope aside, and then relapsed to his former state. He laid a brown hand on Jean's knee. Two years ago, I called the cards,' he said quietly. "'It means a Grass Valley War.' Not until late that afternoon did Jean's father broach the subject uppermost in his mind. Then, at an opportune moment, he drew Jean away into the cedars out of sight. "'Son, I sure hate to make your homecoming unhappy,' he said, with evidence of agitation. But so help me God, I have to do it. Dad, you called me prodigal, and I reckon you were right. I've shirked my duty to you. I'm ready now to make up for it, replied Jean, feelingly. Well, well, sure that's fine spoken, my boy. Let's sit down here and have a long talk. First off, what did Jim Blaisdell tell you? End of Chapter 3, Part 1《Section Six of To the Last Man》by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Part Two. Briefly, Jean outlined the neighbor rancher's conversation. Then Jean recounted his experience with Coulter, and concluded with Blaisdell's reception of the sheepman's threat. If Jean expected to see his father rise up like a lion in his wrath. He made a huge mistake. This news of Coulter and his talk never struck even a spark from Gaston Isbel. Well, he began thoughtfully, reckon there are only two points in Jim's talk I need touch on. There's sure going to be a Grass Valley War, and Jim's idea of the cause of it seems to be pretty much the same as that of all the other cattlemen. It'll go down as a black blot on the history page of the Tonto Basin, has a war between rival sheepmen and cattlemen. Same old fight over water and grass. Jean, my son, that is wrong. It'll not be a war between sheepmen and cattlemen, but a war of honest ranchers against rustlers masking as sheep raisers. Mind you, I don't belittle the trouble between sheepmen and cattlemen in Arizona. It's real, it's vital, and it's serious. It'll take law and order to straighten out the grazing question. Some day the government will keep sheep off of cattle ranges. So get things right in your mind, my son. You can trust your dad to tell the absolute truth. In this fight, that'll wipe out some of the Isabels, maybe all of them. You're on the side of justice and right. Knowing that, a man can fight a hundred times harder than he who knows he is a liar and a thief. The old rancher wiped his perspiring face and breathed slowly and deeply. 
Jean sensed in him the rise of a tremendous emotional strain. Wonderingly, he watched the keen, lined face. More than material worries were at the root of brooding, mounting thoughts in his father's eyes. Now take what Jim said about your coming to chase these sheep herders out of the valley. Jean, I started that talk. I had my tricky reasons. I know these greaser sheep herders, and I know the respect Texans have for a gunman. Some say I bragged. Some say I'm an old fool in his dotage, raving about a favorite son. But there are people who hate me and are afraid. True, son, I talked with a purpose, but sure I was mighty cold and steady when I did. My feeling was that you'd do what I'd do if I were thirty years younger. No, I reckon you'd do more. For I figured on your blood, John. You're an Indian and a Texan and French, and you've trained yourself in the Oregon woods. When you were only a boy, few marksmen I ever knew could beat you, and I never saw your equal for eye and ear for tracking a horse and for all the gifts that make a woodsman. Well, remembering this, and seeing the trouble ahead for the Isbels, I just broke out whenever I had a chance. I bragged before men I'd reason to believe who would take my words deep. For instance, not long ago, I missed some stock, and happening in the Greaves' place one Saturday night, I sure talked loud. His bar room was full of men, and some of them were in my black book. Greaves took my talk a little testy. He said, Well, Gas, maybe you're right about some of these cattle thieves living among us, but ain't they just as liable to be some of your friends or relatives as Ted Meeker's or mine, or anyone else around here? That was when Greaves and me fell out. I yelled at him, No, by God, they're not. My record here and that of my people is open. The least I can say for you, Greaves, and your crowd, is that your records fade away on dim trails. Then he said, nasty-like, Well, if you could work out all the dim trails in the Tonto, you'd sure be surprised. And then I roared. Sure, that was the chance I was looking for. I swore the trails he hinted of would be tracked to the holes of the rustlers who made them. I told him I had sent for you, and when you got here, these slippery, mysterious thieves, whoever they were, would sure have hell to pay. Greaves said he hoped so, but he was afraid I was partial to my Indian son. Then we had hot words. Blaisdell got between us. When I was leaving, I took a parting fling at him. Greaves, you ought to know the Isbels. Considering you're from Texas, maybe you've got reason for throwing taunts at my claims for my son Jean. Yes, he's got Indian in him, and that'll be the worst for the men who will have to meet him. I'm telling you, Greaves, Jean Isabel is the black sheep of the family. If you ride down his record, you'll find he's sure in line to be another Pogan, or Reddy Kingfisher, or Hardin, or any of the Texas gunmen you ought to remember. Greaves, there are men rubbing elbows with you right here that my Indian son is going to track down. Jean bent his head in stunned cognizance of the notoriety which his father had chosen to affront any and all Tonto Basin men who were under the ban of his suspicion. What a terrible reputation and trust to have saddled upon him. Thrills and strange, heated sensations seemed to rush together inside Jean, forming a hot ball of fire that threatened to explode. A retreating self made feeble protests. He saw his own pale face going away, from this older, grimmer man. Son, if I could have looked forward to anything but blood spilling, I'd never have given you such a name to uphold, continued the rancher. What I'm going to tell you now is my secret. My other sons and Ann have never heard it. Jim Blisdale suspects there's something strange, but he doesn't know. I'll sure never tell anybody else but you, and you must promise to keep my secret now and after I'm gone. I promise, said Jean. Well, and now to get it out, began his father, breathing hard. His face twitched and his hands clenched. The sheepmen here I have to reckon with 
Is Lee Jorth a lifelong enemy of mine? We were born in the same town, played together as children, and fought with each other as boys. We never got along together, and we both fell in love with the same girl. It was nip and tuck for a while. Ellen Sutton belonged to one of the old families of the South. She was a beauty, and much courted, and I reckon it was hard for her to choose. But I won her, and we became engaged. Then the war broke out. I enlisted with my brother Jean. He advised me to marry Ellen before I left, but I would not. That was the blunder of my life. Soon after our parting, her letters ceased to come. But I didn't distrust her. That was a terrible time, and all was confusion. Then I got crippled and put in a hospital, and in about a year I was sent back home. At this juncture, Jean refrained from further gaze at his father's face. Lee Jorth had gotten out of going to war, went on the rancher, in lower, thicker voice. He married my sweetheart, Ellen. I knew the story long before I got well. He had run after her like a hound after a hare, and Ellen married him. Well, when I was able to get about, I went to see Jorth and Ellen. I confronted them. I had to know why she had gone back on me. Lee Jorth hadn't changed any with all his good fortune. He'd made Ellen believe in my dishonor. But I reckon, lies or no lies, Ellen Sutton was faithless. In my absence, he had won her away from me, and I saw that she loved him as she never had me. I reckon that killed all my generosity. If she'd been imposed upon and weaned away by his lies and had regretted me a little, I'd have forgiven, perhaps. But she worshipped him. She was his slave, and I, well, I learned what hate was. The war ruined the Suttons, same as so many Southerners. Lee Jorth went in for raising cattle. He'd gotten the Sutton range, and after a few years, he began to accumulate stock. In those days, every cattleman was a little bit of a thief. Every cattleman drove in and branded calves he couldn't swear was his. Well, the Isabels were the strongest cattle raisers in that country. And I laid a trap for Lee Jorth, caught him in the act of branding calves of mine I'd marked, and I proved him a thief. I made him a rustler. I ruined him. We met once. But Jorth was one Texan not strong on the draw, at least against an Isbel. He left the country. He had friends and relatives, and they started him at stock raising again. But he began to gamble, and he got in with a shady crowd. He went from bad to worse, and then he came back home. When I saw the change in proud, beautiful Ellen Sutton, and how she still worshipped Jorth, it sure drove me near mad between pity and hate. Well, I reckon in a Texan, hate outlives any other feeling. There came a strange turn of the wheel, and my fortunes changed. Like most young bloods of the day, I drank and gambled. And one night I run across Jorth and a card-sharp friend. He fleeced me. We quarreled. Guns were thrown. I killed my man. About that period, the Texas Rangers had come into existence. And, son, when I said I never was run out of Texas, I wasn't holding to strict truth. I rode out on a horse. I went to Oregon. There I married soon, and there Bill and Guy were born. Their mother did not live long. And next I married your mother, Jean. She had some Indian blood, which, for all I could see, made her only the finer. She was a wonderful woman, and gave me the only happiness I ever knew. You remember her, of course, and those home days in Oregon. I reckon I made another great blunder when I moved to Arizona. But the cattle country had always called me. I had heard of this wild Tonto Basin, and how Texans were settling there and Jim Blaisdell sent me word to come, that this sure was a garden spot of the West. Well, it is, and your mother was gone. Three years ago, Lee Jorth drifted into the Tonto, and strange to me, along about a year or so after his coming, the Hash Knife Gang rode up from Texas. Jorth went in for raising sheep. 
Along with some other sheepmen, he lives up in the rim canyons. Somewhere back in the wild breaks is the hiding place of the Hash Knife Gang. Nobody but me, I reckon, associates Colonel Jorth, as he's called, with Dags and his gang. Maybe Blysdale and a few others have a hunch, but that's no matter. As a sheepman, Jorth has a legitimate grievance with the cattlemen. But what could be settled by a square consideration for the good of all and the future, Jorth will never settle. He'll never settle because he is now no longer an honest man. He's in with Dags. I can't prove this, son, but I know it. I saw it in Jorth's face when I met him that day with Greaves. I saw more. I sure saw what he's up to. He never met me at an even break. He's dead set on using this sheep and cattle feud to ruin my family and me, even as I ruined him. But he means more, Jean. This will be a war between Texans and a bloody war. There are bad men in this Tonto, some of the worst that didn't get shot in Texas. Jorth will have some of these fellows. Now, are we going to wait to be sheeped off our range and to be murdered from ambush? No, we are not, replied Jean quietly. Well, come down to the house, said the rancher, and led the way without speaking until he halted by the door. There he placed his finger on a small hole in the wood, about the height of a man's head. Jean saw it was a bullet hole, and that a few gray hairs stuck to its edges. The rancher stepped closer to the doorpost, so that his head was within an inch of the wood. Then he looked at Jean with eyes in which there glinted dancing specks of fire, like wild sparks. Son, the sneakin' shot at me was made three mornings ago, I recollect, moving my head just when I heard the crack of a rifle. Sure was surprised, but I got inside quick. Jean scarcely heard the latter part of his speech. He seemed doubled up inwardly, in hot and cold convulsions of changing emotion. A terrible hold upon his consciousness was about to break and let go. The first shot had been fired, and he was an Isbel. Indeed, his father had made him ten times an Isbel. Blood was thick. His father did not speak to dull ears. This strife of raising tumult in him seemed the effect of years of calm, of peace in the woods, of dreamy waiting for he knew not what. It was the passionate, primitive life in him that had awakened to the call of blood ties. "'That's about all, son,' concluded the rancher. "'You understand now why I feel they're going to kill me. I feel it here.' With solemn gesture, he placed his broad hand over his heart. "'And, Jean, strange whispers come to me at night. It seems like your mother was calling or trying to warn me.' I can't explain these queer whispers, but I know what I know. Jorth has his followers. You must have yours, replied Jean tensely. Sure, son, and I can take my choice of the best men here, replied the rancher with pride, but I'll not do that. I'll lay the deal before them and let them choose. I reckon it won't be a long-winded fight. It'll be short and bloody, after the way of Texans. I'm looking to you, Jean, to see that an Isbel is the last man. My God, Dad, is there no other way? Think of my sister, Anne, of my brother's wives, and of, of other women. Dad, these damned Texas feuds are cruel, horrible, burst out Jean in passionate protest. Jean, would it be any easier for our women if we let these men shoot us down in cold blood? Oh, no, no, I see. There's no hope of, of... But, Dad, I wasn't thinking about myself. I don't care. Once started, I'll... I'll be what you bragged I was. Only it's so hard to give in. Jean leaned an arm against the side of the cabin, and bowing his face over it, he surrendered to the irresistible contention within his breast. And, as if with a wrench, that strange inward hole broke. He let down. He went back, something that was boyish and hopeful, and in its place slowly rose the dark tide of his inheritance, the savage instinct of self-preservation bequeathed 
by his Indian mother, and the fierce, feudal bloodlust of his Texan father. Then, as he raised himself, gripped by a sickening coldness in his breast, he remembered Ellen Jorth's face as she had gazed dreamily down off the rim, so soft, so different, with tremulous lips, sad, musing, with far-seeing stare of dark eye, peering into the unknown, the instinct of life still unlived. With confused vision and nameless pain, Jean thought of her. "'Dad, it's hard on the young folks,' he said bitterly. "'The sins of the father, you know. "'And the other side, how about Jorth? "'Has he any children?' "'What a curious gleam of surprise and conjecture "'Jean encountered in his father's gaze. "'He has a daughter, Ellen Jorth, "'named after her mother. "'The first time I saw Ellen Jorth, "'I thought she was a ghost of the girl I had loved and lost. "'Sight of her was like a blade in my side. "'But the looks of her and what she is they don't jibe. Old as I am, my heart, bah, Ellen Jorth is a damned hussy. Jean Isabel went off alone into the cedars. Surrender and resignation to his father's creed should have ended his perplexity and worry. His instant and burning resolve to be as his father had represented him should have opened his mind to slow cunning, to the craft of the Indian, to the development of hate. But there seemed to be an obstacle, a cloud in the way of vision, a face limned on his memory. Those damning words of his father had been a shock, how little or great he could not tell. Was it only a day since he had met Ellen Jorth? What had made all the difference? Suddenly, like a breath, the fragrance of her hair came back to him, the sweet coolness of her lips. Jean trembled. He looked around him as if he were pursued or surrounded by eyes, by instincts, by fears, by incomprehensible things. Uh-huh. That must be what ails me, he muttered. The look of her and that kiss, they've gone hard on me. I should never have stopped the talk. Am I to kill her father and leave her to God knows what? Something was wrong somewhere. Jean absolutely forgot that within the hour he had pledged his manhood, his life to a feud, which could be blotted out only in blood. If he had understood himself, he would have realized that the pledge was no more thrilling and unintelligible in its possibilities than this instinct which drew him irresistibly. Ellen Jorth. So my dad calls her a damned hussy. So that explains the way she acted, why she never hit me when I kissed her and her words, so easy and cool-like. Hussy? That means she's bad, bad, scornful of me, maybe disappointed because my kiss was innocent. It was, I swear. And all she said, oh, I've been kissed before. Jean grew furious with himself for the spreading of a new sensation in his breast that seemed now to ache. He had become infatuated all in a day with this Ellen Jorth. Was he jealous of the men who had the privilege of her kisses? No. But his reply was hot with shame, with uncertainty. The thing that seemed wrong was outside of himself. A blunder was no crime. To be attracted by a pretty girl in the woods, to yield to an impulse, was no disgrace nor wrong. He had been foolish over a girl before, though not to such a rash extent. Ellen Jorth, had stuck in his consciousness, and with her a sense of regret. Then swiftly rang his father's bitter words, the revealing, but the looks of her and what she is, they don't jibe. In the import of these words hid the meaning of the wrong that troubled him. Broodingly, he pondered over them. The looks of her, yes, she was pretty, but it didn't dawn on me at first. I, I was sort of excited, I liked to look at her, but didn't think. And now, consciously, her face was called up, infinitely sweet and more impelling for the deliberate memory. Flash of brown skin, smooth and clear. Level gaze of dark, wide eyes. Steady, bold, unseeing. Red curved lips. Sad and sweet. 
Her strong, clean, fine face rose before Jean, eager and wistful, one moment softened by dreamy, musing thought, and the next stormily passionate, full of hate, full of longing, but the more mysterious and beautiful. She looks like that. But she's bad, concluded Jean, with bitter finality. I might have fallen in love with Ellen Jorth if, if she had been different. But the conviction forced upon Jean did not dispel the haunting memory of her face, nor did it wholly silence the deep and stubborn voice of his consciousness. Later that afternoon, he sought a moment with his sister. Anne, did you ever meet Ellen Jorth? he asked. Yes, but not lately, replied Anne. Well, I met her as I was riding along yesterday. She was herding sheep, went on Jean rapidly. I asked her to show me the way to the rim, and she walked with me a mile or so. I can't say the meeting was not interesting, at least to me. Will you tell me what you know about her? Sure, Jean, replied his sister, with her dark eyes fixed wonderingly and kindly on his troubled face. I've heard a great deal, but in this Tonto Basin I don't believe all I hear. What I know, I'll tell you. I first met Ellen Jorth two years ago. We didn't know each other's names then. She was the prettiest girl I ever saw. I liked her. She liked me. She seemed unhappy. The next time we met was at a roundup. There were other girls with me, and they snubbed her. But I left them and went round with her. That snub cut her to the heart. She was lonely. She had no friends. She talked about herself, how she hated the people, but loved Arizona. She had nothing fit to wear. I didn't need to be told that she'd been used to better things. Just when it looked as if we were going to be friends, she told me who she was and asked me my name. I told her. Jean, I couldn't have hurt her more if I'd slapped her face. She turned white. She gasped. And then she ran off. The last time I saw her was about a year ago. I was riding a shortcut trail to the ranch where a friend lived, and I met Ellen Jorth riding with a man I'd never seen. The trail was overgrown and shady. They were riding close and didn't see me right off. The man had his arm around her. She pushed him away. I saw her laugh. Then he got hold of her again and was kissing her when his horse shied at sight of mine. They rode by me then. Ellen Jorth held her head high and never looked at me. And do you think she's a bad girl? demanded Jean bluntly. Bad? Oh, Jean exclaimed Anne in surprise and embarrassment. Dad said she was a damned hussy. Jean, Dad hates the Jorths. Sister, I'm asking you, what you think of Ellen Jorth? Would you be friends with her if you could? Yes. Then you don't believe she's bad? No. Ellen Jorth is lonely, unhappy. She has no mother. She lives alone among rough men. Such a girl can't keep men from handling her and kissing her. Maybe she's too free. Maybe she's wild. But she's honest, John. You can trust a woman to tell. When she rode past me that day, her face was white and proud. She was a Jorth, and I was an Isbel. She hated herself. She hated me. But no bad girl could look like that. She knows what's said of her all around the valley, but she doesn't care. She'd encourage gossip. Thank you, Anne, replied John huskily. Please keep this, this meeting of mine with her all to yourself, won't you? Why, Jean, of course I will. Jean wandered away again, peculiarly grateful to Anne for reviving and upholding something in him that seemed a wavering part of the best of him, a chivalry that had demanded to be killed by judgment of a righteous woman. He was conscious of an uplift, a gladdening of his spirit, Yet the ache remained. More than that, he found himself plunged deeper into conjecture, doubt. Had not the Ellen Jorth incident ended? He denied his father's indictment of her and accepted the faith of his sister. Reckon that's about all, as Dad says, he soliloquized. Yet was that all? He paced under the cedars, 
He watched the sunset. He listened to the coyotes. He lingered there after the call for supper, until out of the tumult of his conflicting emotions and ponderings there evolved the staggering consciousness that he must see Ellen Jorth again. End of Chapter 3, Part 2「Section Seven of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part One. Ellen Jorth hurried back into the forest, hotly resentful of the accident that had thrown her in contact with an Isbel. Disgust filled her, disgust that she had been amiable to a member of the hated family that had ruined her father. The surprise of this meeting did not come to her while she was under the spell of stronger feelings. She walked under the trees swiftly, with head erect, looking straight before her, and every step seemed a relief. Upon reaching camp, her attention was distracted from herself. Pepe, the Mexican boy, with the two shepherd dogs, was trying to drive sheep into a closer bunch to save the lambs from coyotes. Ellen loved the fleecy, tottering little lambs, and at this season she hated all the prowling beasts of the forest. From this time on for weeks the flock would be besieged by wolves, lions, bears, the last of which were often bold and dangerous. The old grizzlies that killed the ewes to eat only the milk bags were particularly dreaded by Ellen. She was a good shot with a rifle, but had orders from her father to let the bears alone. Fortunately, such sheep-killing bears were but few, and were left to be hunted by men from the ranch. Mexican sheep-herders could not be depended upon to protect their flocks from bears. Ellen helped Pepe drive in the stragglers, and she took several shots at coyotes skulking along the edge of the brush. The open glade in the forest was favorable for herding the sheep at night, and the dogs could be depended upon to guard the flock, and in most cases to drive predatory beasts away. After this task, which brought the time to sunset, Ellen had supper to cook and eat. Darkness came, and a cool night wind set in. Here and there a lamb bleated plaintively. With her work done for the day, Ellen sat before a ruddy campfire and found her thoughts again centering around the singular adventure that had befallen her. Disdainfully, she strove to think of something else, but there was nothing that could dispel the interest of her meeting with Jean Isbel. Thereupon she impatiently surrendered to it, and recalled every word and action which she could remember. And in the process of this meditation she came to an action of hers, recollection of which brought the blood tingling to her neck and cheeks, so unusually and burningly that she covered them with her hands. What did he think of me, she mused doubtfully. It did not matter what he thought, but she could not help wondering. And when she came to the memory of his kiss, she suffered more than the sensation of throbbing scarlet cheeks. Scornfully and bitterly she burst out, Sure he couldn't have thought much good of me. The half-hour following this reminiscence was far from being pleasant. Proud, passionate, strong-willed Ellen Jorth found herself a victim of conflicting emotions. The event of the day was too close. She could not understand it. Disgust and disdain and scorn could not make this meeting with Jean Isabel as if it had never been. Pride could not efface it from her mind. The more she reflected, the harder she tried to forget, the stronger grew a significance of interest. And when a hint of this dawned upon her consciousness, she resented it so forcefully that she lost her temper, scattered the campfire, and went into the little teepee tent to roll in her blankets. Thus settled, snug and warm for the night, with a shepherd dog curled at the opening of her tent, she shut her eyes and confidently bade sleep end her perplexities. But sleep did not come at her invitation. She found herself wide awake, keenly sensitive to the sputtering of the campfire, the tinkling of the bells on the rams, the bleeding of lambs, 
the sough of wind in the pines, and the hungry sharp bark of coyotes off in the distance. Darkness was no respecter of her pride. The lonesome night, with its emphasis on solitude, seemed to induce clamoring and strange thoughts, a confusing ensemble of all those that had annoyed her during the daytime. Not for long hours did sheer weariness bring her to slumber. Ellen awakened late and failed of her usual alacrity. Both Pepe and the shepherd dog appeared to regard her with surprise and solicitude. Ellen's spirit was low this morning. Her blood ran sluggishly. She had to fight a mournful tendency to feel sorry for herself. At first, she was not very successful. There seemed to be some kind of pleasure in reveling in melancholy which her common sense told her had no reason for existence. But states of mind persisted in spite of common sense. Pepe, when is Antonio coming back? she asked. The boy could not give her a satisfactory answer. Ellen had willingly taken the sheep herder's place for a few days, but now she was impatient to go home. She looked down the green and brown aisles of the forest until she was tired. Antonio did not return. Ellen spent the day with the sheep, and in the manifold task of caring for a thousand newborn lambs, she forgot herself. This day saw the end of lambing time for that season. The forest resounded to the babble of blahs and bleats. When night came, she was glad to go to bed for what with loss of sleep and weariness, she could scarcely keep her eyes open. The following morning she awakened early, bright, eager, expectant, full of bounding life, strangely aware of the beauty and sweetness of the scented forest, strangely conscious of some nameless stimulus to her feelings. Not long was Ellen in associating this new and delightful variety of sensations with the fact that Jean Isabel had set today for his ride up to the rim to see her. Ellen's joyousness fled. Her smiles faded. The spring morning lost its magic radiance. Sure, there's no sense in my lying to myself, she soliloquized, thoughtfully. It's queer of me, feeling glad about him, without knowing. Lord, I must be lonesome. To be glad to see an Isbel, even if he is different. Soberly, she accepted the astounding reality. Her confidence died with her gaiety. Her vanity began to suffer. And she caught at her admission that Jean and Isabel was different. She resented it in amaze. She ridiculed it. She laughed at her naive confession. She could arrive at no conclusion other than she was a weak-minded, fluctuating, inexplicable little fool. But for all that, she found her mind had been made up for her without consent or desire, before her will had been consulted, and that inevitably and unalterably she meant to see Jean Isbel again. Long she battled with this strange decree. One moment she won a victory over this new, curious self, only to lose it the next. And at last, out of her conflict, there emerged a few convictions that left her with some shreds of pride. She hated all Isbel's, she hated any Isbel, and particularly she hated Jean Isbel. She was only curious, intensely curious, to see if he would come back, and if he did come, what would he do? She wanted only to watch him from some covert. She would not go near him, not let him see her or guess of her presence. Thus she assuaged her hurt vanity. Thus she stifled her miserable doubts. Long before the sun had begun to slant westward toward the mid-afternoon, Jean Isabel had set as a meeting time, Ellen directed her steps through the forest to the rim. She felt ashamed of her eagerness. She had a guilty conscience that no strange thrills could silence. It would be fun to see him, to watch him, to let him wait for her, to fool him. Like an Indian, she chose the soft pine needle mats to tread upon, and her light moccasined feet left no trace. Like an Indian also, she made a wide detour and reached the rim a quarter of a mile west of the spot where she had talked with Jean Isabel, and here, turning east, 
she took care to step on the bare stones. This was an adventure, seemingly the first she had ever had in her life. Assuredly, she had never before come directly to the rim without halting to look, to wonder, to worship. This time she scarcely glanced into the blue abyss. All absorbed was she in hiding her tracks. Not one chance in a thousand would she risk. The Jorth pride burned even while the feminine side of her dominated her actions. She had some difficult rocky points to cross, then windfalls to round, and at length reached the covert she desired. A rugged yellow point of the rim stood somewhat higher than the spot Ellen wanted to watch. A dense thicket of jack pines grew to the very edge. It afforded an ambush that even the Indian eyes Jean Isabel was credited with could never penetrate. Moreover, if by accident she had made a noise and excited suspicion, she could retreat unobserved and hide in the huge rocks below the rim, where a ferret could not locate her. With her plan decided upon, Ellen had nothing to do but wait. So she repaired to the other side of the pine thicket and to the edge of the rim where she could watch and listen. She knew that long before she saw Isbel, she would hear his horse. It was altogether unlikely that he would come on foot. Sure, Ellen Jorth, you're a queer girl, she mused. I reckon I wasn't well acquainted with you. Beneath her yawned a wonderful deep canyon, rugged and rocky with but few pines on the north slope, thick with dark green timber on the south slope. Yellow and gray crags, like turreted castles, stood up out of the sloping forest on the side opposite her. The trees were all sharp, spear-pointed. Patches of light green aspens showed strikingly against the dense black. The great slope beneath Ellen was serrated with narrow, deep gorges, almost canyons in themselves. Shadows alternated with clear, bright spaces. The mile-wide mouth of the canyon opened upon the basin, down into a world of wild, timbered ranges and ravines, valleys and hills that rolled and tumbled in dark green waves to the Sierra Anchas. But for once Ellen seemed singularly unresponsive to this panorama of wildness and grandeur. Her ears were like those of a listening deer, and her eyes continually reverted to the open places along the rim. At first, in her excitement, time flew by. Gradually, however, as the sun moved westward, she began to be restless. The soft thud of dropping pine cones, the rustling of squirrels up and down the shaggy barked spruces, the crackling of weathered bits of rocks, these caught her keen ears many times and brought her up erect and thrilling. Finally she heard a sound which resembled that of an unshod hoof on stone. Stealthily, then, she took her rifle and slipped back through the pine thicket to the spot she had chosen. The little pines were so close together that she had to crawl between their trunks. The ground was covered with a soft bed of pine needles, brown and fragrant. In her hurry, she pricked her ungloved hand on a sharp pine cone, and drew the blood. She sucked the tiny wound. Sure I'm wondering if that's a bad omen, she muttered, darkly thoughtful. Then she resumed her sinuous approach to the edge of the thicket, and presently reached it. Ellen lay flat a moment to recover her breath, then raised herself on her elbows. Through an opening in the fringe of buck brush, she could plainly see the promontory where she had stood with Jean Isabel, and also the approaches by which he might come. Rather nervously, she realized that her covert was hardly more than a hundred feet from the promontory. It was imperative that she be absolutely silent. Her eyes searched the openings along the rim. The gray form of a deer crossed one of these, and she concluded it had made the sound she had heard. Then she lay down more comfortably and waited. Resolutely she held, as much as possible, to her sensorial perceptions. The meaning of Ellen Jorth lying in ambush, just to see an Isabel, was a conundrum she refused to ponder in the present. She was doing it, 
and the physical act had its fascination. Her ears, attuned to all the sounds of the lonely forest, caught them and arranged them according to her knowledge of woodcraft. A long hour passed. The sun had slanted to a point halfway between the zenith and the horizon. Suddenly a thought confronted Ellen Jorth. He's not coming, she whispered. The instant that idea presented itself, she felt a blank sense of loss, a vague regret, something that must have been disappointment. Unprepared for this, she was held by surprise for a moment, and then she was stunned. Her spirit, swift and rebellious, had no time to rise in her defense. She was a lonely, guilty, miserable girl, too weak for pride to uphold, too fluctuating to know her real self. She stretched there, burying her face in the pine needles, digging her fingers into them, wanting nothing so much as that they might hide her. The moment was incomprehensible to Ellen and utterly intolerable. The sharp pine needles, piercing her wrists and cheeks and her hot heaving breast, seemed to give her exquisite relief. The shrill snort of a horse sounded near at hand. With a shock, Ellen's body stiffened. Then she quivered a little, and her feelings underwent swift change. Cautiously and noiselessly, she raised herself upon her elbows and peeped through the opening in the brush. She saw a man tying a horse to a bush somewhat back from the rim. Drawing a rifle from its saddle sheath, he threw it in the hollow of his arm and walked to the edge of the precipice. He gazed away across the basin and appeared lost in contemplation or thought. Then he turned to look back into the forest, as if he expected someone. Ellen recognized the lithe figure, the dark face so like an Indian's. It was Isbel. He had come. Somehow his coming seemed wonderful and terrible. Ellen shook as she leaned on her elbows. Jean Isabel, true to his word, in spite of her scorn, had come back to see her. The fact seemed monstrous. He was an enemy of her father. Long had range rumor been bandied from lip to lip. Old Gas Isabel had sent for his Indian son to fight the Jorths. Jean Isabel, son of a Texan, unerring shot, peerless tracker, a bad and dangerous man. Then there flashed over Ellen a burning thought. If it were true, if he was an enemy of her father's, if a fight between Jorth and Isbel was inevitable, she ought to kill this Jean Isbel right there in his tracks as he boldly and confidently waited for her. Fool he was to think she would come. Ellen sank down and dropped her head until the strange tremor of her arms ceased. That dark and grim flash of thought retreated. She had not come to murder a man from ambush, but only to watch him, to try to see what he meant, what he thought, to allay a strange curiosity. After a while she looked again. Isabel was sitting on an upheaved section of the rim, in a comfortable position from which she could watch the openings in the forest and gaze as well across the west curve of the basin to the Mazatals. He had composed himself to wait. He was clad in a buckskin suit, rather new, and it certainly showed off to advantage compared with the ragged and soiled apparel Ellen remembered. He did not look so large. Ellen was used to the long, lean, rangy Arizonians and Texans. This man was built differently. He had the widest shoulder of any man she had ever seen, and they made him appear rather short. But his lithe, powerful limbs proved he was not short. Whenever he moved, the muscles rippled. His hands were clasped round a knee, brown sinewy hands, very broad and fitting the thick muscular wrists. His collar was open, and he did not wear a scarf as did the men Ellen knew. Then her intense curiosity at last brought her steady gaze to Jean Isabel's head and face. He wore a cap, evidently of some thin fur. His hair was straight and short, and in color a dead raven black. His complexion was dark, clear tan, with no traces of red. 
He did not have the prominent cheekbones nor the high bridged nose usual with white men who were part Indian. Still he had the Indian look. Ellen caught that in the dark, intent, piercing eyes, in the wide, level, thoughtful brows, in the stern impassiveness of his smooth face. He had a straight, sharp-cut profile. Ellen whispered to herself, I saw him right the other day, only I'd not admit it. The finest-looking man I ever saw in my life is a damned Isbel. Was that what I came out here for? She lowered herself once more, and folding her arms under her breasts, she reclined comfortably on them, and searched out a smaller peephole from which she could spy upon Isbel. As she watched him, the new and perplexing side of her mind waxed busier. Why had he come back? What did he want of her? Acquaintance? Friendship? Was impossible for them. He had been respectful, deferential toward her in a way that had strangely pleased until the surprising moment when he had kissed her. That had only disrupted her rather dreamy pleasure in a situation she had not experienced before. All the men she had met in this wild country were rough and bold. Most of them had wanted to marry her, and, failing that, they had persisted in amorous attentions not particularly flattering or honorable. They were a bad lot, and contact with them had dulled some of her sensibilities. But this Jean Isabel had seemed a gentleman. She struggled to be fair, trying to forget her antipathy, as much to understand herself as to give him due credit. True, he had kissed her, crudely and forcibly, but that kiss had not been an insult. Ellen's finer feelings forced her to believe this. She remembered the honest amaze and shame and contrition with which she had faced her, trying awkwardly to explain his bold act. Likewise, she recalled the subtle swift change in him at her words, Oh, I've been kissed before. She was glad she had said that. Still, was she glad after all? She watched him. Every little while he shifted his gaze from the blue gulf beneath him to the forest. When he turned thus, the sun shone on his face, and she caught the piercing gleam of his dark eyes. She saw, too, that he was listening, watching and listening for her. Ellen had to still a tumult within her. It made her feel very young, very shy, very strange. All the while she hated him, because he manifestly expected her to come. Several times he rose and walked a little way into the woods. The last time he looked at the westering sun and shook his head. His confidence had gone. Then he sat and gazed down into the void. But Ellen knew he did not see anything there. He seemed an image carved in the stone of the rim, and he gave Ellen a singular impression of loneliness and sadness. Was he thinking of the miserable battle his father had summoned him to lead, of what it would cost, of its useless pain and hatred? Ellen seemed to divine his thoughts. In that moment she softened toward him, and in her soul quivered and stirred an intangible something that was like pain, that was too deep for her understanding. But she felt sorry for an Isabel until the old pride resurged. What if he admired her? She remembered his interest, the wonder and admiration, the growing light in his eyes, and it had not been repugnant to her until he disclosed his name. What's in a name, she mused, recalling poetry learned in her girlhood. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. He's an Isabel, yet he might be splendid, noble. Bah, he's not, and I'd hate him anyhow. End of chapter 4, part 1
If he discovered her there, she felt that she would die of shame. Then she became aware that a blue jay was screeching in a pine above her, and a red squirrel somewhere near was chattering his shrill annoyance. These two denizens of the woods could be depended upon to espy the wariest hunter and make known his presence to their kind. Ellen had a moment of more than dread. This keen-eyed, keen-eared Indian might see right through her brushy covert, might hear the throbbing of her heart. It relieved her immeasurably to see him turn away and take the pacing the promontory with his head bowed and his hands behind his back. He had stopped looking off into the forest. Presently he wheeled to the west, and by the light upon his face, Ellen saw that the time was near sunset. Turkeys were beginning to gobble back on the ridge. Isbel walked to his horse and appeared to be untying something from the back of his saddle. When he came back, Ellen saw that he carried a small package, apparently wrapped in paper. With this under his arm, he strode off in the direction of Ellen's camp and soon disappeared in the forest. For a little while Ellen lay there in bewilderment. If she had made conjectures before, they were now multiplied. Where was Jean Esbel going? Ellen sat up suddenly. Well, sure this here beats me, she said. What did he have in that package? What was he going to do with it? It took no little willpower to hold her there when she wanted to steal after him through the woods and find out what he meant. But his reputation influenced even her, and she refused to pit her cunning in the forest against his. It would be better to wait until he returned to his horse. Thus decided, she lay back again in her covert and gave her mind over to pondering curiosity. Sooner than she expected, she espied Isabel approaching through the forest empty-handed. He had not taken his rifle. Ellen averted her glance a moment and thrilled to see the rifle leaning against a rock. Verily, Jean Isbel had been far removed from hostile intent that day. She watched him stride swiftly up to his horse, untie the halter, and mount. Ellen had an impression of his arrow-like straight figure and sinuous grace and ease. Then he looked back at the promontory as if to fix a picture of it in his mind, and rode away along the rim. She watched him out of sight. What ailed her? Something was wrong with her, but she recognized only relief. When Isabel had been gone long enough to assure Ellen that she might safely venture forth, she crawled through the pine thicket to the rim on the other side of the point. The sun was setting behind the black range, shedding a golden glory over the basin. Westward, the zigzag rim reached like a streamer of fire into the sun. The vast promontories jutted out with blazing beacon lights upon their stone-walled faces. Deep down, the basin was turning shadowy dark blue, going to sleep for the night. Ellen bent swift steps toward her camp. Long shafts of gold preceded her through the forest. Then they paled and vanished. The tips of pines and spruces turned gold. A hoarse-voiced old turkey gobbler was booming his chug-a-lug from the highest ground, and the softer chick of hen turkeys answered him. Ellen was almost breathless when she arrived. Two packs and a couple of lop-eared burrows attested to the fact of Antonio's return. This was good news for Ellen. She heard the bleat of lambs and the tinkle of bells coming nearer and nearer, and she was glad to feel that if Isbel had visited her camp, most probably it was during the absence of the herders. The instant she glanced into her tent, she saw the package Isbel had carried. It lay on her bed. Ellen stared blankly. The impudence of him, she ejaculated, then she kicked the package out of the tent. Words and actions seemed to liberate a damned-up hot fury. She kicked the package again, and thought she would kick it into the smoldering campfire. But somehow she stopped short of that. She left the thing there on the ground. Pepe and Antonio hove in sight, driving in the tumbling woolly flock. Ellen did not want them to see the package, 
so with contempt for herself and somewhat lessening anger, she kicked it back into the tent. What was in it? She peeped inside the tent, devoured by curiosity. Neat, well-wrapped, and tied packages like that were not often seen in the Tonto Basin. Ellen decided she would wait until after supper and, at a favorable moment, lay it unopened on the fire. What did she care what it contained? Manifestly, it was a gift. She argued that she was highly incensed with this insolent Isbel, who had the effrontery to approach her with some sort of present. It developed that the usually cheerful Antonio had returned taciturn and gloomy. All Ellen could get out of him was that the job of a sheep herder had taken on hazards inimical to peace-loving Mexicans. He had heard something he would not tell. Ellen helped prepare the supper, and she ate in silence. She had her own brooding troubles. Antonio presently told her that her father had said she was not to start back home after dark. After supper, the herders repaired to their own tent, leaving Ellen the freedom of her campfire. Wherewith, she secured the package and brought it forth to burn. Feminine curiosity rankled strong in her breast, yielding so far as to shake the parcel and press it, and finally tear a corner off the paper, she saw some words written in lead pencil. Bending nearer the blaze, she read, For my sister Anne. Ellen gazed at the big, bold handwriting, quite legible and fairly well done. Suddenly, she tore the outside wrapper completely off. From printed words on the inside, she gathered that the package had come from a store in San Francisco. Reckon he fetched home a lot of presents for his folks, the kids and his sister, muttered Ellen. That was nice of him. Whatever this is, he sure meant it for his sister, Anne, Anne Isbel. Why, she must be that black-eyed girl I met and liked so well, before I knew she was an Isbel, his sister. Whereupon, for the second time, Ellen deposited the fascinating package in her tent. She could not burn it up just then. She had other emotions besides scorn and hate, and memory of that soft-voiced, kind-hearted, beautiful Isbel girl checked her resentment. I wonder if he is like his sister, she said thoughtfully. It appeared to be an unfortunate thought. Sean Isbel certainly resembled his sister. Too bad they belonged to the family that ruined Dad. Ellen went to bed without opening the package or without burning it. And to her annoyance, wherever she lay, she appeared to touch this strange package. There was not much room in the little tent. First she put it at her head beside her rifle. But when she turned over, her cheek came in contact with it. Then she felt as if she had been stung. She moved it again, only to touch it presently with her hand. Next, she flung it to the bottom of her bed, where it fell upon her feet. And whatever way she moved them, she could not escape the pressure of this undesirable and mysterious gift. By and by she fell asleep, only to dream that the package was a caressing hand stealing about her, feeling for hers, and holding it with soft, strong clasp. When she awoke, she had the strangest sensation in her right palm. It was moist, throbbing, hot, and the feel of it on her cheek was strangely thrilling and comforting. She lay awake then. The night was dark and still, only a low moan of wind in the pines and the faint tinkle of a sheep bell broke the serenity. She felt very small and lonely lying there in the deep forest, and try how she would it was impossible to think the same then as she did in the clear light of day. Resentment, pride, anger, these seemed abated now. If the events of the day had not changed her, they had at least brought up softer, kinder memories and emotions than she had known for long. Nothing hurt and saddened her so much as to remember the gay, happy days of her childhood, her sweet mother, her old home. Then her thought returned to Isbel and his gift. It had been years since anyone had made her a gift. 
What could this one be? It did not matter. The wonder was that Jean Isbel should bring it to her and that she could be perturbed by its presence. He meant it for his sister, and so he thought well of me, she said in finality. Morning brought Ellen further vacillation. At length she rolled the obnoxious package inside her blankets, saying that she would wait until she got home and then consign it cheerfully to the flames. Antonio tied her pack on a burrow. She did not have a horse and therefore had to walk the several miles to her father's ranch. She set off at a brisk pace, leading the burro and carrying her rifle, and soon she was deep in the fragrant forest. The morning was clear and cool, with just enough frost to make the sunlit grass sparkle as if with diamonds. Ellen felt fresh, buoyant, singularly full of life. Her youth would not be denied. It was pulsing, yearning. She hummed an old southern tune, and every step seemed one of pleasure in action, of advance toward some intangible future happiness. All the unknown of life before her called. Her heart beat high in her breast, and she walked as one in a dream. Her thoughts were swift-changing, intimate, deep, and vague, not of yesterday or today, nor of reality. The big gray white-tailed squirrels crossed ahead of her on the trail, scampered over the piney ground to hop on tree trunks, and there they paused to watch her pass. The vociferous little red squirrels barked and chatted at her. From every thicket sounded the gobbles of turkeys. The blue jays squalled in the treetops. A deer lifted his head from browsing and stood motionless, with long ears erect, watching her go by. Thus happily and dreamily absorbed, Ellen covered the forest miles and soon reached the trail that led down into the wild breaks of Chevalon Canyon. It was rough going and less conducive to sweet wanderings of mind. Ellen slowly lost them, and then a familiar feeling assailed her, one she never failed to have upon returning to her father's ranch, a reluctance, a bitter dissatisfaction with her home a loyal struggle against the vague sense that all was not as it should be. At the head of this canyon, in a little, level, grassy meadow, stood a rude, one-room log shack, with a leaning red stone chimney on the outside. This was the abode of a strange old man who had long lived there. His name was John Sprague, and his occupation was raising burrows. No sheep or cattle or horses did he own, not even a dog. Rumor had said Sprague was a prospector, one of the many who had searched that country for the lost Dutchman gold mine. Sprague knew more about the basin and the rim than any of the sheepmen or ranchers. From the Black Butte to the Sibicu, and from Chevlon Butte to Reno Pass, he knew every trail, canyon, ridge, and spring, and could find his way to them on the darkest night. His fame, however, depended mostly upon the fact that he did nothing but raise burrows, and would raise nothing but black burrows with white faces. These burrows were the finest bread in all the basin and were in great demand. Sprague sold a few every year. He had made a present of one to Ellen, although he hated to part with them. This old man was Ellen's one and only friend. Upon her trip out to the rim with the sheep, Uncle John, as Ellen called him, had been away on one of his infrequent visits to Grass Valley. It pleased her now to see a blue column of smoke lazily lifting from the old chimney and to hear the discordant bray of burrows. As she entered the clearing, Sprague saw her from the door of his shack. "'Hello, Uncle John,' she called. "'Well, if it ain't Ellen,' he replied heartily. "'When I seen that white-faced Jinny, I knew who was leading her. Where you been, girl? Sprague was a little, stoop-shouldered old man, with gristled head and face, and shrewd gray eyes that beamed kindly on her over his ruddy cheeks. Ellen did not like the tobacco stain on his grizzled beard, nor the dirty, motley, ragged, ill-smelling garb he wore, but she had ceased her useless attempts to make him more cleanly. 
"'I've been herding sheep,' replied Ellen. "'And where have you been, Uncle? "'I missed you on the way over.' "'Been packing in some grub. "'And I reckon I stayed longer in Grass Valley than I recollect. "'But that was only natural, considering. "'What?' asked Ellen bluntly, as the old man paused. "'Sprague took a black pipe out of his vest pocket "'and began rimming the bowl with his fingers. "'The glance he bent on Ellen was thoughtful and earnest, and so kind that she feared it was pity. Ellen suddenly burned for news from the village. "'Well, come in and sit down, won't you?' he asked. "'No, thanks,' replied Ellen, and she took a seat on the chopping block. "'Tell me, Uncle, what's going on down in the valley?' "'Nothing much yet except talk, and there's a heap of that.' "'Huh. There's always talk,' declared Ellen contemptuously, a nasty, gossipy, catty hole, that Grass Valley. Ellen, there's going to be war, a bloody war in the old Tonto Basin, went on Sprague seriously. War? Between whom? The Isbels and their enemies. I reckon most people down there, and sure all the cattlemen, are on old Gass's side, Blaisdell, Gordon, Fredericks, Blue. They'll all be in it. Who are they going to fight? queried Ellen sharply. Well, the open talk is that the sheepmen are forcing this war. But there's talk not so open, and I reckon not very healthy for any man to whisper hereabouts. Uncle John, you needn't be afraid to tell me anything, said Ellen. I'd never give you away. You've been a good friend to me. Reckon I want to be, Ellen, he returned, nodding his shaggy head. It ain't easy to be fond of you as I am and keep my mouth shut. I'd like to know something. Have you any relatives away from here that you could go to till this fight is over? No. All I have, so far as I know, are right here. How about friends? Uncle John, I have none, she said sadly, with bowed head. Well, well, I'm sorry. I was hoping you might get away. She lifted her face. Sure you don't think I'd run off if my dad got into a fight, she flashed. I hope you will. I'm a Jorth, she said darkly, and dropped her head again. Sprague nodded gloomily. Evidently he was perplexed and worried, and strongly swayed by affection for her. Would you go away with me, he asked. We could pack over to the Mazatels and live there till this blows over. Thank you, Uncle John. You're kind and good, but I'll stay with my father. His troubles are mine. Uh-huh, well... I might have reckoned so. Ellen, how do you stand on this here sheep and cattle question? I think what's fair for one is fair for another. I don't like sheep as much as I like cattle. But that's not the point. The range is free. Suppose you had cattle and I had sheep. I'd feel as free to run my sheep anywhere as you were to run your cattle. Right. But what if you throwed your sheep round my range and sheeped off the grass so my cattle would have to move or starve. Sure, I wouldn't throw my sheep round your range, she declared stoutly. Well, you've answered half of the question. And now suppose a lot of my cattle was stolen by rustlers, but not a single one of your sheep. What'd you think then? I'd sure think rustlers chose to steal cattle because there was no profit in stealing sheep. Exactly. But wouldn't you have a queer idea about it? I don't know. Why queer? What are you driving at, Uncle John? Well, wouldn't you get kind of a hunch that the rustlers was, say, a little friendly toward the sheepmen? Ellen felt a sudden, vibrating shock. The blood rushed to her temples. Trembling all over, she rose. Uncle John, she cried. Now, girl, you needn't fire up that way. Set down and don't. Dare you insinuate my father has? Ellen, I ain't insinuating nothing, interrupted the old man. I'm just asking you to think, that's all. You're most grown into a young woman now, and you've got sense. There's bad times ahead, Ellen, and I hate to see you mix in them. Oh, you do make me think, replied Ellen, with smarting tears in her eyes. You make me unhappy. Oh, I know my dad is not liked in this cattle country, but it's unjust. He happened to go in for sheep-raising. I wish he hadn't. It was a mistake. 
Dad always was a cattleman till he came here. He made enemies who, who ruined him, and everywhere misfortune crossed his trail. But, oh, Uncle John, my dad is an honest man. Well, child, I didn't mean to make you cry, said the old man feelingly, and he averted his troubled gaze. Never mind what I said. I'm an old meddler. I reckon nothing I could do or say would ever change what's going to happen. If only you wasn't a girl. There I go again. Ellen, face your future and fight your way. All youngsters have to do that. And it's the right kind of fight that makes the right kind of man or woman. Only you must be sure to find yourself. And by that I mean to find the real, true, honest-to-God best in you and stick to it and die fighting for it. You're a young woman, almost, and a blamed handsome one, which means you'll have more trouble and a harder fight. This country ain't easy on a woman. Once slander has marked her. What do I care for talk down in that basin, returned Ellen? I know they think I'm a hussy. I've let them think it. I've helped them, too. You're wrong, child, said Sprague earnestly. Pride and temper. You must never let anyone think bad of you, much less help them to. I hate everybody down there, cried Ellen passionately. I hate them so I glory in their thinking me bad. My mother belonged to the best blood in Texas. I am her daughter. I know who and what I am. That uplifts me whenever I meet the sneaky, sly suspicions of these basin people. It shows me the difference between them and me. That's what I glory in. Ellen, you're a wild, headstrong child, rejoined the old man in severe tones. Word has been passed again your good name, your honor, and haven't you given cause for that? Ellen felt her face blanch, and all her blood rush back to her heart in sickening force. The shock of his words was like a stab from a cold blade. If their meaning and the stern, just light of the old man's glance did not kill her pride and vanity, they surely killed her girlishness. She stood mute, staring at him, with her brown, trembling hands stealing up toward her bosom, as if to ward off another and a mortal blow. Ellen burst out Sprague hoarsely. You mistook me. Ah, I didn't mean what you think. I swear, Ellen, I'm old and blunt. I ain't used to women. But I've a love for you, child, and respect, just the same as if you were my own. And I know you're good. Forgive me. I meant only, haven't you been, say, sort of careless? Careless? queried Ellen, bitterly and low. And powerful thoughtless, and blind, letting men kiss you and fondle you, when you're really a grown-up woman now. Yes, I have, whispered Ellen. Well, then, why did you let them? I don't know. I didn't think. The men never let me alone. Never, never. I got tired everlastingly pushing them away. And sometimes, when they were kind and I was lonely for something, I didn't mind if one or another fooled around. I never thought. It never looked as you have made it look. Then, those few times, riding the trail to Grass Valley, when people saw me, then I guess I encouraged such attentions. Oh, I must be. I'm a shameless little hussy. Hush that kind of talk, said the old man, as he took her hand. Ellen, you're only young and lonely and bitter. No mother, no friends, no one but a lot of rough men. It's a wonder you have kept yourself good. But now your eyes are open, Ellen. They're brave and beautiful eyes, girl. And if you stand by the light in them, you will come through any trouble. And you'll be happy. Don't ever forget that. Life is hard enough, God knows. But it's unfailing true in the end to the man or woman who finds the best in them and stands by it. Uncle John, you talk so kindly. You've made me have hope. There seems so little for me to live for, hope for. But I'll never be a coward again, nor a thoughtless fool. I will find some good in me, or make some, and never fail it, come what will. I'll remember your words. I'll believe the future holds wonderful things for me. 
I'm only eighteen. Sure, all my life won't be lived here. Perhaps this threatened fight over sheep and cattle will blow over. Somewhere there must be some nice girl to be a friend, a sister to me, and maybe some man who'd believe, in spite of all they say, that I'm not a hussy. Well, Ellen, you remind me of what I was wanting to tell you when you just got here. Yesterday I heard you call that name in a bar room, and there was a fellow there who raised hell. He nearly killed one man and made another plum eat his words, and he scared that crowd stiff. Old John Sprague shook his grizzled head and laughed, beaming upon Ellen as if the memory of what he had seen had warmed his heart. "'Was it you?' asked Ellen, tremulously. "'Me? Aw, oh, I wasn't nowhere. Ellen, this fellow was quick as a cat in his actions, and his words was like lightning.' "'Who?' she whispered. "'Well, no one else but a stranger just come to these parts, and Isbel, too. Jean Isbel.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Ellen faintly. "'In a barroom full of men, almost all of them in sympathy with the sheep crowd, most of them on the Jorth side, this Jean Isabel resented an insult to Ellen Jorth. No, cried Ellen. Something terrible was happening to her mind or her heart. Well, he sure did, replied the old man, and it's going to be good for you to hear all about it. End of chapter 4, part 2《Section 9 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 1. Old John Sprague launched into his narrative with evident zest. I hung around Greaves' store most of two days, and I heard a heap. Some of it was just plain old men's gab, but I reckon I got the drift of things concerning Grass Valley. Yesterday morning, I was packing my burrows in Greaves' backyard, taking my time carrying out supplies from the store. And at last, when I went in, I seen a strange fella was there. Strapping young man, not so young either, and he had on buckskin. Hair as black as my burrows, dark face, sharp eyes. You took him for an Indian. He carried a rifle, one of them new forty-fours, and also something wrapped in paper that he seemed particular careful about. He wore a belt around his middle, and there was a bowie knife in it, carried like I've seen scouts and Injun fighters have on the frontier in the seventies. That looked queer to me, and I reckoned to the rest of the crowd there. No one overlooked the big six-shooter he packed, Texas fashion. Well, I didn't have no idea this fellow was an Isbel till I heard Greaves call him that. Isbel, said Greaves, Reckon your money's counterfeit here. I can't sell you anything. Counterfeit? Not much, spoke up the young fella, and he flipped some gold twenties on the bar, where they rung like bells. Why not? Ain't this a store? I want a cinch strap. Greaves looked particular sour that morning. I'd been watching him for two days. He hadn't had much sleep, for I had my bed back of the store, and I heard men come in the night and have long confabs with him. Whatever was in the wind hadn't pleased him none, and I calculated that young Isbel wasn't a good sight for Greaves' sore eyes anyway. But he paid no more attention to Isbel, acted just as if he hadn't heard Isbel say he wanted a cinch strap. I stayed inside the store then. There was a lot of fellas I'd seen, and some I'd knowed couple of card games going on and drinking, of course. I soon gathered that the general atmosphere wasn't friendly to Jean Isbel. He seen that quick enough, but he didn't leave. Between you and me, I sort of took a liking to him, and I sure watched him as close as I could, not seeming to, you know. Reckon they all did the same, only you couldn't see it. It got just about the same as if Isbel hadn't been in there, only you knowed it wasn't really the same. That's how I got the hunch the crowd was all sheepmen or their friends. The day before I heard a lot of talk about this young Isabel and what he'd come to the Grass Valley for and what a bad hombre he was. And when I seen him, I was bound to admit 
he looked his reputation. Well, pretty soon come in two more fellas, and I knowed both of them. You know them too, I'm sorry to say. For I'm coming to facts now that will shake you. The first fella was your father's Mexican foreman, Lorenzo, and the other was Sim Bruce. I reckon Bruce wasn't drunk, but he sure had been looking on red liquor. When he seen Isbel, darn me, if he didn't swell and bustle all up like a mad old turkey gobbler. Greaves, he said, if that fella's Jean Isabel, I ain't hankering for the company you keep. And he made no bones of pointing right at Isbel. Greaves looked up dry and sour, and he bit out spiteful like. Well, Sim, we ain't had a hell of a lot of choice in this here matter. That's Jean Isbel, sure enough. Maybe you can persuade him that his company and his custom ain't wanted round here. Jean Isabel sat on the counter and took it all in, but he didn't say nothing. The way he looked at Bruce was sure enough for me to see that there might be a surprise any minute. I've looked at a lot of men in my day and can sure feel events coming. Bruce got himself a stiff drink, and then he straddles over to the floor in front of Isbel. "'Ain't you Jean Isbel, son of old gas Isbel?' asked Bruce, sort of lolling back and giving a hitch to his belt. "'Yes, sir, you've identified me,' said Isbel, nice and polite. "'My name's Bruce. I'm ranging sheep hereabouts, and I have interest in Colonel Lee Jorth's business.' "'How do, Mr. Bruce,' replied Isbel, very civil and cool as you please. Bruce had an eye for the crowd that was now listening and watching. He swaggered closer to Isbel. We've heard you come into the Tonto Basin to run a sheepman off the range. How about that? Well, you heard wrong, said Isabel quietly. I came to work for my father. That work depends upon what happens. Bruce began to get redder of face, and he shook a husky hand in front of Isbel. I'll tell you this here, my Nez Pierce Isbel. And when he sort of choked for more wind, Greaves spoke up. Sim, I sure reckon that Nez Pierce handle will stick. And the crowd haw-hawed. Then Bruce got going again. I'll tell you this here, Nez Pierce. There's been enough happen already to run you out of Arizona. Well, you don't say. What, for instance? asked Isabel, quick and sarcastic. That made Bruce bust out puffin' and spittin'. What, for instance, huh? Why, you darn half-breed. You get run out for making up to Ellen Jorth. That won't go in this here country. Not for any Isbel. You liar, called Isbel, and like a big cat, he dropped off the counter. I heard his moccasins pat soft on the floor, and I bet to myself that he was as dangerous as he was quick. But his voice and his looks didn't change even a little. I'm not a liar, yelled Bruce. I'll make you eat that. I can prove what I say. You was seen with Ellen Jorth up on the rim day before yesterday. You was watched. You was with her. You made up to her. You grabbed her and kissed her. And I'm here to say, Nez Pierce, that you're a marked man on this range. Who saw me? asked Isabel, quiet and cold. I seen then that he turned white in the face. You can't lie out of it, hollered Bruce, waving his hands. We got you dead to rights. Lorenzo saw you, followed you, watched you. Bruce pointed at the grinning greaser. Lorenzo is Colonel Jorth's foreman. He's seen you maulin of Ellen Jorth. And when he tells the Colonel and Tad Jorth and Jackson Jorth, ha, 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 while hell will be a cooler place for you than this here Tonto. Greaves and his gang had come around, sure tickled clean to the gizzards at this mess. I noticed, however, that they was Texans enough to keep back to one side in case this Isabel started any action. Well, Isabel took a look at Lorenzo. Then with one swift grab, he jerked the little greaser off his feet and pulled him close. Lorenzo stopped grinning. He began to look a little sick, but it was plain he had right on his side. "'You say you saw me?' demanded Isbel. "'Si, señor,' replied Lorenzo. "'What did you see?' 
I see senor and senorita. I hide by manzanita. I see senorita like grande senor very much. She likes senor kiss. She... Then Isbel hit the little greaser a backhanded crack in the mouth. Sure it was a crack. Lorenzo went over the counter backward and landed like a packed load of wood, and he didn't get up. Mr. Bruce, said Isabel, and you fellows who heard that lion greaser, I did meet Ellen Jorth, and I lost my head. I kissed her. But it was an accident. I meant no insult. I apologized. I tried to explain my crazy action. That was all. That greaser lied. Ellen Jorth was kind enough to show me the trail. We talked a little. Then, I suppose, because she was young and pretty and sweet, I lost my head. She was absolutely innocent. That damn greaser told a barefaced lie when he said she liked me. The fact was, she despised me. She said so. And when she learned I was Jean Isbel, she turned her back on me and walked away. At this point of his narrative, the old man halted, as if to impress Ellen not only with what had just been told, but particularly with what was to follow. The reciting of his tale had evidently given Sprague an unconscious pleasure. He glowed. He seemed to carry the burden of a secret that he yearned to divulge. As for Ellen, she was deadlocked in breathless suspense. All her emotions waited for the end. She begged Sprague to hurry. "'Well, I wish I could skip the next chapter and have only the last to tell,' rejoined the old man, and he put a heavy, solicitous hand upon hers. Sim Bruce haw-hawed loud and loud. "'Say, Nez Pierce, he calls out, most insolent-like. "'We are two good sheepmen here to have the wool pulled over our eyes. "'We sure know what you meant by Ellen Jorth, "'but you wasn't smart when you told her you was Jean Isabel.' Ha ha. Isbel flashed a strange, surprised look from the red faced Bruce to Greaves and to the other men. I take it he was wondering if he heard right or if they got the same hunch that had come to him, and I reckoned he determined to make sure. Why wasn't I smart? he asked. Sure, you wasn't smart if you was aiming to be one of Ellen Jorth's lovers, said Bruce with a leer. For if you hadn't given yourself away, you could have been easy enough. There was no mistaking Bruce's meaning, and when he got it out, some of the men there laughed. Isabel kept looking from one to another of them. Then, facing Greaves, he said deliberately, Greaves, this drunken Bruce is excuse enough for a showdown. I take it that you are sheepmen, and you're going on Jorth's side of the fence in the matter of this sheep ranging. "'Well, Ness Pierce, I reckon you hit plumb center,' said Greaves dryly. He spread wide his big hands to the other men, as if to say they might as well own the jig was up. "'All right. You're Jorth's backers. Have any of you a word to say in Ellen Jorth's defense? I tell you the Mexican lied. Believe in me or not doesn't matter. But this vile mouth, Bruce, hinted against that poor girl's honor.' Again some of the men laughed, but not so noisy, and there was a nervous shuffling of feet. Isbel looked sort of queer. His neck had a bulge round his collar, and his eyes was like black coals of fire. Grief spread his big hands again, as if to wash them of this part of the dirty argument. When it comes to any women I pass, much less play a hand for a wildcat like Jorth's girl, said Greaves, sort of cold and thick. Bruce sure ought to know her. According to talk hereabouts and what he says, Ellen Jorth has been his girl for two years. Then Isbel turned his attention to Bruce, and I, for one, began to shake in my boots. Say that to me, he called. Sure, she's my girl, and that's why I'm going to have you run off this range. Isbel jumped at Bruce. You damn drunken cur! You vile-mouthed liar! I may be an Isbel, but by God you can't slander that girl to my face. Then he moved so quick I couldn't see what he did. But I heard his fist hit Bruce. It sounded like an axe, again a beef. 
Bruce fell clear across the room, and by Jenny, when he landed, Isbel was there. As Bruce staggered up, all bloody-faced, bellowing and spitting out teeth, Isabel eyed Greaves's crowd and said, If any of you make a move, it'll mean gunplay. Nobody moved, that's sure. In fact, none of Greaves' outfit was packing guns, at least in sight. When Bruce got all the way up, he was a tall fella, why Isabel took a full swing at him and knocked him back across the room again the counter. You know when a fella's hurt by the way he yells. Bruce got that second smash right on his big red nose. I never seen anyone so quick as Isbel. He vaulted over that counter just the second Bruce fell back on it, and then with Greaves' gang in front so he could catch any moves of theirs, he just slugged Bruce right and left and banged his head on the counter. Then as Bruce sunk limp and slipped down, looking like a bloody sack, Isabel let him fall to the floor. Then he vaulted back over the counter. Wiping the blood off his hands, he throwed his kerchief down in Bruce's face. Bruce wasn't dead or bad hurt. He'd just been beaten bad. He was moaning and slobbering. Isbel kicked him, not hard, but just sort of disgustful. Then he faced that crowd. Greaves, that's what I think of your sim, Bruce. Tell him next time he sees me to run or pull a gun. And then Isbel grabbed his rifle and package off the counter and went out. He didn't even look back. I seen him mount his horse and ride away. Now, girl, what have you to say? Ellen could only say goodbye, and the word was so low as to be almost inaudible. She ran to her burrow. She could not see very clearly through tear-blurred eyes, and her shaking fingers were all thumbs. It seemed she had to rush away, somewhere, anywhere, not to get away from old John Sprague, but from herself, this palpitating, bursting self whose feet stumbled down the trail. All, all seemed ended for her. That interminable story, it had taken so long, and every minute of it she had been helplessly torn asunder by feelings she had never known she possessed. This Ellen Jorth was an unknown creature. She sobbed now as she dragged the burrow down the canyon trail. She sat only to rise. She hurried only to stop. Driven, pursued, barred, she had no way to escape the flaying thoughts, no time or will to repudiate them. The death of her girlhood, the rendering aside of a veil of maiden mystery, only vaguely, instinctively guessed, the barren, sordid truth of her life, as seen by her enlightened eyes, the bitter realization of the vileness of men of her clan, in contrast to the manliness and chivalry of an enemy, the hard facts of unalterable repute, as created by slander and fostered by low minds, all these were forces in a cataclysm that had suddenly caught her heart and whirled her through changes immense and agonizing, to bring her face to face with reality, to force upon her suspicion and doubt of all she had trusted, to warn her of the dark, impending horror of a tragic, bloody feud, and lastly, to teach her the supreme truth at once so glorious and so terrible, that she could not escape the doom of womanhood. About noon that day Ellen Jorth arrived at the Knoll, which was the location of her father's ranch. Three canyons met there to form a large one. The Knoll was a symmetrical hill situated at the mouth of the three canyons. It was covered with brush and cedars, and here and there lichened rocks showing above the bleached grass. Below the knoll was a wide, grassy flat or meadow, through which a willow-bordered stream cut its rugged boulder-strewn bed. Water flowed abundantly at this season, and the deep washes leading down from the slopes attested to the fact of cloudbursts and heavy storms. This meadow valley was dotted with horses and cattle, and meandered away between the timbered slopes to lose itself in a green curve. A singular feature of this canyon was that a heavy growth of spruce trees covered the slope facing northwest, and the opposite slope, exposed to the sun, and therefore less snowbound in winter, 
held a sparse growth of yellow pines. The ranch house of Colonel Jorth stood round the rough corner of the largest of the three canyons, and rather well hidden. It did not obtrude its rude and broken-down log cabins, its squalid surroundings, its black mud holes of corrals upon the beautiful and serene Meadow Valley. Ellen Jorth approached her home slowly, with dragging, reluctant steps, and never before in the three unhappy years of her existence there had the ranch seemed so bare, so uncared for, so repugnant to her. As she had seen herself with clarified eyes, so now she saw her home. The cabin that Ellen lived in with her father was a single-room structure with one door and no windows. It was about twenty feet square. The huge, ragged stone chimney had been built on the outside, with the wide-open fireplace set inside the logs. Smoke was rising from the chimney. As Ellen halted at the door and began unpacking her burrow, she heard the loud, lazy laughter of men. An adjoining log cabin had been built in two sections, with a wide-roofed hall or space between them. The door in each cabin faced the other, and there was a tall man standing in one. Ellen recognized Daggs, a neighbor sheepman, who evidently spent more time with her father than at his own home, wherever that was. Ellen had never seen it. She heard this man draw, "'Jorth, here's your kid come home.' Ellen carried her bed inside the cabin and unrolled it upon a couch built of boughs in the far corner. She had forgotten Jean Isabel's package, and now it fell out under her sight. Quickly she covered it. A Mexican woman, relative of Antonio, and the only servant about the place, was squatting Indian fashion before the fireplace, stirring a pot of beans. She and Ellen did not get along well together, and few words ever passed between them. Ellen had a canvas curtain stretched upon a wire across the small triangular corner, and this afforded her a little privacy. Her possessions were limited in number. The crude square table she had constructed herself. Upon it was a little old-fashioned walnut-framed mirror, a brush and comb, and a dilapidated ebony cabinet which contained odds and ends, the sight of which always brought a smile of derisive self-pity to her lips. Under the table stood an old leather trunk. It had come with her from Texas and contained clothing and belongings of her mother's. Above the couch on pegs hung her scant wardrobe. A tiny shelf held several worn-out books. When her father slept indoors, which was seldom except in winter, he occupied a couch in the opposite corner. A rude cupboard had been built against the logs next to the fireplace. It contained supplies and utensils. Toward the center, somewhat closer to the door, stood a crude table and two benches. The cabin was dark and smelled of smoke, of the stale odors of past cooked meals, of the mustiness of dry, rotting timber. Streaks of light showed through the roof where the rough-hewn shingles had split or weathered. A strip of bacon hung upon one side of the cupboard, and upon the other a haunch of venison. Ellen detested the Mexican woman because she was dirty. The inside of the cabin presented the same unkept appearance usual to it after Ellen had been away for a few days. Whatever Ellen had lost during the retrogression of the Jorths, she had kept her habit of cleanliness, and straight away upon her return she set to work. The Mexican woman sullenly slouched away to her own quarters outside, and Ellen was left to the satisfaction of labor. Her mind was as busy as her hands. As she cleaned and swept and dusted, she heard from time to time the voices of men, the clip-clop of shod horses, the bellow of cattle, and a considerable time elapsed before she was disturbed. A tall shadow darkened the doorway. "'Howdy, little one,' said a lazy, drawing voice. "'So you all got home.' Ellen looked up. A superbly built man leaned against the doorpost. Like most Texans, he was light-haired and light-eyed. His face was lined and hard. His long, sandy mustache 
hid his mouth and drooped with a curl. Spurred, booted, belted, packing a heavy gun low down on his hip, he gave Ellen an entirely new impression. Indeed, she was seeing everything strangely. "'Hello, Daggs,' replied Ellen. "'Where's my dad?' "'He's playing cards with Jackson and Coulter. "'Sure playing bad, too, and it's gone to his head.' "'Gambling?' queried Ellen. "'My child, when did Colonel Jorth ever play for fun?' said Daggs, with a lazy laugh. "'There's a stack of gold on the table. "'Reckon your Uncle Jackson will win it. "'Coulter's sure out of luck.' "'Daggs stepped inside. "'He was graceful and slow. "'His long spurs clinked. He laid a rather compelling hand on Ellen's shoulder. "'Here, my girl, give us a kiss,' he said. "'Dags, I'm not your girl,' replied Ellen, as she slipped out from under his hand. Then Dags put his arm round her, not with violence or rudeness, but with an indolent, affectionate assurance, at once bold and self-contained. Ellen, however, had to exert herself to get free of him, and when she had placed the table between them, she looked him square in the eyes. "'Dags, you keep your paws off me,' she said. "Oh, now, Ellen, I ain't no bear,' he remonstrated. "'What's the matter, kid?' "'I'm not a kid, and there's nothing the matter. You're to keep your hands to yourself, that's all.' He tried to reach her across the table, and his movements were lazy and slow, like his smile. His tone was coaxing. "'My dear,' Sure you sat on my knee just the other day now, didn't you? Ellen felt the blood sting her cheeks. I was a child, she returned. Well, listen to this here grown-up young woman, all in a few days. Don't be in a temper, Ellen. Come, give us a kiss. She deliberately gazed into his eyes. Like the eyes of an eagle, they were clear and hard, just now warmed by the dalliance of the moment but there was no light, no intelligence in them to prove he understood her. The instant separated Ellen immeasurably from him and from all his ilk. Dags, I was a child, she said. I was lonely, hungry for affection. I was innocent. Then I was careless, too, and thoughtless when I should have known better. But I hardly understood you men. I put such thoughts out of my mind. I know now, know what you mean, what you have made people believe I am. Ah, sure, I got your hunch, he returned, with a change of tone. But I asked you to marry me. Yes, you did. The first day you got here to my dad's house. And you asked me to marry you, after you found you couldn't have your way with me. To you, the one didn't mean any more than the other. Sure I did. More than Sim, Bruce, and Coulter, he retorted. They never asked you to marry. No, they didn't. And if I could respect them at all, I'd do it, because they didn't ask me. Well, I'll be doggone, ejaculated Daggs thoughtfully, as he stroked his long mustache. I'll say to them what I've said to you, went on Ellen. I'll tell Dad to make you let me alone. I wouldn't marry one of you, loafers, to save my life. I've my suspicions about you. You're a bad lot. Daggs changed subtly. The whole indolent nonchalance of the man vanished in an instant. "'Well, Miss Jorth, I reckon you mean we're a bad lot of sheepmen,' he queried, in the cool, easy speech of a Texan. "'No,' flashed Ellen. "'Sure I don't say sheepmen. I say you're a bad lot.' "'Oh, the hell you say,' Dag spoke, as he might have spoken to a man. Then, turning swiftly on his heel, he left her. Outside he encountered Ellen's father. She heard Dag speak. Lee, you little wildcat is sure here, and take my hunch. Somebody has been talking to her. Who has? asked her father in his husky voice. Ellen knew at once that he had been drinking. Lord only knows, replied Daggs, but sure it wasn't any friends of ours. We can't stop people's tongues, said Jorth resignedly. "'Well, I ain't so sure,' continued Daggs, with his slow, cool laugh. "'Reckon I never yet heard any dead man's tongue wag.'" End of Chapter 5, Part 1
Section 10 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 2. Then the musical tinkle of his spurs sounded fainter. A moment later, Helen's father entered the cabin. His dark, moody face brightened at sight of her. Ellen knew she was the only person in the world left for him to love, and she was sure of his love. Her very presence always made him different, and through the years, the darker their misfortunes, the farther he slipped away from better days, the more she loved him. "'Hello, my Ellen,' he said, and he embraced her. When he had been drinking, he never kissed her. "'Sure, I'm glad you're home. This here hole is bad enough any time, but when you're gone, it's black. I'm hungry.' Ellen laid food and drink on the table, and for a while she did not look directly at him. She was concerned about this new searching power of her eyes. In relation to him, she vaguely dreaded it. Lee Jorth had once been a singularly handsome man. He was tall, but did not have the figure of a horseman. His dark hair was streaked with gray and was white over his ears. His face was sallow and thin, with deep lines. Under his round, prominent brown eyes, like deadened furnaces, were blue, swollen welts. He had a bitter mouth and a weak chin, not wholly concealed by gray mustache and pointed beard. He wore a long frock coat and a wide-brimmed sombrero, both black in color, and so old and stained and frayed that along with the fashion of them, they betrayed that they had come from Texas with him. Jorth always persisted in wearing a white linen shirt, likewise a relic of his southern prosperity, and today it was ragged and soiled as usual. Ellen watched her father eat and waited for him to speak. It occurred to her strangely that he never asked about the sheep or the newborn lambs. She divined with a subtle new woman's intuition that he cared nothing for his sheep. "'Ellen, what riled Dags?' inquired her father presently. He sure had a fire in his eye. Long ago, Ellen had betrayed an indignity she had suffered at the hands of a man. Her father had nearly killed him. Since then, she had taken care to keep her troubles to herself. If her father had not been blind and absorbed in his own brooding, he would have seen a thousand things sufficient to inflame his southern pride and temper. "'Dags asked me to marry him again, and I said he belonged to a bad lot,' she replied. Jorth laughed in scorn. "'Fool! My God, Ellen, I must have dragged you low, that every damned Drew or sheepman who comes along thinks he can marry you.' At the break in his words, the incomplete meaning, Ellen dropped her eyes. Little things once never noted by her were now come to have a fascinating significance. Never mind, Dad, she replied. They can't marry me. Dag said someone had been talking to you. How about that? Old John Sprague had just gotten back from Grass Valley, said Ellen. I stopped in to see him. Sure, he told me, all the village gossip. Anything to interest me? he queried darkly. Yes, Dad. I'm afraid a good deal, she said hesitatingly. Then, in accordance with the decision Ellen had made, she told him of the rumored war between sheepmen and cattlemen, that old Isbel had Blaisdell, Gordon, Fredericks, Blue, and other well-known ranchers on his side, that his son John Isbel had come from Oregon with a wonderful reputation as a fighter and scout and tracker, that it was no secret how Colonel Lee Jorth was at the head of the sheepmen, that a bloody war was sure to come. Ha! exclaimed Jorth, with a stain of red in his sallow cheek. Reckon none of that is news to me. I knew all that. Ellen wondered if he had heard of her meeting with Jean Isbel. If not, he would hear as soon as Sim Bruce and Lorenzo came back. She decided to forestall them. Dad, I met Jean Isbel. He came into my camp asked the way to the rim. I showed him. We, we talked a little. And sure we're getting acquainted when, 
when he told me who he was. Then I left him, hurried back to camp. Coulter met Isbel down in the woods, replied Jorth ponderingly. Said he looked like an Indian, a hard and slippery customer to reckon with. Sure, I guess I can endorse what Coulter said, returned Ellen dryly. She could have laughed aloud at her deceit. Still, she had not lied. How'd this here young Isbel strike you? queried her father suddenly, glancing up at her. Ellen felt the slow, sickening, guilty rise of blood in her face. She was helpless to stop it. But her father evidently never saw it. He was looking at her without seeing her. He, he struck me as different from men here, she stammered. Did Sprague tell you about this half-Indian Isbel, about his reputation? Yes. Did he look to you like a real woodsman? Indeed he did. He wore buckskin. He stepped quick and soft. He acted at home in the woods. He had eyes black as night and sharp as lightning. They sure saw about all there was to see. Jorth chewed at his mustache and lost himself in brooding thought. Dad, tell me, is there going to be a war? asked Ellen presently. What a red, strange, rolling flash blazed in his eyes. His body jerked. Sure, you might as well know. Between sheepmen and cattlemen? Yes. With you, Dad, at the head of one faction, and Gaston Isbel the other? Daughter, you have it correct, so far as you go. Oh, Dad, can't this fight be avoided? You forget you're from Texas, he replied. Can it be helped, she repeated stubbornly. No, he declared, with deep, hoarse passion. Why not? Well, we sheepmen are going to run sheep anywhere we like on the range, and cattlemen won't stand for that. But Dad is so foolish, declared Ellen earnestly. You sheepmen do not have to run sheep over the cattle range. I reckon we do. Dad, that argument doesn't go with me. I know the country. For years to come there will be room for both sheep and cattle without overrunning. If some of the range is better in water and grass, then whoever got there first should have it. That sure is only fair. It's common sense, too. Ellen, I reckon some cattle people have been prejudicing you, said Jorth bitterly. Dad, she cried hotly. This had grown to be an ordeal for Jorth. He seemed the victim of contending tides of feeling. Some will or struggle broke within him, and the change was manifest. Haggard, shifty-eyed, with wobbling chin, he burst into speech. See here, girl, you listen. There's a clique of ranchers down in the basin, all those you named with Isbel at their head. They have resented sheepmen coming down into the valley. They want it all to themselves. That's the reason. Sure, there's another. All the Isbels are crooked. Their cattle and horse thieves have been for years. Gaston Isbel always was a maverick rustler. He's getting old now and rich, so he wants to cover his tracks. He aims to blame this cattle rustling and horse stealing onto us sheepmen and run us out of the country. Gravely, Ellen Jorth studied her father's face, and the newly found truth seeing power of her eyes did not fail her. In part, Perhaps in all, he was telling lies. She shuddered a little, loyally battling against the insidious convictions being brought to fruition. Perhaps in his brooding over his failures and troubles, he had leaned toward false judgments. Ellen could not attach dishonor to her father's motives or speeches. For long, however, something about him had troubled her, perplexed her, fearfully, she believed she was coming to some revelation, and despite her keen determination to know, she found herself shrinking. Dad, mother told me before she died that the Isbels had ruined you, said Ellen very low. It hurt her so to see her father cover his face that she could hardly go on. If they ruined you, they ruined all of us. I know what we had once, what we lost again and again and I see what we are come to now. Mother hated the Isbels. She taught me to hate the very name. 
but I never knew how they ruined you, or why, or when. And I want to know now. Then it was not the face of a liar that Jorth disclosed. The present was forgotten. He lived in the past. He even seemed younger in the revivifying flash of hate that made his face radiant. The lines burned out. Hate gave him back the spirit of his youth. Gaston Isbel and I were boys together in Weston, Texas, began Jorth, in swift, passionate voice. We went to school together. We loved the same girl, your mother. When the war broke out, she was engaged to Isbel. His family was rich. They influenced her people. But she loved me. When Isbel went to war, she married me. He came back and faced us. God, I'll never forget that. Your mother confessed her unfaithfulness, by heaven. She taunted him with it. Isbel accused me of winning her by lies. But she took the sting out of that. Isbel never forgave her, and he hounded me to ruin. He made me out a card sharp, cheating my best friends. I was disgraced. Later on, he tangled me in the courts. He beat me out of property. And last, by convicting me of rustling cattle, he run me out of Texas. Black and distorted now, Jorth's face was a spectacle to make Ellen sick with a terrible passion of despair and hate. The truth of her father's ruin and her own were enough. What mattered all else? Jorth beat the table with fluttering, nerveless hands that seemed all the more significant for their lack of physical force. And so help me, God, it's got to be wiped out in blood, he hissed. That was his answer to the wavering and nobility of Ellen, and she, in her turn, had no answer to make. She crept away into the corner behind the curtain, and there on her couch, in the semi-darkness, she lay with strained heart and a resurging, unconquerable tumult in her mind. And she lay there from the middle of that afternoon until the next morning. When she awakened, she expected to be unable to rise. She hoped she could not. But life seemed multiplied in her, and in action was impossible. Something young and sweet and hopeful that had been in her did not greet the sun this morning. In their place was a woman's passion to learn for herself, to watch events, to meet what must come, to survive. After breakfast, at which she sat alone, she decided to put Isbel's package out of the way, so that it would not be subjecting her to continual annoyance. The moment she picked it up, the old curiosity assailed her. "'Sure, I'll see what it is anyway,' she muttered, and with swift hands she opened the package. The action disclosed two pair of fine soft shoes, of a style she had never seen, and four pairs of stockings, two of strong serviceable wool, and the others of a finer texture. Ellen looked at them in amaze. Of all the things in the world, these would have been the last she expected to see, and strangely, they were what she wanted and needed most. Naturally, then, Ellen made the mistake of taking them into her hands to feel their softness and warmth. Sure, he saw my bare legs, and he brought me these presents he intended for his sister. He was ashamed for me, sorry for me, and I thought he looked at me bold-like, as I used to be looked at here. Is Bell or not? He's sure. But Ellen Jorth could not utter aloud the conviction her intelligence tried to force upon her. It'd be a pity to burn them, she mused. I can't do it. Sometime I might send them to Anne Isbel. Whereupon she wrapped them up again and hid them in the bottom of the old trunk, and slowly, as she lowered the lid, looking darkly, blankly, at the wall, she whispered, Jean Isbel, I hate him. Later, when Ellen went outdoors, she carried her rifle, which was unusual for her, unless she intended to go into the woods. The morning was sunny and warm. A group of shirt-sleeved men lounged in the hall and before the porch of the double cabin. Her father was pacing up and down, talking forcibly. 
Ellen heard his hoarse voice. As she approached, he ceased talking, and his listeners relaxed their attention. Ellen's glance ran over them swiftly. Dags, with his superb head like that of a hawk, uncovered to the sun. Coulter, with his lowered, secretive looks, his sand-gray lean face. Jackson Jorth, her uncle, huge, gaunt, hawking, with white in his black beard and hair, and the fire of a ghoul in his hollow eyes. Tad Jorth, another brother of her father's, younger, red of eye and nose, a weak-chinned drinker of rum. Three other limber-legged Texans lounged there, partners of Dag's, and they were sun-browned, light-haired, blue-eyed men, singularly alike in appearance, from their dusty high-heeled boots to their broad black sombreros. They claimed to be sheepmen. All Ellen could be sure of was that Rock Wells spent most of his time there, doing nothing but look for a chance to waylay her. Springer was a gambler, and the third, who answered to the strange name of Queen, was a silent, lazy, watchful-eyed man who never wore a glove on his right hand and who never was seen without a gun within easy reach of that hand. "'Howdy, Ellen. Sure you ain't going to say good morning to this here bad lot,' drawled Dags, with good-natured sarcasm. "'Why, sure. Good morning, you hard-working, industrious, manana sheep-raisers,' replied Ellen coolly. Dags stared. The others appeared taken back by a greeting so foreign from any to which they were accustomed from her. Jackson Jorth let out a gruff ha-ha. Some of them doffed their sombreros, and Rock Wells managed a lazy, polite good morning. Ellen's father seemed the most significantly struck by her greeting and the least amused. Ellen, I'm not liking your talk, he said with a frown. Dad, when you play cards, don't you call a spade a spade? Well, sure I do. Well, I'm calling spades spades. Uh-huh, grunted Jorth furtively, dropping his eyes. Where are you going with your gun? I'd rather you hung around here now. Reckon I might as well get used to packing my gun all the time, replied Ellen. Reckon I'll be treated more like a man. Then the event Ellen had been expecting all morning took place. Sim Bruce and Lorenzo rode around the slope of the knoll and trotted toward the cabin. Interest in Ellen was relegated to the background. Sure they're busting with news, declared Daggs. They'd been riding some, you bet, remarked another. Huh? exclaimed Jorth. Bruce sure looks queer to me. Red liquor, said Tad Jorth sententiously. You all know the brand Greaves hands out. Nah, Sim ain't drunk, said Jackson Jorth. Look at his bloody shirt. The cool, indolent interest of the crowd vanished at the red color pointed out by Jackson Jorth. Daggs rose in a single, springy motion to his lofty height. The face Bruce turned to Jorth was swollen and bruised, with unhealed cuts. Where his right eye should have been, showed a puffed, dark, purple bulge. His other eye, however, gleamed with hard and sullen light. He stretched a big, shaking hand toward Jorth. "'That Nez Pierce Isbel beat me half to death,' he bellowed. Jorth stared hard at the tragic, almost grotesque figure, at the battered face, but speech failed him. It was Daggs who answered Bruce. "'Well, Sim,' I'll be damned if you don't look it. Beat you? With what? burst out Jorth explosively. I thought he was swinging an axe, but grief swore it was his fists, bawled Bruce, in misery and fury. Where was your gun? queried Jorth sharply. Gun? Hell! exclaimed Bruce, flinging wide his arms. Ask Lorenzo. He had a gun, and he got a biff in the jaw before my turn come. Ask him. Attention thus directed to the Mexican, who showed a heavy, discolored swelling upon the side of his olive-skinned face. Lorenzo looked only serious. "'Ah, speak up!' shouted Jorth impatiently. 
Senor Isbel hit me very quick, replied Lorenzo, with expressive gesture. I see thousand stars, then mucho black, all like night. At that, some of Dag's men lolled back with dry, crisp laughter. Dag's hard face rippled with a smile, but there was no humor in anything for Colonel Jorth. Tell us what come off, quick, he ordered. Where did it happen? Why? Who saw it? What did you do? Bruce lapsed into a sullen impressiveness. Well, I happened in Greaves' store and run into Jean Isbel. Sure was looking for him. I had my mind made up what to do. But I got to shooting off my gab instead of my gun. I called him Nez Pierce, and I throwed all that talk in his face about old gas Isbel sending for him, and I told him he'd get run out of the Tonto. Reckon I was just warming up. But then it all happened. He slugged Lorenzo just one, and Lorenzo slid peaceful-like to bed behind the counter. I hadn't time to think of throwing a gun before he wailed into me. He knocked out two of my teeth, and I swallowed one of them. Ellen stood in the background behind three of the men, and in the shadow. She did not join in the laugh that followed Bruce's remarks. She had known that he would lie. Uncertain yet of her reaction to this, but more bitter and furious as he revealed his utter baseness, she waited for more to be said. "'Well, I'll be doggoned,' drawled Dags. "'What do you make of this kind of fightin?' queried Jorth. "'Darn if I know,' replied Dags in perplexity. "'Sure and certain it's not the way of a Texan. Maybe this young Isbel really is what old Gas swears he is. Sure Bruce ain't nothing to give an edge to a real gunfighter. Looks to me like Isbel bluffed Greaves and his gang and licked your men without throwing a gun.' "'Maybe Isbel doesn't want the name of drawing first blood,' suggested Jorth. "'That'd be like Gas,' spoke up Rockwells quietly. "'I once rode for Gas in Texas.' "'Say, Bruce,' said Daggs, "'was this here palavering of yours and Jean Isbel's about the old stock dispute? "'About his father's range and water, and particular about sheep?' "'Well, I yelled a heap,' declared Bruce haltingly. But I don't recollect all I said. I was riled. Sure, though, it was the same old argument that's been fetching us closer and closer to trouble. Daggs removed his keen, hawk-like gaze from Bruce. Well, Jorth, all I say is this. If Bruce is telling the truth, we ain't got a hell of a lot to fear from this young Isbel. I've known a heap of gunfighters in my day, and Jean Isbel don't run true to class. Sure, there never was a gunman who risked crippling his right hand by slugging anybody. Well, broke in Bruce sullenly, y'all can take it dead straight or not. I don't give a damn. You've sure got my hunch that Nez Pierce Isbel is liable to handle any of you fellas just as he did me and just as easy. What's more, he's got Greaves figured. And you all know that Greaves is as deep in... "'Shut up that kind of gab,' demanded Jorth stridently, "'and answer me. "'Was the row in Grief's barroom about sheep?' "'Aw, oh, hell, I said so, didn't I?' shouted Bruce, "'with a fierce uplift of his distorted face. "'Ellen strode out from the shadow of the tall men "'who had obscured her. "'Bruce, you're a liar,' she said bitingly. "'The surprise of her sudden appearance "'seemed to root Bruce to the spot. All but the discolored places on his face turned white. He held his breath a moment, then expelled it hard. His effort to recover from the shock was painfully obvious. He stammered incoherently. "'Sure you're more than a liar, too,' cried Ellen, facing him with blazing eyes, and the rifle, gripped in both hands, seemed to declare her intent of menace. The row was not about sheep, Jean Isabel didn't beat you for anything about sheep. Old John Sprague was in Greaves' store. He heard you. He saw Jean Isabel beat you as you deserved. And he told me. Ellen saw Bruce shrink in fear of his life. And despite her fury, she was filled with disgust that he could imagine she would have his blood on her hands. Then she divined 
that Bruce saw more in the gathering storm in her father's eyes than he had to fear from her. "'Girl, what the hell you saying?' hoarsely called Jorth, in dark amaze. "'Dad, you leave this to me,' she retorted. Daggs stepped beside Jorth, significantly on his right side. "'Let her alone, Lee,' he advised coolly. "'She sure got a hunch on Bruce.' "'Sim, Bruce, you cast a dirty slur on my name,' cried Ellen passionately. It was then that Daggs grasped Jorth's right arm and held it tight. "'Just what I thought,' he said. "'Stand still, Lee. Let's see the kid make him show down.' "'That's what Jean Isbel beat you for,' went on Ellen, "'for slandering a girl who wasn't there. Me, you rotten liar.' "'But, Ellen, it wasn't all lies,' said Bruce huskily. "'I was half drunk and horribly jealous. "'You know Lorenzo seeing Isbel kissing you. I can prove that.' Ellen threw up her head and a scarlet wave of shame and wrath flooded her face. Yes, she cried ringingly. He saw Jean Isbel kiss me once, and it was the only decent kiss I've had in years. He meant no insult. I didn't know who he was. And through his kiss, I learned a difference between men. You made Lorenzo lie, and if I had a shred of good name left in Grass Valley, you dishonored it. You made him think I was your girl, damn you. I ought to kill you. Eat your words now. Take them back, or I'll cripple you for life. Ellen lowered the cocked rifle toward his feet. Sure, Ellen, I take it back. All I said, gulped Bruce. He gazed at the quivering rifle barrel and then into the face of Ellen's father. Instinct told him where his real peril lay. Here the cool and tactful Dags showed himself master of the situation. "'Here, listen,' he called. "'Ellen, I reckon Bruce was drunk and out of his head.' "'He sure ate his words. "'Now we don't want any cripples in this camp. "'Let him alone. "'Your dad got me here to lead the Jorths, "'and that's my say to you. "'Sim, you're sure a low-down lying rascal. "'Keep away from Ellen after this, "'or I'll bore you myself. "'Jorth, it won't be a bad idea "'for you to forget you're a Texan "'till you cool off.' Let Bruce stomp some Isbel lead. Sure, the Jorth Isbel war is about on, and I reckon we'd be smart to believe old Gass's talk about his Ness Pierce son. End of chapter five, part two. Section eleven of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 1 From this hour Ellen Jorth bent all of her lately awkward intelligence and will to the only end that seemed to hold possible salvation for her. In the crisis sure to come, she did not want to be blind or weak. Dreaming and indolence, habits born in her which were often comfort to one as lonely as she, would ill fit her for the hardest test she divined and dreaded. In the matter of her father's fights, she must stand by him, whatever the issue or the outcome, in what pertained to her own principles, her womanhood, and her soul, she stood absolutely alone. Therefore, Ellen put dreams aside and indolence of mind and body behind her. Many tasks she found, and when these were done for a day, she kept active in other ways, thus earning the poise and peace of labor. Jorth rode off every day, sometimes with one or two of the men, often with a larger number. If he spoke of such trips to Ellen, it was to give an impression of visiting the ranchers of his neighbors or the various sheep camps. Often he did not return the day he left. When he did get back, he smelled of rum and appeared heavy from need of sleep. His horses were always dusty and sweat-covered. During his absences, Ellen fell victim to anxious dread until he returned. Daily, he grew darker and more haggard of face, more obsessed by some impending fate. Often he stayed up late, haranguing with the men in the dim-lit cabin where they drank and smoked, but seldom gambled any more. When men did not gamble, 
Something immediate and perturbing was on their minds. Ellen had not yet lowered herself to the deceit and suspicion of eavesdropping, but she realized that there was a climax approaching in which she would deliberately do so. In those closing May days, Ellen learned the significance of many things that previously she had taken as a matter of course. Her father did not run a ranch. There was absolutely no ranching done and little work. Often, Ellen had to chop wood herself. Jorth did not possess a plow. Ellen was bound to confess that the evidence of this lack dumbfounded her. Even old John Sprague raised some hay, beets, turnips. Jorth's cattle and horses fared ill during the winter. Ellen remembered how they used to clean up four-inch oak saplings and aspens. Many of them died in the snow. The flocks of sheep, however, were driven down into the basin in the fall and across the Reno Pass to Phoenix and Maricopa. Ellen could not discover a fence post on the ranch, nor a piece of salt for the horses and cattle, nor a wagon, nor any sign of a sheep-shearing outfit. She had never seen any sheep sheared. Ellen could never keep track of the many and different horses running loose and hobbled round the ranch. There were droves of horses in the woods, and some of them wild as deer. According to her long-established understanding, her father and her uncles were keen on horse trading and buying. Then the many trails leading away from the Jorth Ranch, these grew to have a fascination for Ellen, and the time came when she rode out on them to see for herself where they led. The sheep ranch of Dags, supposed to be only a few miles across the ridges, down in Bear Canyon, never materialized at all for Ellen. This circumstance so interested her that she went up to see her friend Sprague and got him to direct her to Bear Canyon, so that she would be sure not to miss it. And she rode from the narrow, maple-thicket head of it near the rim, down all its length. She found no ranch, no cabin, not even a corral in Bear Canyon. Sprague said there was only one canyon by that name. Daggs had assured her of the exact location of his place, and so had her father. Had they lied? Were they mistaken in the canyon? There were many canyons, all heading up near the rim all running and widening down for miles through the wooded mountains and vastly different from deep, short, yellow-walled gorges that cut into the rim from the basin side. Ellen investigated the canyons within six or eight miles of her home, both to the east and to the west. All she discovered was a couple of old log cabins, long deserted. Still, she did not follow out all the trails to their ends. Several of them led far into the deepest, roughest, wildest breaks of gorge and thicket that she had seen. No cattle or sheep had ever been driven over these trails. This riding around of Ellen's at length got to her father's ears. Ellen expected that a bitter quarrel would ensue, for she certainly would refuse to be confined to the camp. But her father only asked her to limit her riding to the Meadow Valley and straight away forgot all about it. In fact, his abstraction one moment, his intense nervousness the next, his harder drinking and fiercer harangues with the men grew to be distressing for Ellen. They presaged his further deterioration and the ever-present evil of the growing feud. One day Jorth rode home in the early morning, after an absence of two nights. Ellen heard the clip-clop of horses long before she saw them. "'Hey, Ellen, come out here,' called her father. Ellen left her work and went outside. A stranger had ridden in with her father, a young giant whose sharp-featured face appeared marked by ferret-like eyes and a fine, light, fuzzy beard. He was long, loose-jointed, not heavy of build, and he had the largest hands and feet Ellen had ever seen. Next, Ellen espied a black horse they had evidently brought with them. Her father was holding a rope halter. At once the black horse struck Ellen as being a beauty and a thoroughbred. "'Ellen, here's a horse for you,' said Jorth, 
with something of pride. I made a trade. Reckon I wanted him myself, but he's too gentle for me and maybe a little small for my weight. Delight visited Ellen for the first time in many days. Seldom had she owned a good horse, and never one like this. Oh, Dad, she exclaimed in her gratitude. Sure is yours on one condition, said her father. What's that? asked Ellen, as she laid caressing hands on the restless horse. You're not to ride him out of the canyon. Agreed. All dead black, isn't he, except that white face. What's his name, Dad? I forgot to ask, replied Jorth as he began unsaddling his own horse. Slater, what's this here black's name? The lanky giant grinned. I reckon it was Spades. Spades ejaculated Ellen blankly. What a name. Well, I guess it's as good as any. He sure is black. Ellen, keep him hobbled when you're not riding him, was her father's parting advice as he walked off with the stranger. Spades was wet and dusty, and his satiny skin quivered. He had fine, dark, intelligent eyes that watched Ellen's every move. She knew how her father and his friends dragged and jammed horses through the woods and over the rough trails. It did not take her long to discover that this horse had been a pet. Ellen cleaned his coat and brushed him and fed him. Then she fitted her bridle to suit his head and saddled him. His evident response to her kindness assured her that he was gentle, so she mounted and rode him, to discover he had the easiest gait she had ever experienced. He walked and trotted to suit her will, but when left to choose his own gait, he fell into a graceful little pace that was very easy for her. He appeared quite ready to break into a run at her slightest bidding, but Ellen satisfied herself on this first ride with his slower gaits. "'Spades, you've sure cut out my burrow, Jinny,' said Ellen regretfully. "'Well, I reckon women are fickle.' Next day she rode up the canyon to show Spades to her friend John Sprague. The old burrow breeder was not at home. As his door was open, however, and a fire smoldering, Ellen concluded that he would soon return. So she waited. Dismounting, she left Spades free to graze on the new green grass that carpeted the ground. The cabin and little level clearing accentuated the loneliness and wildness of the forest. Ellen always liked it here, and had once been in the habit of visiting the old man often. But of late she had stayed away, for the reason that Sprague's talk and his news and his poorly hidden pity depressed her. Presently she heard hoofbeats on the hard-packed trail leading down the canyon in the direction from which she had come. Scarcely likely was it that Sprague should return from this direction. Ellen thought her father had sent one of the herders for her, but when she caught a glimpse of the approaching horseman down in the aspens, she failed to recognize him. After he had passed one of the openings, she heard his horse stop. Probably the man had seen her. At least, she could not otherwise account for his stopping. The glimpse she had of him had given her the impression that he was bending over, peering ahead in the trail, looking for tracks. Then she heard the rider come on again, more slowly this time. At length, the horse trotted out into the opening, to be hauled up short. Ellen recognized the buckskin-clad figure, the broad shoulders, the dark face, of Jean Isbel. Ellen fell prey to the strangest quaking sensation she had ever suffered. It took violence of her newborn spirit to subdue that feeling. Isbel rode slowly across the clearing toward her. For Ellen, his approach seemed singularly swift, so swift that her surprise, dismay, conjecture, and anger obstructed her will. The outwardly calm and cold Ellen Jorth was a travesty that mocked her, that she felt he would discern. The moment Isbel drew close enough for Ellen to see his face, she experienced a strong, shuddering repetition of her first shock of recognition. He was not the same. The light, the youth, was gone. This, however, 
did not cause her emotion. Was it not a sudden transition of her nature to the dominance of hate? Ellen seemed to feel the shadow of her unknown self standing with her. Isbel halted his horse. Ellen had been standing near the trunk of a fallen pine, and she instinctively backed against it. How her legs trembled. Isbel took off his cap and crushed it nervously in his bare, brown hand. "'Good morning, Miss Ellen,' he said. Ellen did not return his greeting, but queried almost breathlessly, "'Did you come by our ranch?' "'No, I circled,' he replied. "'Jean Isbel, what do you want here?' she demanded. "'Don't you know?' he returned. His eyes were intensely black and piercing. They seemed to search Ellen's very soul. To meet their gaze was an ordeal that only her rousing fury sustained. Ellen felt on her lips a scornful allusion to his half-breed Indian traits and the reputation that preceded him, but she could not utter it. No, she replied. It's hard to call a woman a liar, he returned bitterly, but you must be, seeing you're a jorth. Liar? Not to you, Jean Isabel, she retorted. I'd not lie to you to save my life. He studied her with keen, sober, moody intent. The dark fire of his eyes thrilled her. If that's true, I'm glad, he said. Sure it's true. I've no idea why you came here. Ellen did have a dawning idea that she could not force into oblivion. But if she ever admitted it to her consciousness, she must fail in the contempt and scorn and fearlessness she chose to throw in this man's face. "'Does old Sprague live here?' asked Isbel. "'Yes, I expect him back soon. Did you come to see him?' "'No. Did Sprague tell you anything about the row he saw me in?' "'He did not,' replied Ellen, lying with stiff lips. She who had sworn she could not lie. She felt the hot blood leaving her heart, mounting in a wave. All her conscious will seem impelled to deceive. What had she to hide from Jean Isbel? And a still, small voice replied that she had to hide the Ellen Jorth who had waited for him that day, who had spied upon him, who had treasured a gift she could not destroy, who had hugged to her miserable heart the fact that he had fought for her name. I'm glad of that, Isbel was saying thoughtfully. Did you come here to see me, interrupted Ellen. She felt that she could not endure this reiterated suggestion of fineness, of consideration in him. She would betray herself, betray what she did not even realize herself. She must force other footing, and that should be the one of strife between the Jorths and the Isbels. No, honest I didn't, Miss Ellen, he rejoined humbly. I'll tell you presently why I came. But it wasn't to see you. I don't deny I want it. But that's no matter. You didn't meet me that day on the rim. Meet you, she echoed coldly. Sure you never expected me. Somehow I did, he replied, with those penetrating eyes on her. I put something in your tent that day. Did you find it? Yes, she replied, with the same casual coldness. What did you do with it? I kicked it out, of course, she replied. She saw him flinch. And you never opened it? Certainly not, she retorted, as if forced. Don't you know anything about, about people? Sure, even if you are an Isabel, you never were born in Texas. Thank God I wasn't, he replied. I was born in a beautiful country of green meadows and deep forests and white rivers, not in a barren desert where men live dry and hard as the cactus. Where I come from, men don't live on hate. They can forgive. Forgive? Could you forgive a Jorth? Yes, I could. Sure, that's easy to say, with all the wrongs on your side, she declared bitterly. Ellen Jorth, the first wrong was on your side, retorted Jean. His voice fell. Your father stole my father's sweetheart, by lies, by slander, by dishonor, by making terrible love to her in his absence. "'It's a lie,' cried Ellen passionately. "'It is not,' he declared solemnly. 
Jean Isbel, I say you lie. No, I say you've been lied to, he thundered. The tremendous force of his spirit seemed to fling truth at Ellen. It weakened her. But mother loved dad best. Yes, afterward. No wonder, poor woman. But it was the action of your father and your mother that ruined all these lives. You've got to know the truth, Ellen Jorth. All the years of hate had borne their fruit. God Almighty can never save us now. Blood must be spilled. The Jorths and Isbels can't live on the same earth, and you've got to know the truth because the worst of this hell falls on you and me. The hate that he spoke of alone upheld her. Never, Jean Isbel, she cried. I'll never know truth from you. I'll never share anything with you, not even hell. Isbel dismounted and stood before her, still holding his bridle reins. The bay horse champed his bit and tossed his head. Why do you hate me so? he asked. I just happen to be my father's son. I never harmed you or any of your people. I met you, fell in love with you, in a flash, though I never knew it till after. Why do you hate me so terribly? Ellen felt a heavy, stifling pressure within her breast. You're an Isbel. Don't speak of love to me. I didn't intend to. But your, your hate seems unnatural, and we'll probably never meet again. I can't help it. I love you. Love at first sight. Jean Isbel and Ellen Jorth. Strange, isn't it? It was all so strange. My meeting you so lonely and unhappy. My seeing you so sweet and beautiful. My thinking you so good in spite of... Sure it was strange, interrupted Ellen with scornful laugh. She had found her defense. In hurting him, she could hide her own hurt. Thinking me so good in spite of... Ha, ha. And I've said I've been kissed before. Yes, in spite of everything, he said. Ellen could not look at him as he loomed over her. She felt a wild tumult in her heart. All that crowded to her lips for utterance was false. Yes, kissed before I met you and since, she said mockingly. And I laugh at what you call love, Jean Isbel. Laugh if you want, but believe it was sweet, honorable, the best in me, he replied, in deep earnestness. Bah, cried Ellen, with all the force of her pain and shame and hate. By heaven, you must be different from what I thought, exclaimed Isbel, huskily. Sure, if I wasn't, I'd make myself. Now, Mr. Jean Isbel, get on your horse and go. Something of composure came to Ellen with these words of dismissal, and she glanced up at him with half-veiled eyes. His changed aspect prepared her for some blow. That's a pretty black horse. Yes, replied Ellen, blankly. Do you like him? I, I love him. All right. I'll give him to you then. He'll have less work and kinder treatment than if I used him. I've got some pretty hard rides ahead of me. You, you'd give, whispered Ellen, slowly stiffening. Yes, he's mine, replied Isbel. With that, he turned to whistle. Spades threw up his head, snorted, and started forward at a trot. He came faster the closer he got. And if ever Ellen saw the joy of a horse at sight of a beloved master, she saw it then. Isbel laid a hand on the animal's neck and caressed him. Then, turning back to Ellen, he went on speaking. I picked him from a lot of fine horses of my father's. We got along well. My sister Anne rode him a good deal. He was stolen from our pasture day before yesterday. I took his trail and tracked him up here. Never lost his trail till I got to your ranch, where I had the circle till I picked it up again. Stolen? Pasture? Tracked him up here? Echoed Ellen, without any evidence of emotion whatever. Indeed, she seemed to have been turned to stone. Tracking him was easy. I wish for your sake it had been impossible, he said bluntly. For my sake, she echoed, in precisely the same tone. Manifestly, that tone irritated Isbel beyond control. He misunderstood it. With a hand far from gentle, 
he pushed her bent head back so he could look into her face. Yes, for your sake, he declared harshly. Haven't you sense enough to see that? What kind of game do you think you can play with me? Game? I? Game of what? she asked. Why, a game of ignorance, innocence, any old game to fool a man who's trying to be decent. This time Ellen mutely looked her dull, dark questioning, and it inflamed Isbel. You know your father's a horse thief, he thundered. Outwardly, Ellen remained the same. She had been prepared for an unknown and a terrible blow. It had fallen, and her face, her body, her hands, locked with the supreme fortitude of pride and sustained by hate, gave no betrayal of the crashing, thundering ruin within her mind and soul. Motionless, she leaned there, meeting the piercing fire of Isbel's eyes, seeing in them a righteous and terrible scorn. In one flash, the naked truth seemed blazed at her. The faith that she had fostered died a sudden death. A thousand perplexing problems were solved in a second of whirling, revealing thought. "'Ellen Jorth, you know your father's with this hash-knife gang of rustlers,' thundered Isbel. Sure, she replied, with the cool, easy, careless defiance of a Texan. You know he's got this Dags to lead his faction against the Isbels. Sure. You know this talk of sheepmen bucking the cattlemen is all a blind. Sure, reiterated Ellen. Isbel gazed darkly down upon her. With his anger spent for the moment, he appeared ready to end the interview but he seemed fascinated by the strange look of her, by the incomprehensible something she emanated. Havoc gleamed in his pale, set face. He shook his dark head, and his broad hand went to his breast. "'To think I fell in love with such as you!' he exclaimed, and his other hand swept out in a tragic gesture of helpless pathos and impotence. The hell Isbel had hinted at now possessed Ellen, body, mind, and soul, disgraced, scorned by an Isbel, yet loved by him. In that divination there flamed up a wild, fierce passion to hurt, to render, to flay, to fling back upon him a stinging agony. Her thought flew upon her like whips. Pride of the Jorths, pride of the old Texas blue blood. It lay dead at her feet, killed by the scornful words of the last of that family to whom she owed her degradation. Daughter of a horse-thief and rustler, dark and evil and grim, set the forces within her, accepting her fate, damning her enemies, true to the blood of the Jorths. The sins of the father must be visited upon the daughter. Sure you might have had me that day on the rim if you hadn't told me your name, she said mockingly, and she gazed into his eyes with all the mystery of a woman's nature. Isbel's powerful frame shook as with an ague. Girl, what do you mean? Sure, I'd have been plumb fond of you having make up to me, she drawled. It possessed her now with irresistible power, this fact of the love he could not help. Some fiendish woman's satisfaction dwelt in her consciousness of her power to kill the noble, the faithful, the good in him. Ellen Jorth, you lie, he burst out hoarsely. Jean, sure I'd been a toy and a rag for these rustlers long enough. I was tired of them. I wanted a new lover. And if you hadn't given yourself away... Isbel moved so swiftly that she did not realize his intention until his hard hand smote her mouth. Instantly, she tasted the hot, salty blood from a cut lip. Shut up, you hussy, he ordered roughly. Have you no shame? My sister Anne spoke well of you. She made excuses. She pitied you. That, for Ellen, seemed the culminating blow under which she almost sank. But one moment longer could she maintain this unnatural and terrible poise. Jean Isabel, go along with you, she said impatiently. I'm waiting here for Sim Bruce. End of chapter 6, part 1
Section 12 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 2. At last, it was as if she struck his heart. Because of doubt of himself and a stubborn faith in her, his passion and jealousy were not proof against this last stab. Instinctive subtlety inherent in Ellen had prompted the speech that tortured Isbel. How the shock to him rebounded on her. She gasped as he lunged for her, too swift for her to move a hand. One arm crushed round her like a steel band, the other, hard across her breast and neck, forced her head back. Then she tried to wrestle away, but she was utterly powerless. His dark face bent down closer and closer. Suddenly, Ellen ceased trying to struggle. She was like a stricken creature paralyzed by the piercing, hypnotic eyes of a snake. Yet, in spite of her terror, if he meant death by her, she welcomed it. "'Ellen Jorth, I'm thinking yet you lie,' he said, low and tense between his teeth. "'No, no,' she screamed wildly. Her nerve broke there. She could no longer meet those terrible black eyes. Her passionate denial was not only the last of her shameful deceit, it was the woman of her, repudiating herself and him, and all this sickening, miserable situation. Isbel took her literally. She had convinced him, and the instant held blank horror for Ellen. "'By God, then, I'll have something of you anyway,' muttered Isabel thickly. Ellen saw the blood bulge in his powerful neck. She saw his dark, hard face, strange now, fearful to behold, come lower and lower, till it blurred and obstructed her gaze. She felt the swell and ripple and stretch, then the bind of his muscles, like huge coils of elastic rope. Then, with savage, rude force, his mouth closed on hers. All Ellen's senses reeled, as if she were swooning. She was suffocating. The spasm passed, and a bursting spurt of blood revived her to acute and terrible consciousness. For the endless period of one moment, he held her so that her breast seemed crushed. His kisses burned and brazed her lips, and then, shifting violently to her neck, they pressed so hard that she choked under them. It was as if a huge bat had fastened upon her throat. Suddenly, the remorseless, binding embraces, the hot and savage kisses, fell away from her. Isbel had let go. She saw him throw up his hands and stagger back a little, all the while with his piercing gaze on her. His face had been dark purple. Now it was white. No, Ellen Jorth, he panted. I don't want any of you that way. And suddenly he sank on a log and covered his face with his hands. What I loved in you was what I thought you were. Like a wildcat, Ellen sprang upon him, beating him with her fists, tearing at his hair, scratching his face in blind fury. Isbel made no move to stop her, and her violence spent itself with her strength. She swayed back from him, shaking so that she could scarcely stand. You damned Isabel, she gasped with hoarse passion. You insulted me. Insulted you? laughed Isabel in bitter scorn. It couldn't be done. Oh, I'll kill you, she hissed. Isabel stood up and wiped the red scratches on his face. Go ahead. There's my gun, he said, pointing to his saddle sheath. Somebody's got to begin this jorth Isabel feud. It'll be a dirty business. I'm sick of it already. Kill me. First blood for Ellen Jorth. Suddenly, the dark, grim tide that had seemed to engulf Ellen's very soul cooled and receded, leaving her without its false strength. She began to sag. She stared at Isbel's gun. Kill him, whispered the retreating voices of her hate, but she was as powerless as if she were still held in Jean Isbel's giant embrace. I want to kill you, she whispered, but I can't. Leave me. You're no Jorth, the same as I'm no Isbel. We oughtn't to be mixed up in this deal, he said somberly. 
I'm sorry for you than I am for myself. You're a girl. You once had a good mother, a decent home. And this life you've led here, mean as it's been, is nothing to what you'll face now. Damn the men that brought you to this. I'm going to kill some of them. With that, he mounted and turned away. Ellen called out for him to take his horse. He did not stop nor look back. She called again, but her voice was fainter, and Isbel was now leaving at a trot. Slowly she sagged against the tree, lower and lower. He headed into the trail leading up the canyon. How strange a relief Ellen felt. She watched him ride into the aspens and start up the slope, at last to disappear in the pines. It seemed at the moment that he took with him something which had been hers. A pain in her head dulled the thoughts that wavered to and fro. After he had gone, she could not see so well. Her eyes were tired. What had happened to her? There was blood on her hands. Isbel's blood? She shuddered. Was it an omen? Lower she sank against the tree and closed her eyes. Old John Sprague did not return. Hours dragged by. Dark hours for Ellen Jorth, lying prostrate beside the tree, hiding the blue sky and golden sunlight from her eyes. At length, the legacy of despair, the black, dull misery wore away, and she gradually returned to a condition of coherent thought. What had she learned? Sight of the black horse grazing near seemed to prompt the trenchant replies. Spades belonged to Jean Isbel. He had been stolen by her father, or by one of her father's accomplices. Isbel's vaulted cunning as a tracker had been no idle boast. Her father was a horse thief, a rustler, a sheepman, only as a blind, a consort of Dags, leader of the Hash Knife Gang. Ellen well remembered the ill repute of that gang way back in Texas years ago. Her father had gotten in with his famous band of rustlers to serve his own ends, the extermination of the Isbels. It was all very plain now to Ellen. Daughter of a horse thief and a rustler, she muttered. And her thoughts sped back to the days of her girlhood. Only the very early stage of that time had been happy. In the light of Isbel's revelation, the many changes of residence, the sudden moves to unsettled parts of Texas, the periods of poverty and sudden prosperity, all leading to the final journey to this God-forsaken Arizona. These were now seen in their true significance. As far back as she could remember, her father had been a crooked man, and her mother had known it. He had dragged her to her ruin. The degradation had killed her. Ellen realized that with poignant sorrow, with a sudden revolt against her father. Had Gaston Isbel truly and dishonestly started her father on his downhill road? Ellen wondered. She hated the Isbels with unutterable and growing hate, yet she had it in her to think, to ponder, to weigh judgment in their behalf. She owed it to something in herself to be fair. But what did it matter who was to blame for the jorth Isbel feud? Somehow Ellen was forced to confess that deep in her soul it mattered terribly. To be true to herself, the self that she alone knew, she must have right on her side. If the Jorths were guilty, and she clung to them and their creed, then she would be one of them. But I'm not, she mused aloud. My name's Jorth, and I reckon I have bad blood. But it never came out in me till today. I've been honest. I've been good. Yes, good as my mother taught me to be, in spite of all. Sure, my pride made me a fool. And now, have I any choice to make? I'm a Jorth. I must stick to my father. All this summing up, however, did not wholly account for the pang in her breast. What had she done that day? And the answer beat in her ears like a great throbbing hammer stroke. In an agony of shame, in the throes of hate, she had perjured herself. She had sworn away her honor. She had basely made herself vile. She had struck ruthlessly at the great heart of a man who loved her. Ah, that thrust had rebounded 
to leave this dreadful pang in her breast. Loved her? Yes, the strange truth, the insupportable truth. She had to contend now, not with her father and her disgrace, not with the baffling presence of Jean Isbel, but with the mysteries of her own soul. Wonder of all wonders was it that such love had been born for her. Shame, worse than all other shame, was it that she should kill by a poisoned lie? By what monstrous motive had she done that? To sting Isbel as he had stung her. But that had been base. Never could she have stooped so low except in a moment of tremendous tumult. If she had done sore injury to Isbel, what bad had she done to herself? How strange, how tenacious had been his faith in her honor. Could she ever forget? She must forget it. But she could never forget the way he had scorned those vile men in Greaves's store, the way he had beaten Bruce for defiling her name, the way he had stubbornly denied her own insinuations. She was a woman now. She had learned something of the complexity of a woman's heart. She could not change nature, and all her passionate being thrilled to the manhood of her defender. But even while she thrilled, she acknowledged her hate. It was the contention between the two that caused the pang in her breast. And now what's left for me, murmured Ellen. She did not analyze the significance of what had prompted that query. The most incalculable of the day's disclosure was the wrong she had done herself. Sure I'm done for, one way or another, I must stick to Dad or kill myself. Ellen rode spades back to the ranch. She rode like the wind. When she swung out of the trail into the open meadow, in plain sight of the ranch, her appearance created a commotion among the loungers before the cabin. She rode spades at a full run. "'Who's after you?' yelled her father, as she pulled the black to a halt. Jorth held a rifle. Dags, Coulters, the other Jorths were there, likewise armed, and all watchful, strung with expectancy. "'Sure nobody's after me,' replied Ellen. "'Can't I run a horse round here without being chased?' Jorth appeared both incensed and relieved. "'Ah, what you mean, girl? Running like a streak right down on us. You're acting queer these days.' and you look queer. I'm not liking it. Reckon these are queer times for the Jorths, replied Ellen sarcastically. Dags found strange horse tracks crossing the meadow, said her father, and that worried us. Someone's been snooping round the ranch, and when we seen you running so wild, we sure thought you was being chased. No, I was only trying out spades to see how fast he could run, returned Ellen. Reckon when we do get chased, it'll take some running to catch me. Ha ha, roared Dags. It sure will, Ellen. Girl, it's not only your running and your looks that's queer, declared Jorth, in dark perplexity. You talk queer. Sure, Dad. You're not used to hearing spades called spades, said Ellen, as she dismounted. Humph, ejaculated her father as if convinced of the uselessness of trying to understand a woman. Say, did you see any strange horse tracks? I reckon I did, and I know who made them. Jorth stiffened. All the men behind him showed a sudden intensity of suspense. Who? demanded Jorth. Sure it was Jean Isbel, replied Ellen coolly. He came up here tracking his black horse. Jean Isbel "'Tracking his black horse?' repeated her father. "'Yes, he's not overrated as a tracker, that's sure.' Blank silence ensued. Ellen cast a slow glance over her father and the others. Then she began to loosen the cinches of her saddle. Presently, Jorth burst the silence with a curse, and Dags followed with one of his sardonic laughs. "'Well, boss, what did I tell you?' he drawled. Jorth strode to Ellen, and whirling her around with a strong hand, he held her facing him. "'Did you see Isbel?' "'Yes,' replied Ellen, just as sharply as her father had asked. "'Did you talk to him?' "'Yes.' "'What did he want up here?' "'I told you he was tracking the black horse you stole.' 
Jorth's hand and arm dropped limply. His sallow face turned a livid hue. A maze merged into discomfiture, and that gave place to rage. He raised a hand as if to strike Ellen, and suddenly Daggs' long arm shot out to clutch Jorth's wrist. Wrestling to free himself, Jorth cursed under his breath. "'Let go, Daggs,' he shouted stridently. "'Am I drunk that you grab me?' "'Well, you ain't drunk, I reckon,' replied the rustler with sarcasm. "'But you're sure some things I'll reserve for your private ear.' Jorth gained a semblance of composure, but it was evident that he labored under a shock. "'Ellen, did Jean Isabel see this black horse?' "'Yes, he asked me how I got spades, and I told him.' "'Did he say spades belonged to him?' Sure, I reckon he proved it. You can always tell a horse that loves its master. Did you offer to give spades back? Yes, but Isbel wouldn't take him. Ah, huh, and why not? He said he'd rather I kept him. He was about to engage in a dirty, blood-spilling deal, and he reckoned he'd not be able to care for a fine horse. I didn't want spades. I tried to make Isbel take him, but he rode off, and that's all there is to that. Maybe it's not, replied Jorth, chewing his mustache and eyeing Ellen with dark, intent gaze. You've met this Isbel twice. It wasn't any fault of mine, retorted Ellen. I hear he's sweet on you. How about that? Ellen smarted under the blaze of blood that swept to neck and cheek and temple. But it was only memory which fired this shame. What her father and his crowd might think were matters of supreme indifference, yet she met his suspicious gaze with truthful, blazing eyes. "'I hear talk from Bruce and Lorenzo,' went on her father, "'and Dags here—' "'Dags nothing,' interrupted that worthy. "'Don't fetch me in. I said nothing, and I think nothing.' "'Yes, Jean Isabel was sweet on me, Dad, but he will never be again,' returned Ellen, in low tones. With that, she pulled her saddle off spades, and, throwing it over her shoulder, she walked off to her cabin. Hardly had she gotten indoors when her father entered. "'Ellen, I didn't know that horse belonged to Isbel,' he began, in the swift, hoarse, persuasive voice so familiar to Ellen. "'I swear I didn't. I bought him, traded with Slater for him. Honest to God, I never had any idea he was stolen.' Why, when you said, that horse you stole, I felt as if you'd knifed me. Ellen sat at the table and listened while her father paced to and fro, and by his restless action and passionate speech worked himself into a frenzy. He talked incessantly, as if her silence was condemnatory, and as if eloquence alone could convince her of his honesty. It seemed that Ellen saw and heard with keener faculties than ever before. He had a terrible thirst for her respect. Not so much for her love, she divined, but that she would not see how he had fallen. She pitied him with all her heart. She was all he had, and he was all the world to her. And so, as she gave ear to his long, illogical rigmarole of argument and defense, she slowly found that her pity and her love were making vital decisions for her. As of old, in poignant moments, her father lapsed into a denunciation of the Isabels and what they had brought him to. His sufferings were real, at least, in Ellen's presence. She was the only link that bound him to a long past, happier times. She was her mother over again, the woman who had betrayed another man for him, and had gone with him to her ruin and death. "'Dad, don't go on so,' said Ellen, breaking in upon her father's rant. "'I will be true to you, as my mother was. I am a Jorth. Your place is my place. Your fight is my fight. Never speak of the past to me again. If God spares us through this feud, we will go away and begin all over again, far off, where no one ever heard of a Jorth. If we're not spared, we'll at least have had our whack at these damned Isbels. End of chapter 6, 
Part Two. Section Thirteen of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Part One. During June, Jean Isabel did not ride far away from Grass Valley. Another attempt had been made upon Gaston Isbel's life. Another cowardly shot had been fired from ambush, this time from a pine thicket bordering the trail that led to Blaisdell's ranch. Blaisdell heard this shot so near his home it was fired. No trace of the hidden foe could be found. The ground all around the vicinity bore a carpet of pine needles which showed no trace of footprints. The supposition was that this cowardly attempt had been perpetrated, or certainly instigated, by the Jorths. But there was no proof, and Gaston Isbel had other enemies in the Tonto Basin beside the Sheep Clan. The old man raged like a lion about the sneaking attack on him, and his friend Blaisdell urged an immediate gathering of their kin and friends. Let's quit ranching till this trouble's settled, he declared. Let's arm and ride the trails and meet these men halfway. It won't help our side any to wait till you're shot in the back. More than one of Isbel's supporters offered the same advice. No, we'll wait till we know for sure, was the stubborn cattleman's reply to all these promptings. No, well, hell. Didn't Jean find that black horse up at Jorth's ranch, demanded Blaisdell. What more do we want? John couldn't swear Jorce stole the black. Well, by thunder, I can swear to it, growled Blaisdell, and we're losing cattle all the time. Who's stealing them? We've always lost cattle ever since we started ranching here. Gas, I reckon you want Jorth to start this fight in the open. It'll start soon enough, was Isbel's gloomy reply. Jean had not failed altogether in his tracking of lost or stolen cattle. Circumstances had been against him, and there was something baffling about this rustling. The summer storm set in early, and it had been his luck to have heavy rains wash out fresh tracks that he might have followed. The range was large, and cattle were everywhere. Sometimes a loss was not discovered for weeks. Gaston Isbel's sons were now the only men left to ride the range. Two of his riders had quit because of the threatened war, and Isbel had let another go. So Jean did not often learn that cattle had been stolen until their tracks were old. Added to that was the fact that this Grass Valley country was covered with horse tracks and cattle tracks. The rustlers, whoever they were, had long been at the game, and now that there was reason for them to show their cunning, they did. Early in July the hot weather came. Down on the red ridges of the Tonto it was hot desert. The nights were cool, the early mornings were pleasant, but the day was something to endure. When the white cumulus clouds rolled up out of the southwest, growing larger and thicker and darker, here and there coalescing into a black thundercloud, Jean welcomed them. He liked to see the gray streamers of rain hanging down from a canopy of black, and the roar of rain on the trees as it approached, like a trampling army, was always welcome. The grassy flats, the red ridges, the rocky slopes, the thickets of manzanita and scrub oak and cactus were dusty, glaring, throat-parching places under the hot summer sun. Jean longed for the cool heights of the rim, the shady pines, the dark sweet verdure under the silver spruces, the tinkle and murmur of the clear rills. He often had another longing, too, which he bitterly stifled. Jean's ally, the keen-nosed shepherd dog, had disappeared one day and had never returned. Among men at the ranch, there was a difference of opinion as to what had happened to Shep. The old rancher thought he had been poisoned or shot. Bill and Guy Isbel believed he had been stolen by sheep herders, who were always stealing dogs, and Jean inclined to the conviction that Shep had gone off with the timber wolves. The fact was that Shep did not return, 
and Jean missed them. One morning at dawn, Jean heard the cattle bellowing and trampling out in the valley, and upon hurrying to the vantage point he was amazed to see upward of five hundred steers chasing a lone wolf. Jean's father had seen such a spectacle as this, but it was a new one for Jean. The wolf was a big gray and black fellow, rangy and powerful, and until he got the steers all behind him, he was rather hard put to it to keep out of their way. Probably he had dogged the herd, trying to sneak in and pull down a yearling, and finally the steers had charged him. Jean kept along the edge of the valley in the hope they would chase him within rifle range. But the wary wolf saw Jean and sheared off, gradually drawing away from his pursuers. Jean returned to the house for his breakfast and then set off across the valley. His father owned one small flock of sheep that had not yet been driven up on the rim, where all the sheep in the country were run during the hot, dry summer down on the Tonto. Young Everts and the Mexican boy named Bernardino had charge of this flock. The regular Mexican herder, a man of experience, had given up his job, and these boys were not equal to the task of risking the sheep up in the enemy's stronghold. This flock was known to be grazing in a side draw, well up from Grass Valley, where the brush afforded some protection from the sun, and there was good water and a little feed. Before Jean reached his destination, he heard a shot. It was not a rifle shot, which fact caused Jean a little concern. Everts and Bernardino had rifles, but to his knowledge, no small arms. Jean rode up on one of the black-brushed conical hills that rose on the south side of Grass Valley, and from there he took a sharp survey of the country. At first he made out only cattle and bare meadow land and the low encircling ridges and hills. But presently up toward the head of the valley he descried a bunch of horsemen riding toward the village. He could not tell their number. That dark moving mass seemed to Jean to be instinct with life, mystery, menace. Who were they? It was too far for him to recognize horses, let alone riders. They were moving fast, too. Jean watched them out of sight, then turned his horse downhill again and rode on his quest. A number of horsemen like that was a very unusual sight around Grass Valley at any time. What did it portend now? Jean experienced a little shock of uneasy dread that was a new sensation for him. Brooding over this, he proceeded on his way, at length, to turn into the draw where the camp of the sheepherders was located. Upon coming in sight of it, he heard a hoarse shout. Young Everts appeared running frantically out of the brush. Jean urged his horse into a run and soon covered the distance between them. Everts appeared beside himself with terror. "'Boy, what's the matter?' queried Jean as he dismounted, rifle in hand, peering quickly from Everts' white face to the camp and all around. "'Bernardino, Bernardino!' gasped the boy, wringing his hands and pointing. Jean ran the few remaining rods to the sheep camp. He saw the little teepee, a burned-out fire, a half-finished meal, and the Mexican lad lying prone on the ground, dead, with a bullet hole in his ghastly face. Near him lay an old six-shooter. "'Whose gun is that?' demanded Jean as he picked it up. "'Bernardino's,' replied Everts huskily. He, "'He just got it the other day.' "'Did he shoot himself accidentally?' "'Oh, no, no. He didn't do it at all.' "'Who did, then?' "'The men. They rode up. A gang. They did it,' panted Everts. "'Did you know who they were?' "'No, I couldn't tell. I saw them coming, and I was scared.' Bernardino had gone for water. I run and hid in the brush. I wanted to yell, but they come too close. Then I heard them talking. Bernardino come back. They appeared friendly-like. That made me rise up to look, and I couldn't see good. I heard one of them ask Bernardino to let him see his gun. 
and Bernardino handed it over. He looked at the gun and haw-hawed, and flipped it up in the air, and when it fell back in his hand, it, it went off, bang, and Bernardino dropped. I hid down close. I was scared stiff. I heard them talk more, but not what they said. Then they rode away, and I hid there till I seen you coming. "'Have you got a horse?' queried John sharply. "'No, but I can ride one of Bernardino's burros. "'Get one. Hurry over to Blaisdell. "'Tell him to send word to Blue and Gordon and Fredericks "'to ride like the devil to my father's ranch. "'Hurry now.' "'Young Everts ran off without reply. "'Jean stood looking down at the limp and pathetic figure "'of the Mexican boy. "'By heaven!' he exclaimed grimly. "'The Jorth Isbel wars on. "'Deliberate, cold-blooded murder.' I'll gamble Dags did this job. He's been given the leadership. He started it. Bernardino, greaser or not, you were a faithful lad, and you won't go long unavenged. Jean had no time to spare. Tearing a tarpaulin out of the teepee, he covered the lad with it and then ran for his horse. Mounting, he galloped down the draw, over the little red ridges, out into the valley, where he put his horse to a run. Action changed the sickening horror that sight of Bernardino had engendered. Jean even felt a strange, grim relief. The long, dragging days of waiting were over. Jorth's gang had taken the initiative. Blood had begun to flow, and it would continue to flow now till the last man of one faction stood over the dead body of the last man of the other. Would it be a Jorth or an Isbel? My instinct was right, he muttered aloud. That bunch of horses gave me a queer feeling. Jean gazed all around, the grassy, cattle-dotted valley he was crossing so swiftly, and toward the village. But he did not see any sign of the dark group of riders. They had gone on to Greaves' store there, no doubt, to drink and to add more enemies of the Isbels to their gang. Suddenly across Jean's mind, flashed the thought of Ellen Jorth. What'll become of her? What'll become of all the women, my sister, the little ones? No one was in sight around the ranch. Never had it appeared more peaceful and pastoral to Jean. The grazing cattle and horses in the foreground, the haystack half eaten away, the cows in the fence pasture, the column of blue smoke lazily ascending, the crackle of hens, the solid, well-built cabins. All these seemed to repudiate Jean's haste and his darkness of mind. This place was his father's farm. There was not a cloud in the blue summer sky. As Jean galloped up the lane, someone saw him from the front door, and then Bill and Guy and their gray-headed father came out upon the porch. Jean saw how he waved the woman folk back, and then strode out into the lane. Bill and Guy reached his side as Jean pulled his heaving horse to a halt. They all looked at Jean swiftly and intently, with a little hard, fiery gleam strangely identical in the eyes of each. Probably before a word was spoken, they knew what to expect. "'Well, you sure was in a hurry,' remarked the father. "'What the hell's up?' queried Bill grimly. Guy Isabel remained silent, and it was he who turned slightly pale. Jean leaped off his horse. Bernardino's just been killed, murdered with his own gun. Gaston Isabel seemed to exhale a long, damned, bursting breath that let his chest sag. A terrible, deadly glint, pale and cold as sunlight on ice, grew slowly to dominate his clear eyes. Uh-huh ejaculated Belle Isabel hoarsely. None of the three men asked who had done the killing. They were silent a moment, motionless, locked in the secret seclusion of their own minds. Then they listened with absorption to John's brief story. "'Well, that lets us in,' said his father. "'I wish we had more time. Reckon I'd done better to listen to you boys and have my men close at hand. Jacobs happened to ride over.' That makes five of us beside the women. Aw, oh, Dad, you don't reckon they'll round us up here? asked Guy Isbel. 
Boys, I always feared they might, replied the old man, but I never really believed that they'd have the nerve. Sure, I ought to have figured Dags better. This here secret business of shooting at us from ambush looked about Jorth's size to me, but I reckon now we'll have to fight without our friends. Let them come, said John. I sent for Blaisdell, Blue, Gordon, and Fredericks. Maybe they'll get here in time. But if they don't, it needn't worry us much. We can hold out here longer than Jorth's gang can hang around. We'll want plenty of water, wood, and meat in the house. Well, I'll see to that, rejoined his father. Jean, you go out close by, where you can see all around and keep watch. Who's going to tell the women? asked Guy Isbel. The silence that momentarily ensued was an eloquent testimony to the hardest and saddest aspect of this strife between men. The inevitableness of it in no wise detracted from its sheer uselessness. Men from time immemorial had hated and killed one another, always to the misery and degradation of their women. Old Gaston Isbel showed this tragic realization in his lined face. "'Well, boys, I'll tell the women,' he said. "'Sure you needn't worry none about them. They'll be game.' Jean rode away to an open knoll a short distance from the house, and here he stationed himself to watch all points. The cedared ridge back of the ranch was the one approach by which Jorth's gang might come close without being detected, but even so, Jean could see them and ride to the house in time to prevent a surprise. The moments dragged by, and at the end of an hour, Jean was in hopes that Blaisdell would soon come. These hopes were well founded. Presently, he heard a clatter of hoofs on hard ground to the south, and upon wheeling to look, he saw the friendly neighbor coming fast along the road, riding a big white horse. Blaisdell carried a rifle in his hand, and the sight of him gave Jean a glow of warmth. He was one of the Texans who would stand by the Isbels to the last man. Jean watched him ride to the house, watched the meeting between him and his lifelong friend. There floated out to Jean's old Blaisdell's roar of rage. Then out on the green of Grass Valley, where a long, swelling plain swept away toward the village, there appeared a moving, dark patch, a bunch of horses. Jean's body gave a slight start, the shock of sudden propulsion of blood through all his veins. Those horses bore riders. They were coming straight down the open valley on the wagon road to Isbel's ranch. No subterfuge. No secrecy nor sneaking in that advance. A hot thrill ran over Jean. By heaven, they mean business, he muttered. Up to the last moment, he had unconsciously hoped Jorth's gang would not come boldly like that. The verifications of all a Texan's inherited instincts left no doubts, no hopes, no illusions, only a grim certainty that this was not conjecture, nor probability, but fact. For a moment longer, Jean watched the slowly moving dark patch of horsemen against the green background. Then he hurried back to the ranch. His father saw him coming. He strode out as before. Dad, Jorth is coming, said Jean huskily. How he hated to be forced to tell his father that. The boyish love of old had flashed up. Where, demanded the old man, his eagle gaze sweeping the horizon. Down the road from Grass Valley, you can't see from here. Well, come in and let's get ready. Isbel's house had not been constructed with the idea of repelling an attack from a band of Apaches. The long living room of the main cabin was the one selected for defense and protection. This room had two windows and a door facing the lane and a door at each end, one of which opened into the kitchen and the other into an adjoining room and later built cabin. The logs of this main cabin were of large size, and the doors and window coverings were heavy, affording safer protection from bullets than the other cabins. When Jean went in, he seemed to see a host of white faces lifted to him. His sister Anne, 
his two sisters-in-law, the children, all mutely watched him with eyes that would haunt him. "'Well, Blaisdell, John says Jorth and his precious gang of wrestlers are on the way here,' announced the rancher. "'Damn me if it's not a bad day for Lee Jorth,' declared Blaisdell. "'Clear off that table,' ordered Isbel, "'and fetch out all the guns and shells we've got.' Once laid upon the table, these presented a formidable arsenal, which consisted of three new forty-four Winchesters that John had brought with him from the coast, the enormous buffalo, or so-called needle gun, that Gaston Isbel had used for years, a Henry rifle, which Blaisdell had brought, and a half a dozen six-shooters. Piles and packages of ammunition littered the table. "'Sort out these here shells,' said Isbel. "'Everybody wants to get hold of his own.' Jacobs, the neighbor who was present, was a thick-set, bearded man, rather jovial among those lean, jawed Texans. He carried a forty-four rifle of an old pattern. "'Well, boys, if I'd known we was in for some fun, I'd have fetched more shells. Only got one magazine full. Maybe them new forty-fours will fit my gun.' It was discovered that the ammunition John had brought in quantity fitted Jacob's rifle a fact which afforded peculiar satisfaction to all the men present. "'Well, sure we're lucky,' declared Gaston Isbel. The women sat apart, in the corner toward the kitchen, and there seemed to be a strange fascination for them in the talk and action of the men. The wife of Jacobs was a little woman, with homely face and very bright eyes. Jean thought she would be a help in the household during the next doubtful hours. Every moment Jean would go to the window and peer out down the road. His companions evidently relied upon him, for no one else looked out. Now that the suspense of days and weeks was over, these Texans faced the issue with talk and act not noticeably different from those of ordinary moments. At last, John espied the dark mass of horsemen out in the valley road. They were close together, walking their mounts, and evidently in earnest conversation. After several ineffectual attempts, Jean counted eleven horses, every one of which, he was sure, bore a rider. "'Dad, look out,' called Jean. Gaston Isbel strode to the door and stood looking, without a word. The other men crowded to the windows. Blaisdell cursed under his breath. Jacob said, By golly, come to pay us a call. The women sat motionless with dark, strained eyes. The children ceased their play and looked fearfully to their mother. When just out of rifle shot of the cabin, the band of horsemen halted and lined up in a half circle, all facing the ranch. They were close enough for Jean to see their gestures, but he could not recognize any of their faces. It struck him singularly that none of them wore a mask. "'Jean, do you know any of them?' asked his father. "'No, not yet. They're too far off.' "'Dad, I'll get your old telescope,' said Guy Isabel, and he ran out toward the adjoining cabin. Blaisdell shook his big, hoary head and rumbled out of his bull-like neck, well, now you're here, you sheep fellas. What are you going to do about it? Guy Isabel returned with a yard-long telescope, which he passed to his father. The old man took it with shaking hands and leveled it. Suddenly it was as if he had been transfixed. Then he lowered the glass, shaking violently, and his face grew gray with an exceedingly bitter wrath. Jorth, he swore harshly, Jean had only to look at his father to know that recognition had been like a mortal shock. It passed. Again, the rancher leveled the glass. Well, Blaisdell, there's our old Texas friend Dags, he drawled dryly, and Greaves, our honest storekeeper of Grass Valley, and their Stonewall Jackson Jorth and Tad Jorth with the same old red nose. And say, damned, if one of the gang isn't queen, as bad a gunfighter as Texas ever bred. Sure, I thought he'd been killed in the Big Bend country, so I heard. 
And there's Craig, another respectable sheepman of Grass Valley. Ha, ha. And, well, I don't recognize any more of them. Jean forthwith took the glass and moved it slowly across the faces of that group of horsemen. Sim Bruce, he said instantly. I see Coulter. And, yes, Greaves is there. I've seen the man next to him, face like a ham. Sure, that is Craig, interrupted his father. Jean knew the dark face of Lee Jorth by the resemblance it bore to Ellen's, and the recognition brought a twinge. He thought, too, that he could tell the other Jorths. He asked his father to describe Dags and then Queen. It was not likely that Jean would fail to know these several men in the future. Then Blaisdell asked for the telescope, and, when he got through looking and cursing, he passed it on to the others, who, one by one, took a long look until finally it came back to the old rancher. Well, Daggs is waving his hands here and there, like a general about to send out scouts, ha <laughs> ha, and appears to me he's not overlooking our horses. Well, that's natural for a rustler. He'd have to steal a horse or a steer before going into a fight or to dinner or to a funeral. It'll be his funeral if he goes fooling around with them horses, declared Guy Isabel, peering anxiously out of the door. Well, son, sure it'll be somebody's funeral, replied his father. Jean paid but little heed to the conversation. With sharp eyes fixed upon the horsemen, he tried to grasp at their intention. Daggs pointed to the horses in the pasture lot that lay between him and the house. These animals were the best on the range and belonged mostly to Guy Isbel, who was the horse fancier and trader of the family. His horses were his passion. "'Looks like they'd do some horse-stealing,' said John. "'Lend me that glass,' demanded Guy forcefully. He surveyed the band of men for a long moment, then he handed the glass back to Jean. "'I'm going out there after my horses,' he declared. "'No,' exclaimed his father. "'That gang come to steal and not to fight. Can't you see that?' If they meant to fight, they'd do it. They're out there arguing about my horses. Guy picked up his rifle. He looked sullenly determined, and the gleam in his eye was one of fearlessness. Son, I know Dag, said his father, and I know Jorth. They've come to kill us. It'd be sure death for you to go out there. I'm going anyhow. They can't steal my horses out from under my eyes, and they ain't in range. "'Well, Guy, you ain't going alone,' spoke up Jacobs, cheerily, as he came forward. End of Chapter 7, Part 1「Section 14 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 2 the red-haired young wife of Guy Isbel showed no change of her grave face. She had been reared in a stern school. She knew men in times like these. But Jacob's wife appealed to him. Bill, don't risk your life for a horse or two. Jacob's laughed and answered, Not much risk, and went out with Guy. To Jean their actions seemed foolhardy. He kept a keen eye on them and saw instantly when the band became aware of Guy's and Jacob's entrance into the pasture. It took only another second then to realize that Daggs and Jorth had deadly intent. Jean saw Daggs slip out of his saddle, rifle in hand. Others of the gang did likewise, until half of them were dismounted. "'Dad, they're going to shoot,' called out Jean sharply. "'Yell for Guy and Jacob's. Make them come back.' The old man shouted. Bill Isbel yelled. Blaisdell lifted his stentorian voice. Jean screamed piercingly. Guy, run, run! But Guy Isbel and his companion strode on into the pasture, as if they had not heard, and if no menacing horse thieves were within miles. They had covered about a quarter of the distance across the pasture, and were nearing the horses, when Jean saw red flashes and white puffs of smoke burst out from the front of that dark band of rustlers. 
Then followed the sharp, rattling crack of rifles. Guy Isbel stopped short, and dropping his gun, he threw up his arms and fell headlong. Jacobs acted as if he had suddenly encountered an invisible blow. He had been hit. Turning, he began to run, and ran fast for a few paces. There were more quick, sharp shots. He let go of his rifle. His running broke. Walking, reeling, staggering, he kept on. A hoarse cry came from him. Then a single rifle shot peeled out. Sean heard the bullet strike. Jacob fell to his knees and then forward on his face. Jean Isabel felt himself turned to marble. The suddenness of this tragedy paralyzed him. His gaze remained riveted on those prostrate forms. A hand clutched his arm, a shaking woman's hand, slim and hard and tense. "'Bill's killed,' whispered a broken voice. "'I was watching. They're both dead.' The wives of Jacob and Guy Isbel had slipped up behind Jean, and from behind him they had seen the tragedy. "'I asked Bill not to go,' faltered the Jacob's woman, and covering her face with her hands she groped back to the corner of the cabin, where the other women, shaken and white, received her in their arms. Guy Isbel's wife stood at the window, peering over Jean's shoulder. She had the nerve of a man. She had looked out upon death before. Yes, they're dead, she said bitterly. And how are we going to get their bodies? At this, Gaston Isbel seemed to rouse from the cold spell that had transfixed him. God, this is hell for our women, he cried out hoarsely. My son, my son, murdered by the Jorths. Then he swore a terrible oath. Jean saw the remainder of the mounted rustlers get off, and then, all of them, leading their horses, they began to move around to the left. "'Dad, they're moving round,' said John. "'Up to some trick,' declared Bill Isbel. "'Bill, you make a hole through the back wall. Say about the fifth log up,' ordered the father. "'Sure, we've got to look out.' The elder son grasped the tool, and scattering the children, who had been playing near the back corner, he began to work at the point designated. The little children backed away with fixed, wondering, grave eyes. The women moved their chairs and huddled together as if waiting and listening. Jean watched the rustlers until they passed out of his sight. They had moved toward the sloping, brushy ground to the north and west of the cabins. "'Let me know when you get a hole in the back wall,' said Jean and he went through the kitchen and cautiously out another door to slip into a low-roofed, shed-like end of the rambling cabin. This small space was used to store winter firewood. The chinks between the walls had not been filled with adobe clay, and he could see out on three sides. The rustlers were going into the juniper brush. They had moved out of sight and presently reappeared without their horses. It looked to Jean as if they intended to attack the cabins. Then they halted at the edge of the brush and held a long consultation. Jean could see them distinctly, though they were too far distant for him to recognize any particular man. One of them, however, stood and moved apart from the closely massed group. Evidently, from his strides and gestures, he was exhorting his listeners. Jean concluded, this was either Daggs or Jorth. Whoever it was had a loud, coarse voice, and this and his actions impressed Jean with the suspicion that the man was under the influence of the bottle. Presently, Bill Isbel called to Jean in a low voice, Jean, I got the hole made, but we can't see anyone. I see them, Jean replied. They're having a powwow. Looks to me like either Jorth or Daggs is drunk. He's arguing to charge us, and the rest of the gang are holding back. Tell Dad, and all of you keep watching. I'll let you know when they make a move. Jorth's gang appeared to be in no hurry to expose their plan of battle. Gradually the group disintegrated a little. Some of them sat down, others walked to and fro. Presently, two of them went into the brush, probably back to the horses. 
In a few moments they reappeared, carrying a pack. And when this was deposited on the ground, all the rustlers sat down around it. They had brought food and drink. Jean had to utter a grim laugh at their coolness, and he was reminded of many daredevil deeds known to have been perpetrated by the Hash Knife Gang. Jean was glad of a reprieve. The longer the rustlers put off the attack, the more time the allies of the Isbels would have to get here. Rather hazardous, however, would it be now for anyone to attempt to get to the Isbels' cabin in the daytime. Night would be more favorable. Twice Bill Isbel came to the kitchen to whisper to Jean. The strain in the large room, from which the rustlers could not be seen, must have been great. Jean told him all he had seen and what he thought about it. Eatin' and drinkin', ejaculated Bill. Well, I'll be. That'll jar the old man. He wants to get the fight over. Tell him I said it'll be over too quick for us, unless we are mighty careful, replied Jean sharply. Bill went back, muttering to himself. Then followed a long wait, fraught with suspense, during which Jean watched the rustlers regale themselves. The day was hot and still and the unnatural silence of the cabin was broken now and then by the gay laughter of the children. The sound shocked and haunted Jean. Playing children? Then another sound so faint he had to strain to hear it, disturbed and saddened him. His father's slow tread up and down the cabin floor, to and fro, to and fro. What must be in his father's heart this day? At length the rustlers rose, and with rifles in hand, they moved as one man down the slope. They came several hundred yards closer, until Jean, grimly cocking his rifle, muttered to himself that a few more rods closer would mean the end of several of that gang. They knew the range of a rifle well enough, and once more sheared off at right angles with the cabin. When they got even with the line of corrals, they stooped down and were lost to Jean's sight. This fact caused him alarm. They were, of course, crawling up on the cabins. At the end of the line of corrals ran a ditch, the bank of which was high enough to afford cover. Moreover, it ran along in front of the cabins, scarcely a hundred yards, and it was covered with grass and little clumps of brush, from behind which the rustlers could fire into the windows and through the clay chinks without any considerable risk to themselves. As they did not come into sight again, Jean concluded he had discovered their plan. Still, he waited a while longer, until he saw the faint little clouds of dust rising behind the far end of the embankment. That discovery made him rush out and through the kitchen to the large cabin, where his sudden appearance startled the men. "'Get back out of sight,' he ordered sharply, and with swift steps he reached the door and closed it. "'They're behind the bank out there by the corrals, and they're going to crawl down that ditch closer to us. It looks bad. They have grass and brush to shoot from. We've got to be mighty careful how we peep out.' "'Uh-huh. All right,' replied his father. You women keep the kids with you in that corner, and you all better lay down flat. Blaisdell, Bill Isbell, and the old man crouched at the large window, peeping through cracks in the rough edges of the logs. Jean took his post beside the small window, with his keen eyes vibrating like a compass needle. The movement of a blade of grass, the flight of a grasshopper, could not escape his trained sight. Look sharp now, he called to the other men. I see dust. They're working along almost that bare spot on the bank. I saw the tip of a rifle, a black hat, more dust. They're spreading along behind the bank. Loud voices, and then thick clouds of yellow dust coming from behind the highest and brushiest line of the embankment, attested to the truth of Jean's observations, and also to a reckless disregard of danger. Suddenly, John caught a glint of moving color through the fringe of brush. Instantly, he was strung like a whipcord. Then a tall, hatless, coatless man stepped up in plain sight, 
The sun shone on his fair, ruffled hair. Dags. Hey, you Isbels, he bawled, in magnificent, derisive boldness. Come out and fight. Quick as lightning, Jean threw up his rifle and fired. He saw tufts of fair hair fly from Dags's head. He saw the squirt of red blood. Then quick shots from his comrades rang out. They all hit the swaying body of the rustler. But Jean knew with a terrible thrill that his bullet had killed Dags before the other three struck. Dags fell forward, his arms and half his body resting over the embankment. Then the rustlers dragged him back out of sight. Hoarse shouts rose. A cloud of yellow dust drifted away from the spot. Dags burst out Gaston Isbel. Jean, you knocked off the top of his head. I seen that when I was pulling the trigger. Sure we over here wasted our shots. God, he must have been crazier drunk to pop up there. And brace us that way, says Blaisdell, breathing hard. Arizona's bad for Texans, replied Isbel sardonically. Sure it's been too peaceful here. Rustlers have no practice at fighting, and I reckon Dags forgot. Dags made as crazy a move as that of Guy and Jacobs, spoke up Jean. They were overbold, and he was drunk. Let them be a lesson to us. Jean had smelled whiskey upon his entrance to the cabin. Bill was a hard drinker, and his father was not immune. Blaisdell, too, drank heavily upon occasions. Jean made a mental note that he would not permit their chances to become impaired by liquor. Rifles began to crack, and puffs of smoke rose all along the embankment for the space of a hundred feet. Bullets whistled through the rude window casing and spattered on the heavy door, and one split the clay between the logs before Jean narrowly missing him. Another volley followed, then another. The rustlers had repeating rifles, and they were emptying their magazines. Jean changed his position. The other men profited by his wise move. The volleys had merged into one continuous rattling roar of rifle shots. Then came a sudden cessation of reports, with silence of relief. The cabin was full of dust, mingled with the smoke from the shots of Jean and his companions. Jean heard the stifled breaths of the children. Evidently they were terror-stricken, but they did not cry out. The woman uttered no sound. A loud voice pealed from behind the embankment. Come out and fight. Do you Isbels want to be killed like sheep? This sally gained no reply. Jean returned to his post by the window, and his comrades followed his example. And they exercised extreme caution when they peeped out. Boys, don't shoot till you see one, said Gaston Isbel. Maybe after a while they'll get careless, but Jorth will never show himself. The rustlers did not again resort to volleys. One by one, from different angles, they began to shoot, and they were not firing at random. A few bullets came straight in at the windows to pat into the walls. A few others ticked and splintered the edges of the windows, and most of them broke through the clay chinks between the logs. It dawned upon Jean that these dangerous shots were not accident. They were well aimed, and most of them hit low down. The cunning rustlers had some unerring riflemen, and they were picking out the vulnerable places all along the front of the cabin. If Jean had not been lying flat, he would have been hit twice. Presently, he conceived the idea of driving pegs between the logs high up and kneeling on these. He managed to peep out from the upper edge of the window. But this position was awkward and difficult to hold for long. He heard a bullet hit one of his comrades. Whoever had been struck never uttered a sound. Jean turned to look. Bill Isbel was holding his shoulder, where red splotches appeared on his shirt. He shook his head at Jean, evidently, to make light of the wound. The women and children were lying face down and could not see what was happening. Plain it was that Bill did not want them to know. Blaisdell bound up the bloody shoulder with a scarf. Steady firing from the rustlers went on at the rate of one shot every few minutes. 
The Isbels did not return these. John did not fire again that afternoon. Toward sunset, when the besiegers appeared to grow restless or careless, Blaisdell fired at something moving behind the brush, and Gaston Isbel's huge buffalo gun boomed out. "'Well, what are they going to do after dark, and what are we going to do?' grumbled Blaisdell. "'Reckon they'll never charge us,' said Gaston. "'They might set fire to the cabin,' added Bill Isbel. He appeared to be the gloomiest of the Isbel faction. There was something on his mind. "'Well, the Jorths are bad, but I reckon they'll not burn us alive,' replied Blaisdell. "'Ha!' Ah, ejaculated Gaston Isbel. "'Much you know about Lee Jorth. He would skin me alive and throw red-hot coals on my raw flesh.' So they talked during the hour, from sunset to dark. Jean Isabel had little to say. He was revolving possibilities in his mind. Darkness brought a change in the attack of the rustlers. They stationed men at four points around the cabins, and every few minutes one of these outposts would fire. These bullets embedded themselves in the logs, causing but little anxiety to the Isbels. Jean "'What you make of it?' asked the old rancher. "'Looks to me this way,' replied Jean. "'They're set for a long fight. "'They're shooting just to let us know they're on the watch.' "'Uh-huh. "'Well, what are you going to do about it?' "'I'm going out there presently.' "'Gaston Isabel grunted his satisfaction "'at this intention of Jean's. "'All was pitch dark inside the cabin.' The women had water and food at hand. Jean kept a sharp lookout from his window while he ate his supper of meat, bread, and milk. At last the children, worn out by the long day, fell asleep. The women whispered a little in their corner. About nine o'clock, Jean signified his intention of going out to reconnoiter. Dad, they got the best of us in the daytime, he said, but not after dark. Jean buckled on a belt that carried shells, a bowie knife, and a revolver, and with rifle in hand, he went out through the kitchen to the yard. The night was darker than usual, as some of the stars were hidden by clouds. He leaned against the log cabin, waiting for his eyes to become perfectly adjusted to the darkness. Like an Indian, Jean could see well at night. He knew every point around the cabins and sheds and corrals, every post, log, tree, rock, adjacent to the ranch. After perhaps a quarter of an hour watching, during which time several shots were fired from behind the embankment and one each from the rustlers at the other locations, Jean slipped out on his quest. He kept in the shadow of the cabin walls, then the line of orchard trees, then a row of currant bushes. Here, crouching low, he halted to look and listen. He was now at the edge of the open ground, with the gently rising slope before him. He could see the dark patches of cedar and juniper trees. On the north side of the cabin, a streak of fire flashed in the blackness, and a shot rang out. Jean heard the bullet hit the cabin. Then silence enfolded the lonely ranch, and the darkness lay like a black blanket. A low hum of insects pervaded the air. Dull sheets of lightning illumined the dark horizon to the south. Once John heard voices, but he could not tell from which direction they came. To the west of him then flared out another rifle shot. The bullet whistled down over Jean, the thud into the cabin. Jean made a careful study of the obscure, gray-black open before him, and then the background to his rear. So long as he kept the dense shadows behind him, he could not be seen. He slipped from behind his covert, and gliding with absolute noiseless footsteps, he gained the first clump of junipers. Here he waited patiently and motionlessly for another round of shots from the rustlers. After the second shot from the west side, Jean sheered off to the right, Patches of brush, clumps of juniper, and isolated cedars covered this slope, affording Jean a perfect means for his purpose, which was to make a detour and come up behind the rustler who was firing from that side. 
Jean climbed to the top of the ridge, descended the opposite slope, made his turn to the left, and slowly worked up behind the point near where he expected to locate the rustler. Long habit in the open by day and night rendered his sense of direction almost as perfect as sight itself. The first flash of fire he saw from this side proved that he had come straight up toward his man. Jean's intention was to crawl up on this one of the Jorth gang and silently kill him with a knife. If the plan worked successfully, Jean meant to work round to the next rustler. Laying aside his rifle, he crawled forward on hands and knees, making no more sound than a cat. His approach was slow. He had to pick his way. Be careful not to break twigs nor rattle stones. His buckskin garments made no sound against the brush. John located the rustler, sitting on the top of the ridge in the center of an open space. He was alone. John saw the dull red end of the cigarette he was smoking. The ground on the ridge was rocky and not well adapted for Jean's purpose. He had to abandon the idea of crawling up on the rustler, whereupon Jean turned back patiently and slowly to get his rifle. Upon securing it, he began to retrace his course, this time more slowly than before, as he was hampered by the rifle. But he did not make the slightest sound, and at length he reached the edge of the open ridge top. Once more, to espy the dark form of the rustler silhouetted against the sky. The distance was not more than fifty yards. As Jean rose to his knee and carefully lifted his rifle round to avoid the twigs of a juniper, he suddenly experienced another emotion beside the one of grim, hard wrath at the Jorths. It was an emotion that sickened him, made him weak internally, a cold shaking, ungovernable sensation. Suppose this man was Ellen Jorth's father. Jean lowered the rifle. He felt it shake over his knee. He was trembling all over. The astounding discovery that he did not want to kill Ellen's father, that he could not do it, awakened Jean to the despairing nature of his love for her. In this grim moment of indecision, when he knew his Indian subtlety and ability gave him a great advantage over the Jorths, he fully realized his strange, hopeless, and irresistible love for the girl. He made no attempt to deny it any longer. Like the night and the lonely wilderness around him, like the inevitableness of this Jorth Isbel feud, this love of his was a thing, a fact, a reality. He breathed to his own inward ear, to his soul. He could not kill Ellen Jorth's father. Feud or no feud, Isbel or not, he could not deliberately do it. And why not? There was no answer. Was he not faithless to his father? He had no hope of ever winning Ellen Jorth. He did not want the love of a girl of her character. But he loved her. And this struggle must be against the insidious and mysterious growth of that passion. It swayed him already. It made him a coward. Through his mind and heart, swept the memory of Ellen Jorth, her beauty and charm, her boldness and pathos, her shame and her degradation. And the sweetness of her outweighed the boldness, and the mystery of her arrayed itself in unquenchable protest against her acknowledged shame. Jean lifted his face to the heavens, to the pitiless white stars, to the infinite depths of the dark blue sky. He could sense the fact of his being an atom in the universe of nature. What was he? What was his revengeful father? What were hate and passion and strife in comparison to the nameless something, immense and everlasting, that he sensed in this dark moment? But the rustlers, Dags, the Jorths, they had killed his brother Guy, murdered him brutally and ruthlessly. Guy had been a playmate of Jean's, a favorite brother, Bill had been secretive and selfish. Jean had never loved him as he did Guy. Guy lay dead down there on the meadow. This feud had begun to run its bloody course. Jean steeled his nerve. The hot blood crept back along his veins. 
The dark and masterful tide of revenge waved over him. The keen edge of his mind then cut out sharp and trenchant thoughts. He must kill when and where he could. This man could hardly be Ellen Jorth's father. Jorth would be with the main crowd, directing hostilities. Jean could shoot this rustler guard, and his shot would be taken by the gang as the regular one from their comrade. Then swiftly Jean leveled his rifle, covered the dark form, grew cold and set, and pressed the trigger. After the report, he rose and wheeled away. He did not look nor listen for the result of his shot. A clammy sweat wet his face, the hollow of his hands, his breasts. A horrible, leaden, thick sensation oppressed his heart. Nature had endowed him with Indian gifts, but the exercise of them to this end caused a revolt in his soul. Nevertheless, it was the Isbel blood that dominated him. The wind blew cool on his face. The burden upon his shoulders seemed to lift. The clamoring whispers grew fainter in his ears. And by the time he had retraced his cautious steps back to the orchard, all his physical being was strung to the task at hand. Something had come between his reflective self and this man of action. Crossing the lane, he took to the west line of sheds and passed beyond them into the meadow. In the grass he crawled silently away to the right, using the same precaution that had actuated him on the slope. Only here he did not pause so often, nor move so slowly. Jean aimed to go far enough to the right to pass the end of the embankment behind which the rustlers had found such efficient cover. This ditch had been made to keep water during the spring thaws and summer storms from pouring off the slope to flood the corrals. Jean miscalculated and found he had come upon the embankment somewhat to the left of the end, which fact, however, caused him no uneasiness. He lay there a while to listen. Again he heard voices. After a time, a shot pealed out. He did not see the flash, but he calculated that it had come from the north side of the cabins. The next quarter of an hour discovered to Jean that the nearest guard was firing from the top of the embankment, perhaps a hundred yards distant, and a second one was performing the same office from a point apparently only a few yards further on two rustlers close together. Jean had not calculated upon that. For a while he pondered on what was best to do, and at length decided to crawl round behind them and as close as the situation made advisable. He found the ditch behind the embankment a favorable path by which to stalk these enemies. It was dry and sandy, with borders of high weeds. The only drawback was that it was almost impossible for him to keep from brushing against the dry, invisible branches of the weeds. To offset this, he wormed his way like a snail, inch by inch, taking a long time before he caught sight of the sitting figure of a man, black against a dark blue sky. This rustler had fired his rifle three times during Jean's slow approach. Jean watched and listened for a few moments, then wormed himself closer and closer, until the man was within twenty steps of him. Jean smelled tobacco smoke, but he could see no light of pipe or cigarette, because the fellow's back was turned. "'Say, Ben,' said this man to his companion, sitting hunched up a few yards distant. "'Sure it strikes me queer that Summers ain't shooting over there.' Jean recognized the dry, drawling voice of Greaves, and the shock of it seemed to contract the muscles of his whole thrilling body, like that of a panther about to spring. End of Chapter 7 Part 2《Section 15 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray》this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, Part 1 
was sure thinking that same, said the other man. And say, didn't that last shot sound too sharp for Summers, 45? Come to think of it, I reckon it did, replied Greaves. Well, I'll go around over there and see. The dark form of the rustler slipped out of sight over the embankment. Better go slow and careful, warned Greaves, and only go close enough to call Summers. Maybe that damned half-breed Isbel is coming some engine on us. Jean heard the soft swish of footsteps through the wet grass. Then all was still. He lay flat with his cheek on the sand, and he had to look ahead and upward to make out the dark figure of Greaves on the bank. One way or another, he meant to kill Greaves, and he had the willpower to resist the strongest gust of passion that had ever stormed his breast. If he arose and shot the rustler, the act would defeat his plan of slipping on around upon the other outposts, who were firing at the cabins. Jean wanted to call softly to Greaves. You're right about the half-breed. And then, as he wheeled aghast, to kill him as he moved. But it suited Jean to risk leaping upon the man. Jean did not waste time in trying to understand the strange, deadly instinct that gripped him at the moment. But he realized then he had chosen the most perilous plan to get rid of Greaves. Jean drew a long, deep breath and held it. He let go of his rifle. He rose silently as a lifting shadow. He drew the bowie knife. Then, with light, swift bounds, he glided up the bank. Greaves must have heard a rustling, a soft, quick pad of moccasins, for he turned with a start. At that instant, Jean's left arm darted like a striking snake around Greaves's neck and closed tight and hard. With his right hand free, holding the knife, Jean might have ended the deadly business in just one move. But when his bared arm felt the hot, bulging neck, something terrible burst out of the depths of him. To kill this enemy of his father's was not enough. Physical contact had unleashed the savage soul of the Indian. Yet there was more. And as Jean gave the straining body a tremendous jerk backward, he felt the same strange thrill, the dark joy that he had known when his fist had smashed the face of Sim Bruce. Greaves had leered. He had corroborated Bruce's vile insinuation about Ellen Jorth. So it was more than hate that actuated Jean Isbel. Greaves was heavy and powerful. He whirled himself feet first over backward in a lunge like that of a lassoed steer. But Jean's hold held. They rolled down the bank into the sandy ditch, and Jean landed uppermost, with his body at right angles with that of his adversary. Greaves, your hunch was right, hissed Jean. It's the half-breed, and I'm going to cut you, first for Ellen Jorth, and then for Gaston Isbel. Jean gazed down into the gleaming eyes. Then his right arm whipped the big blade. It flashed, it fell, low down, as far as Jean could reach. It entered Greaves's body. All the heavy, muscular frame of Greaves seemed to contract and burst. His spring was that of an animal in terror and agony. It was so tremendous that it broke Jean's hold. Greaves let out a strangled yell that cleared, swelling wildly, with a hideous mortal note. He wrestled free. The big knife came out. Supple and swift, he got to his knees. He had his gun out when Jean reached him again. Like a bear, Jean enveloped him. Greaves shot, but he could not raise the gun nor twist it far enough. Then Jean, letting go with his right arm, swung the buoy. Greaves' strength went out in an awful hoarse cry. His gun boomed again, then dropped from his hand. He swayed. Jean let go. And that enemy of the Isbels sank limply in the ditch. Jean's eyes roved for his rifle and caught the starlit gleam of it. Snatching it up, he leaped over the embankment and ran straight for the cabins. From all around, yells of the Jorth faction attested to their excitement and fury. A fence loomed up, gray in the obscurity. Jean vaulted it darted across the lane into the shadow of the corral, and soon gained the first cabin. 
Here he leaned to regain his breath. His heart pounded high and seemed too large for his breast. The hot blood beat and surged all over his body. Sweat poured off him. His teeth were clenched tight as a vice, and it took effort on his part to open his mouth so he could breathe more freely and deeply. But these physical sensations were as nothing compared to the tumult of his mind. Then the instinct, the spell, let go its grip, and he could think. He had avenged Guy. He had depleted the ranks of the Jorths. He had made good the brag of his father, all of which afforded him satisfaction. But these thoughts were not accountable for all that he felt, especially for the bitter, sweet sting of the fact that death to the defier of Ellen Jorth could not efface the doubt, the regret, which seemed to grow with the hours. Groping his way into the woodshed, he entered the kitchen, and calling low, he went on into the main cabin. "'Jean, Jean!' came his father's shaking voice. "'Yes, I'm back,' replied Jean. "'Are you all right?' "'Yes. I think I've got a bullet crease on my leg. I didn't know I had it till now. It's bleeding a little, but it's nothing.' Jean heard soft steps, and someone reached shaking hands for him. They belonged to his sister Anne. She embraced him. Jean felt the heave and throb of her breast. "'Why, Anne, I'm not hurt,' he said, and held her close. "'Now you lie down and try to sleep.' In the black darkness of the cabin, Jean led her back to the corner, and his heart was full. Speech was difficult, because the very touch of Anne's hands had made him divine that the success of his venture in no wise changed the plight of the women. "'Well, what happened out there?' demanded Blaisdell. "'I got two of them,' replied Jean. The fellow who was shooting from the ridge west, and the other was Greaves.' "'Ha!' exclaimed his father. "'Sure then it was Greaves yelling,' declared Blaisdell. "'By God, I never heard such yells. What'd you do, Jean?' I knifed him, you see. I'd planned to slip up on one after another, and I didn't want to make a noise. But I didn't get any farther than Greaves. Well, I reckon that'll end their shooting in the dark, muttered Gaston Isbel. We've got to be on the lookout for something else. Fire, most likely. The old rancher's surmise proved to be partially correct. Jorth's faction ceased the shooting. Nothing further was seen or heard from them. But this silence and apparent break in the siege was harder to bear than deliberate hostility. The long, dark hours dragged by. The men took turns watching and resting, but none of them slept. At last the blackness paled, and gray dawn stole out of the east. The sky turned rose over the distant range, and daylight came. The children awoke, hungry and noisy, having slept away their fears. The women took advantage of the quiet morning hour to get a hot breakfast. "'Maybe they've gone away,' suggested Guy Isabel's wife, peering out of the window. She had done that several times since daybreak. Jean saw her somber gaze search the pasture until it rested upon the dark, prone shape of her dead husband lying face down in the grass. Her look worried Jean. No, Esther, they've not gone yet, replied Jean. I seen some of them out there at the edge of the brush. Blaisdell was optimistic. He said Jean's night work would have its effect and that the Jorth contingent would not renew the siege very determinedly. It turned out, however, that Blaisdell was wrong. Directly after sunrise, they began to pour volleys from four sides and from closer range. During the night, Jorth's gang had thrown earth banks and constructed log breastworks, from behind which they were now firing. Jean and his comrades could see the flashes of fire and streaks of smoke to such good advantage that they began to return the volleys. In half an hour, the cabin was so full of smoke that Jean could not see the womanfolk in the corner. The fierce attack then abated somewhat, and the firing became more intermittent, and therefore more carefully aimed. A glancing bullet cut a furrow in Blaisdell's hoary head, 
making a painful though not serious wound. It was Esther Isabel who stopped the flow of blood and bound Blaisdell's head, a task which she performed skillfully and without a tremor. The old Texan could not sit still during this operation. Sight of the blood on his hands, which he tried to rub off, appeared to inflame him to a great degree. Isabel, we got to go out there, he kept repeating, and kill them all. No, we're going to stay here, replied Gaston Isabel. Sure I'm looking for Blue and Fredericks and Gordon to open up out there. They ought to be here. And if they are, you sure can bet they've got the fight sized up. Isabel's hopes did not materialize. The shooting continued without any lull until about midday. Then the Jorth faction stopped. Well, what's up now? queried Isabel. Boys, hold your fire and let's wait. Gradually the smoke wafted out of the windows and doors, until the room was once more clear. And at this juncture, Esther Isbel came over to take another gaze out upon the meadows. Jean saw her suddenly start violently, then stiffen, with a trembling hand outstretched. Look, she cried. Esther, get back, ordered the old rancher. Keep away from that window. What the hell, muttered Blaisdell. She sees something or she's gone dotty. Esther seemed turned to stone. Look, the hogs have broken into the pasture. They'll eat Guy's body. Everyone was frozen with horror at Esther's statement. Jean took a swift survey of the pasture. A bunch of big black hogs had indeed appeared on the scene and were rooting around in the grass not far from where lay the bodies of Guy Isbel and Jacobs. The herd of hogs belonged to the rancher and was allowed to run wild. "'Jane, those hogs,' stammered Esther Isbel, to the wife of Jacobs. "'Come, look. Do you know anything about hogs?' The woman ran to the window and looked out. She stiffened, as had Esther. "'Dad, will those things eat human flesh?' queried Jean breathlessly. The old man stared out of the window. Surprise seemed to hold him. A completely unexpected situation had staggered him. Jean, can you, can you shoot that far? he asked huskily. To those hogs? No, it's out of range. Then by God, we've got to stay trapped in here and watch an awful sight, ejaculated the old man, completely unnerved. See the break in the fence? Jorth's done that to let in the hogs. Ah, oh, Isbel. It's not so bad as all that, remonstrated Blaisdell, wagging his bloody head. Jorth wouldn't do such a hell-bent trick. It sure done. Well, maybe the hogs won't find Guy and Jacobs, returned Blaisdell, weakly. Plain it was that he only hoped for such a contingency and certainly doubted it. Look, cried Esther Isbel piercingly. They're working straight up the pasture. Indeed, the John had appeared to be the fatal truth. He looked blankly, feeling a little sick. Anne Isbel came to peer out of the window, and she uttered a cry. Jacob's wife stood mute, as if dazed. Blaisdell swore a mighty oath. Isbel, we can't stand here and watch them hogs eat our people. Well, we'll have to. What else on earth can we do? Esther turned to the men. She was white and cold except her eyes, which resembled gray flames. Somebody can run out there and bury our dead men, she said. Why, child, it'd be sure death. You saw what happened to Guy and Jacobs. We just got to bear it. Sure, nobody needn't look out and see. Jean wondered if it would be possible to keep from watching. The thing had a horrible fascination. The big hogs were rooting and tearing in the grass, some of them lazy, others nimble, and all were gradually working closer and closer to the bodies. The leader, a huge gaunt boar that had fared ill all his life in this barren country, was scarcely fifty feet away from where Guy Isbel lay. And get me some of your clothes and a sunbonnet quick, said Jean, forced out of his lethargy. I'll run out there disguised. Maybe I can go through with it. 
No, ordered his father positively and with dark face flaming. Guy and Jacobs are dead. We can't help them now. But Dad, pleaded Jean. He had been wrought to a pitch by Esther's blaze of passion, by the agony in the face of the other woman. I tell you no, thundered Gaston Isbel, flinging his arms wide. I will go, cried Esther, her voice ringing. You won't go alone, instantly answered the wife of Jacobs, repeating unconsciously the words her husband had spoken. You stay right here, shouted Gaston Isbel hoarsely. I'm going, replied Esther. You've no hold over me. My husband is dead. No one can stop me. I'm going out there to drive those hogs away and bury him. Esther, for heaven's sakes, listen, replied Isbel. If you show yourself outside, Jorth and his gang will kill you. They may be mean, but no white man could be so low as that. Then they pleaded with her to give up her purpose, but in vain. She pushed them back and ran out through the kitchen with Jacob's wife following her. Jean turned to the window in time to see both women run out into the lane. Jean looked fearfully and listened for shots, but only a loud haw-haw came from the watchers outside. That coarse laugh relieved the tension in Jean's breast. Possibly the Jorths were not as black as his father painted them. The two women entered an open shed and came forth with a shovel and a spade. Sure they've got to hurry, burst out Gaston Isbel. Shifting his gaze, John understood the import of his father's speech. The leader of the hogs had no doubt scented the body. Suddenly he espied them and broke into a trot. Run, Esther, run, yelled John with all his might. That urged the woman to flight. Jean began to shoot. The hog reached the body of Guy. Jean's shots did not reach nor frighten the beast. All the hogs now had caught a scent and went ambling toward their leader. Esther and her companion passed swiftly out of sight behind a corral. Loud and piercingly, with some awful note, rang out their screams. The hogs appeared frightened. The leader lifted his long snout, looked, and turned away. The others had halted. They too wheeled and ran off. All was silent then in the cabin, and also outside, wherever the Jorth faction lay concealed. All eyes manifestly were fixed upon the brave wives. They spaded up the sod and dug a grave for Guy Isbel. For a shroud, Esther wrapped him in her shawl. Then they buried him. Next they hurried to the side of Jacob's, who lay some yards away. They dug a grave for him. Mrs. Jacobs took off her outer skirt to wrap round him. Then the two women labored hard to lift and lower him. Jacobs was a heavy man. When he had been covered, his widow knelt beside the grave. Esther went back to the other, but she remained standing and did not look as if she prayed. Her aspect was tragic that of a woman who had lost father, mother, sisters, brother, and now her husband in this bloody Arizona land. The deed and demeanor of these wives of the murdered men surely must have shamed Jorth and his followers. They did not fire a shot during the ordeal, nor give any sign of their presence. Inside the cabin, all were silent too. Jean's eyes blurred, so that he continually had to wipe them. Old Isbel made no effort to hide his tears. Blaisdell nodded his shaggy head and swallowed hard. The woman sat staring into space. The children, in round-eyed dismay, gazed from one to the other of their elders. "'Well, they're coming back,' declared Isbel, in immense relief. "'And so help me, Jorth let them bury their dead.' The fact seemed to have been monstrously strange to Gaston Isbel. When the women entered, the old man said brokenly, I'm sure glad, and I reckon I was wrong to oppose you, and wrong to say what I did about Jorth. No one had any chance to reply to Isbel, for the Jorth gang, as if to make up for lost time and surcharged feelings of shame, renewed the attack with such a persistence and furious volleying 
that the defenders did not risk a return shot. They all had to lie flat next to the lowest log in order to keep from being hit. Bullets rained in through the window, and all the clay between the logs low down was shot away. This fusillade lasted for more than an hour. Then gradually the fire diminished on one side and then on the other until it became desultory and finally ceased. Uh-huh. Sure they've shot their bolt, declared Gaston Isbel. Well, I don't know about that, returned Blaisdell, but they shot a hell of a lot of shells. Listen, suddenly called Jean. Somebody's yelling. End of Chapter 8, Part 1「Section sixteen of to the last man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight, part two. Hey, Isbel came in loud, hoarse voice. Let your women fight for you. Gaston Isbel sat up with a start, and his face turned livid. Jean needed no more to prove that the derisive voice from outside had belonged to Jorth. The old rancher lunged up to his full height, and with reckless disregard of life, he rushed to the window. Jorth, he roared, I dare you to meet me man to man. This elicited no answer. Jean dragged his father away from the window. After that, a waiting silence ensued, gradually less fraught with suspense. Blaisdell started conversation by saying he believed the fight was over for that particular time. No one disputed him. Evidently, Gaston Isbel was loath to believe it. Jean, however, watching at the back of the kitchen, eventually discovered that the Jorth gang had lifted the siege. Jean saw them congregate at the edge of the brush, somewhat lower down than they had been the day before. A team of mules drawn a wagon appeared on the road and turned toward the slope. Saddled horses were led down out of the junipers. Jean saw bodies, evidently of dead men, lifted into the wagon to be hauled away toward the village. Seven mounted men, leading four riderless horses, rode out into the valley and followed the wagon. Dad, they're gone, declared Jean. We had the best of this fight. If only Guy and Jacobs had listened. The old man nodded moodily. He had aged considerably during these two trying days. His hair was grayer. Now that the blaze and glow of the fight had passed, he showed a subtle change, a fixed and morbid sadness, a resignation to a fate he had accepted. The ordinary routine of ranch life did not return for the Isbels. Blaisdell returned home to settle matters there so that he could devote all his time to this feud. Gaston Isbel sat down to wait for the members of his clan. The male members of the family kept guard and turn over the ranch that night. Another day dawned. It brought word from Blaisdell that Blue, Fredericks, Gordon, and Colmer were all at his house on the way to join the Isbels. This news appeared greatly to rejuvenate Gaston Isbel but his enthusiasm did not last long. Impatient and moody by turns, he paced or moped around the cabin, always looking out, sometimes toward Blaisdell's ranch, but mostly toward Grass Valley. It struck Jean as singular that neither Esther Isbel nor Mrs. Jacobs suggested a reburial of their husbands. The two bereaved women did not ask for assistance, but repaired to the pasture and there spent several hours working over the graves. They raised mounds, which they sodded, and then placed stones at the heads and feet. Lastly, they fenced in the graves. "'I reckon I'll hitch up and drive back home,' said Mrs. Jacobs, when she returned to the cabin. "'I've much to do in plan. Probably I'll go to my mother's home. She's old and will be glad to have me.' If I had any place to go, I'd sure go, declared Esther Isbel bitterly. Gaston Isbel heard this remark. He raised his face from his hands, evidently both nettled and hurt. 
Esther, sure that's not kind, he said. The red-haired woman, for she did not appear to be a girl any more, halted before his chair and gazed down at him with a terrible flare of scorn in her gray eyes. Gaston Isbel, all I got to say to you is this, she retorted, with the voice of a man. Seeing that you and Lee Jorth hate each other, why couldn't you act like men? You damned Texans with your bloody feuds, dragging in every relation, every friend to murder each other. That's not the way of Arizona men. We've all got to suffer, and we women be ruined for life. Because you had differences with Jorth. If you were half a man, you'd go out and kill him yourself, and not leave a lot of widows and orphaned children. Jean himself writhed under the lash of her scorn. Gaston Isbel turned a dead white. He could not answer her. He seemed stricken with merciless truth. Slowly dropping his head, he remained motionless, a pathetic and tragic figure, and he did not stir until the rapid beat of hoofs denoted the approach of horsemen. Blaisdell appeared on his white charger, leading a pack animal, and behind him rode a group of men, all heavily armed, and likewise with packs. "'Get down and come in,' was Isbel's greeting. "'Bill, you look after their packs. Better leave the horses saddled.' The booted and spurred riders trooped in, and their demeanor fitted their errand. Jean was acquainted with all of them. Fredericks was a lanky Texan, the color of dust, and he had yellow, clear eyes like those of a hawk. His mother had been an Isbel. Gordon, too, was related to Jean's family, though distantly. He resembled an industrious miner more than a prosperous cattleman. Blue was the most striking of the visitors, as he was the most noted a little shrunken gray-eyed man with years of cowboy written all over him. But he looked the quiet, easy, cool, and deadly Texan he was reputed to be. Blue's Texas record was shady and was seldom alluded to, as unfavorable comment had turned out to be hazardous. He was the only one of the group who did not carry a rifle, but he packed two guns, a habit not often noted in Texans, and almost never in Arizonians. Comer, Anne Isabel's fiancé, was the youngest member of the clan, and the one closest to Jean. His meeting with Anne affected Jean powerfully, and brought to a climax an idea that had been developing in Jean's mind. His sister devotedly loved this lean-faced, keen-eyed Arizonian, and it took no great insight to discover that Calmer reciprocated her affection. They were young. They had long life before them. It seemed to Jean a pity that Calmer should be drawn into this war. Jean watched them as they conversed apart, and he saw Anne's hands creep up to Calmer's breast, and he saw her dark eyes, eloquent, hungry, fierceful, lifted with queries her lips did not speak. Jean stepped beside them, and laid an arm over both their shoulders. "'Colmer, for Anne's sake, you'd better back out of this jorth Isbel fight,' he whispered. Colmer looked insulted. "'But, Jean, it's Anne's father,' he said. "'I'm almost one of the family.' "'You're Anne's sweetheart, and by heaven, I say you oughtn't to go with us,' whispered Jean. "'Go with you?' faltered Anne. "'Yes.' Dad's going straight after Jorth, can't you tell that? And there'll be one hell of a fight. Anne looked up into Colmer's face with all her soul in her eyes, but she did not speak. Her look was noble. She yearned to guide him right, yet her lips were sealed. And Colmer betrayed the trouble of his soul. The code of men held him bound, and he could not break from it, though he divined in that moment how truly it was wrong. "'Jean, your dad started me in the cattle business,' said Colmer, earnestly, "'and I'm doing well now. "'And when I asked him for Anne, "'he said he'd be glad to have me in the family. "'Well, when this talk of fight come up, "'I asked your dad to let me go in on his side. "'He wouldn't hear of it. "'But after a while, as the time passed, "'and he made more enemies, "'he finally consented.' 
I reckon he needs me now, and I can't back out, not even for Anne. I would if I were you, replied Jean, and he knew that he lied. Jean, I'm gambling to come out of the fight, said Calmer with a smile. He had no morbid fears nor presentiments such as troubled Jean. Why, sure, you stand as good a chance as anyone, rejoined Jean. It wasn't that I was worrying about so much. What was it then? asked Anne steadily. If Andrew does come through alive, he'll have blood on his hands, returned Jean with passion. He can't come through without it. I've begun to feel what it means to have killed my fellow men, and I'd rather your husband and the father of your children never felt that. Colmer did not take Jean as subtly as Anne did. She shrunk a little. Her dark eyes dilated. But Colmer showed nothing of her spiritual reaction. He was young. He had wild blood. He was loyal to the Isbels. Jean, never worry about my conscience, he said with a keen look. Nothing would tickle me any more than to get a shot at every damned one of the Jorths. That established Colmer's status in regard to the Jorth-Isabel feud. Jean had no more to say. He respected Anne's friend and felt poignant sorrow for Anne. Gaston Isabel called for meat and drink to be set on the table for his guests. When his wishes had been complied with, the women took the children into the adjoining cabin and shut the door. Ah, well, we can eat and talk now. First the newcomers wanted to hear particulars of what had happened. Blaisdell had told all he knew and had seen, but that was not sufficient. They plied Gaston and Isbel with questions. Laboriously and ponderously, he rehearsed the experiences of the fight at the ranch, according to his impressions. Bill Isbel was exhorted to talk, but he had of late manifested a sullen and taciturn disposition. In spite of Jean's vigilance, Bill had continued to imbibe red liquor. Then Jean was called upon to relate all he had seen and done. It had been Jean's intention to keep his mouth shut, first for his own sake, and secondly, because he did not like to talk of his deeds. But when thus appealed to by these somber-faced, intent-eyed men, he divined that the more carefully he described the cruelty and baseness of their enemies, and the more vividly he presented his participation in the first fight of the feud, the more strongly he would bind these friends to the Isbel cause. So he talked for an hour, beginning with his meeting with Coulter up on the rim, and ending with an account of his killing Greaves. His listeners sat through this long narrative with unabated interest, and at the close they were leaning forward, breathless and tense. "'Ah, so Greaves got his deserts at last,' exclaimed Gordon. All the men around the table made comments, and the last from Blue was the one that struck Jean forcibly. "'Sure, that was a strange and a hell of a way to kill Greaves. Why'd you do that, Jean?' "'I told you. I wanted to avoid noise, and I hoped to get more of them.' Blue nodded his lean, eagle-like head and sat thoughtfully, as if not convinced of anything, save John's prowess. After a moment, Blue spoke again. Then going back to John's telling about rustled cattle, I've got this to say. I've long suspected that someone living right here in the valley has been driving off cattle and dealing with rustlers, and now I'm sure of it. The speech did not elicit the amaze of Gaston Isbel that Jean expected it would. You mean Greaves or some of his friends? No, they wasn't none of them in the cattle business like we are. Sure, we all knowed Greaves was crooked, but what I'm figuring is that some so-called honest man in our settlement has been making crooked deals. Blue was a man of deeds rather than words, and so much strong speech from him whom everyone knew to be remarkably reliable and keen, made a profound impression upon most of the Isbel faction. But to Jean's surprise, his father did not rave. It was Blaisdell who supplied the rage and invective. 
Bill Isbel, also, was strangely indifferent to this new element in the condition of cattle dealing. Suddenly Jean caught a vague flash of thought, as if he had intercepted the thought of another's mind, and he wondered, could his brother Bill know anything about this crooked work alluded to by Blue? Dismissing the conjecture, Jean listened earnestly. And if it's true, it sure makes this difference. We can't blame all the rustling on to Jorth, concluded Blue. Well, it's not true, declared Gaston Isbel roughly. Jorth and his hash knife gang are at the bottom of all the rustling in the valley for years back, and they've got to be wiped out. Isbel, I reckon we'd all feel better if we talk straight, replied Blue coolly. I'm here to stand by the Isbels, and you know what that means. But I'm not here to fight Jorth because he may be a rustler. The others may have their own reasons, but mine is this. You once stood by me in Texas when I was needing friends. Well, I'm standing by you now. Jorth is your enemy, and so he is mine. Gaston Isbel bowed to this ultimatum, scarcely less agitated than when Esther Isbel had denounced him. His rabid and morbid hate of Jorth had eaten into his heart to take possession there, like the parasite that battened upon the life of its victim. Blue's steely voice, his cold, gray eyes, showed the unbiased truth of the man, as well as his fidelity to his creed. Here again, but in a different manner, Gaston Isbel had the fact flung at him that other men must suffer, perhaps die, for his hate. And the very soul of the old rancher apparently rose in passionate revolt against the blind, headlong, elemental strength of his nature. So it seemed to Jean, who, in love and pity, that hourly grew, saw through his father. Was it too late? Alas, Gaston Isbel could never be turned back. Yet something was altering his brooding, fixed mind. Well, said Blaisdell gruffly, let's get down to business. I'm for having Blue to be foreman of this here outfit, and all of us to do as he says. Gaston Isbel opposed this selection and indeed resented it. He intended to lead the Isbel faction. All right, then. Give us a hunch what we're going to do, replied Blaisdell. We're going to ride off on Jorth's trail, and one way or another, kill him. Kill him. I reckon that'll end the fight. What did old Isbel have in his mind? His listeners shook their head. No, asserted Blaisdell. Killing Jorth might be the end of your desires, Isbel, but it'd never end our fight. We have gone too far. If we take Jorth's trail from here, it means we have to wipe out that rustler gang, or stay to the last man. Yes, by God, exclaimed Fredericks. Let's drink to that, said Blue. Strangely, they turned to this Texas gunman, instinctively recognizing him, the brain and heart and the past deeds that fitted him for the leadership of such a clan. Blue had all in his life to lose and nothing to gain, yet his spirit was such that he could not lean to all the possible gain of the future and leave a debt unpaid. Then his voice, his look, his influence were those of a fighter. They all drank with him, even Jean, who hated liquor. And this act of drinking seemed the climax of the council. Preparations were at once begun for their departure on Jorth's trail. Jean took but little time for his own needs, a horse, a blanket, a knapsack of meat and bread, a canteen and his weapons, with all the ammunition he could pack, made up his outfit. He wore his buckskin suit, leggings and moccasins. Very soon, the cavalcade was ready to depart. Jean tried not to watch Bill Isabel say goodbye to his children, but it was impossible not to. Whatever Bill was, as a man, he was father of those children, and he loved them. How strange that the little ones seemed to realize the meaning of this goodbye. They were grave, somber-eyed, pale up to the last moment, then they broke down and wept. Did they sense that their father would never come back? Jean caught that dark, fatalistic, 
presentiment. Bill Isbel's convulsed face showed that he also caught it. Jean did not see Bill say goodbye to his wife, but he heard her. Old Gaston Isabel forgot to speak to the children, or else could not. He never looked at them, and his goodbye to Anne was as if he were only riding to the village for a day. Jean saw a woman's love, woman's intuition, woman's grief in her eyes. He could not escape her. "'Oh, Jean, oh, brother,' she whispered, as she enfolded him. "'It's awful, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Goodbye. If killing must be, see that you kill the Jorths. Goodbye.' Even in Anne, gentle and mild, the Isbel blood spoke at the last. Jean gave Anne over to the pale-faced calmer, who took her in his arms. Then Jean fled out to his horse. This cold-blooded devastation of a home was almost more than he could bear. There was love here. What would be left? Colmer was the last one to come out to the horses. He did not walk erect, nor as one whose sight was clear. Then, as the silent, tense, grim men mounted their horses, Bill Isbel's oldest child, the boy, appeared in the door. His little form seemed instinct with a force vastly different from grief. His face was the face of an Isbel. "'Daddy, kill em all!' he shouted, with a passion all the fiercer for its incongruity to the treble voice. So the poison had spread from father to son. End of chapter 8, part 2section 17 of to the last man by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 9 part 1 half a mile from the isbel ranch the cavalcade passed the log cabin of everts father of the boy who attended sheep with bernardino it suited gaston isbel to halt here no need to call everts and his son appeared so quickly as to convince observers that they had been watching. "'Howdy, Jake,' said Isbel. "'I'm wanting a word with you alone.' "'Sure, boss, get down and come in,' replied Everts. Isabel led him aside, and said something forcible that John divined from the very gesture which accompanied it. His father was telling Everts that he was not to join the Isabel jorth War. Everts had worked for the Isbels a long time, and his faithfulness, along with something stronger and darker, showed in his rugged face as he stubbornly opposed his bell. The old man raised his voice. No, I tell you, and that settles it. They returned to the horses, and before mounting, Isbel, as if he remembered something, directed a somber gaze on young Everts. Son, did you bury Bernardino? "'Dad and me went over yesterday,' replied the lad. "'I sure was glad the coyotes hadn't been round. "'How about the sheep?' "'I left them there. "'I was going to stay, but being all alone I got scared. "'The sheep was doing fine. "'Good water and some grass. "'And this ain't the time for varmints to hang around.' "'Jake, keep your eye on that flock,' returned Isabel. "'And if I shouldn't happen to come back, you can call the sheep yours.' I'd like your boy to ride up to the village, not with us, so anybody would see him, but afterwards. We'll be at Abel, Meekers. Again John was confronted with an uneasy premonition as to some idea or plan his father had not shared with his followers. When the cavalcade started on again, John rode to his father's side and asked him why he had wanted the Everts boy to come to Grass Valley. And the old man replied that, as the boy could run to and fro in the village without danger, he might be useful in reporting what was going on at Greaves's store, where undoubtedly the Jorth gang would hold forth. This appeared reasonable enough, therefore Jean smothered the objection he had meant to make. The valley road was deserted. When, a mile further on, the riders passed a group of cabins just on the outskirts of the village, Jean's quick eye caught sight of curious and evidently frightened people 
trying to see while they avoided being seen. No doubt the whole settlement was in a state of suspense and terror. Not unlikely this dark, closely grouped band of horsemen appeared to them as Jorth's gang had looked to Jean. It was an orderly, trotting march that manifested neither hurry nor excitement, but any western eye could have caught the singular aspect of such a group as if the intent of the riders was a visible thing. Soon they reached the outskirts of the village. Here their approach had been watched for or had been already reported. Jean saw men, women, children peeping from behind cabins and from half-open doors. Farther on, Jean espied the dark figures of men slipping out the back way through orchards and gardens and running north toward the center of the village. Could these be friends of the Jorth crowd? On the way with warnings of the approach of the Isbels. Jean felt convinced of it. He was learning that his father had not been absolutely correct in his estimation of the way Jorth and his followers were regarded by their neighbors. Not improbably, there were really many villagers who, being more interested in sheep raising than in cattle, had an honest leaning toward the Jorths. Some, too, no doubt, had leanings that were dishonest indeed, if not in sincerity. Gaston Isbel led his clan straight down the middle of the wide road of Grass Valley until he reached the point opposite Abel Meeker's cabin. Jean espied the same curiosity from behind Meeker's door and windows as had been shown all along the road. But presently, at Isbel's call, the door opened and a short, swarthy man appeared. He carried a rifle. Howdy, Gas, he said. What's the good word? Well, Abel, it's not good, but bad, and it sure has started, replied Isbel. I'm asking you to let me have your cabin. You're welcome. I'll send the folks round to Jim's, returned Meeker, and if you want me, I'm with you, Isbel. Thanks, Abel, but I'm not leading any more kin and friends into this here deal. Well, just as you say, but I'd like damn bad to join with you. My brother Ted was shot last night. Ted, is he dead? ejaculated Isbel blankly. We can't find out, replied Meeker. Jim says that Jeff Campbell said that Ted went into Greaves' place last night. Greaves was always friendly to Ted, but Greaves wasn't there. No, he sure wasn't, interrupted Isbel with a dark smile, and he never will be there again. Meeker nodded with slow comprehension, and a shade crossed his face. Well, Campbell claimed he heard from someone who was there. Anyway, the Jorths were drinking hard, and they raised a row with Ted. Same old sheep talk, and somebody shot him. Campbell said Ted was thrown out back, and he was sure he wasn't killed. Ah, oh, well, I'm sorry, Abel. Your family had to lose in this. Maybe Ted's not bad hurt. I sure hope so. And you and Jim keep out of the fight, anyway. All right, Isbel, but I reckon I'll give you a hunch. If this here fight lasts long, the whole damn basin will be in it, on one side or the other. Abel, you're talking sense, broke in Blaisdell, and that's why we're up here for quick action. I heard you got dags, whispered Meeker, as he peered all around. Well, you heard correct, drawled Blaisdell. Meeker muttered strong words into his beard. Say, was Daggs in that Jorth outfit? He was, but he walked right into Jean's forty-four, and I reckon his carcass would show some more. And where's Guy Isbel? demanded Meeker. Dead and buried, Abel, replied Gaston Isbel. And now I'd be obliged if you would hurry your folks away and let us have your cabin and corral. Have you got any hay for the horses? Sure, the barn's half full, replied Meeker as he turned away. Come on in. No, we'll wait till you've gone. When Meeker had gone, Isabel and his men sat their horses and looked about them and spoke low. Their advent had been expected, and the little town awoke to the imminence of the impending battle. Inside Meeker's house there was the sound of indistinct voices of women 
and the bustle incident to a hurried vacating. Across the wide road, people were peering out on all sides, some hiding, others walking to and fro from fence to fence, whispering in little groups. Down the wide road, at the point where it turned, stood Greaves's fort-like stone house, low, flat, isolated, with its dark, eye-like windows, it presented a forbidding and sinister aspect. Jean distinctly saw the forms of men, some dark, others in shirt-sleeves, come to the wide door and look down the road. Well, I reckon only about five hundred good horse steps are separating us from that outfit, drawled Blaisdell. No one replied to his jocularity. Gaston Isbel's eyes narrowed to a slit in his furrowed face, and he kept them fastened upon Greaves' store. Blue, likewise, had a somber cast of countenance, not, perhaps, any darker nor grimmer than those of his comrades, but more representative of intense preoccupation of mind. The look of him thrilled John, who could sense its deadliness, yet could not grasp any more. Altogether, the manner of the villagers and the watchful pacing to and fro of the Jorth followers and the silent boating front of Isbel and his men summed up for Jean the menace of the moment that must very soon change to a terrible reality. At a call from Meeker, who stood at the back of the cabin, Gaston Isbel rode into the yard, followed by the others of his party. "'Somebody look after the horses,' ordered Isbel, as he dismounted and took his rifle and pack. "'Better leave the saddles on, leastways, till we see what's coming off.' Jean and Bill Isbel led the horses back to the corral. While watering and feeding them, Jean somehow received the impression that Bill was trying to speak, to confide in him, to unburden himself of some load. This peculiarity of Bill's had become marked when he was perfectly sober. Yet he had never spoken or even begun anything unusual. Upon the present occasion, however, Jean believed that his brother might have gotten rid of his emotion, or whatever it was, had they not been interrupted by Colmer. Boys, the old man's orders are for us to sneak round on the three sides of Greaves's store, keeping out of gunshot till we find good cover, and then crawl closer to pick off any of Jorth's gang who shows himself. Bill Isabel strolled off without a reply to Colmer. Well, I don't think so much of that, said Jean ponderingly. Jorth has lots of friends here. Somebody might pick us off. I kicked, but the old man shut me up. He's not to be bucked again now. Struck me as powerful queer, but no wonder. Maybe he knows best. Did he say anything about what he and the rest of them are going to do? Nope. Blue taxed him with that, and he got the same as me. I reckon we'd better try it out, for a while anyway. Looks like he wants us to keep out of the fight, replied Jean thoughtfully. Maybe, though, Dad's no fool. Colmer, you wait here till I get out of sight. I'll go round and come up as close as advisable behind Greaves's store. You take the right side and keep hid. With that, Jean strode off, going around the barn, straight out of the orchard lane to the open flat, and then climbing a fence to the north of the village. Presently, he reached the line of sheds and corrals to which he held until he arrived at the road. This point was about a quarter of a mile from Greaves's store and around the bend. Jean sighted no one. The road, the fields, the yards, the backs of the cabins all looked deserted. A blight had settled down upon the peaceful activities of Grass Valley. Crossing the road, Jean began to circle until he came close to several cabins around which he made a wide detour. This took him to the edge of the slope, where brush and thickets afforded him a safe passage to a line directly back of Greaves's store. Then he turned toward it. Soon he was again approaching a cabin of that side, and some of its inmates descried him. Their action attested to their alarm. 
Jean half expected a shot from this quarter. Such were his growing doubts, but he was mistaken. A man, unknown to Jean, closely watched his guarded movements and then waved a hand, as if to signify to Jean that he had nothing to fear. After this act, he disappeared. Jean believed that he had been recognized by someone not antagonistic to the Isbels. Therefore he passed the cabin, and coming to a thick scrub oak tree that offered shelter, he hid there to watch. From this spot he could see the back of Greaves' store, at a distance probably too far for a rifle bullet to reach. Before him, as far as the store, on each side extended the village common. In front of the store ran the road. Jean's position was such that he could not command sight of this road down toward Meeker's house, a fact that disturbed him. Not satisfied with this stand, he studied his surroundings in the hope of espying a better, and he discovered what he thought would be a more favorable position, although he could not see much further down the road. Jean went back around the cabin, and coming out into the open to the right, he got the corner of Greaves's barn between him and the window of the store. Then he boldly hurried into the open, and soon reached an old wagon, from behind which he proposed to watch. He could not see either window or door of the store, but if any of the Jorth contingent came out the back way, they would be within reach of his rifle. Jean took the risk of being shot at from either side. So sharp and roving was his sight that he soon espied Colmer slipping along behind the trees some hundred yards to the left. All his efforts to catch a glimpse of Bill, however, were fruitless. And this appeared strange to Jean, for there were several good places on the right from which Bill could have commanded the front of Greaves's store and the whole west side. Colmer disappeared among some shrubbery and Jean seemed left alone to watch a deserted, silent village. Watching and listening, he felt that the time dragged, yet the shadows cast by the sun showed him that, no matter how tense he felt and how the moments seemed hours, they were really flying. Suddenly, Jean's ears rang with the vibrant shock of a rifle report. He jerked up, strung and thrilling. It came from in front of the store. It was followed by revolver shots, heavy booming. Three, he counted, and the rest were too close together to enumerate. A single hoarse yell pealed out, somehow trenchant and triumphant. Other yells, not so wild and strange, muffled the first one. Then silence clamped down on the store and the open square. Jean was deadly certain that some of the Jorth clan would show themselves. He strained to still the trembling, those sudden shots and that significant yell had caused him. No man appeared. No more sounds caught Jean's ears. The suspense, then, grew unbearable. It was not that he could not wait for an enemy to appear, but that he could not wait to learn what had happened. Every moment he stayed there with his hands like steel on his rifle, with eyes of a falcon, but added to the dreadful dark certainty of disaster. A rifle shot swiftly, followed by revolver shots. What could they mean? Revolver shots of different caliber, surely fired by different men. What could they mean? It was not these shots that accounted for Jean's dread, but the yell which had followed. All his intelligence and all his nerve were not sufficient to fight down the feeling of calamity and at last, yielding to it, he left his post and ran like a deer across the open, through the cabin yard and around the edge of the slope to the road. Here his caution brought him to a halt. Not a living thing crossed his vision. Breaking into a run, he soon reached the back of Meeker's place and entered the hurry forward to the cabin. Colmer was there in the yard, breathing hard, his face working, and in front of him crouched several of the men with rifles ready. The road to Jean's flashing glance was apparently deserted. Blue sat on the doorstep, lighting a cigarette. 
Then on the moment, Blaisdell strode to the door of the cabin. Jean had never seen him look like that. Jean, look down the road, he said brokenly, and with big hand shaking, he pointed down toward Greaves's store. Like lightning, Jean's glance shot down, 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 until it stopped to fix upon the prostrate form of a man lying in the middle of the road, a man of lengthy build, shirt-sleeved arms flung wide, white head in the dust, dead. Jean's recognition was as swift as his sight, his father. They had killed him, the Jorths. It was done. His father's premonition of death had not been false. And then, after these flashing thoughts, came a sense of blankness, momentarily almost oblivion, that gave place to a rending of the heart. The pain Jean had known only at the death of his mother. It passed this agonizing pang, and its icy pressure yielded to a rushing gust of blood, fiery as hell. "'Who did it?' whispered Jean. "'Jorth,' replied Blaisdell huskily. "'Son, we couldn't hold your dad back. We couldn't. He was like a lion, and he throwed his life away. Oh, if it hadn't been for that, it'd not be so awful. Sure, we come here to shoot and be shot, but not like that. By God, it was murder. Murder.' Jean's mute lips framed the query easily read. "'Tell him, Blue, I can't,' continued Blaisdell, and he tramped back into the cabin. "'Set down, Jean, and take things easy,' said Blue calmly. "'You know we all reckoned we'd get plugged one way or another in this deal, and sure it doesn't matter much how a fella gets it. All that ought to bother us is to make sure the other outfit bites the dust, same as your dad had to.' Under this man's tranquil presence, all the more quieting because it seemed so deadly sure and cool, Jean felt the uplift of his dark spirit, the acceptance of fatality, the mounting control of faculties that must wait. The little gunman seemed to have about his inert presence something that suggested a rattlesnake's inherent knowledge of its destructiveness. Jean sat down and wiped his clammy face. "'John, your dad reckoned to square accounts with Jorth, and save us all,' began Blue, puffing out a cloud of smoke. But he reckoned too late. Maybe years ago, or even not long ago, if he had called Jorth out man to man, there'd never been any Jorth-Isbel war. Gaston Isbel's conscience woke too late. That's how I figure it. "'Hurry, tell me how it happened,' panted John. "'Well,' A little while after you left, I seen your dad writing on a leaf he tore out of a book. Meeker's Bible, as you can see. I thought that was funny. And Blaisdell gave me a hunch. Pretty soon along comes young Everts. The old man calls him out of our hearing and talks to him. Then I see him give the boy something, which I afterward figured was what he wrote on the leaf out of the Bible. Me and Blaisdell both tried to get out of him what that meant, but not a word. I kept watching, and after a while, I seen young Everts slip out the back way. Maybe half an hour, I seen a bare-legged kid cross the road and go into Greaves' store. Then sure I tumbled to your dad. He sent a note to Jorth to come out and meet him face to face, man to man. Sure it was like reading what your dad had wrote. But I didn't say nothing to Blaisdell. I just watched. Blue drawed these last words, as if he enjoyed remembrance of his keen reasoning. A smile wreathed his thin lips. He drew twice on the cigarette and emitted another cloud of smoke. Quite suddenly then he changed. He made a rapid gesture, the whip of a hand, significant and passionate, and swift words followed. Colonel Lee Jorth stalked out of the store, out into the road, maybe a hundred steps. Then he halted. He wore his long black coat and his wide black hat, and he stood like a stone. What the hell, burst out Blaisdell, coming out of his trance. The rest of us just looked. I'd forgot your dad for a minute. So had all of us. But we remembered soon enough when we seen him stalk out. 
Everybody had a hunch then. I called him. Blaisdell begged him to come back. All the fellows had a say. No use. Then I sure cussed him and told him it was plain as day that Jorth didn't hit me like an honest man. I can sense such things. I knew Jorth had a trick up his sleeve. I've not been a gunfighter for nothing. Your dad had no rifle. He packed his gun at his hip. He just stalked down that road like a giant, going faster and faster, holding his head high. It sure was fine to see him, but I was sick. I heard Blaisdell groan and Frederick Starr cussed something fierce. When your dad halted, I reckon about fifty steps from Jorth, then we all went numb. I heard your dad's voice, then Jorth's. They cut like knives. You could sure hear the hate they had for each other. Blue had become a little husky. His speech had grown gradually to denote his feeling. Underneath his serenity, there was a different order of man. I reckon both your dad and Jorth went for their guns at the same time, an even break. But just as they drew, someone shot a rifle from the store. Must have been a forty-five seventy, a big gun. The bullet must have hit your dad low down, about the middle. He acted that way, sinking to his knees, and he was wild in shooting, so wild that he must have missed. Then he wobbled, and Jorth run in a dozen steps, shooting fast, till your dad fell over. Jorth run closer and bent over him. Then he straightened up with an Apache yell, if I ever heard one. And then Jorth back slow, looking all the time back to the store, and then went in. Blue's voice ceased. Jean seemed suddenly released from an impelling magnet that now dropped him to some numb, dizzy depth. Blue's lean face grew hazy. Then Jean bowed his head in his hands and sat there, while a slight tremor shook all his muscles at once. He grew deathly cold and deathly sick. This paroxysm slowly wore away, and Jean grew conscious of a dull amaze at the apparent deadness of his spirit. Blaisdell placed a huge, kindly hand on his shoulder. "'Brace up, son,' he said, with a voice now clear and resonant. "'Sure it's what your dad expected, and what we must all look for. If you was going to kill Jorth before, think how. Sure you're going to kill him now.' "'Blaisdell's talking,' put in Blue, and his voice had a cold ring. Lee Jorth will never see the sun rise again. These calls to the primitive in Jean, to the Indian, were not in vain. But even so, when the dark tide rose in him, there was still a haunting consciousness of the cruelty of the singular doom imposed upon him. Strangely, Ellen Jorth's face floated back in the depths of his vision, pale, fading, like the face of a spirit floating by. Blue said Blaisdell, let's get Isabel's body soon as we dare and bury it. Reckon we can right after dark. Sure, replied Blue, but you fellas figure that out. I'm thinking hard. I've got something on my mind. Jean grew fascinated by the looks and speech and action of the little gunman. Blue indeed had something on his mind and it boded ill to the men in that dark square stone house down the road. He paced to and fro in the yard, back and forth on the path to the gate, and then he entered the cabin to stalk up and down, faster and faster, until all at once he halted, as if struck, to upfling his right arm in a singular fierce gesture. "'Jean, call the men in,' he said tersely. They all filed in sinister and silent, with eager faces turned to the little Texan. His dominance showed markedly. End of chapter 9, part 1《Gordon, you stand in the door and keep your eye peeled,' went on Blue. "'Now, boys, listen. I've thought it all out. This game of man-hunting 
is the same to me as cattle raising is to you. And my life in Texas all comes back to me, I reckon, in good stead for us now. I'm going to kill Lee Jorth, him first, and maybe his brothers. I had to think of a good many ways before I hit on one I reckon will be sure. It's got to be sure. Jorth has got to die. Well, here's my plan. That Jorth outfit is drinking some. We can gamble on it. They're not going to leave that store, and of course, they'll be expecting us to start a fight. I reckon they'll look for some such siege as they held round Isbel's ranch. But we sure ain't going to do that. I'm going to surprise that outfit. There's only one man among them who is dangerous, and that's Queen. I know Queen, but he doesn't know me, and I'm going to finish my job before he gets acquainted with me. After that, all right? Blue paused a moment, his eyes narrowing down, his whole face setting in a hard cast of intense preoccupation, as if he visualized a scene of extraordinary nature. "'Well, what's your trick?' demanded Blaisdell. "'You all know Grease's store,' continued Blue, "'how them windows have wooden shutters that keep a light from showing outside. "'Well, I'm gambling that as soon as it's dark, Jorth's gang will be celebrating. "'They'll be drinking, and they'll have a light, and the windows will be shut. "'They're not going to worry none about us. "'That store is like a fort. It won't burn. "'And sure,' They'll never think of us charging them in there. Well, as soon as it's dark, we'll go round behind the lots and come up just across the road from Greaves's. I reckon we'd better leave Isbel where he lays till this fight's over. Maybe you'll have more and him to bury. We'll crawl behind them bushes in front of Coleman's yards. And here's where Jean comes in. He'll take an axe and his guns, of course, and do some of his engines sneaking round to the back of Greaves's store. And, Jean, you must do a slick job of this, but I reckon it'll be easy for you. Back there ought to be dark as pitch, for anyone looking out of the store, and I'm figuring you can take your time and crawl right up. Now, if you don't remember how Greaves's backyard looks, I'll tell you. Here Blue dropped on one knee to the floor, and with a finger... He traced a map of Greaves's barn and fence, the back door and window, and especially a break in the stone foundation, which led into a kind of cellar where Greaves stored wood and other things that could be left outdoors. Jean, I take particular pains to show you where this hole is, said Blue, because if the gang runs out, you can duck in there and hide, and if they run out into the yard, well, you'll make it a sorry run for them. When you've crawled up close to Greaves' back door and waited long enough to see and listen, then you're to run fast and swing your axe smash against the window. Take a quick peep in if you want to. It might help. Then jump quick and take a swing at the door. You'll be standing to one side, so if the gang shoots through the door, they won't hit you. Bang that door good and hard. Well, now's where I come in. When you swing that axe... I'll sure run to the front of the store. Jorth and his outfit will be some attentive to that pounding of yours on the back door, so I reckon, and they'll be looking that way. I'll run in, yell, and throw my guns on Jorth. Hump, is that all? ejaculated Blaisdell. I reckon that's all, and I'm figuring it's a hell of a lot, responded Blue, dryly. That's what Jorth will think. Where do we come in? "'Well, y'all can back me up,' replied Blue dubiously. "'You see, my plan goes as far as killing Jorth and maybe his brothers. "'Maybe I'll get a crack at Queen, but I'll be sure of Jorth. "'After that, all depends. "'Maybe it'll be easy for me to get out. "'And if I do, you fellas will know it and can fill that storeroom full of bullets.' "'Well, Blue, with all respect to you, I sure don't like your plan,' declared Blaisdell. Success depends on too many little things, any one of which might go wrong. Blaisdell, I reckon I know this here game better than you, replied Blue. A gunfighter goes by instinct. This trick will work. But suppose that front door of Greaves' store is barred, protested Blaisdell. 
It hasn't got any bar, said Blue. You sure? Yes, I reckon, replied Blue. Hell, man, ain't you taking a terrible chance, queried Blaisdell. Blue's answer to that was a look that brought blood to Blaisdell's face. Only then did the rancher really comprehend how the little gunman had taken such desperate chances before and meant to take them now, not with any hope or assurance of escaping with his life, but to live up to his peculiar code of honor. Blaisdell, did you ever hear of me in Texas? he queried dryly. Well, no, Blue. I can't swear I did, replied the rancher apologetically. And Isabel was always sort of mysterious about his acquaintance with you. My name's not Blue. Uh-huh. Well, what is it, then, if I'm safe to ask? returned Blaisdell gruffly. It's King Fisher, replied Blue. The shock that stiffened Blaisdell must have been communicated to the others. Jean certainly felt amaze, and some other emotion not fully realized, when he found himself face to face with one of the most notorious characters ever known in Texas, an outlaw long supposed to be dead. Men, I reckon I'd kept my secret if I had any idea of coming out of this Isabel Jorth war alive, said Blue. But I'm going to cash. I feel it here. Isabel was my friend. He saved me from being lynched in Texas. And so I'm going to kill Jorth. Now I'll take it kind of you, if any of you come out of this alive, to tell who I was and why I was on the Isbel side. Because this sheep and cattle war, this talk of Jorth and the Hash Knife Gang, it makes me sick. I know there's been crooked work on Isbel's side, too. And I never want it on record that I killed Jorth because he was a rustler. By God, Blue, it's late in the day for such talk, burst out Blaisdell in rage and amaze. But I reckon you know what you're talking about. Well, I sure don't want to hear it. At this juncture, Bill Isbel quietly entered the cabin, too late to hear any of Blue's statement. Jean was positive of that, for as Blue was speaking those last revealing words, Bill's heavy boots had resounded on the gravel path outside. Yet something in Bill's look, or in the way Blue averted his lean face, or in the entrance of Bill at that particular moment, all of these together seemed to Jean to add further mystery to the long secret causes leading up to the jorth Isbel War. Did Bill know what Blue knew? Jean had an inkling that he did, and on the moment, so perplexing and bitter, Jean gazed out of the door, down the deserted road, to where his dead father lay, white-haired and ghastly in the sunlight. Blue, you could have kept that to yourself, as well as your real name, interposed Jean with bitterness. It's too late now for either to do any good. But I appreciate your friendship for Dad, and I'm ready to help carry out your plan. That decision of John's appeared to put an end to protest or argument from Blaisdell or any of the others. Blue's fleeting dark smile was one of satisfaction. Thereupon, most of this group of men seemed to settle a grim restraint. They went out and walked and watched. They came in again, restless and somber. John thought that he must have bent his gaze a thousand times down the road to the tragic figure of his father. That sight roused all emotions in his breast, and the one that stirred there most was pity. The pity of it, Gaston Isbel lying face down in the dust of the village street. Patches of blood showed on the back of his vest and one white-sleeved shoulder. He had been shot through. Every time Jean saw this blood, he had to stifle a gathering of wild, savage impulses. Meanwhile, the afternoon hours dragged by, and the village remained as if its inhabitants had abandoned it. Not even a dog showed on the side of the road. Jorth and some of his men came out in front of the store and sat on the steps in close convening groups. Every move they made seemed significant of their confidence and importance. About sunset, they went back into the store 
closing door and window shutters. Then Blaisdell called the Isabel faction to have food and drink. Jean felt no hunger, and Blue, who had kept apart from the others, showed no desire to eat. Neither did he smoke, though early in the day he had never been without a cigarette between his lips. Twilight fell and darkness came. Not a light showed anywhere in the blackness. Well, I reckon it's about time, said Blue, and he led the way out of the cabin to the back of the lot. Jean strolled behind him, carrying his rifle and an axe. Silently, the other men followed. Blue turned to the left and led through the field until he came within sight of a dark line of trees. That's where the road turns off, he said to Jean, and here's the back of Coleman's place. Well, Jean, good luck. Jean felt the grip of a steel-like hand, and in the darkness he caught the gleam of Blue's eyes. Jean had no response in words for the laconic Blue, but he wrung the hard, thin hand and hurried away in the darkness. Once alone, his part of the business at hand rushed him into eager, thrilling action. This was the sort of work he was fitted to do. In this instance, it was important, but it seemed to him that Blue had coolly taken the perilous part. And this cowboy, with gray in his thin hair, was in reality the great King Fisher. Jean marveled at the fact, and he shivered all over for Jorth. In ten minutes, fifteen, more or less, Jorth would lie gasping bloody froth and sinking down. Something in the dark, lonely, silent, oppressive summer night told Jean this. He strode on swiftly. Crossing the road at a run, he kept on over the ground he had traversed during the afternoon, and in a few moments he stood breathing hard at the edge of the common behind Greaves's store. A point of light penetrated the blackness. It made Jean's heart leap. The Jorth contingent were burning the big lamp that hung in the center of Greaves's store. Jean listened. Loud voices and coarse laughter sounded, discord, on the melancholy silence of the night. What Blue had called his instinct had surely guided him aright. Death of Gaston Isbel was being celebrated by revel. In a few moments, Jean had regained his breath. Then all his faculties set intensely to the action at hand. He seemed to magnify his hearing and his sight. His movements made no sound. He gained the wagon, where he crouched a moment. The ground seemed a pale, obscure medium, hardly more real than the gloom above it. Through this gloom of night, which looked thick like a cloud, but was really clear, shone the thin, bright point of light, accentuating the black square that was Greaves's store. Above this stood a gray line of tree foliage, and then the intensely dark blue sky, studded with white, cold stars. A hound bayed lonesomely somewhere in the distance. Voices of men sounded more distinctly, some deep and low, others loud, unguarded, with a vacant note of thoughtlessness. Jean gathered all his forces, until sense of sight and hearing were in exquisite accord with the suppleness and lightness of his movements. He glided on about ten short, swift steps before he halted. That was as far as his piercing eyes could penetrate. If there had been a guard stationed outside the store, Jean would have seen him before being seen. He saw the fence, reached it, entered the yard, glided in the dense shadow of the barn, until the black square began to loom gray, the color of stone at night. Jean peered through the obscurity. No dark figure of a man showed against that gray wall, only a black patch, which must be the hole in the foundation mentioned. A ray of light now streaked out from the little black window. To the right showed the wide black door. Farther on, Jean glided silently. Then he halted. There was no guard outside. Jean heard the clink of a cap, the lazy draw of a Texan, and then a strong, harsh voice, Jorth's. 
It strung Jean's whole being tight and vibrating. Inside he was on fire, while cold thrills rippled over his skin. It took tremendous effort of will to hold himself back another instant to listen, to look, to feel, to make sure. And that instant charged him with a mighty current of hot blood, straining, throbbing, damning. When John leaped, this current burst. In a few swift bounds, he gained his point halfway between the door and window. He leaned his rifle against the stone wall. Then he swung the axe. Crash! The window shutter split and rattled to the floor inside. The silence then broke with a hoarse, What's that? With all his might, Jean swung the heavy axe on the door. Smash! The lower half caved in and banged to the floor. Bright light flared out of the hole. Look out, yelled a man in loud alarm. They're battering the back door. Jean swung again, high on the splintered door. Crash. Pieces flew inside. They've got axes, hoarsely shouted another voice. Shove the counter again the door. No, thundered a voice of authority. That denoted terror as well. Let them come in. Pull your guns and take cover. They ain't coming in, was the hoarse reply. They'll shoot in on us from the dark. Put out the lamp, yelled another. Jean's third heavy swing caved in part of the upper half of the door. Shouts and curses intermingled with the sliding of benches across the floor and the hard shuffle of boots. This confusion seemed to be split and silenced by a piercing yell of different caliber, of terrible meaning. It stayed Jean's swing caused him to drop the axe and snatch up his rifle. Don't anybody move. Like a steel whip, this voice cut the silence. It belonged to Blue. John swiftly bent to put his eye to a crack in the door. Most of those visible seemed to have frozen into unnatural positions. Jorth stood in front of his men, hatless and coatless, one arm outstretched, and his dark profile set toward a little man just inside the door. This man was Blue. Jean needed only one flashing look at Blue's face, at his leveled, quivering guns, to understand why he had chosen this trick. "'Who are you?' demanded Jorth, in husky pants. "'Reckon I'm Isbel's right-hand man,' came the biting reply. "'Once tolerable well-known in Texas. King Fisher.' The name must have been a guarantee of death. Jorth recognized this outlaw and realized his own fate. In the lamplight, his face turned a pale greenish-white. His outstretched hand began to quiver down. Blue's left gun seemed to leap up and flash red and explode. Several heavy reports merged almost as one. Jorth's arms jerked limply, flinging his gun and his body sagged in the middle. His hands fluttered like crippled wings and found their way to his abdomen. His death-pale face never changed its set look nor position toward Blue, but his gasping utterance was one of horrible mortal fury and terror. Then he began to sway, still with that strange rigid set of his face toward his slayer until he fell. His fall broke the spell. Even Blue, like the gunman he was, had paused to watch Jorth in his last mortal action. Jorth's followers began to draw and shoot. Jean saw Blue's return fire bring down a huge man who fell across Jorth's body. Then Jean, quick as the thought that actuated him, raised his rifle and shot at the big lamp. It burst in a flare. It crashed to the floor. Darkness followed, a blank, thick, enveloping mantle. Then red flashes of gun emphasized the blackness. Inside the store there broke loose a pandemonium of shots, yells, curses, and thudding boots. Jean shoved his rifle barrel inside the door, and holding it low down, he moved it to and fro while he worked lever and trigger until the magazine was empty. Then, drawing a six-shooter, he emptied that. A roar of rifles from the front of the store 
told Jean that his comrades had entered the fray. Bullets zipped through the door he had broken. Jean ran swiftly round the corner, taking care to sheer off a little to the left, and when he got clear of the building, he saw a line of flashes in the middle of the road. Blaisdell and the others were firing into the door of the store. With nimble fingers, Jean reloaded his rifle. Then swiftly he ran across the road and down to get behind his comrades. Their shooting had slackened. Jean saw dark forms coming his way. "'Hello, Blaisdell!' he cried warningly. "'That you, Jean?' returned the rancher, looming up. "'Well, we wasn't worried about you.' "'Blue?' queried Jean sharply. A little dark figure shuffled past Jean. "'Howdy, Jean,' said Blue dryly. "'You sure did your part. Reckon I'll need to be tied up, but I ain't hurt much.' "'Calmer's hit,' cried the voice of Gordon. "'A few yards' distance. Help me, somebody.' Jean ran to help Gordon uphold the swaying Colmer. "'Are you hurt bad?' asked Jean anxiously. The young man's head rolled and hung. He was breathing hard and did not reply. They almost had to carry him. "'Come on, men,' called Blaisdell, turning back toward the others who were still firing. "'We'll let well enough alone. Fredericks, you and Bill help me find the body of the old man. It's here somewhere.' Farther on down the road, the searchers stumbled over Gaston Isbel. They picked him up and followed Jean and Gordon, who were supporting the wounded Calmer. Jean looked back to see Blue dragging himself along in the rear. It was too dark to see distinctly. Nevertheless, Jean got the impression that Blue was more severely wounded than he had claimed to be. The distance to Meeker's cabin was not far, but it took what Jean felt to be a long and anxious time to get there. Colmer apparently rallied somewhat. When this procession entered Meeker's yard, Blue was lagging behind. "'Blue, how are you?' called Blaisdell with concern. "'Well, I got my boots on anyhow,' replied Blue huskily. He lurched into the yard and slid down on the grass and stretched out. "'Man, you're hurt bad,' exclaimed Blaisdell. The others halted in their slow march, and, as if, by tacit, unspoken word, lowered the body of Isbel to the ground. Then Blaisdell knelt beside Blue. Jean left calmer to Gordon and hurried to peer down into Blue's dim face. "'No, I ain't hurt,' said Blue, in a much weaker voice. "'I'm just killed. It was Queen. You heard me Queen was only a bad man in that lot. I knowed it. I could have killed him, but I was after Lee Jorth and his brothers. Blue's voice failed there. Well, ejaculated Blaisdell. Sure was funny, Jorth's face, when I said Kingfisher, whispered Blue. Funnier, when I bored him through. But it was Queen. His whisper died away. Blue called Blaisdell sharply. Receiving no answer, he bent lower in the starlight and placed a hand upon the man's breast. Well, he's gone. I wonder if he really was the old Texas Kingfisher. No one would ever believe it. But if he killed the Jorths, I'll sure believe him. End of Chapter 9, Part 2「Section 19 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10, Part 1 Two weeks of lonely solitude in the forest had worked incalculable change in Ellen Jorth. Late in June her father and her two uncles had packed and ridden off with Dags, Coulter, and six other men, all heavily armed, some somber, with drink, others hard and grim, with a foretaste of fight. Ellen had not been given any orders. Her father had forgotten to bid her goodbye or had avoided it. Their dark mission was stamped on their faces. They had gone, and, keen as had been Ellen's pang, nevertheless their departure was a relief. She had heard them bluster and brag so often that she had her doubts of any great Jorth-Isbel war. 
barking dogs did not bite. Somebody, perhaps on each side, would be badly wounded, possibly killed, and then the feud would go on as before, mostly talk. Many of her former impressions had faded. Development had been so rapid and continuous in her that she could look back to a day-by-day -day transformation. At night she had hated the sight of herself, and when dawn came she would rise, singing. Jorth had left Ellen at home with the Mexican woman and Antonio. Ellen saw them only at mealtimes, and often not then, for she frequently visited old John Sprague, or came home late to do her own cooking. It was but a short distance up to Sprague's cabin, and since she had stopped riding the black horse, Spades, she walked. Spades was accustomed to having grain, and in the mornings he would come down to the ranch and whistle. Ellen had vowed she would never feed the horse, and bade Antonio do it. But one morning Antonio was absent. She fed Spades herself. When she laid a hand on him, and when he rubbed his nose against her shoulder, she was not quite so sure she hated him. Why should I, she queried. A horse can't help it if he belongs to, to. Ellen was not sure of anything, except more and more it grew good to be alone. A whole day in the lonely forest passed swiftly, yet it left a feeling of long time. She lived by her thoughts. Always the morning was bright, sunny, sweet, and fragrant and colorful, and her mood was pensive, wistful, dreamy. And always, just as surely as the hours passed, thought intruded upon her happiness, and thought brought memory, and memory brought shame, and shame brought fight. Sunset after sunset, she had dragged herself back to the ranch, sullen and sick and beaten. Yet she never ceased to struggle. The July storms came, and the florist floor, that had been so sear and brown and dry and dusty, changed as if by magic. The green grass shot up, the flowers bloomed, and along the canyons beds of lacy ferns swayed in the wind and bent their graceful tips over the amber-colored waters. Ellen haunted these cool dells, these pine-shaded, mossy-rocked ravines, where the brooks tinkled and the deer came down to drink. She wandered alone, but there grew to be company in the aspens and the music of the little waterfalls. If she could have lived in that solitude always, never returning to the ranch home that reminded her of her name, she could have forgotten and have been happy. She loved the storms. It was a dry country, and she had learned through years to welcome the creamy clouds that rolled from the southwest. They came sailing and clustering and darkening at last to form a great purple angry mass that appeared to lodge against the mountain rim and burst into dazzling streaks of lightning and gray palls of rain. Lightning seldom struck near the ranch, but up on the rim there was never a storm that did not splinter and crash some of the noble pines. During the storm season, sheep herders and woodsmen generally did not camp under the pines. Fear of lightning was inborn in the natives, but for Ellen the dazzling white streaks, or the tremendous splitting, crackling shock, or the thunderous boom and rumble along the battlements of the rim, had no terrors. A storm eased her breast. Deep in her heart was a hidden gathering storm, and somehow, to be out where the elements were warring, when the earth trembled and the heavens seemed to burst asunder, afforded her strange relief. The summer days became weeks, and farther and farther they carried Ellen on the wings of solitude and loneliness, until she seemed to look back years at the self she had hated. And always, when the dark memory impinged upon peace, she fought and fought, until she seemed to be fighting hatred itself. Scorn of scorn and hate of hate, yet even her battles grew to be dreams. For when the inevitable retrospect brought back Jean Isabel and his love, 
and her cowardly falsehood, she would shudder a little bit and put an unconscious hand to her breast and utterly fail in her fight and drift off down to vague and wistful dreams. The clean and healing forest, with its whispering wind and imperious solitude, had come between Ellen and the meaning of the squalid sheep ranch, with its travesty of home, its tragic owner, and it was coming between her two selves, the one that she had been forced to be and the other that she did not know, the thinker, the dreamer, the romancer, the one who lived in fancy the life she loved. The summer morning dawned that brought Ellen strange tidings. They must have been created in her sleep and now were realized in the glorious burst of golden sun, in the sweep of creamy clouds across the blue, in the solemn music of the wind in the pines, in the wild screech of the blue jays, and the noble bugle of a stag. These heralded the day as no ordinary day. Something was going to happen to her. She divined it, she felt it, and she trembled. Nothing beautiful, hopeful, wonderful could ever happen to Ellen Jorth. She had been born to disaster, to suffer, to be forgotten and die alone. Yet all nature about her seemed a magnificent rebuke to her morbidness. The same spirit that came out there with the thick amber light was in her. She lived, and something in her was stronger than mind. Ellen went to the door of her cabin, where she flung out her arms, driven to embrace this nameless purport of the morning. And a well-known voice broke in upon her rapture. Well, lass, I like to see you happy, and I hate myself for coming, because I've been to Grass Valley for two days and I've got news. Old John Sprague stood there with a smile that did not hide a troubled look. Oh, Uncle John, you startled me, exclaimed Ellen, shocked back to reality. And slowly she added, Grass Valley? News? She put out an appealing hand, which Sprague quickly took in his own as if to reassure her. Yes, and not bad so far as you Jorths are concerned, he replied. The first Jorth Isbel fight has come off. Reckon you remember, making me promise to tell you if I heard anything? Well, I didn't wait for you to come up. So Ellen heard her voice calmly saying, What was this lying calm when there seemed to be a stone hammer at her heart? The first fight. Not so bad for the Jorths, then it had been bad for the Isbels. A sudden cold stillness fell upon her senses. Let's sit down outdoors, Sprague was saying. Nice and sunny this morning. I declare I'm out of breath, not used to walking. And besides, I left Grass Valley in the night and I'm tired. But excuse me for hanging round that village last night. There were sure... Who, who was killed, interrupted Ellen her voice breaking low and deep. Guy Isbel and Bill Jacobs on the Isbel side, and Dags, Craig, and Greaves on your father's side, stated Sprague, with something of awed haste. Ah, breathed Ellen, and she relaxed to sink back against the cabin wall. Sprague seated himself on the log beside her, turning to face her, and he seemed burdened and grave with important matters. I heard a good many conflicting stories, he said earnestly. The village folks is all scared, and there's no believing their gossip. But I got what happened, straight from Jake Everts. The fight come off day before yesterday. Your father's gang rode down to Isbel's ranch. Daggs was seen to be wanting some of the Isbel horses, so Everts says, and Guy Isbel and Jacobs ran out in the pasture. Dags and some others shot them down. Kill them that way? Put in Ellen sharply. So Everett says he was on the ridge and swears he seen it all. They killed Guy and Jacobs in cold blood. No chance for their lives, not even the fight. Well, then they surrounded the Isbel cabin. The fight lasted all that day and all night and the next day. Everett says Guy and Jacobs laid out there all this time. 
and a herd of hogs broke in the pasture and was eating the dead bodies. My God, burst out Ellen. Uncle John, you sure can't mean my father wouldn't stop fighting long enough to drive the hogs off and bury those dead men. Edward says they stopped fighting all right, but it was to watch the hogs, declared Sprague. And then, what do you think? The women folks come out, the red-headed one, Guy's wife, and Jacob's wife. They drove the hogs away and buried their husbands right there in the pasture. Everett says he has seen the graves. It is the women who can teach these bloody Texans a lesson, declared Ellen forcibly. Well, Daggs was drunk, and he got up from behind where the gang was hiding and dared the Isabels to come out. They shot him to pieces, and that night some one of the Isabels shot Craig, who was alone on guard. And last, this here is what I come to tell you. Jean Isabel slipped up in the dark on Greaves and knifed him. Why do you want to tell me that particularly? asked Ellen slowly. Because I reckon the facts in the case are queer, and because, Ellen, your name was mentioned, announced Sprague positively. My name mentioned, echoed Ellen. Her horror and disgust gave way to a quickening process of thought, a mounting astonishment. By whom? Jean Isbel, replied Sprague, as if the name and the fact were momentous. Ellen sat still as a stone, her hands between her knees. Slowly, she felt the blood recede from her face, pricking her kin down below her neck. That name locked her thought. Ellen, it's a mighty queer story. Too queer to be a lie, went on Sprague. Now you listen. Everett's got this from Ted Meeker. And Ted Meeker heard it from Greaves, who didn't die till the next day after Jean knifed him. And your dad shot Ted for telling what he heard. No, Greaves wasn't killed outright. He was cut something terrible in two places. They wrapped him all up and next day packed him in a wagon back to Grass Valley. Everett says Ted Meeker was friendly with Greaves and went to see him as he was laying in his room next to the store. Well, according to Meeker's story, Greaves came to and talked. He said he was sitting there in the dark, shooting occasionally at Isbel's cabin, when he heard a rustling behind him in the grass. He knowed someone was crawling on him, but before he could get his gun around, he was jumped by what he thought was a grizzly bear. But it was a man, and he shut off Greaves' wind and dragged him back in the ditch. And he said, Greaves, it's the half-breed, and he's going to cut you, first for Ellen Jorth, and then for Gaston Isbel. Greaves said, Jean ripped him with a bowie knife. And that was all Greaves remembered. He died soon after telling this story. He must have fought awful hard. The second cut Isbel gave him went clear through him. Some of the gang was there when Greaves talked, and naturally they wondered why Jean Isbel had said, first for Ellen Jorth. Somebody remembered that Greaves had cast a slur on your good name, Ellen. And then they had Jean Isbel's reason for saying that to Greaves. It caused a lot of talk, and when Sim Bruce busted in, some of the gang haw-hawed him and said as how he'd get the third cut from Jean Isbel's buoy. Bruce was half drunk, and he began to cuss and rave about Jean Isbel being in love with his girl. As bad luck would have it, a couple of more fellas come in and asked meeker questions. He just got to that part, Greaves, it's the half-breed, and he's going to cut you, first for Ellen Jorth, went in walked your father. Then it all had to come out, what Jean Isabel had said and done, and why. How Greaves had backed Sim Bruce in slurring you. Sprague paused to look hard at Ellen. Oh, then what did Dad do, whispered Ellen. He said, by God, half-breed or not, there's one Isabel who's a man and he killed Bruce on the spot and gave Meeker a nasty wound. Somebody grabbed him before he could shoot Meeker again. They threw Meeker out 
and he crawled to a neighbor's house, where he was when Everts seen him. Ellen felt Sprague's rough but kindly hand shaking her. "'And now what do you think of Jean Isbel?' he queried. A great, unsurmountable wall seemed to obstruct Ellen's thought. It seemed gray in color. It moved toward her. It was inside her brain. "'I tell you, Ellen Jorth,' declared the old man, "'that Jean Isabel loves you, loves you terribly, and he believes you're good.' "'Oh, no, he doesn't,' faltered Ellen. "'Well, he just does. "'Oh, Uncle John, he can't believe that,' she cried. "'Of course he can, he does. "'You are good, good as gold, Ellen, and he knows it. "'What a queer deal it all is, poor devil, "'to love you that terribly and have to fight your people. "'Ellen, your dad had it correct. "'Isbel or not, he's a man. "'And I say what a shame you two are divided by hate. "'Hate that you had nothing to do with.' "'Sprague patted her head and rose to go. "'Maybe that fight will end the trouble. "'I reckon it will. "'Don't cross bridges till you come to them, Ellen. "'I must hurry back now. "'I didn't take time to unpack my burrows. "'Come up soon, and say, Ellen, "'don't think hard any more of that Jean Isbel. End of chapter 10, part 1「Section 20 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10, Part 2 Sprague strode away, and Ellen neither heard nor saw him go. She sat perfectly motionless, yet had a strange sensation of being lifted by invisible and mighty power. It was like movement felt in a dream. She was being impelled upward when her body seemed immovable as stone. When her blood beat down this deadlock of her physical being and rushed on and on through her veins, it gave her an irresistible impulse to fly, to sail through space, to run and run and run. And on the moment the black horse, Spades, coming from the meadow, whinnied at sight of her. Ellen leaped up and ran swiftly but her feet seemed to be stumbling. She hugged the horse and buried her hot face in his mane and clung to him. Then, just as violently, she rushed for her saddle and bridle and carried the heavy weight as easily as if it had been an empty sack. Throwing them upon him, she buckled and strapped with strong, eager hands. It never occurred to her that she was not dressed to ride. Up she flung herself, and the horse, sensing her spirit, plunged in the strong, free gait down the canyon trail. The ride, the action, the thrill, the sensations of violence were not all she needed. Solitude, the empty aisles of the forest, the far miles of lonely wilderness, were these the added all? Spades took a swinging, rhythmic lope up the winding trail. The wind fanned her hot face. The sting of whipping aspen branches was pleasant. A deep rumble of thunder shook the sultry air. Up beyond the green slope of the canyon massed the creamy clouds, shading darker and darker. Spades loped on the levels, leaped the washes, trotted over the rocky ground, and took to a walk up the long slope. Ellen dropped the reins over the pommel. Her hands could not stay set on anything. They pressed her breast and flew out to caress the white aspens and to tear at the maple leaves and gather the lavender juniper berries and came back again to her heart. Her heart that was going to burst or break. As it had swelled, so now it labored. It could not keep pace with her needs. All that was physical, all that was living in her, had to be unleashed. Spades gained the level forest. How the great brown-green pines seemed to bend their lofty branches over her, protectively, understandingly. Patches of azure blue sky flashed between the trees. The great white clouds sailed along with her, 
and shafts of golden sunlight, flecked with gleams of falling pine needles, shone down through the canopy overhead. Away in front of her, up the slow heave of forest land, boomed the heavy thunderbolts along the battlements of the rim. Was she riding to escape from herself? For no gate suited her until Spades was running hard and fast through the glades. Then the pressure of dry wind, the thick odor of pine, the flashes of brown and green and gold and blue, the soft, rhythmic thuds of hoofs, the feel of the powerful horse under her, the whip of spruce branches on her muscles contracting and expanding in hard action, all these sensations seemed to quell for the time the mounting cataclysm in her heart. The oak swales, the maple thickets, the aspen groves, the pine-shaded aisles, and the miles of silver spruce all sped by her, as if she had ridden the wind, and through the forest ahead shone the vast open of the basin, gloomed by purple and silver cloud, shadowed by gray storm, and in the west brightened by golden sky. Straight to the rim she had ridden, and to the point where she had watched Jean Isabel that unforgettable day. She rode to the promontory behind the pine thicket and beheld a scene which stayed her restless hands upon her heaving breast. The world of sky and cloud and earthly abyss seemed one of storm-sundered grandeur. The air was sultry and still, and smelled of the peculiar burnt wood odor caused by lightning striking trees. A few heavy drops of rain were pattering down from the thin gray edge of clouds overhead. To the east hung the storm, a black cloud lodged against the rim, from which long misty veils of rain streamed down into the gulf. The roar of rain sounded like the steady roar of the rapids of a river. Then a blue-white, piercingly bright, ragged streak of lightning shot down out of the black cloud. It struck with a splitting report that shocked the very wall of rock under Ellen. Then the heavens seemed to burst open with thundering crash and close with mighty thundering boom. Long roar and longer rumble rolled away to the eastward. The rain poured down in roaring cataracts. The south held a panorama of purple-shrouded range and canyon, canyon and range, on across the rolling leagues to the dim, lofty peaks, all canopied over with angry, dusky, low-drifting clouds, horizon-wide, smoky, and sulfurous. And as Ellen watched, hand pressed to her breast, feeling incalculable relief in sight of this tempest and gulf that resembled her soul, the sun burst out from behind the long bank of purple cloud in the west and flooded the world there with golden lightning. "'It is for me,' cried Ellen. "'My mind, my heart, my very soul. Oh, I know, I know now. I love him, love him, love him.' She cried it out to the elements. "'Oh, I love Jean Isabel, and my heart will burst or break.' The might of her passion was like the blaze of the sun. Before it, all else retreated, diminished. The suddenness of truth dimmed her sight, but she saw clearly enough to crawl into the pine thicket, through the clutching dry twigs, over the mats of fragrant needles, to the covert where she had once spied upon Jean Isbel. And here she lay face down for a while, hands clutching the needles, breast pressed hard upon the ground, stricken and spent, but vitality was exceedingly strong in her. It passed that weakness of realization, and she awakened to the consciousness of love. But in the beginning, it was not consciousness of the man. It was new, sensorial life, elemental, primitive, a liberation of a million inherited instincts, quivering and physical, over which Ellen had no more control than she had over the glory of the sun. If she thought at all, it was of her need to be hidden like an animal, low down near the earth, covered by green thicket, 
lost in the wildness of nature. She went to nature, unconsciously seeking a mother. And love was a birth from the depths of her, like a rushing spring of pure water long underground, and at last propelled to the surface by a convulsion. Ellen gradually lost her tense rigidity and relaxed. Her body softened. She rolled over until her face caught the lacy golden shadows cast by sun and bough. Scattered drops of rain pattered around her. The air was hot, and its odor was that of dry pine and spruce fragrance penetrated by brimstone from the lightning. The nest where she lay was warm and sweet. No eye, save that of nature, saw her in her abandonment. An ineffable and exquisite smile wreathed her lips, dreamy, sad, sensuous, the supremacy of unconscious happiness. Over her dark and eloquent eyes, as Ellen gazed upward, spread a luminous film, a veil. She was looking intensely, yet she did not see. The wilderness enveloped her with its secretive elemental sheaths of rock, of tree, of cloud, of sunlight. Through her thrilling skin poured the multiple and nameless sensations of the living organisms stirred to supreme sensitiveness. She could not lie still, but all her movements were gentle, involuntary. The slow reaching out of her hand to grasp at nothing visible was similar to the lazy stretching of her limbs, to the heave of her breast, to the ripple of muscle. Ellen knew not what she felt. To live that sublime hour was beyond thought. Such happiness was like the first dawn of the world to the sight of man. It had to do with bygone ages. Her heart, her blood, her flesh, her very bones were filled with instincts and emotions common to the race before intellect developed, when the savage lived only with his sensorial perceptions. Of all happiness, joy, bliss, rapture, to which man was heir, that of intense and exquisite preoccupation of the senses, unhindered and unburdened by thought, was the greatest. Ellen felt that which life meant with its inscrutable design. Love was the only realization of her mission on the earth. The dark storm cloud with its white ragged ropes of lightning and downstreaming gray veils of rain, the purple gulf rolling like a colored sea to the dim mountains, the glorious golden light of the sun. These had enchanted her eyes with her beauty of the universe. They had burst the windows of her blindness. When she crawled into the green, brown covert, it was to escape to great perception. She needed to be encompassed by close, tangible things. And there her body paid the tribute to the realization of life, shock, convulsion, pain, relaxation, and then unutterable and insupportable sensing of her environment and the heart. In one way, she was a wild animal alone in the woods, forced into the mating that meant reproduction of its kind. In another, she was an infinitely higher being, shot through and through with the most resistless and mysterious transport that life could give to flesh. And when that spell slackened its hold, there wedged into her mind a consciousness of the man she loved, Jean Isbel. Then emotion and thought strove for mastery over her. It was not herself or love that she loved, but a living man. Suddenly he existed so clearly for her that she could see him, hear him, almost feel him. Her whole soul, her very life, cried out to him for protection, for salvation, for love, for fulfillment. No denial, no doubt marred the white blaze of her realization. From the instant she had looked up into Jean Isabel's dark face, she had loved him. Only she had not known. She bowed now and bent, and humbly quivered under the mastery of something beyond her ken. Thought clung to the beginnings of her romance, to the three times she had seen him, every look, every word, 
Every act of his returned to her now in the light of the truth. Love at first sight? He had sworn it, bitterly, eloquently, scornful of her doubts. And now a blind, sweet, shuddering ecstasy swayed her. How weak and frail seemed her body, too small, too slight, for this monstrous and terrible engine of fire and lightning and fury and glory, her heart. It must burst or break. Relentlessly, memory pursued Ellen, and her thoughts whirled and emotion conquered her. At last she quivered up to her knees, as if lashed to action. It seemed that first kiss of Isbel's, cool and gentle and timid, was on her lips. And her eyes closed and hot tears welled from under her lids. Her groping hands found only the dead twigs and pine boughs of the trees. Had she reached out to clasp him? Then hard and violent on her mouth and cheek and neck burned those other kisses of Isbel's, and with the flashing, stinging memory came the truth that now she would have bartered her soul for them. Utterly she surrendered to the resistlessness of his love. Her loss of mother and friends, her wandering from one wild place to another, her lonely life among bold and rough men, had developed her for violent love. It overthrew all pride, it engendered humility, it killed hate. Ellen wiped the tears from her eyes, and as she knelt there, she swept to her breast a fragrant spreading bough of pine needles. I'll go to him, she whispered. I'll tell him of, of my, my love. I'll tell him to take me away, away to the end of the world, away from here, before it's too late. It was a solemn, beautiful moment, but the last spoken words lingered hauntingly. Too late, she whispered. And suddenly, it seemed that death itself shuddered in her soul. Too late? It was too late. She had killed his love. That jorth blood in her, that poisonous hate, had chosen the only way to strike this noble Isbel to the heart. Basely, with abandonment of womanhood, she had mockingly perjured her soul with a vile lie. She writhed. She shook under the whip of this inconceivable fact. Lost, lost. She wailed her misery. She might as well be what she had made John Isabel think she was. If she had been shamed before, she was now abased, degraded, lost in her own sight. And if she would have given her soul for his kisses, she now would have killed herself to earn back his respect. John Isbel had given her at sight the deference she had unconsciously craved and the love that would have been her salvation. What a horrible mistake she had made of her life. Not her mother's blood, but her father's, the Jorth blood, had been her ruin. Again Ellen fell upon the soft pine needle mat, face down, and she groveled and burrowed there, in an agony that could not bear the sense of light. All she had suffered was as nothing to this, to have awakened to a splendid and uplifting love for a man whom she had imagined she hated, who had fought for her name, and had killed in revenge for the dishonor she had avowed, to have lost his love, and what was infinitely more precious to her now in her ignominy, his faith in her purity. This broke her heart. End of chapter 10, part 2section twenty one of to the last man by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven part one when ellen utterly spent in body and mind reached home that day a melancholy sultry twilight was falling fitful flares of sheet lightning swept across the dark horizon to the east the cabins were deserted Antonio and the Mexican woman were gone. The circumstances made Ellen wonder, but she was too tired and too sunken in spirit to think long about it, or to care. She fed and watered her horse, and left him in the corral. Then supperless, 
and without removing her clothes, she threw herself upon the bed and at once sank into heavy slumber. Some time during the night she awoke. Coyotes were yelping, and from that sound she concluded it was near dawn. Her body ached, her mind seemed dull. Drowsily, she was sinking into slumber again when she heard the rapid clip-clop of trotting horses. Startled, she raised her head to listen. The men were coming back. Relief and dread seemed to clear her stupor. The trotting horses stopped across the lane from her cabin, evidently at the corral where she had left spades. She heard him whistle. From the sound of hoofs, she judged the number of horses to be six or eight. Low voices of men mingled with thuds and cracking of straps and flopping of saddles on the ground. After that, the heavy tread of boots sounded on the porch of the cabin opposite. A door creaked on its hinges. Next, a slow footstep, accompanied by clinking spurs, approached Ellen's door, and a heavy hand banged upon it. She knew this person could not be her father. Hello, Ellen? She recognized the voice as belonging to Coulter. Somehow its tone, or something about it, sent a little shiver down her spine. It acted like a revivifying current. Ellen lost her dragging lethargy. "'Hey, Ellen, are you there?' added Coulter, louder voice. "'Yes, of course I'm here,' she replied. "'What do you want?' "'Well, I'm sure glad you're home,' he replied. "'Antonio's gone with his squaw, and I was some worried about you.' "'Who's with you, Coulter?' queried Ellen, sitting up. "'Rock Wells and Springer. Tad Jorth was with us, but we had to leave him over here in a cabin. What's the matter with him? Well, he's hurt tolerable bad, was the slow reply. Ellen heard Coulter's spurs jangle, as if he had uneasily shifted his feet. Where's Dad and Uncle Jackson? asked Ellen. A silence, pregnant enough to augment Ellen's dread, finally broke to Coulter's voice, somehow different. Sure, they're back on the trail and we're to meet them where we left Tad. Are you going away again? I reckon. And Ellen, you're going with us. I am not, she retorted. Well, you are if I have to pack you, he replied forcibly. It's not safe here any more. That damned half-breed Isbel with his gang are on our trail. The name seemed like a red-hot blade at Ellen's leaden heart. She wanted to fling a hundred queries on Coulter, but she could not utter one. Ellen, we've got to hit the trail and hide, continued Coulter anxiously. You mustn't stay here alone. Suppose them Isbels would trap you. They'd tear off your clothes and rope you to a tree. Ellen, sure you're going. You hear me? Yes, I'll go, she replied, as if forced. Well, that's good, he said quickly, and rustled tolerable lively. We've got to pack. The slow jangle of Coulter's spurs and his slow steps moved away out of Ellen's hearing. Throwing off the blankets, she put her feet to the floor and sat there a moment staring at the blank nothingness of the cabin interior in the obscure gray of dawn. Cold, gray, dreary, obscure, like her life, her future. And she was compelled to do what was hateful to her. As a jorth, she must take to the unfrequented trails and hide like a rabbit in the thickets. But the interest of the moment, a premonition of events to be, quickened her into action. Ellen unbarred the door and let in the light. Day was breaking, with an intense, clear, steely light in the east, through which the morning star still shone white. A ruddy flare betokened the advent of the sun. Ellen unbraided her tangled hair and brushed and combed it. A queer, still pang came to her at sight of pine needles tangled in her brown locks. Then she washed her hands and face. Breakfast was a matter of considerable work, and she was hungry. The sun rose and changed the gray world of forest. For the first time in her life, Ellen hated the golden brightness, the wonderful blue of sky the scream of the eagles, and the screech of the jay, and the squirrels she had always loved to feed, were neglected that morning. Coulter came in. 
Ellen had never before looked attentively at him, or else he had changed. Her scrutiny of his lean, hard features accorded him more Texan attributes than formerly. His gray eyes were as light, as clear, as fierce as those of an eagle. And the sand gray of his face, the long, drooping, fair mustache, hid the secrets of his mind, but not its strength. The instant Ellen met his gaze, she sensed the power in him that she instinctively opposed. Coulter had not been so bold nor so rude as Dags, but he was the same kind of man, perhaps the more dangerous for his secretiveness, his cool, waiting, inscrutableness. "'Morning, Ellen,' he drawled. "'You sure look good for sore eyes.' "'Don't pay me compliments, Coulter,' replied Ellen. "'And your eyes are not sore.' Well, I'm sore, sure, from fighting and riding and laying out, he said bluntly. Tell me what happened, returned Ellen. Girl, it's a tolerable long story, replied Coulter, and we've no time now. Wait till we get to camp. Am I to pack my belongings or leave them here? asked Ellen. Reckon you'd better leave them here. But if we did not come back... Well, I reckon... It's not likely we'll come soon, he said, rather evasively. Coulter, I'll not go off into the woods with just the clothes I have on my back. Ellen, we've sure got to pack all the grab we can. This sure ain't going to be a visit to neighbors. We're shy of pack horses. But you make up a bundle of belongings you care for and the things you'll need bad. We'll throw it on somewhere. Coulter stalked away across the lane and Ellen found herself dubiously staring at his tall figure. Was it the situation that struck her with a foreboding perplexity, or was it her intuition stealing her against this man? Ellen could not decide, but she had to go with him. Her prejudice was unreasonable at this portentous moment, and she could not yet feel that she was solely responsible to herself. When it came to making a small bundle of her belongings, she was in a quandary. She discarded this and put in that, and then reversed the order. Next in preciousness to her mother's things were the long-hidden gifts of Jean Isbel. She could part with neither. While she was selecting and packing this bundle, Coulter again entered and, without speaking, began to rummage in the corner where her father kept his possessions. This irritated Ellen. "'What do you want there?' she demanded. "'Well, I reckon your dad wants his papers and the gold he left here and a change of clothes. Now, doesn't he?' returned Coulter coolly. "'Of course, but I suppose you would have me pack them.' Coulter vouchsafed no reply to this, but deliberately went on rummaging with little regard for how he scattered things. Ellen turned her back on him. At length, when he left, she went to her father's corner and found that, as far as she was able to see, Coulter had taken neither papers nor clothes, but only the gold. Perhaps, however, she had been mistaken, for she had not observed Coulter's departure closely enough to know whether or not he carried a package. She missed only the gold. Her father's papers, old and musty, were scattered about, and these she gathered up to slip in her own bundle. Coulter, or one of the men, had saddled spades, and now he was tied to the corral fence, champing his bit and pounding the sand. Ellen wrapped bread and meat inside her coat, and after tying this behind her saddle, she was ready to go. But evidently she would have to wait, and preferring to remain outdoors, she stayed by her horse. Presently, while watching the men pack, she noticed that Springer wore a bandage round his head under the brim of his sombrero. His motions were slow and lacked energy. Suttering at the sight, Ellen refused conjecture. All too soon she would learn what happened, and all too soon, perhaps, she herself would be in the midst of another fight. She watched the men. They were making a hurried, slipshod job of packing food supplies from both cabins. More than once she caught Coulter's gray gleam of gaze on her, and she did not like it. 
I'll ride up and say good-bye to Sprague, she called to Coulter. Sure you won't do nothing of that kind, he called back. There was authority in his tone that angered Ellen, and something else which inhibited her anger. What was there about Coulter with which she must reckon? The other two Texans laughed aloud, to be suddenly silenced by Coulter's harsh and lowered curses. Ellen walked out of hearing and sat upon a log, where she remained until Coulter hailed her. "'Get up and ride,' he called. Ellen complied with this order, and riding up behind the three mounted men, she soon found herself leaving what for years had been her home. Not once did she look back. She hoped she would never see the squalid, bare pretension of a ranch again. Coulter and the other riders drove the pack horses across the meadow, off of the trails, and up the slope into the forest. Not very long did it take Ellen to see that Coulter's object was to hide his tracks. He zigzagged through the forest, avoiding the bare spots of dust, the dry sun-baked flats of clay where water lay in spring, and he chose the grassy open glades, the long pine-needle matted aisles. Ellen rode at their heels, and it pleased her to watch for their tracks. Coulter, manifestly, had been long practice in this game of hiding his trail, and he showed the skill of a rustler. But Ellen was not convinced that he could ever elude a real woodsman. Not improbably, however, Coulter was only aiming to leave a trail difficult to follow, and which would allow him and his confederates ample time to forge ahead of pursuers. Ellen could not accept a certainty of pursuit. Yet Coulter must have expected it, and Springer and Wells also, for they had a dark, sinister, furtive demeanor that strangely contrasted with the cool, easy manner habitual to them. They were not seeking the level routes of the forest land, that was sure. They rode straight across the thick, timbered ridges down into another canyon, up out of that and across rough, rocky bluffs, and down again. These riders headed a little to the northwest, and every mile brought them into wilder, more rugged country, until Ellen, losing count of canyons and ridges, had no idea where she was. No stop was made at noon to rest the laboring, sweating pack animals. Under circumstances where pleasure might have been possible, Ellen would have reveled in this hard ride into a wonderful forest, ever thickening and darkening. But the wild beauty of glade and the spruce slopes and the deep bronze-walled canyons left her cold. She saw and felt, but had no thrill, except now and then a thrill of alarm, when Spades slid to his haunches down some steep, damp, piney declivity. All the woodland up and down appeared to be richer, greener, as they traveled farther west. Grass grew thick and heavy. Water ran in all ravines. The rocks were bronze and copper and russet, and some had green patches of lichen. Ellen felt the sun now on her left cheek, and knew that the day was waning, and that Coulter was swinging farther to the northwest. She had never before ridden through such heavy forest and down and up such wild canyons. Toward sunset, the deepest and ruggedest canyon halted their advance. Coulter rode to the right, searching for a place to get down through a spruce thicket that stood on end. Presently he dismounted, and the others followed suit. Ellen found that she could not lead Spades because he slid down upon her heels, so she looped the end of her reins over the pommel and left him free. She herself managed to descend by holding the branches and sliding all the way down that slope. She heard the horses cracking the brush, snorting and heaving. One pack slipped and had to be removed from the horse and rolled down. At the bottom of this deep, green-walled notch roared a stream of water, shadowed, cool, mossy, damp. This narrow gulch seemed the wildest place Ellen had ever seen. She could just see the sunset flushed 
gold-tipped spruces far above her. The men repacked the horse that had slipped his burden, and once more resumed their progress ahead, now turning up this canyon. There was no horse trail, but deer and bear trails were numerous. The sun sank, and the sky darkened. But still the men rode on, and the farther they traveled, the wilder grew the aspect of the canyon. At length, Coulter broke away through a heavy thicket of willows and entered a side canyon, the mouth of which Ellen had not even descried. It turned and widened, and at length opened out into a round pocket, apparently enclosed, and as lonely and isolated a place as even pursued rustlers could desire. Hidden by jutting wall and thicket of spruce were two old log cabins, joined together by roof and attic floor, the same as the double cabin at the Jorth Ranch. Ellen smelled wood smoke, and presently, on going round the cabins, she saw a bright fire. One man stood beside it, gazing at Coulter's party, which evidently he had heard approaching. "'Hello, Queen,' said Coulter. "'How's Tad?' He's holding on fine, replied Queen, bending over the fire where he turned pieces of meat. Where's father? suddenly asked Ellen, addressing Coulter. As if he had not heard her, he went on wearily, loosening a pack. Queen looked at her. The light of the fire only partially shone on his face. Ellen could not see his expression. But from the fact that Queen did not answer her question, she got further intimation of impending catastrophe. The long, wild ride had helped prepare her for the secrecy and taciturnity of men who had resorted to flight. Perhaps her father had been delayed, or was still off on the deadly mission that had obsessed him, or there might, and probably was, darker reasons for his absence. Ellen shut her teeth and turned to the needs of her horse, and presently, Returning to the fire, she thought of her uncle. "'Queen, is my Uncle Tad here?' she asked. "'Sure, he's in there,' replied Queen, pointing at the nearer cabin. Ellen hurried toward the dark doorway. She could see how the logs of the cabin had moved awry, and what a big dilapidated hovel it was. As she looked in, Coulter loomed over her, placed a familiar and somehow masterful hand upon her. Ellen let it rest on her shoulder a moment. Must she forever be repulsing these rude men among whom her lot was cast? Did Coulter mean what Daggs had always meant? Ellen felt herself weary, weak in body, and her spent spirit had not rallied. Yet whatever Coulter meant by his familiarity, she could not bear it. So she slipped out from under his hand. "'Uncle Tad, are you here?' she called into the blackness. She heard the mice scamper and rustle, and she smelled the musty, old, woody odor of a long, unused cabin. "'Hello, Ellen,' came a voice she recognized as her uncle's. Yet it was strange. "'Yes, I'm here. Bad luck to me. How you bucking up, girl?' "'I'm all right, Uncle Tad. Only tired and worried. I—' "'Tad, how's your hurt?' interrupted Coulter. "'Reckon I'm easier,' replied Jorth wearily. "'But sure, I'm in bad shape. I'm still spitting blood. I keep telling Queen that bullet lodged in my lungs, but he says it went through.' "'Well, hang on, Tad,' replied Coulter, with a cheerfulness Ellen sensed was really indifferent. "'Oh, what the hell's the use?' exclaimed Jorth. "'It's all up with us, Coulter.' "'Well, shut up, then, tersely,' returned Coulter. It ain't doing you or us any good to holler. Tad Jorth did not reply to this. Ellen heard his breathing, and it did not seem natural. It rasped a little, came hurriedly, then caught in his throat. Then he spat. Ellen shrunk back against the door. He was breathing through blood. Uncle, are you in pain? she asked. Yes, Ellen, it burns like hell, he said. Oh, I'm sorry. Isn't there something I can do? I reckon not. Queen did all anybody could do for me, now, unless it's prey. Coulter laughed at this, the slow, easy, drawing laugh of a Texan. But Ellen felt pity for this wounded uncle. 
She had always hated him. He had been a drunkard, a gambler, a waster of her father's property. And now he was a rustler and a fugitive, lying in pain, perhaps mortally hurt. Yes, uncle, I will pray for you, she said softly. End of chapter 11, part 1「Section twenty two of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven, part two. The change in his voice held a note of sadness that she had been quick to catch. Ellen, you're the only good Jorth in the whole damned lot, he said. God, I see it all now. We've dragged you to hell. Yes, Uncle Ted. I sure been dragged some, but not yet to hell, she responded, with a break in her voice. You will be, Ellen, unless... Aw, oh, shut up that kind of gab, will you? broke in Coulter harshly. It amazed Ellen that Coulter should dominate her uncle, even though he was wounded. Tad Jorth had been the last man to take orders from anyone, much less a rustler of the Hash Knife Gang. This Coulter began to loom up in Ellen's estimate as he loomed physically over her, a lofty figure, dark, motionless, somehow menacing. Ellen, has Coulter told you yet about... about Lee and Jackson? inquired the wounded man. The pitch-black darkness of the cabin seemed to help fortify Ellen to bear further trouble. Coulter told me that Dad and Uncle Jackson would meet us here, she rejoined hurriedly. Jorth could be heard breathing in difficulty, and he coughed and spat again and seemed to hiss. Ellen, he lied to you. They'll never meet us here. Why not? whispered Ellen. Because, Ellen, he replied in husky pants, your dad and Uncle Jackson are dead and buried. If Ellen suffered a terrible shock, it was a blankness, a deadness, a slow-creeping failure of sense in her knees. They gave way under her, and she sank on the grass against the cabin wall. She did not faint, nor grow dizzy, nor lose her sight. But for a while, there was no process of thought in her mind. Suddenly it was there, the quick, spiritual rending of her heart, followed by a profound emotion of intimate and irretrievable loss and after that, grief and bitter realization. An hour later, Ellen found strength to go to the fire and partake of the food and drink her body sorely needed. Coulter and the men waited on her solicitously and in silence, now and then stealing furtive glances at her from under the shadow of their black sombreros. The dark night settled down like a blanket. There were no stars. The wind moaned fitfully among the pines, and all about that lonely hidden recess was in harmony with Ellen's thoughts. "'Girl, you're sure game,' said Coulter admiringly, "'and I reckon you never got it from the Jorths.' "'Tad in there, he's game,' said Queen, in mild protest. "'Not to my notion,' replied Coulter. "'Any man can be game when he's croaking with somebody around. "'But Lee Jorth and Jackson... They always was yellow, clear to their gizzards. They was born in Louisiana, not Texas. Sure, they're no more Texans than I am. Ellen here, she must have got another strain in her blood. To Ellen, their words had no meaning. She rose and asked, Where can I sleep? I'll fetch a light presently, and you can make your bed in there by Tad, replied Coulter. Yes, I'd like that. Well, if you reckon you can coax him to talk, you're sure wrong, declared Coulter, with that cold timber of voice that struck like steel on Ellen's nerves. I cussed him good and told him to keep his mouth shut. Talkin' makes him cough, and that fetches up the blood. Besides, I reckon, I'm the one to tell you how your dad and uncle got killed. Tad didn't see it done, and he was bad hurt when it happened. Sure all the fellows left, have their idea about it, but I've got it straight. Coulter, tell me now, cried Ellen. Well, all right. Come over here, he replied, 
and drew her away from the campfire out in the shadow of gloom. Poor kid, I sure feel bad about it. He put a long arm around her waist and drew her against him. Ellen felt it, yet did not offer any resistance. All her faculties seemed absorbed in a morbid and sad anticipation. Ellen, you sure know I always loved you now, don't you? he asked with suppressed breath. No, Coulter, it's news to me and not what I want to hear. Well, you may as well hear it right now, he said. It's true. And what's more, your dad gave you to me before he died. What, Coulter? You must be a liar. Ellen, I swear I'm not lying, he returned in eager passion. I was with your dad last and heard him last. He sure knew I loved you for years. And he said he'd rather you be left in my care than anybody's. My father gave you to me in marriage, ejaculated Ellen, in bewilderment. Coulter's ready assurance did not carry him over this point. It was evident that her words somewhat surprised and disconcerted him for the moment. To let me marry a rustler? One of the hash knife gang? exclaimed Ellen, with weary incredulity. Well, your dad belonged to Daggs's gang, same as I do, replied Coulter, recovering his cool ardor. No, cried Ellen. Yes, he sure did for years, declared Coulter positively. Back in Texas, and it was your dad that got Daggs to come to Arizona. Ellen tried to fling herself away, but her strength and her spirit were ebbing, and Coulter increased the pressure of his arm. All at once she sank limp. Could she escape her fate? Nothing seemed left to fight with or for. All right. Don't hold me so tight, she panted. Now tell me how Dad was killed, and who, who. Coulter bent over her, so he could peer into her face. In the darkness, Ellen just caught the gleam of his eyes. She felt the viral force of the man in the strain of his body as he pressed her close. It all seemed unreal, a hideous dream, the gloom, the moan of the wind, the weird solitude, and this rustler with hands and will like cold steel. We'd come back to Greaves' store, Coulter began, and as Greaves was dead, we all got free with his liquor. Sure, some of us got drunk. Bruce was drunk, and Tad in there, he was drunk. Your dad put away more than I ever seen him. But sure, he wasn't exactly drunk. He got one of them weak and shaky spells. He cried, and he wanted some of us to get the Isbels to call off the fightin'. He sure was ready to call it quits. I reckon the killin' of Daggs, and then the awful way Greaves was cut up by Jean Isbel, took all the fight out of your dad. He said to me, Coulter, we'll take Ellen and leave this here country and begin life all over again, where no one knows us. Oh, did he really say that? Did he really mean it? murmured Ellen, with a sob. I swear it, by the memory of my dead mother, protested Coulter. Well, when night come, the Isbels rode down on us in the dark and began to shoot. They smashed in the door, tried to burn us out, and hollered around for a while. Then they left, and we reckoned there'd be no more trouble that night. All the same, we kept watch. I was the soberest one, and I bossed the gang. We had some quarrels about the drinking. Your dad said if we kept it up, it'd be the end of the Jorths. And he planned to send word to the Isbels next morning that he was ready for a truce. And I was to go fix it up with Gaston Isbel. Well, your dad went to bed in Greaves' room, and a little while later your Uncle Jackson went in there too. Some of the men laid down in the store and went to sleep. I kept guard till about three in the morning and I got so sleepy I couldn't hold my eyes open. So I waked up Wells and Slater and set them on guard, one at each end of the store. Then I laid down on the counter to take a nap. Coulter's low voice, the strain and breathlessness of him, the agitation which he appeared to be laboring, and especially the simple, matter-of-fact detail of his story, carried absolute conviction to Ellen Jorth. 
Her vague doubt of him had been created by his attitude toward her. Emotion dominated her intelligence. The images, the scenes called up by Coulter's words, were as true as the gloom of the wild gulch and the loneliness of the night solitude, as true as the strange fact that she lay passive in the arms of a rustler. Well, after a while I woke up, went on Coulter, clearing his throat. It was gray dawn. All was still as death. And something sure was wrong. Wells and Slater had got to drinking again and now lay dead drunk or asleep. Anyways, when I kicked them, they never moved. Then I heard a moan. It came from the room where your dad and uncle was. I went in. It was just light enough to see. Your Uncle Jackson was laying on the floor, cut half in two, dead as a doornail. Your dad lay on the bed. He was alive, breathing his last. He says, That half-breed Isbel knifed us while we slept. The window shutter was open. I seen where Jean Isabel had come in and gone out. I seen his moccasin tracks in the dirt outside, and I seen where he'd stepped in Jackson's blood and tracked it to the window. You sure can see them bloody tracks yourself if you go back to Greaves's store. Your dad was going fast. He said, Coulter, take care of Ellen, and I reckon he meant a lot by that. He kept saying, My God, if I'd only seen Gaston Isbel before it was too late. And then he raved a little, whispering out of his head. And after that he died. I woke up the men, and about sunup, we carried your dad and uncle out of town and buried them. And then Isabel's shot at us while we were burying our dead. That's where Tad got his hurt. Then we hit the trail for Jorth's ranch. And now, Ellen, that's all my story. Your dad was ready to bury the hatchet with his old enemy. And that Nez Pierce John Isabel, like the sneaking savage he is, murdered your uncle and your dad. Cut him horrible. Made him suffer tortures of hell. All for Isabel revenge. When Coulter's husky voice ceased, Ellen whispered through lips as cold and still as ice. Let me go. Leave me here, alone. Why, sure, I reckon I understand, replied Coulter. I hated to tell you, but you had to hear the truth about that half-breed. I'll carry your pack in the cabin and unroll your blankets. Releasing her, Coulter strode off in the gloom. Like a dead weight, Ellen began to slide until she slipped down full length beside the log. And then she lay in the cool, damp shadow, inert and lifeless, so far as outward physical movement was concerned. She saw nothing and felt nothing of the night, the wind, the cold, the falling dew. For the moment or hour, she was crushed by despair and seemed to see herself sinking down and down into a black, bottomless pit, into an abyss where murky tides of blood and furious gusts of passion contended between her body and her soul. Into the stormy blast of hell. In her despair, she longed, she ached for death. Born of infidelity, cursed by the taint of evil blood, further cursed by higher instinct for good and happy life, dragged from one lonely and wild and sordid spot to another, never knowing love or peace or joy or home, left to the companionship of violent and vile men, driven by a strange fate to love with unquenchable and insupportable love a half-breed, a savage, an Isbel, the hereditary enemy of her people, and at last the ruthless murderer of her father. What in the name of God had she left to live for? Revenge? An eye for an eye, a life for a life. But she could not kill Jean Isbel. Woman's love could turn to hate, but not the love of Ellen Jorth. He could drag her by the hair in the dust, beat her, and make her a thing to loathe, and cut her mortally in his savage and implacable thirst for revenge. But, with her last gasp, she would whisper she loved him, and that she had lied to him to kill his faith. It was that, his strange faith in her purity, which had won her love. Of all men, 
that he should be the one to recognize the truth of her, the womanhood yet unsullied. How strange, how terrible, how overpowering. False, indeed, was she to the Jorths, false as her mother had been to an Isabel. This agony and destruction of her soul was the bitter Dead Sea fruit, the sins of her parents visited upon her. I'll end it all, she whispered to the night shadows that hovered over her. No coward was she. No fear of pain or mangled flesh or death or the mysterious hereafter could ever stay her. It would be easy. It would be a last thrill, a transport of self-abasement and the supreme self-proof of her love for Jean Isbel to kiss the rim rock where his feet had trod and then fling herself down into the depths. She was the last Jorth, so the wronged Isbels would be avenged. But he would never know. Never know I lied to him, she wailed to the night wind. She was lost, lost on earth and to hope of heaven. She had a right to neither live nor to die. She was nothing but a little weed along the trail of life, trampled upon, buried in the mud. She was nothing but a single rotten thread in a tangled web of love and hate and revenge, and she had broken. Lower and lower she seemed to sink. Was there no end to this gulf of despair? If Coulter had returned, he would have found her a rag and a toy, a creature degraded, fit for his vile embrace. To be thrust deeper into the mire, to be punished fittingly for her betrayal of a man's noble love and her own womanhood, to be made an end of body, mind, and soul. But Coulter did not return. The wind mourned. The owls hooted, the leaves rustled, the insects whispered their melancholy night song. The campfire flickered and faded. Then the wild forest land seemed to close imponderably over Ellen. All that she wailed in her despair, all that she confessed in her abasement, was true and hard as life could be. But she belonged to nature. If nature had not failed her, had God failed her, it was there, the lonely land of trees and fern and flower and brook, full of wild birds and beasts, where the mossy rocks could speak, and the solitude had ears, where she had always felt herself unutterably a part of creation. Thus a wavering spark of hope quivered through the blackness of her soul and gathered light. The gloom of the sky, the shifting clouds of dull shade, split asunder to show a glimpse of a radiant star, piercingly white, cold, pure, a steadfast eye of the universe, beyond all understanding, and illimitable, with its meaning of the past and the present and the future. Ellen watched it until the drifting clouds once more hid it from her strained sight. What had that star to do with hell? She might be crushed and destroyed by life, but was there not something beyond? Just to be born, just to suffer, just to die, could that be all? Despair did not lose its hold on Ellen. The strife and pang of her breast did not subside. But with the long hours, and the strange closing in of the forest around her, and the fleeting glimpse of that wonderful star, with a subtle divination of the meaning of her beating heart and throbbing mind, and lastly, with a voice thundering at her conscience that a man's faith in a woman must not be greater, nobler, than her faith in God and eternity, with these she checked the dark flight of her soul toward destruction. End of chapter 11, part 2「Section 23 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray » This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12, Part 1 A chill, gray, somber dawn was breaking when Ellen dragged herself into the cabin and crept under her blankets, there to sleep the sleep of exhaustion. When she awoke, the hour appeared to be late afternoon. Sun and sky shone through the sunken and decayed roof of the old cabin. Her uncle, Tad Jorth, lay upon a blanket bed, 
upheld by a crude couch of boughs. The light fell upon his face, pale, lined, cast in a still mold of suffering. He was not dead, for she heard his respiration. The floor underneath Ellen's blankets was bare clay. She and Jorth were alone in this cabin. It contained nothing besides their beds and a rank growth of weeds along the decayed lower logs. Half of the cabin had a rude ceiling of rough-hewn boards, which formed a kind of loft. This attic extended through to the adjoining cabin, forming the ceiling of the porch-like space between the two structures. There was no partition. A ladder of two aspen saplings, pegged to the logs, and with braces between for steps, led up to the attic. Ellen smelled wood smoke and the odor of frying meat, and she heard the voices of men. She looked out to see that Slater and Somers had joined their party, an addition that might have strengthened it for defense, but did not lend to her own situation anything favorable. Somers had always appeared the one best to avoid. Coulter espied her and called her to come and feed your pale face. His comrades laughed, not loudly but guardedly, as if noise was something to avoid. Nevertheless, they awoke Tad Jorth, who began to toss and moan on the bed. Ellen hurried to his side, and at once ascertained that he had a high fever and was in a critical condition. Every time he tossed, he opened a wound in his right breast rather high up. For all she could see, Nothing had been done for him except the binding of a scarf round his neck and under his arm. This scant bandage had worked loose. Going to the door, she called out, "'Fetch me some water.' When Coulter brought it, Ellen was rummaging in her pack for some clothing or towel that she could use for bandages. "'Weren't any of you decent enough to look after my uncle?' she queried. "'Huh? Well?' "'What the hell?' rejoined Coulter. "'We sure did all we could. "'I reckon you think it wasn't a tough job "'to pack him up the rim. "'He was done for then, and I said so.' "'I'll do all I can for him,' said Ellen. "'Sure, go ahead. "'When I get plugged or knifed by that half-breed, "'I sure hope you'll be round to nurse me.' "'You seem to be pretty sure of your fate, Coulter.' "'Sure as hell,' he bit out darkly. "'Summer saw Isbel and his gang trailing us to the Jorth Ranch. "'Are you going to stay here and wait for them?' "'Sure, I've been quarreling with the fellows out there over that very question. "'I'm for leaving the country, but Queen, the damn gunfighter, "'is dead set to kill that cowman, Blue, "'who swore he was King Fisher, the old Texas outlaw. "'None but Queen are spoiling for another fight.' All the same, they won't leave Tad Jorth here alone. Then Coulter leaned in at the door and whispered, Ellen, I can't boss this outfit, so let's you and me shake em. I've got your dad's gold. Let's ride off tonight and shake this country. Coulter, muttering under his breath, left the door and returned to his comrades. Ellen had received her first intimation of his cowardice and his mention of her father's gold started a train of thought that persisted in spite of her efforts to put all her mind to attending her uncle. He grew conscious enough to realize her working over him, and thanked her with a look that touched Ellen deeply. It changed the direction of her mind. His suffering and imminent death, which she was able to alleviate and retard somewhat, worked upon her pity and compassion so that she forgot her own plight. Half the night she was tending him, cooling his fever, holding him quiet. Well, she realized that but for her ministrations he would have died. At length he went to sleep. And Ellen, sitting beside him in the lonely, silent darkness of that late hour, received again the intimation of nature, those vague and nameless stirrings of her innermost being, those whisperings out of the night and the forest and the sky. Something great would not let go of her soul. She pondered. Attention to the wounded man occupied Ellen, 
and soon she redoubled her activities in this regard, finding in them something of protection against Coulter. He had weighed later, as she went to the spring for water, with a lunge like that of a bear. He had tried to embrace her, but Ellen had been too quick. "'Well, are you going away with me?' he demanded. "'No, I'll stick by my uncle,' she replied. That motive of hers seemed to obstruct his will. Ellen was keen to see that Coulter and his comrades were at a last stand and disintegrating under a severe strain. Nerve and courage of the open and the wild they possessed, but only in a limited degree. Coulter seemed obsessed by his passion for her, and though Ellen in her stubborn pride did not yet fear him, she realized she ought to. After that incident, she watched closely, never leaving her uncle's bedside, except when Coulter was absent. One or more of the men kept constant lookout somewhere down the canyon. Day after day passed on the wings of suspense, of watching, of ministering to her uncle, of waiting for some hour that seemed fixed. Coulter was like a hound upon her trail. At every turn he was there to importune her, to run off with him, to frighten her with the menace of the Isbels, to beg her to give herself to him. It came to pass that the only relief she had was when she ate with the men or barred the cabin door at night. Not much relief, however, was there in the shut and barred door. With one thrust of his powerful arm, Coulter could have caved it in. He knew this as well as Ellen. Still she did not have the fear she should have had. There was her rifle beside her, and though she did not allow her mind to run darkly on its possible use, still the fact of it being there at hand somehow strengthened her. Coulter was a cat playing with a mouse, but not yet sure of his quarry. Ellen came to know hours when she was weak, weak physically, mentally, spiritually, morally, when, under the sheer weight of this frightful and growing burden of suspense, she was not capable of fighting her misery, her abasement, her low ebb of vitality, and at the same time wholly withstanding Coulter's advances. He would come into the cabin, and utterly indifferent to Tad Jorth, he would try to make bold and unrestrained love to Ellen. When he caught her in one of her unresisting moments, and was able to hold her in his arms and kiss her, he seemed to be beside himself with the wonder of her. At such moments, if he had any softness or gentleness in him, they expressed themselves in a sooner or later letting her go, when apparently she was about to faint. So it must have become fascinatingly fixed in Coulter's mind that at times Ellen repulsed him with scorn and at others could not resist him. Ellen had escaped two crises in her relation with this man, and as a morbid doubt, like a poisonous fungus, began to strangle her mind. She instinctively divined that there was an approaching and final crisis. No uplift of her spirit came this time, no intimations, no whisperings. How horrible it all was. Too long to be good and noble, to realize that she was neither, to sink lower, day by day. Must she decay like one of these rotting logs? Worst of all, then, was the insinuating and ever-growing hopelessness. What was the use? What did it matter? Who would ever think of Ellen Jorth? Oh, God, she whispered in her distraction, is nothing left, nothing at all? A period of several days of less torment to Ellen followed. Her uncle, apparently took a turn for the better, and Coulter let her alone. This last circumstance nonplussed Ellen. She was at a loss to understand it, unless the Isbel menace now encroached upon Coulter so formidably that he had forgotten her for the present. Then one bright August morning, when she had begun to relax her eternal vigilance and breathe without oppression, Coulter encountered her darkly silent and fierce. He grasped her and drew her off her feet. Ellen struggled violently, 
but the total surprise had deprived her of strength, and that paralyzing weakness assailed her as never before. Without apparent effort, Coulter carried her, striding rapidly away from the cabins into the border of spruce trees at the foot of the canyon wall. Coulter, where, oh, where are you taking me? She found voice to cry out. By God, I don't know, he replied, with strong, vibrant passion. I was a fool not to carry you off long ago, but I waited. I was hoping you'd love me. And now that Isabel gang has corralled us. Summers has seen the half-breed up on the rocks, and Springer's seen the rest of them sneaking around. I run back after my horse and you. But Uncle Tad, we mustn't leave him alone, cried Ellen. We've got to, replied Coulter grimly. Tad sure won't worry you no more, soon as John Isbel gets to him. Oh, let me stay, implored Ellen. I will save him. Coulter laughed at the utter absurdity of her appeal and claim. Suddenly, he set her down upon her feet. Stand still, he ordered. Ellen saw his big bay horse saddled with pack and blanket, tied there in the shade of a spruce. With swift hands, Coulter untied him and mounted him, scarcely moving his piercing gaze from Ellen. He reached to grasp her. Up with you. Put your foot in the stirrup. His will, like his powerful arm, was irresistible for Ellen at that moment. She found herself swung up behind him. Then the horse plunged away. What with the hard motion and Coulter's iron grasp on her, Ellen was in a painful position. Her knees and feet came into violent contact with branches and snags. He galloped the horse, tearing through the dense thicket of willows that served to hide the entrance to the side canyon, and when out in the larger and more open canyon, he urged him to a run. Presently, when Coulter put the horse to a slow rise of ground, thereby bringing him to a walk, it was just in time to save Ellen a serious bruising. Again the sunlight appeared to shade over. They were in the pines. Suddenly, with backward lunge, Coulter halted the horse. Ellen heard a yell. She recognized Queen's voice. Turn back, Coulter, turn back. With an oath, Coulter wheeled his mount. If I didn't run plumb into them, he ejaculated harshly, and scarcely had the goaded horse gotten a start when a shot rang out. Ellen felt a violent shock, as if her momentum had suddenly met with a check, and then she felt herself wrenched from Coulter, from the saddle, and propelled into the air. She alighted on soft ground and thick grass, and was unhurt save for the violent wrench and shaking that had rendered her breathless. Before she could rise, Coulter was pulling at her, lifting her to her feet. She saw the horse lying with bloody head. Tall pines loomed all around. Another rifle cracked. Run, his Coulter, and he bounded off, dragging her by the hand. Another yell pealed out. Here we are, Coulter. Again it was Queen's shrill voice. Ellen ran with all her might, her heart in her throat, and her sight failing to record more than a blur of passing pines and a blank green wall of spruce. Then she lost her balance, was falling, yet she could not fall because of that steel grip on her hand, and was dragged and finally carried into a dense shade. She was blinded. The trees whirled and faded. Voices and shots sounded far away. Then something black seemed to be wiped across her feeling. It turned to gray, to moving blankness, to dim, hazy objects, spectral and tall, like blanketed trees. And when Ellen fully recovered consciousness, she was being carried through the forest. "'Well, little one, that was a close shave for you,' said Coulter's hard voice, growing clearer. "'Reckon your keeling over was natural enough.' He held her lightly in both arms, her head resting above his left elbow. Ellen saw his face as a gray blur, then taking sharper outline, until it stood out distinctly, pale and clammy, with eyes cold and wonderful in their intense flare. As she gazed upward, Coulter turned his head to look back through the woods, 
and his motion betrayed a keen, wild vigilance. The veins of his lean brown neck stood out like whip cords. Two comrades were stalking beside him. Ellen heard their stealthy steps, and she felt Coulter sheer from one side to the other. They were proceeding cautiously, fearful of the rear, but not wholly trusting to the fore. "'Reckon we'd better go slow and look before we leap,' said one whose voice Ellen recognized as Springer's. "'Sure that open slope ain't to my liking, with our Ness Pierce friend prowling round,' drawled Coulter, as he set Ellen down on her feet. Another of the rustlers laughed. "'Say, can't he twinkle through the forest? I had four shots at him. Harder to hit than a turkey running crossways.' This facetious speaker was the evil-visaged, sardonic Somers. He carried two rifles and wore two belts of cartridges. "'Ellen, sure you ain't so dead white as you was,' observed Coulter, and he chucked her under the chin with familiar hand. "'Sit down here. I don't want you stopping any bullets, and there's no telling.' Ellen was glad to comply with his wish. She had begun to recover wits and strength, yet she still felt shaky. She observed that their position, then, was on the edge of a well-wooded slope from which she could see the grassy canyon floor below. They were on a level bench projecting out from the main canyon wall that loomed gray and rugged and pine-fringed. Summers and Coulter and Springer gave careful attention to all points of the compass, especially in the direction from which they had come. They evidently anticipated being trailed or circled or headed off, but did not manifest much concern. Summers lit a cigarette. Springer wiped his face with a grimy hand and counted the shells in his belt, which appeared to be half empty. Coulter stretched his long neck like a vulture and peered down the slope and through the aisles of the forest up toward the canyon rim. End of chapter 12, part 1「Section twenty four of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve, part two. Listen, he said tersely, and bent his head a little to one side, ear to the slight breeze. They all listened. Ellen heard the beating of her heart, the rustle of leaves, the tapping of a woodpecker, and faint remote sounds that she could not name. Dear, I reckon, spoke up Summers. Ah, oh, well, I reckon they ain't trailing us yet, replied Coulter. We gave them a shade better than they sent us. Short and sweet, ejaculated Springer, and he removed his black sombrero to poke a dirty finger through a bullet hole in the crown. That's how close I come to cashin'. I was lying behind a log, listening and watching, and when I stuck my head up a little, zam! Somebody made my bonnet leak. Where's Queen? asked Coulter. He was with me first off, replied Summers, and then when the shooting slacked, after I plugged that big, red-faced, white-haired pal of Isbel's— Reckon that was Blaisdell, interrupted Springer. Queen, he got tired, laying low, went on Summers. He wanted action. I heard him chewing to himself, and when I asked him what was eating him, he upped and growled that he was going to quit this engine fighting, and he slipped off in the woods. Well, that's the gunfighter of it, declared Coulter, wagging his head. Ever since that cowman, Blue, braced us and said he was King Fisher, why Queen has been sulkier and sulkier. He can't help it. He'll do the same trick as Blue tried, and he'll sure get his everlasting. But he's the Texas breed, all right. Say, do you reckon Blue really is King Fisher? queried Summers. Nah, ejaculated Coulter, with downward sweep of his hand. Many a would-be gunslinger has borrowed Fisher's name, but Fisher is dead these many years. Ah, oh, well, maybe, but don't you forget it. That Blue was no would-be, declared Summers. He was the genuine article. I should smile, affirmed Springer. The subject irritated Coulter. He dismissed it. 
with another forcible gesture and a counter-question. How many left in that Isbel outfit? No tellin'. There were sure enough of them, replied Summers. Anyhow, the woods was full of flying bullets. Springer, did you account for any of them? Nope, not that I noticed, responded Springer dryly. I had my chance at the half-breed. Reckon I was nervous. Was Slater near you when he yelled out? No, he was lying beside Summers. Wasn't that a queer way for a man to act? broke in Summers. A bullet hit Slater, cut him down the back as he was lying flat. Reckon it wasn't bad, but it hurt him so that he jumped right up and staggered around. He made a target as big as a tree. And maybe them Isbels didn't riddle him. That was when I got my crack at Bill Isbel, declared Coulter, with grim satisfaction. When they shot my horse out from under me, I had Ellen to think of, and couldn't get my rifle. Sure had to run, as you seen. Well, as I only had my six-shooter, there was nothing for me to do but lay low and listen to the sping of lead. Wells was standing up behind a tree, about thirty yards off. He got plugged, and falling over, he began to crawl my way, still holding to his rifle. I crawled along the log to meet him, but he dropped about halfway. I went on and took his rifle and belt. When I peeped out from behind a spruce bush, then I seen Bill Isbell. He was shooting fast, and all of them was shooting fast. That was when they had the open shot at Slater. Well, I bored Bill Isbell right through his middle. He dropped his rifle, and all bent double, he fooled around in a circle till he flopped over the rim. I reckon he's laying right up there somewhere below that dead spruce. I'd sure like to see him. Ah, oh, you'd be crazy as queen if you tried that, declared Summers. We're not out of the woods yet. I reckon not, replied Coulter, and I've lost my horse. Where'd you leave yours? They're down the canyon below that willow break, and saddled and none of them tied. Reckon we'll have to look them up before dark. Coulter, what are we going to do? demanded Springer. Wait here a while, then cross the canyon and work round up under the bluff back to the cabin. And then what? queried Summers, doubtfully eyeing Coulter. We've got to eat, and we've got to have blankets, rejoined Coulter testily, and I reckon we can hide there and stand a better show in a fight than running for it in the woods. Well, I'm giving you a hunch that it looked like you were running for it, retorted Summers. Yes, and packing the girl, added Springer. Looks funny to me. Both rustlers eyed Coulter with dark and distrustful glances. What he might have replied never transpired, for the reason that his gaze, always shifting around, had suddenly fixed on something. Is that a wolf? he asked, pointing to the rim. Both his comrades moved to get in line with his finger. Ellen could not see from her position. Sure, that's a big loafer, declared Summers. Reckon he scented us. There he goes along the rim, observed Coulter. He doesn't act leery. Looks like a good sign to me. Maybe the Isbels have gone the other way. Looks bad to me, rejoined Springer gloomily. And why? demanded Coulter. I seen that animal. First time I reckoned it was a loafer. Second time it was right near them Isbels. And I'm damned now if I don't believe it's that half-loafer sheepdog of gas Isbels. Well, what if it is? Ha! Huh. Sure we needn't worry about hiding out, replied Springer, sententiously. With that dog, Jean Isbel could trail a grasshopper. The hell you say, muttered Coulter. Manifestly, such a possibility put a different light upon the present situation. The men grew silent and watchful, occupied by brooding thoughts and vigilant surveillance of all points. Summers slipped off into the brush, soon to return, with intent look of importance. I heard something, he whispered jerking his thumb backward, rolling gravel, cracking of twigs. No deer. Reckon it'd be a good idea for us to slip round across this bench. Well, you fellas go, and I'll watch here, returned Coulter. Not much, said Summers, while Springer leered knowingly. 
Coulter became incensed, but he did not give way to it. Pondering a moment, he finally turned to Ellen. You wait here till I come back, and if I don't come in reasonable time, you slip across the canyon and through the willows to the cabins. Wait till about dark. With that, he possessed himself of one of the extra rifles and belts and silently joined his comrades. Together they noiselessly stole into the brush. Ellen had no other thought than to comply with Coulter's wishes. There was her wounded uncle, who had been left unattended, and she was anxious to get back to him. Besides, if she had wanted to run off from Coulter, where could she go? Alone in the woods, she would get lost and die of starvation. Her lot must be cast with the Jorth faction until the end. That did not seem far away. Her strained attention and suspense made the moments fly by. By and by, several shots pealed out far across the side canyon on her right, and they were answered by reports sounding closer to her. The fight was on again, but these shots were not repeated. The flies buzzed, the hot sun beat down and sloped to the west, the soft warm breeze stirred the aspens, the ravens croaked, the red squirrels and blue jays chattered. Suddenly, a quick, short yelp electrified Ellen, brought her upright with sharp, listening rigidity. Sure it was not a wolf, and hardly could it be a coyote. Again she heard it, the yelp of a sheepdog. She had heard that often enough to know. And she rose to change her position so she could command a view of the rocky bluff above. Presently, she espied what really appeared to be a big timber wolf. But another yelp satisfied her that it really was a dog. She watched him. Soon it became evident that he wanted to get down over the bluff. He ran to and fro and then out of sight. In a few moments, his yelp sounded from lower down at the base of the bluff. And it was now the cry of an intelligent dog that was trying to call someone to his aid. Ellen grew convinced that the dog was near where Coulter had said Bill Isbel had plunged over the declivity. Would the dog yelp that way if the man was dead? Ellen thought not. No one came, and the continuous yelping of the dog got on Ellen's nerves. It was a call for help, and finally she surrendered to it. Since her natural terror when Coulter's horse was shot out from under her, and she had been dragged away, she had not recovered from fear of the Isbels. But calm consideration now convinced her that she could hardly be in a worse plight in their hands than if she remained with Coulter's. So she started out to find the dog. The wooded bench was level for a few hundred yards, and then it began to heave in rugged rocky bulges up toward the rim. It did not appear far to where the dog was barking, but the latter part of the distance proved to be a hard climb over jumbled rocks and through thick brush. Panting and hot, she at length reached the base of the bluff to find that it was not very high. The dog espied her before she saw him, for he was coming toward her when she discovered him. Big, shaggy, grayish, white and black, with wild, keen face and eyes he assuredly looked the reputation Springer had accorded him but sagacious, guarded was his approach. He appeared friendly. "'Hello, doggy,' panted Ellen. "'What's wrong up here?' He yelped. His ears lost their stiffness. His body sank a little, and his bushy tail wagged to and fro. What a gray, clear, intelligent look he gave her. Then he trotted back. Ellen followed him around a corner of bluff to see the body of a man lying on his back. Fresh earth and gravel lay about him, attesting to his fall from above. He had on neither coat nor hat, and the position of his body and limbs suggested broken bones. Ellen hurried to his side. She saw that the front of his shirt low down was a bloody blotch, but he could lift his head, his eyes were open, and he was perfectly conscious. Ellen did not recognize the dusty, skinned face, yet the mold of features the look of the eyes seemed strangely familiar. 
"'You're Jorth's girl,' he said, in faint voice of surprise. "'Yes, I'm Ellen Jorth,' she replied. "'And are you Bill Isbel?' "'All that's left of me. "'But I'm thanking God somebody come, even a Jorth.' Ellen knelt beside him and examined the wound in his abdomen. A heavy bullet had indeed, as Coulter had avowed, torn clear through his middle. Even if he had not sustained other serious injury from the fall over the cliff, the terrible bullet wound meant death very shortly. Ellen shuddered. How inexplicable were men! How cruel, bloody, mindless! "'Isabel, I'm sorry. There's no hope,' she said, low-voiced. "'You've not long to live. I can't help you. God knows I'd do so if I could.' All over, he sighed, with his eyes looking beyond her. I reckon I'm glad. But you can do something for me, will you? Indeed, yes, tell me, she replied, lifting his dusty head on her knee. Her hands trembled as she brushed his wet hair back from his clammy brow. I've something on my conscience, he whispered. The woman, the sensitive in Ellen, understood and pitied him then. Yes, she encouraged him. I stole cattle, my dad's and Blaisdell's, and made deals with Dags. All the crookedness wasn't on Jorth's side. I want my brother Jean to know. I'll try to tell him, whispered Ellen, out of her great amaze. We were all a bad lot, except Jean, went on Isabel. Dad wasn't fair. God, how he hated Jorth. Jorth, yes, who was your father. Well, they're even now. How so? faltered Ellen. Your father killed Dad. At the last, Dad wanted to save us. He sent word he'd meet him face to face and let that end the feud. They met out in the road. But someone shot Dad down with a rifle, and then your father finished him. And then Isbel added Ellen, with unconscious mocking bitterness, your brother murdered my dad. What? whispered Bill Isbel. Sure you got it wrong. I reckon Jean could have killed your father, but he didn't. Queer, we all thought. Ah, who did kill my father? burst out Ellen, and her voice rang like great hammers at her ears. It was Blue. He went in the store alone, faced the whole gang alone, bluffed them, taunted them, told them he was King Fisher. Then he killed your dad, and Jackson Jorth, and Jean was out back of the store. We were out front. There were shooting. Colmer was hit. Then Blue ran out, bad hurt. Both of them died in Meeker's yard. And so Jean Isbel has not killed a Jorth, said Ellen, in strange, deep voice. No, replied Isbel earnestly. I reckon this feud was hardest on Jean. He never lived here. And my sister Anne said he got sweet on you. Now, did he? Slow, stinging tears filled Ellen's eyes, and her head sank low and lower. "'Yes, he did,' she murmured tremulously. "'Ah, well, that accounts,' replied Isabel wonderingly. "'Too bad. It might have been. A man always sees different when he's dying. If I had my life to live over again. My poor kids deserted in their babyhood, ruined for life, all for nothing.' May God forgive? Then he choked and whispered for water. Ellen laid his head back, and rising, she took a sombrero and started hurriedly down the slope, making dust fly and rocks roll. Her mind was a seething ferment. Leaping, bounding, sliding down the weathered slope, she gained the bench to run across that, and so on down into the open canyon to the willow-bordered brook. Here she filled the sombrero with water and started back, forced now to walk slowly and carefully. It was then, with the violence and fury of intense muscular activity denied her, that the tremendous import of Bill Isbel's revelation burst upon her very flesh and blood, and transfiguring the very world of golden light and azure sky and speaking forest land that encompassed her. Not a drop of the precious water did she spill. Not a misstep did she make. Yet so great was the spell upon her 
that she was not aware she had climbed the steep slope until the dog yelped his welcome. Then, with all the flood of her emotions surging and resurging, she knelt to allay the parching thirst of this dying enemy, whose words had changed frailty to the strength, hate to love, and the gloomy hell of despair to something unutterable. But she had returned too late. Bill Isbel was dead. End of chapter 12, part 2「Section twenty five of to the last man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen, part one. Jean Isbel, holding the wolf dog Shep in leash, was on the trail of the most dangerous of Jorth's gang, the gunman Queen. Dark drops of blood on the stones, and plain tracks of a rider's sharp heeled boots behind coverts indicated the trail of a wounded, slow-traveling fugitive. Therefore Jean Isbel held in the dog and proceeded with the wary eye and watchful caution of an Indian. Queen, true to his class, and emulating Blue, with the same magnificent effrontery and with the same paralyzing suddenness of surprise, had appeared as if by magic at the last night camp of the Isbel faction. Jean had seen him first, in time to leap like a panther into the shadow. But he carried in his shoulder Queen's first bullet of that terrible encounter. Upon Gordon and Fredericks fell the brunt of Queen's fusillade, and they, shot to pieces, staggering and falling, held passionate grip on life long enough to draw and still Queen's guns and send him reeling off into the darkness of the forest. Unarmed and hindered by a painful wound, Jean had kept a vigil near camp that silent and menacing night. Morning disclosed Gordon and Frederick stark and ghastly beside the burned-out campfire, their guns clutched immovably in stiffened hands. Jean buried them as best he could, and when they were underground with flat stones on their graves, he knew himself to be indeed the last of the Isbel clan and all that was wild and savage in his blood and desperate in his spirit rose to make him more than man and less than human. Then for the third time during these tragic last days the wolf-dog Shep came to him. Jean washed the wound Queen had given him and bound it tightly. The keen pang and burn of the lead was a constant and all-powerful reminder of the grim work left for him to do. The whole world was no longer large enough for him and whoever was left of the Jorths. The heritage of blood his father had bequeathed him, the unshakable love for a worthless girl who had so dwarfed and obstructed his will and so bitterly defeated and reviled his poor, romantic boyish faith, the killing of hostile men, so strange in its after-effects, the pursuits and fights and loss of one by one of his confederates these had finally engendered in Jean Isabel a wild, unslackable thirst. These had been the cause of his retrogression. These had unalterably and ruthlessly fixed in his darkened mind one fierce passion, to live and die the last man of that Jorth Isabel feud. At sunrise, Jean left this camp, taking with him only a small knapsack of meat and bread, and with the eager wild Shep in leash, he set out on Queen's bloody trail. Black drops of blood on the stones and an irregular trail of footprints proved to Jean that the gunman was hard hit. Here he had fallen or knelt or sat down, evidently to bind his wounds. Jean found strips of scarf, red and discarded, and the blood drops failed to show on more rocks. In a deep forest of spruce, under silver-tipped spreading branches, Queen had rested, perhaps slept. Then laboring with dragging steps, not improbably with a lame leg, he had gone on, up out of the dark green ravine, to the open, dry, pine-tipped ridge. Here he had rested, perhaps waited to see if he were pursued. From that point his trail spoke an easy language for Jean's keen eye. 
The gunman knew he was pursued. He had seen his enemy. Therefore Jean proceeded with a slow caution, never getting within revolver range of ambush, using all his woodcraft to trail this man and yet save himself. Queen traveled slowly, either because he was wounded or else because he tried to ambush his pursuer. And Jean accommodated his pace to that of Queen. From noon of that day they were never far apart, never out of hearing of a rifle shot. The contrast of the beauty and peace and loneliness of the surroundings to the nature of Queen's flight often obtruded its strange truth into the somber turbulence of Jean's mind, into that fixed columnar idea around which fleeting thoughts hovered and gathered like shadows. Early frost had touched the heights with its magic wand, and the forest seemed a temple in which man might worship nature and life rather than steal through the dells and under the arched aisles like a beast of prey. The green and gold leaves of aspens quivered in the glades, Maples in the ravines fluttered their red and purple leaves. The needle-matted carpet under the pines vied with the long lanes of silver grass, alike enticing to the eye of man and beast. Sunny rays of light, flecked with dust and flying insects, slanted down from the overhanging brown-limbed, green-massed foliage. Roar of wind in the distant forest alternated with soft breeze close at hand. Small, dove-gray squirrels ran all over the woodland, very curious about Jean and his dog, rustling the twigs, scratching the barks of trees, chattering and barking, frisky, saucy, and bright-eyed. A plaintive twitter of wild canaries came from the region above the treetops. First voices of birds in their pilgrimage toward the south, Pine cones dropped with soft thuds. The blue jays followed these intruders in the forest, screeching their displeasure. Like rain pattered the dropping seeds from the spruce. A woody, earthy, leafy fragrance, damp with the current of life, mingled with a cool, dry, sweet smell of withered grass and rotting pines. Solitude and lonesomeness, peace and rest, wildlife and nature reigned there, it was a golden green region, enchanting to the gaze of man. An Indian would have walked there with his spirits. And even as Jean felt all this elevating beauty and inscrutable spirit, his keen eye once more fastened upon the blood-red drops Queen had again left on the gray moss and rock. His wound had reopened. Jean felt the thrill of the scenting panther. The sun set. Twilight gathered, night fell. Jean crawled under a dense, low-spreading spruce, ate some bread and meat, fed the dog, and lay down to rest and sleep. His thoughts burdened him, heavy and black as the mantle of night. A wolf mourned a hungry cry for a mate. Shep quivered under Jean's hand. That was the call which had lured him from the ranch. The wolf blood in him yearned for the wild. Jean tied the cowhide leash to his wrist. When this dark business was at an end, Shep could be free to join the lonely mate morning out there in the forest. Then Jean slept. Dawn broke, cold, clear, frosty, with silvered grass sparkling, with a soft, faint rustling of fallen aspen leaves. When the sun rose red, Jean was again on the trail of Queen. By a frosty, ferned brook, where water tinkled and ran clear as air and cold as ice, Jean quenched his thirst, leaning on a stone that showed drops of blood. Queen, too, had quenched his thirst. What good, what help, Jean wondered, could the cold, sweet granite water, so dear to woodsmen and wild creatures, do this wounded, hunted rustler? Why did he not wait in the open to fight and face the death he had met it? Where was that splendid and terrible daring of the gunman? Queen's love of life dragged him on and on, hour by hour, through the pine groves and spruce woods, through the oak swales and aspen glades, up and down the rocky gorges, and around the windfalls and over the rotting logs. 
The time came when Queen tried no more ambush. He gave up trying to trap his pursuer by lying in wait. He gave up trying to conceal his tracks. He grew stronger, or, in desperation, increased his energy, so that he redoubled his progress through the wilderness. That, at best, would count only a few miles a day. And he began to circle to the northwest, back toward the deep canyon, where Blaisdell and Bill Isbel had reached the end of their trails. Queen had evidently left his comrades. He had lone-handed it in his last fight, but he was now trying to get back to them. Somewhere in these wild, deep forest breaks, the rest of the Jorth faction had found a hiding place. Jean let Queen lead him there. Ellen Jorth would be with them. Jean had seen her. It had been his shot that killed Coulter's horse. And he had withheld further fire because Coulter had dragged the girl behind him, protecting his body with hers. Sooner or later, Jean would come upon their camp. She would be there. The thought of her dark beauty, wasted in wantonness, upon these rustlers added a deadly rage to the bloodlust and righteous wrath of his vengeance. Let her again flaunt her degradation in his face, and, by the god she had forsaken, he would kill her, and so end the race of Jorths. Another night fell, dark and cold, without starlight. The wind moaned in the forest. Shep was restless. He sniffed the air. There was a step on his trail. Again a mournful, eager, wild, and hungry wolf cry broke the silence. It was deep and low, like that of a baying hound, but infinitely wilder. Shep strained to get away. During the night, while Jean slept, he managed to chew the cow-eyed leash apart and run off. Next day, no dog was needed to trail Queen. Fog and low-drifting clouds in the forest and a misty rain had put the rustler off his bearings. He was lost, and showed that he realized it. Strange how a mature man, fighter of a hundred battles, steeped in bloodshed and on his last stand, should grow panic-stricken upon being lost. So Jean Isbel read the signs of the trail. Queen circled and wandered through the foggy, dripping forest until he headed down into a canyon. It was one that notched the rim and led down and down, mile after mile, into the basin. Not soon had Queen discovered his mistake. When he did do so, night overtook him. The weather cleared before morning. Red and bright the sun burst out of the east to flood that low basin land with light. Jean found that Queen had traveled on and on, hoping, no doubt, to regain what he had lost. But in the darkness, he had climbed to the Manzanita slopes instead of back up the canyon. And here he had fought the hold of that strange brush of Spanish name until he fell exhausted. Surely Queen would make a stand and wait somewhere in this devilish thicket for Jean to catch up with him. Many and many a place Jean would have chosen had he been in Queen's place. Many a rock and dense thicket Jean circled or approached with extreme care. Manzanita grew in patches that were impenetrable except for a small animal. The brush was a few feet high, seldom so high that Jean could not look over it, and of a beautiful appearance, having glossy small leaves, a golden berry, and branches of dark red color. These branches were tough and unbendable. Every bush, almost, had low branches that were dead, hard as steel, sharp as thorns, as clutching as cactus. Progress was possible only by endless detours to find the half-closed aisle between patches, or else by crashing through with main strength or walking right over the tops. Jean preferred this last method, not because it was the easiest, but for the reason that he could see ahead so much farther. So he literally walked across the tips of the manzanita brush. Often he fell through, and had to step up again. Many a branch broke with him, letting him down, but for the most part he stepped from fork to fork, on branch after branch, with balance of an Indian and the patience of a man whose purpose was sustaining and immutable. On that south slope under the rim the sun beat down hot. 
there was no breeze to temper the dry air. And before midday, Jean was laboring, wet with sweat, parching with thirst, dusty and hot and tiring. It amazed him, the doggedness and tenacity of life shown by this wounded rustler. The time came when, under the burning rays of the sun, he was compelled to abandon the walk across the tips of the manzanita bushes and take to the winding open threads that ran between. It would have been poor sight, indeed, that he could not have followed Queen's labyrinthine and broken passage through the brush. Then the time came when Jean espied Queen, far ahead and above, crawling like a black bug, along the bright green slope. Sight then acted upon Jean as upon a hound in the chase, but he governed his actions if he could not govern his instincts. Slowly but surely he followed the dusty hot trail, and never a patch of blood failed to send a thrill along his veins. Queen headed up toward the rim, finally vanished from sight. Had he fallen? Was he hiding? But the hour disclosed that he was crawling. Jean's keen eye caught the slow moving of the brush and enabled him to keep just so close to the rustler out of the range of the six shooters he carried. And so all the interminable hours of the hot afternoon that snail pace flight and pursuit kept on. Halfway up the rim, the growth of manzanita gave place to open, yellow, rocky slope dotted with cedars. Queen took to a slow ascending ridge and left his bloody tracks all the way to the top, where in the gathering darkness the weary pursuer lost them. Another night passed. Daylight was relentless to the rustler. He could not hide his trail, but somehow, in a desperate last rally of strength, he reached a point on the heavily timbered ridge that Jean recognized as being near the scene of the fight in the canyon. Queen was nearing the rendezvous of the rustlers, Jean crossed tracks of horses, and then more tracks that he was certain had been made days past by his own party. To the left of this ridge must be the deep canyon that had frustrated his efforts to catch up with the rustlers on the day Blaisdell lost his life, and probably Bill Isbel, too. Something warned Jean that he was nearing the end of the trail, and an unaccountable sense of imminent catastrophe seemed foreshadowed by vague dreads and doubts in his gloomy mind. Jean felt the need of rest, of food, of ease from the strain of the last weeks, but his spirit drove him implacably. Queen's rally of strength ended at the edge of an open bald ridge that was bare of brush or grass and was surrounded by a line of forest on three sides, and on the fourth by a low bluff which raised its gray head above the pines. Across this dusty open, Queen had crawled, leaving unmistakable signs of his condition. Jean took long survey of the circle of trees and of the low rocky eminence, neither of which he liked. It might be wiser to keep the cover, Jean thought, and work around to where Queen's trail entered the forest again. But he was tired, gloomy, and his eternal vigilance was failing. Nevertheless, he stilled for the thousandth time that bold prompting of his vengeance, and, taking to the edge of the forest, he went to considerable pains to circle the open ground. And suddenly, sight of a man sitting back against a tree halted John. He stared to make sure his eyes did not deceive him. Many times stumps and snags and rocks had taken on strange resemblance to a standing or crouching man. This was only another suggestive blunder of the mind behind his eyes. What he wanted to see, he imagined he saw. Jean glided from tree to tree until he made sure that the sitting image indeed was that of a man. He sat bolt upright, facing back across the open, hands resting on his knees, and closer scrutiny showed Jean that he held a gun in each hand. Queen. At last his nerve had revived. He could not crawl any farther. He could never escape, so with the courage of fatality he chose the open to face his foe and die. 
Jean had a thrill of admiration for the rustler. Then he stalked out from under the pines and strolled forward with his rifle ready. A watching man could not have failed to espy Jean, but Queen never made the slightest move. Moreover, his stiff, unnatural position struck Jean so singularly that he halted with a muttered exclamation. He was now about fifty paces from Queen, within range of those small guns. Jean called sharply, Queen! Still the figure never relaxed in the slightest. Jean advanced a few more paces, rifle up, ready to fire the instant Queen lifted a gun. The man's immobility brought the cold sweat to Jean's brow. He stopped to bend the full intense power of his gaze upon this inert figure. Suddenly, over Jean, flashed its meaning. Queen was dead. He had backed up against a pine, ready to face his foe, and he had died there. Not a shadow of a doubt entered Jean's mind as he started forward again. He knew, after all, Queen's blood would not be on his hands. Gordon and Fredericks, in their death throes, had given the rustler mortal wounds. Jean kept on, marveling the while, how ghastly, thin, and hard. Those four days of flight had been hell for Queen. Jean reached him, looked down with staring eyes. The guns were tied to his hands. Jean started violently, as the whole direction of his mind shifted. A lightning glance showed that Queen had been propped against a tree. Another showed boot tracks in the dust. By heaven, they fooled me, hissed Jean, and quickly as he leaped behind the pine, he was not quick enough to escape the cunning rustlers, who had waylaid him thus. He felt the shock, the bite and burn of lead, before he heard a rifle crack. A bullet had ripped through his left forearm. From behind the tree, he saw a puff of white smoke along the face of the bluff, the very spot his keen and gloomy vigilance had described as one of menace. Then several puffs of white smoke and ringing reports betrayed the ambush of the tricksters. Bullets barked the pine and whistled by. Jean saw a man dart from behind the rock and, leaning over, run for another. Jean's swift shot stopped him midway. He fell, got up, and floundered behind a bush scarcely large enough to conceal him. Into that bush Jean shot again and again. He had no pain in his wounded arm, but the sense of the shock clung in his consciousness, and this, with the tremendous surprise of the deceit and sudden release of long-damned, overmastering passion, caused him to empty the magazine of his Winchester in a terrible haste to kill the man he had hit. These were all the loads he had for his rifle. Blood passion had made him blunder. Jean cursed himself, and his hand moved to his belt. His six-shooter was gone. The sheath had been loose. He had tied the gun fast, but the strings had been torn apart. The rustlers were shooting again. Bullets thudded into the pine and whistled by. Bending carefully, Jean reached one of Queen's guns and jerked it from his hand. The weapon was empty. Both of his guns were empty. Jean peeped out again to get the line in which the bullets were coming, and, marking a course from his position to the cover of the forest, he ran with all his might. He gained the shelter. Shrill yells behind him warned that he had been seen, that his reason for flight had been guessed. Looking back, he saw two or three men scrambling down the bluff. Then the loud neigh of a frightened horse pealed out. End of chapter 13, part 1section twenty six of to the last man by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen part two jean discarded his useless rifle and headed down the ridge slope keeping to the thickest line of pines and shearing around the clumps of spruce as he ran his mind whirled with grim thoughts of escape of his necessity to find the camp where Gordon and Fredericks were buried, 
there to procure another rifle and ammunition. He felt the wet blood dripping down his arm, yet no pain. The forest was too open for good cover. He dared not run uphill. His only course was ahead, and that soon ended in an abrupt declivity, too precipitous to descend. As he halted, panting for breath, he heard the ring of hoofs on stone. Then the thudding beat of running horses on soft ground. The rustlers had sighted the direction he had taken. Jean did not waste time to look. Indeed, there was no need, for as he bounded along the cliff to the right, a rifle cracked and a bullet whizzed over his head. It lent wings to his feet. Like a deer, he sped along, leaping cracks and logs and rocks, his ears filled by the rush of wind, until his eye caught sight of thick-growing spruce foliage close to the precipice. He sprang down into the green mass. His weight precipitated him through the upper branches, but lower down his spread arms broke his fall, then retarded it until he caught. A long swaying limb led him down and down, where he grasped another and a stiffer one that held his weight. Hand over hand he worked toward the trunk of this spruce, and gaining it, he found other branches close together, down which he hastened, hold by hold and step by step, until above him was black, dense foliage, and beneath him the brown, shady slope. Sure of being unseen from above, he glided noiselessly down under the trees, slowly regaining freedom from that constriction of his breast. Passing on to a gray lichened cliff, overhanging and gloomy, he paused there to rest and to listen. A faint crack of hoof on stone came to him from above, apparently farther on to the right. Eventually his pursuers would discover that he had taken to the canyon, but for the moment he felt safe. The wound in his forearm drew his attention. The bullet had gone clear through without breaking either bone. His shirt sleeve was soaked with blood. Jean rolled it back and tightly wrapped his scarf around the wound. Yet still the dark red blood oozed out and dripped down into his hand. He became aware of a dull, throbbing pain. Not much time did Jean waste in arriving at what was best to do. For the time being he had escaped, and whatever had been his peril, it was past. In dense, rugged country like this, he could not be caught by rustlers. But he had only a knife left for a weapon, and there was very little meat in the pocket of his coat. Salt and matches he possessed. Therefore, the imperative need was for him to find the last camp, where he could get rifle and ammunition, bake bread, and rest up before taking again the trail of the rustlers. He had reason to believe that this canyon was the one where the fight on the rim, and later on a bench of woodland below, had taken place. Thereupon he arose and glided down under the spruces, toward the level grassy open he could see between the trees. And as he proceeded with the slow step and wary eye of an Indian, his mind was busy. Queen had in his flight unerringly worked in the direction of this canyon until he became lost in the fog, and upon regaining his bearings he had made a wonderful and heroic effort to surmount the Manzanita slope and the rim and to find the rendezvous of his comrades. But he had failed up there on the ridge. In thinking it over, Jean arrived at a conclusion that Queen, finding he could go no farther, had waited, guns in hand, for his pursuer, and he had died in this position. Then, by strange coincidence, his comrades had happened to come across him, and recognizing the situation, they had taken the shells from his guns and propped him up with the idea of luring Jean on. They had arranged a cunning trick and ambush, which had all but snuffed out the last of the Isbels. Coulter probably had been at the bottom of this crafty plan, since the fight at the Isbel Ranch, now seemingly far back in the past, this man Coulter had loomed up more and more as a stronger and more dangerous antagonist than either Jorth or Daggs. Before that, 
he had been little known to any of the Isbel faction. And it was Coulter now who controlled the remnant of the gang, and who had Ellen Jorth in his possession. The canyon wall above Jean on the right grew more rugged and loftier, and the one on the left began to show wooded slopes and breaks, and at last a wide expanse with a winding willow border on the west and a long, low, pine-dotted bench on the east. It took several moments of study for Jean to recognize the rugged bluff above this bench. Up on that canyon several miles was the site where Queen had surprised Jean and his comrades at their campfire. Somewhere in this vicinity was the hiding place of the rustlers. Thereupon, Jean proceeded with the utmost stealth, absolutely certain that he would miss no sound, movement, sign, or anything unnatural to the wild peace of the canyon. And his first sense to register something was his keen smell. Sheep? He was amazed to smell sheep. There must be a flock not far away. Then, from where he glided along under the trees, he saw down to open places in the willow break and noticed sheep tracks in the dark, muddy bank of the brook. Next he heard faint tinkle of bells, and at length, when he could see farther into the open enlargement of the canyon, his surprised gaze fell upon an immense gray, woolly patch that blotted out acres and acres of grass. Thousands of sheep were grazing there. Jean knew there were several flocks of Jorth's sheep on the mountain, in the care of herders, but he had never thought of them being so far west, more than twenty miles from Chevalon Canyon. His roving eyes could not descry any herders or dogs, but he knew there must be dogs close to that immense flock, and whatever his cunning, he could not hope to elude the scent and sight of shepherd dogs. It would be best to go back the way he had come, wait for darkness, then cross the canyon and climb out, and work around to his objective point. Turning at once, he started to glide back, but almost immediately he was brought stock still and thrilling by the sound of hoofs. Horses were coming in the direction he wished to take. They were close. His swift conclusion was that the men who had pursued him up on the rim had worked down into the canyon. One circling glance showed him that he had no sure covert near at hand. It would not do to risk their passing him there. The border of woodland was narrow and not dense enough for close inspection. He was forced to turn back up the canyon in the hope of soon finding a hiding place or breaking the wall where he could climb up. Hugging the base of the wall, he slipped on, passing the point where he had espied the sheep, and gliding on until he was stopped by a bend in the dense line of willows. It sheared to the west there and ran close to the high wall. Jean kept on until he was stooping under a curling border of willow thicket, with branches slim and yellow and masses of green foliage that brushed against the wall. Suddenly he encountered an abrupt corner of rock. He rounded it to discover that it ran at right angles with the one he had just passed. Peering up through the willows, he ascertained that there was a narrow crack in the main wall of the canyon. It had been concealed by willows low down and leaning spruces above, a wild hidden retreat. Along the base of the wall there were tracks of small animals. The place was odorous, like all dense thickets, but it was not dry. Water ran through there somewhere. Jean drew easier breath. All sounds except the rustling of birds or mice in the willows had ceased. The break was pervaded by a dreary emptiness. Jean decided to steal on a little farther, then wait till he felt he might safely dare go back. The golden-green gloom suddenly brightened. Light showed ahead, and parting the willows, he looked out into a narrow, winding canyon, with an open, grassy, willow-streaked lane in the center, and on each side a thin strip of woodland. His surprise was short-lived. A crashing of horses back of him in the willows gave him a shock. He ran out along the base of the wall, back of the trees. Like the strip of woodland in the main canyon, this one was scant and had but little underbrush. 
there were young spruces growing with thick branches clear to the grass, and under these he could have concealed himself. But with a certainty of sheepdogs in the vicinity, he would not think of hiding except as a last resource. These horsemen, whoever they were, were likely to be sheep herders as not. Jean slackened his pace to look back. He could not see any moving objects, but he still heard horses, though not so close now. Ahead of him, this narrow gorge opened out like the neck of a bottle. He would run on to the head of it and find a place to climb to the top. Hurried and anxious as Jean was, he received an impression of singular wild nature of this side gorge. It was a hidden, pine-fringed crack in the rock-ribbed and canyon-cut tableland. Above him, the sky seemed a winding stream of blue. The walls were red and bulged out in spruce-greened shelves. From wall to wall was scarcely a distance of a hundred feet. Jumbles of rocks obstructed his close holding to the wall. He had to walk at the edge of the timber. As he progressed, the gorge widened into wilder, ruggeder aspect. Through the trees ahead, he saw where the wall circled to meet the cliff on the left, forming an oval depression, the nature of which he could not ascertain. But it appeared to be a small opening, surrounded by dense thickets and the overhanging walls. Anxiety augmented to alarm. He might not be able to find a place to scale those rough cliffs. Breathing hard, Jean halted again. The situation was growing critical again. His physical condition was worse. Loss of sleep and rest, lack of food, the long pursuit of Queen, the wound in his arm, and the desperate run for his life, these had weakened him to the extent that if he undertook any strenuous effort he would fail. His cunning weighed all chances. The shade of wall and foliage above and another jumble of ruined cliff hindered his survey of the ground ahead, and he almost stumbled upon a cabin, hidden on three sides, with a small bear clearing in front. It was an old ramshackle structure, like others he had run across in the canyons. Cautiously he approached, and peeped around the corner. At first swift glance, it had all the appearance of long disuse. But Jean had no time for another look. A clip-clop of trotting horses on hard ground brought the same pell-mell rush of sensations that had driven him to wild flight scarcely an hour past. His body jerked with its instinctive impulse, then quivered with his restraint. To turn back would be risky, to run ahead would be fatal. To hide was his one hope. No covert behind, and the clip-clop of hoofs sounded closer. One moment longer, Jean held mastery over his instincts of self-preservation. To keep from running was almost impossible. It was the sheer primitive animal sense to escape. He drove it back and glided along the front of the cabin. Here he saw the cabin adjoined another. Reaching the door, he was about to peep in when the thud of hoofs and voices close at hand transfixed him with a grim certainty that he had not an instant to lose. Through the thin, black streak line of trees, he saw moving red objects. Horses, he must run. Passing the door, his keen nose caught a musty, woody odor, and the tail of his eye saw a bare dirt floor. The cabin was unused. He halted, gave a quick look back, and the first thing his eye fell upon was a ladder, right inside the door, against the wall. He looked up. It led to a loft that, dark and gloomy, stretched halfway across the cabin. An irresistible impulse drove Jean. Slipping inside, he climbed up the ladder to the loft. It was like night up there. But he crawled on the rough-hewn rafters, and, turning with his head toward the opening, he stretched out and lay still. What seemed an interminable moment ended with a trample of hoofs outside the cabin. It ceased. Jean's vibrating ear caught the jingle of spurs and a thud of boots striking the ground. Well, sweetheart, here we are home again, drawled a slow, cool, mocking Texas voice. Home? 
I wonder, Coulter, did you ever have a home, a mother, a sister, much less a sweetheart? Was the reply bitter and caustic. Jean's palpitating, hot body suddenly stretched still and cold with intensity of shock. His very bones seemed to quiver and stiffen into ice. During the instant of realization, his heart stopped, and a slow, contracting pressure enveloped his breast and moved up to constrict his throat. That woman's voice belonged to Ellen Jorth. The sound of it had lingered in his dreams. He had stumbled upon the rendezvous of the Jorth faction. Hard indeed had been the fates meted out to those of the Isbels and Jorths who had passed to their deaths. But no ordeal, not even Queen's, could compare with this desperate one Jean must endure. He had loved Ellen Jorth strangely, wonderfully, and he had scorned repute to believe her good. He had spared her father and her uncle. He had weakened or lost the cause of the Isbels. He loved her now, desperately, deathlessly, knowing from her own lips that she was worthless, loved her the more because he had felt her terrible shame, and to him, the last of the Isbels, had come the cruelest of dooms, to be caught like a crippled rat in a trap, to be compelled to lie, helpless, wounded, without a gun, to listen, and perhaps to see Ellen Jorth enact the very truth of her mocking insinuation. His will, his promise, his creed, his blood must hold him to the stern decree that he should be the last man of the jorth Isbel War. But could he lie there to hear, to see, when he had a knife and an arm? End of chapter 13, part 2《Section 27 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, Part 1. Then followed the leathery flop of saddles to the soft turf and the stamp of loosened horses. Jean heard a noise at the cabin door, a rustle, and then a knock of something hard against wood. Silently, he moved his head to look down through a crack between the rafters. He saw the glint of a rifle leaning against the sill. Then the doorstep was darkened. Ellen Jorth sat down with a long, tired sigh. She took off her sombrero, and the light shone on the rippling dark brown hair, hanging in a tangled braid. The curved nape of her neck showed a warm tint of golden tan. She wore a gray blouse, soiled and torn, that clung to her lissom shoulders. "'Coulter, what are you going to do?' she asked suddenly. Her voice carried something Jean did not remember. It thrilled into the icy fixity of his senses. "'We'll stay here,' was the response, and it was followed by a clinking step of spurred boot. "'Sure I won't stay here,' declared Ellen. "'It makes me sick.' when I think of how Uncle Tad died in there alone, helpless, suffering. The place seems haunted. Well, I'll agree that it's tough on you, but what the hell can we do? A long silence ensued, which Ellen did not break. Something has come off round here since early morning, declared Coulter. Summers and Springer haven't got back, and Antonio's gone. Now, honest, Ellen, didn't you hear rifle shots off somewhere? I reckon I did, she responded gloomily. And which way? Sounded to me, up on the bluff, back pretty far. Well, sure, that's my idea, and it makes me think hard. You know, Summers came across the last camp of the Isbels, and he dug into a grave to find the bodies of Jim Gordon and another man he didn't know. Queen kept good as brag. He braced that Isbel gang and killed those fellas, but either him or Jean Isbel went off, leaving bloody tracks. If it was Queen's, you can bet Isbel was after him. And if it was Isbel's tracks, why, sure, Queen would stick to them. Summers and Springer couldn't follow the trail. They're sure not much good at tracking. But for days they've been riding the woods, hoping to run across Queen. Well, now, maybe they run across Isbel instead. And if they did and got away from him, They'll be here sooner or later. If Isbel was too many for them, he'd hunt for my trail. 
I'm gambling that either Queen or Jean Isbel is dead. I'm hoping it's Isbel, because if he ain't dead, he's the last of the Isbels, and maybe I'm the last of the Jorth gang. Sure, I'm not hankering to meet the half-breed. That's why I say we'll stay here. This is as good a hiding place as there is in the country. We've grub. There's water and grass. Me stay here with you alone? The tone seemed a contradiction to the apparently accepted sense of her words. Jean held his breath. But he could not still the slowly mounting and accelerating faculties within that were involuntarily rising to meet some strange, nameless import. He felt it. He imagined it would be the catastrophe of Ellen Jorth's calm acceptance of Coulter's proposition. But down in Jean's miserable heart lived something that would not die. No mere words could kill it. How poignant the moment of her silence! How terribly he realized that if his intelligence and his emotion had believed her betraying words, his soul had not. But Ellen Jorth did not speak. Her brown head hung thoughtfully. Her supple shoulders sagged a little. "'Ellen, what's happened to you?' went on Coulter. "'All the misery possible to a woman,' she replied dejectedly. "'Sure I don't mean that way,' he continued persuasively. "'I ain't gainsaying the hard facts of your life. It's been bad. Your dad was no good. But I mean, I can't figure the change in you.' "'No, I reckon you can't,' she said. Whoever was responsible for your makeup left out a mind, not to say feeling. Coulter drawled a low laugh. Well, have that your own way. But how much longer are you going to be like this here? Like what? she rejoined sharply. Well, this standoffishness of yours. Coulter, I told you to let me alone, she said sullenly. Sure, and you did that before. But this time you're different, and well, I'm getting tired of it. Here, the cool, slow voice of the Texan sounded an inflexibility before absent, a timber that hinted of illimitable power. Ellen Jorth shrugged her lithe shoulders, and slowly rising, she picked up the little rifle and turned the step into the cabin. Coulter, she said, fetch my pack and my blankets in here. Sure, he returned with good nature. Jean saw Ellen Jorth lay the rifle lengthwise in a chink between two logs, and then slowly turn back to the wall. Jean knew her then, yet did not know her. The brown flash of her face seemed that of an older, graver woman. His strained gaze, like his waiting mind, had expected something he knew not what. A hardened face, a ghost of beauty, a recklessness, a distorted, bitter, lost expression, in keeping with her fortunes. But he had reckoned falsely. She did not look like that. There was incalculable change, but the beauty remained somehow different. Her red lips were parted, her brooding eyes, looking out straight from under the level, dark brows, seemed slow black and wonderful with her steady, passionate light. Jean, in his eager, hungry, devouring of the beloved face, did not on the first instant grasp the significance of its expression. He was seeing the features that had haunted him, but quickly he interpreted her expression as the somber, hunted look of a woman who would bear no more. Under the torn blouse her full breast heaved. She held her hands clenched at her sides. She was listening, waiting, for that jangling, slow step. It came, and with the sound she subtly changed. She was a woman hiding her true feelings. She relaxed, and that strong, dark look of fury seemed to fade back into her eyes. Coulter appeared at the door, carrying a roll of blankets and a pack. "'Throw them here,' she said, "'and I reckon you needn't bother coming in.' That angered the man. With one long stride he stepped over the door still, down into the cabin, and flung the blankets at her feet and then the pack after it. Whereupon, he deliberately sat down in the door facing her. With one hand he slid off his sombrero, which fell outside, and with the other, he reached into his upper vest pocket for the little bag of tobacco that showed there. 
All the time he looked at her. By the light now unobstructed, Jean descried Colter's face, and the sight of it then sounded the roll and drum of his passions. "'Well, Ellen, I reckon we'll have it out right now and here,' he said, and with tobacco in one hand, paper in the other, he began the operations of making a cigarette. However, he scarcely removed his glance from her. "'Yes?' queried Ellen Jorth. "'I'm going to have things the way they were before, and more,' he declared. The cigarette paper shook in his fingers. "'What do you mean?' she demanded. "'You know what I mean,' he retorted. Voice and action were subtly unhinging this man's control over himself. "'Maybe I don't. I reckon you'd better talk plain.' The rustler had clear, gray-yellow eyes, flawless like crystal, and suddenly they danced with little fiery flecks. "'The last time I laid my hand on you I got hit for my pains.' and sure that been ranklin colter you'll get hit again if you put your hands on me she said dark straight glance on him a frown wrinkled the level brows you mean that he asked thickly i sure do manifestly he accepted her assertion something of the incredulity and bewilderment that had vied with his resentment utterly disappeared from his face here I've been waiting for you to love me, he declared, with a gesture not without dignified emotion. Your giving in without that wasn't so much to me. And at these words of the rustlers, Jean Isabel felt an icy, sickening shudder creep into his soul. He shut his eyes. The end of his dream had been long in coming, but at last it had arrived. A mocking voice, like a hollow wind, echoed through that region that lonely and ghost-like hall of his heart which had harbored faith. She burst into speech, louder and sharper, the first words of which Jean's strangely throbbing ears did not distinguish. You? I never gave in to you, and I never will. But, girl, I kissed you, hugged you, handled you, he expostulated, and the making of the cigarette ceased. Yes, you did, you brute, when I was so downhearted and weak. I couldn't lift my hand, she flashed. Ah, you mean I couldn't do that now? I should smile I do, Jim Coulter, she replied. Well, maybe I see presently, he went on, straining with words. But I'm sure curious. Dags, then. He was nothing to you? No more than you, she said morbidly. He used to run after me long ago, it seems. I was only a girl then, innocent and I'd not known any but rough men. I couldn't, all the time, every day, every hour, keep him at arm's length. Sometimes, before I knew, I didn't care. I was a child. A kiss meant nothing to me. But after I knew... Ellen dropped her head in brooding silence. So do you expect me to believe that? he queried, with a derisive leer. Bah! What do I care what you believe? she cried, with lifting head. How about Sim Bruce? That coyote? He lied about me, Jim Coulter. And any man, half a man, would have known he lied. Well, Sim always bragged about you being his girl, asserted Coulter. And he wasn't over particular about details of your love making. Ellen gazed out of the door, over Coulter's head, as if the forest out there was a refuge. She evidently sensed more about the man than appeared in his slow talk in his slouching position. Her lips shut in a firm line, as if to hide their trembling and to still her passionate tongue. Jean, in his absorption, magnified his perceptions. Not yet was Ellen Jorth afraid of this man, but she feared the situation. Jean's heart was at bursting pitch. All within him seemed chaos, a wreck of beliefs and convictions. Nothing was true. He would wake presently out of a nightmare. Yet, as surely as he quivered there, he felt the imminence of a great moment, a lightning flash, a thunderbolt, a balance struck. Coulter attended to the forgotten cigarette. He rolled it, lighted it, all the time with lowered, pondering head. And when he had puffed a cloud of smoke, he suddenly looked up with face as hard as flint, eyes as fiery as molten steel. Well, Ellen... How about Jean Isabel 
our half-breed Nez Pierce friend, who was sure seen handling you familiar, he drawled. Ellen Jorth quivered as under a lash. Her brown face turned a dusty scarlet that slowly receding left her pale. Damn you, Jim Coulter, she burst out furiously. I wish John Isabel would jump in that door or down out of that loft. He killed Greaves for defiling my name. He'd kill you for your dirty insult. And I'd like to watch him do it, you cold-blooded Texan. You thieving rustler, you liar. You lied about my father's death, and I know why. You stole my father's gold, and now you want me. You expect me to fall into your arms. My heaven, can't you tell a decent woman? Was your mother decent? Was your sister decent? Bah, I'm appealing to deafness. But you hear this, Jim Coulter. I'm not what you think I am. I'm not the, the damned hussy you liars have made me out. I'm a Jorth, alas. I've no home, no relatives, no friends. I've been forced to live my life with rustlers, vile men like you and Dags, and the rest of your like. But I've been good. Do you hear that? I am good. So help me, God. And you and all your rottenness can't make me bad. Coulter lounged to his tall height, and the laxity of the man vanished. Vanished also was John Isabel's suspended icy dread, the cold clogging of his fevered mind, vanished in a white, living, leaping flame. Silently he drew his knife, and lay there watching with eyes of a wildcat. The instant Coulter stepped far enough over toward the edge of the loft, Jean meant to bound erect and plunge down upon him. But Jean could wait now. Coulter had a gun at his hip. He must never have a chance to draw it. "'And so you wish Jean Isabel would hop in here, do you?' queried Coulter. "'Well, if I had any pity on you, that's done for it.' A sweep of his long arm so swift, Ellen had no time to move, brought his hand in clutching contact with her. And the force of it flung her half across the cabin room, leaving the sleeve of her blouse in his grasp. Panting, she put out that bared arm and her other to ward him off as he took long, slow strides toward her. Jean rose half to his feet, dragged almost by ungovernable passion to risk all in one leap. But the distance was too great. Coulter, blind as he was to all outward things, would hear, would see in time, to make Jean's effort futile. Shaking like a leaf, Jean sank back, I again to the crack between the rafters. Ellen did not retreat, nor scream, nor move. Every line of her body was instinct with fight, and the magnificent blaze of her eyes would have checked a less callous brute. Coulter's big hand darted between Ellen's arms and fastened in the front of her blouse. He did not try to hold her or draw her close. The unleashed passion of the man required violence. In one savage pull, he tore off her blouse, exposing her white, rounded shoulders and heaving bosom, where instantly a wave of red burned upward. Overcome by the tremendous violence and spirit of the rustler, Ellen sank to her knees with blanched face and dilating eyes, trying with folded arms and trembling hand to hide her nudity. At that moment, the rapid beat of hoofs on the hard trail outside halted Coulter in his tracks. Hell, he exclaimed, and who's that? With a fierce action, he flung the remnants of Ellen's blouse in her face and turned to leap out the door. Jean saw Ellen catch the blouse and try to wrap it around her while she sagged against the wall and stared at the door. The hoofbeats pounded to a solid thumping halt just outside. Jim, there's hell to pay, rasped out a panting voice. Well, Springer, I reckon I wish you paid it without spoiling my deals, reported Coulter, cool and sharp. Deals, huh? You'll be forgetting your lady love in a minute, replied Springer, when I catch my breath. Where's Summers? demanded Coulter. I reckon he's all shot up, if my eyes didn't fool me. Where is he? yelled Coulter. Jimmy's lying up in the bushes round that bluff. I didn't wait to see how he was hurt, but he sure stopped some lead, and he flopped like a chicken with its head cut off. Where's Antonio? 
He run like the greaser he is, declared Springer disgustedly. Ah, and where's Queen? queried Coulter, after a significant pause. Dead. End of chapter 14, part 1. Section 28 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, Part 2. The silence ensuing was fraught with a suspense that held Jean in cold bonds. He saw the girl below rise from her knees, one hand holding the blouse to her breast, the other extended, and with strange, repressed, almost frantic look, she swayed toward the door. "'Well, talk,' ordered Coulter harshly. "'Jim, there ain't a hell of a lot,' replied Springer, drawing a deep breath. "'But what there is is sure interesting. Me and Summers took Antonio with us. He left his woman with the sheep. And we rode up the canyon, clumb out on top, and made a circle back on the ridge. That's the way we've been hunting for tracks.' Up there in a bare spot, we run plumb into Queen, sitting against a tree, right out in the open. Queer sight you ever seen. The damn gunfighter had set down to wait for Isabel, who was trailing him, as we suspected. And he died there. He wasn't cold when we found him. Summers was quick to see a trick, so he propped Queen up and tied the guns to his hands. And Jim, the queerest thing about that deal was this. Queen's guns was empty, not a shell left. It beat us holler. We left him there and hid up high on the bluff, maybe a hundred yards off. The horses we left back of a thicket, and we waited there for a long time. But sure enough, the half-breed come. He was too smart, too much injun. He would not cross the open, but went around. And then he seen Queen. It was great to watch him. After a little... He shoved his rifle out and went right for Queen. This is when I wanted to shoot. I could have plugged him, but Summer says wait and make it sure. When Isbel got up to Queen, he was sort of half hid by a tree. I couldn't wait no longer, so I shot. I hit him, too. We all begun to shoot. Summer showed himself, and that's when Isbel opened up. He used up a whole magazine on Summer's, and then, sudden-like, he quit. It didn't take me long to figure maybe he was out of shells. When I seen him run, I was certain of it. Then we made for the horses and rode after Isbel. Pretty soon I seen him running like a deer down the ridge. I yelled and spurred after him. There's where Antonio quit me. But I kept on, and I got a shot at Isbel. He ran out of sight. I followed him by spots of blood on the stones and grass until I couldn't trail him no more. He must have gone down over the cliffs. He couldn't have done nothing else without me seeing him. I found his rifle, and here it is to prove what I say. I had to go back to climb down off the rim, and I rode fast down the canyon. He's somewhere along that west wall, hiding in the brush. Hard hit, if I know anything about the color of blood. "'Well, that beats me holla, too,' ejaculated Coulter. "'Jim, what's to be done?' inquired Springer eagerly. "'If we're sharp, we can corral that half-breed. "'He's the last of the Isbels.' "'More, pard. "'He's the last of the Isbel outfit,' declared Coulter. "'If you can show me blood in his tracks, I'll trail him.' "'You can bet I'll show you,' rejoined the other rustler. "'But listen.' Wouldn't it be better for us first to see if he crossed the canyon? I reckon he didn't, but let's make sure. And if he didn't, we'll have him somewhere along the West Canyon wall. He's not got no gun. He'll never run that way if he had. Jim, he's our meat. Sure, he'll have that knife, pondered Coulter. We needn't worry about that, said the other positively. He's hard hit, I tell you. All we gotta do is find that bloody trail again and stick to it. Going careful. He's laying low like a crippled wolf. Springer, I want the job of finishing that half-breed, his Coulter. I'll give ten years of my life to stick a gun down his throat and shoot it off. All right, let's rustle. 
Maybe you'll not have to give much more than ten minutes, because I tell you I can find him. It's been easy, but, Jim, I reckon I was afraid. Leave your horse for me and go ahead, the rustler then said brusquely. I've got a job in the cabin here. Ha, ha. Well, Jim, I'll rustle a bit down the trail and wait. No hunting John Isbel alone, not for me. I've had a queer feeling about that knife he used on Greaves, and I reckon you ought to let that Jorth hussy alone long enough to... Springer, I reckon I've got the hog tire. His voice became indistinguishable, and footsteps attested to a slow moving away of the men. Jean had listened with ears acutely strung to catch every syllable, while his gaze rested upon Ellen who stood beside the door. Every line of her body denoted a listening intensity. Her back was toward Jean, so that he could not see her face. And he did not want to see. But he could not help seeing her naked shoulders. She put her head out of the door. Suddenly, she drew it in quickly and half turned her face, slowly raising her white arm. This was the left one, and bore the mark of Coulter's hard fingers. She gave a little gasp. Her eyes became large and staring. They were bent on the hand that she had removed from a step on the ladder. On hand and wrist showed a bright red smear of blood. Jean, with a convulsive leap of his heart, realized that he had left his bloody tracks on the ladder as he had climbed. That moment seemed the supremely terrible one of his life. Ellen Jorth's face blanched and her eyes darkened and dilated with exceeding amaze and flashing thought to become fixed with horror. That instant was the one in which her reason connected the blood on the ladder with the escape of Jean Isbel. One moment she leaned there, still as a stone except for her heaving breast, and then her fixed gaze changed to a swift, 